Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. The non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade Detective Agency. Are you still there? I believe that interpolation is hardly rhetorical, Mr. Spade. To what have you been up, if you'll pardon the expression? And has that girl regained her facilities? I uh, wouldn't know, but her uh, faculties are as good as ever, if you'll pardon the expression. Mr. Spade, sometimes I think you're a regular philanthropist. Don't you mean philanderer? How much money did you make out of that case? Well, I uh, broke even, anyway. That's what I mean. You're a philanthropist. Well, you know best, Bernadine. By the way, was that man really murdered with the bus saw, or was that just publicity? He really was, Bernadine. Why? There just happened to be one lying around. Oh, I don't mean that. Why was he killed? For the wheel of life. Oh. You're not going to ask what that is? Some curio, no doubt. Listen, Bernadine, the wheel of life is, uh... Oh, well. I suppose I don't have to tell you to stay where you are. Just sit quietly with your book in your hand, and I'll be right down to dictate my report on the wheel of life caper. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Come on, mister, give the gals a break. Treat them to a look-see at a really handsome head of hair, neat, well-groomed hair, the way yours is going to look when you spruce up with Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Famous Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, removes loose, ugly dandruff. So how about it, men? Why hold off any longer when now's the time to get Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic? Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. I went down to St. James Infirmary to see my baby there. Ready, Bernadine, little flower? I'm way ahead of you. Keep it clean. No more than three erasures per page. Okie dokie. Oak. I mean doke. I mean date. Oh, I'd love to. July 11, 1948. To uh, Detective Lieutenant Dundee, homicide detail, San Francisco police. Subject, the uh, wheel of life caper. Now, don't go away, Bernadine. I don't know why these things always have to happen to me. Under private detectives in the San Francisco Classified Directory, there are listed somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 agencies, several with large display ads. But somehow she managed to find me. It's all so strange, Mr. Spade. I hardly know where to begin. Well, the beginning is always a pretty good place to start, Miss O'Farrell. Yes, the beginning. It was like waking out of a nightmare you can't remember. Everything seemed out of proportion. Even the buildings along the street seemed to be leaning at a crazy angle. And then I realized I was traveling down a hill. I looked wildly around for something to help me get my bearings, and there was a street sign, O'Farrell, stuck in my mind, so I gave it to your secretary when she asked for my name. Uh Uh-huh. And what's your real name? I don't know. I don't know who I am, where I came from, or where I'm going. Mr. Spade, I'm so frightened. Uh, Now, wait a minute. A lot of people suffer from uh, temporary loss of memory. Uh, Most of them recover But amnesia is a sickness, and I am not a doctor. Oh, and you won't even try to help me? Well, I can give you the name of a good head doctor right here in the building. There's also uh, missing persons. But I'm not a missing person. I'm right here. Yeah, I mean, where you aren't, somebody might be missing you, Nespa. But the police! Oh, I'd rather not. I I might be wanted for some crime. How do I know? You sure you want to find out? Oh, yes, I do. I do. It's terrible not knowing. But I want to find out for myself. Can't you understand that? What do you think I can do for you? You might save my life. From what? 
I'll try to tell you exactly how it happened. First, I looked at my watch. It was three minutes past ten. The cable car stopped at the corner and a man got on. I, I couldn't remember ever having seen him before, but then I couldn't remember anything. He sat down beside me and he caught hold of my arm. I tried to pull away. Well, you can see the marks where he... Yeah. Well, who was he? He acted as if I were... I think I know what you mean. Did you uh, find out who he was? No, no, I was too frightened to speak. What did he say? He sort of growled it out of the side of his mouth, but it sounded as if he said, Lathrop wants to see you. Mm -hmm. You remember anybody named Lathrop? I can't remember anything before three minutes past ten this morning. Well, let's go on with since then. The guy grabbed you, said somebody named Lathrop wanted to see you, and then what? I I went into a panic. I managed to jerk away from him, and I jumped off the moving car, and then I looked in the classified section, and I found you. Why me? I don't know. The name, I guess. A spade to dig up my past. Please, Miss O'Farrell. <laughs> Do you think I'm very silly? No, I think you're very beautiful. I wish you could remember whether you're married or not. Oh, no. Well, at least I have no wedding ring. Uh, what have you got? I mean, besides what's visible. Well, I couldn't find much of anything. I went over my clothing. There don't seem to be any, seem to be any marks of any kind. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, you got any money? Well, a little over $300. Let's have it. The purse, too. All right. Uh Uh-huh, lipstick, aspirin, bobby pins, Kleenex. Uh, Nothing here that couldn't have been bought in any (sighs) drugstore. Powder. (coughs) Hey, what kind of powder is this? Uh, Then there was this in my coat pocket. A match folder. Sailor's Rest Bar, Hotel Calcutta, 1100 Embarcadero. Little number written inside. 120. What's that, a room number? I don't know. My purse, you have to destroy. Here's $10 of your own money. Buy a new one. Well. Did you find something? Coin, Chinese bit. Good luck piece, probably sewn in by whoever made it, maybe in China. That uh, ring any bells? Mm, No. No, I'm afraid not. Shoe. What? Your right shoe. Let's see it. Take it off. Uh, You aren't going to tear it up the way you did the purse, are you? Uh Uh-huh. Dust. Plaster dust. Is that a clue? I don't know, is it? I'm not a detective. Well, you are in this case, baby. If it doesn't mean anything to you, it doesn't mean anything. Oh, it doesn't. That's everything. What am I going to do? Well, let me see. First, we better give you a name. Oh, Farrell's all right. You look like, uh, well, uh, Lana would do, but, no, well, that's in use. Uh, how about, uh, Poppy for forgetfulness? Poppy O'Farrell. <laughs> that's a funny name. No, you think so? Huh? Uh, I think I like it. You do? I think I like you, too. I liked her, too. There may have been blanks in her brain, but the rest of her figured. In the elevator, I started adding it up, and by the time we reached the street floor, it came to quite a tidy sum. Where are we going, Sam? Far, I hope. But uh, first, we're going to find you a place to stay. Oh, yes, we must be practical. No use overdoing it, huh? Oh, no, Sam, I didn't mean... (gasps) Wait... What's the matter? You remember something? That man, the one who followed me this morning, he's standing right out there waiting. The one in the straw hat leaning against the newsstand? Yes. Where are you going, Sam? You stay here. I just remembered something I hoped I could forget. Hello, Shuggy. What brings you back to town? Do I know you? That doesn't matter. I know you. The name you were using when you blew this town was Shuggy Bellows. You wouldn't take the risk of showing your face here again unless the caper was worth it. You've got a big nose. Keep it clean. You've been tailing that girl all day. Why? Damn what damn. Who's Lathrop? I don't remember. Okay, I'll give you a chance to think it over. Hey, officer! You dirty hey, shamash yelling cop. No, no, you don't. Come hey, here. Here, here, no, what's going on here? Break it up. Oh, oh, Mr. Spade. Is this fella giving you trouble now? Yeah, what kind of a beat are you pounding here, Clancy? Letting a cheap grifter like this walk around with an arm kept full of gun? Or are they handing out permits to characters like these this day? Uh, these well, days? now, uh, how about that, son? Uh, have you a permit now? And a goop, copper. Oh, so one of them clever lads he is. What? Come along, me bucko, before I lose me temper and give you your lumps out. Okay, okay, I'm coming. That's better now. Uh, much obliged, Mr. Spade. I'll pay you for this, Thomas. And I goop to you, too. I was sure he would, but I was also sure that I wouldn't have to worry about him for the rest of the night. I checked Poppy O'Farrell in at the Belvedere, locked her in her room, and told Tiny Stover, the house dick, to keep an eye on her. When I left him, he was, and uh, he seemed to be enjoying his work. Then I headed for the Embarcadero. (laughs) 
I found the Hotel Calcutta, but I couldn't find the lobby. There wasn't any. It had been squeezed out by the sailor's rest bar. So I tried the bosun-type bartender. Howdy, mate. You, you got business aboard? Yeah, where do I find the purser? He went ashore. All the officers went ashore except the janitor. He's passed out in his bunk. Oh, how about the passengers? Uh, you're in the thick of them right now. They spend most of their time and their money right here. Uh, which one belongs to 120? You a dick? Yeah, but I got ten bucks. Well, what I can tell you ain't worth it, but thanks anyway. He stayed in his cabin. I only saw him at once. That's when he went ashore. I says to the deck steward, that's room clerk to you, who's a general. He says, name of Coralenko. I noticed him because he was a real creep, see? Six foot four, a solid brass. His head stuck up in the air, and he didn't move nothing from his stern to his shoulders. A real Frankenstein. Hey, do I keep it then? Yeah. Do I get a look at his room? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Who's stopping you? So I went. Nobody stopped me until I opened the door to 120. Then I stopped myself. It was an inside room with one small window and an air shaft. But it looked as if a flurry of snow had blown in. The floor and the rest of the flat surfaces were sprinkled with a fine, dirty white powder. It wasn't snow, it was dust. Plaster dust. Like the stuff I'd found in Poppy's handbag and on her shoes. I shook the place down, not expecting to find anything. I didn't until I opened the wardrobe. It was the body of a well-dressed ship surgeon. But his uniform was rumpled, torn, and bloodstained. From the look of him, his throat had been cut. I wondered if Poppy would be able to jog her memory that far back. When I found the murder weapon, I hoped she couldn't. I really did. It was not a knife. It was not even a razor. It was an electric buzzsaw. That tore it. Makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. And no wonder. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose dandruff. What's more, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil is the only leading hair tonic that contains soothing lanolin. So ask for Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too. And mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to the Wheel of Life caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Times being what they are, I could use a little publicity. And so could you, Lieutenant Dundee. What with the elections coming up and you with no promotion all these years? This one time, I got it instead of you and wished I hadn't. The morning papers called it the buzzsaw murder and went on shamelessly from there. Horror killing related by private eye. Stan Slade, ex-Pinkerton man, mum on Mystery Woman. Elderly sleuth, dodges photographers, denies hotel visit, was in bed with Apple and Good Book, says Peeper. There wasn't a word of truth in it, mainly because nobody could get at the facts. I wasted most of the day down at headquarters trying to find out what name Shuggy Bellows had been booked under. Then I dropped in at the Belvedere. Poppy had checked out. I decided to go back to my office and drink poison. I hardly got the desk drawer open when a sobering influence walked in. It was a Mr. Six Feet Four of solid brass. The Frankenstein, who had been described to me by the bartender, is the occupant of room 120. Excuse me. I am Korlenko. Please, I shall sit down. I am so heavy. Make yourself at home. Oh. Mr. Swade, 
Uh, Slade. Uh, uh, excuse me, I am so heavy. I, I am Korlenko. So you told me. I am really Spade myself. So, why are she hiding from me? Who? That girl, Miss Paget. Her, I am paying one month in advance, $300 American. Me, she have dessert. I am not rich, only moderately wealthy. But you understand, it's not a question from Monius alone. That ship's doctor, he was most kind to me. He cared to me even after I arrived. Now he are dead for his pains, his dirty trick. Yeah, 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 I know how you feel. Now, if you'll uh, take it a little easy, I think we'll get farther. You say this girl's name is uh, Paget, and she traveled with you. Uh, from Macau, da. Uh, where she is the Florence Nightingale for Portuguese hospitals, forcing me to employ her, all others being Chinese nuns. That figures. You were uh, sick? No, only I am so heavy, they are breaking my back in traffic accident, a rickshaw collusion. You're uh, wearing a plastic cast? Yes, like a turtle, I am close with my neck sticking out. Look, see? Now it is better as before. The ship's doctor trimmed the rough edges with buzz saw. Buzz, 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 I can walk. But it's like suit from armor, for which I alive. Look. <laughs> I looked again where he opened his shirt front, exposing the gray-white shell of plaster that surrounded his trunk from collarbone to hips. In a six-inch circle over the left side of his chest, I counted four bullet gouges. I dug one of the slugs out and examined it. It was 32 caliber. The plastic cast, which was molded to the shape of his body, was no more than an inch thick. I didn't see how it had stopped the slugs, but it had. About then, the parts of Korolenko that were not held rigid in the cast began to tremble violently. Why are they doing this? Why? To a virtually helpless man. Why, Mr. Spade? Why? 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 Uh, Where did you have that cast put on? Don't I said Macau? The Portuguese hospital there? The same. They are hanging me up with the neck and plastering me. Comes great pain, they put me to sleep from anesthetic. I I are waking up in ambulance arriving at shipboard. Why you wish I should tell you my operation? More important things we should be discussing. Uh, I think so, too. I think Miss Paget and her friends had something they wanted to smuggle out of Macau and into San Francisco, and you're it. Oh, excuse me. I, I am not comprehensible. Look, I mean, while you were out with the anesthetic, they uh, planted the goods, whatever they are, in or under your cast. Oh, oh, that is why I am so heavy. The wheel, the wheel. The what? The wheel. Look, I show you. He hauled a manila envelope out of his overcoat pocket and waved it in my face. I took it over to my desk and fished out the contents. It was a set of X-ray films. Three of his spine showing the fractures, four of the skull, three I couldn't figure out, and one of his rib cage. Only something new had been added. In silhouette, it looked like the wheel off of a child's wagon. What is it, this wheel? What to do? What to do? Six months I must remain in this straits jacket. If I remove it, I die. If I keep it on, it, they kill me to get their smuggled. Well, you look to me like the luckiest man alive. That wheel or whatever it is saved your life by stopping four slugs. But still I shall die. How shall I die? When shall I die? Your best advice is please. Korolenko, I think you'd better die right now. Excuse me? It's the only safe place for you. The morgue. <laughs> I called my friend Maxie the morgue man, gave him pitch number 137596. He agreed to play along. An hour later, I stood on the curb, head bowed, hat in hand, as the morgue wagon drove away into the gathering mist. Stay facing the way, uh... What do you want, Shuggy? I want to blast this gun straight through you, and I will if you give me any excuse at all. You sound like you mean that, Shuggy. You're getting smart, Shamus. I get going. Where to? Mr. Lathrop wants to see you. Shuggy, dear boy, you've not failed me this time. This will be the fabled Mr. Spade, eh? Come in, come in, come in. Ah, sit down, Mr. Spade. 
We'll talk. Tell your guns to get that pistol out of my ribs. Oh, yes, indeed, Sugar. You mustn't overdo it. And get him out of here. I'm tired and nervous, and my price goes up a thousand bucks every minute he's in this room. When I get to ten thousand, I kill him. Then the price jumps to a hundred to take care of me on a murder rap. I should ought to plug you downstairs. Come, come, Sugar. Don't be ungracious. You wait in the other room now. Okay, it's your party. I get mine later. <laughs> oh, dear. His bite's much worse than his bark, Mr. Spade. Don't start boring me so early in the evening. I came here to talk about the wheel. Oh, so you know about the wheel. I do better than that. I've got it. That may well be, but uh, do you know what to do with it? I got two possibilities. I can turn it over to the cops and you with it, or I can sit on it until it hatches. <laughs> A quaint conceit, sir. Round and round the little wheel goes, and where it shall stop, nobody knows. That's where you're wrong. It stops right here. So you better start placing your bets. Well, just what do you mean by that, sir? There's part of it. What is it? It's one of the slugs your guns will throw at Korolenko. I got three more just like it that I dug out of him before he was carried to the morgue. Well, huh. an advantage, I'll admit. But uh, hardly worth your while to take advantage of. Don't be too sure of that. Just uh, how much do you know about the wheel? So far, it's been worth two human lives to you at the risk of your own. That tells me all I need to know. Oh, no, not quite. Men have been killed in hold-ups for a few paltry sovereigns, but the wheel oh, is a horse of another color. Well, let's not change wheel horses in midstream, Mr. Lathrop. <laughs> yes. You must understand that the wheel has no absolute finitive value. Uh, monetarily speaking, the British Museum might pay close on to 5,000 pounds, hot as it is for the privilege of returning it. <laughs> Occidentals aren't the puka saibs that they once were in the Orient. The theft of the wheel, if countenanced by the Western powers, would have most grave consequences. Most grave. Uh, are you attending, sir? Wake me up when you get to the point. Ah, well, the point, sir, is this. That little wheel, that little wheel of gold, is the wheel of life, which the Buddha himself is said to have received into his hands from paradise. Now... Given such a relic, a few old Buddhist monks can set up a shrine which even in the most miserable surroundings can attract enough pilgrims to outgross Radio City, Madison Square Garden, and Miami Beach in season. To say nothing of Hialeah. Uh, yes, quite. In short, we propose to act as booking agents for the wheel on a royalty basis with a percentage of the house. Mm -hmm. Why did you bring it to San Francisco? But good God, sir. Were we to bargain in the Orient, we should be hacked to pieces in our beds. I'll settle for a lump sum and let you do the bargaining. Uh, and uh, your price, sir? We can talk money later. First, I got to give the cops somebody for the doctor's murder and for Korolenko. Uh -huh. Well, that ought not to be too difficult. Uh, when may I expect delivery? I'll check on it. I went out to St. James Infirmary. <laughs> City Mark. Maxie, Sam Spade. Yes, Sammy. Uh, deal's okay. Send it up. The address is... Sam, the... Sam, wait. Yeah? Sam, you ain't here no more. What happened? Somebody claimed him. A girl. Eh, said she's his daughter. What did he do? When I'm playing dead like you told him to. Maxie, where did she send him? Uh, Avalon Mortuary, Corner Lynch and Hate. Okay, uh, uh, by the way... Uh, yes, yeah, Sammy? Uh, Maxie, put some clean sheets in that morgue wagon, size 16. I may be your next passenger. At the Avalon Mortuary, the night watchman let me in. He said Mr. Korolenko's daughter had brought an overnight bag and was keeping a vigil by his beer in slumber room number seven. I approached on tiptoe. Just as I reached the door, I heard the most terrible sound I've ever heard. It was a buzzsaw biting into plaster. How deep, I didn't like to think. I did the first thing that popped into my head. I grabbed up a lamp from a console, smashed the bulb, and plunged it into a vase of flowers. As luck would have it, slumber room number seven was on the same fuse box. As luck would not have it, I was facing a desperate woman in the dark. I hugged the carpet while she emptied her gun. I hoped she didn't have a spare. I forgot about the buzzsaw. The room lighted up momentarily from the lights inside my head, and I staggered back against the wall. I waited for her to get her bearings again. There was no hope of me getting mine. Then I heard a big, hollow thud. The whole room shook and the lights went on. Poppy O'Farrell and or Paget lay on the floor under the stony weight of Coralenko plus 60 pounds of plaster. Get up! Get up! You're crushing me! 
I can't. I'm so heavy. You, uh, you comfortable there, Korolenko? Comfortable in such situation? Do you ask the turtle, are he comfortable? His faker on bed of nails is equally here as elsewhere. Yeah, okay, okay. Just, just hold her there until I get a statement. And he did. Item, statement by the aforesaid. It was like waking out of a nightmare you can't remember. Everything seemed out of proportion. That was her story, and I had to admire the way she stuck to it. But if you keep trying, I'm sure she'll get back enough of her memory to confess that she planted the wheel of life in Korolenko's turtle shell when she decided to double-cross Shuggy and Lathrop. They never tumbled to her hiding place. They were gunning for Korolenko because they thought Poppy was working with him, which was true in a way, but not the way that they thought. That's why they tortured the doctor in an effort to learn Kay's whereabouts. I understand your boys have picked up the rest of the trio, and they can tell you everything except why I conceived the brilliant idea of having Korolenko play dead. Between you and me, uh, amnesia's a handy little gadget to have around, Dundee. I'm trying to draw a few strategic blanks myself. Period. End of report. Pardon me, Mr. Spade. Yes. There are just a few little coincidentals that I do not find entirely reprehensible. Such, uh, such as? Well, I don't want to appear lucid or anything of that type. Believe but... me, you doesn't. I mean, don't it? Oh, you say the sweetest thing. Mm. Uh, but it's about the wheel. Oh, yes, the wheel. Well, I'll tell you what you do. You type that up. I've got to call in about that now. <laughs> Tonight, when you're making out your must-do list for tomorrow, why not include a reminder to get Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair? Honestly, men, you'll be delighted with the neat, natural way Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair, the way it relieves that annoying dryness and removes loose, ugly dandruff. Just try it and see if I'm not giving you a good steer. Make a note right now to call at your drug or toilet goods counter for Wild Root Cream Oil. Get the big economy bottle and the handy new tube that's easy to pack when you travel. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Uh, did you assert in the lowdown on the Wheel of Life? I certainly didn't. No, we won't know about that for six months. <laughs> because definitively, I mean definitely, that plastic cast has to stay on them. Doctor's orders, you know. Oh, but I won't be here six months from now. You can say that again. But I won't be here six months from now. Stop repeating yourself. But you just said you can say that again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just as distinctly as if I was sitting here. Uh-huh. That's what I like about you, Bernadine. A, a woman of distinction. That's what you are. Well, if you want to take me dancing, why don't you just say so? Oh, Bernadine. It's leap year, and I always say discrimination is the better part of value. You are absolutely corrupt. Well, I'm glad I'm right about something. Good night, Mr. Spade. Good night, and I'll say if it kills me, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd, with musical direction by Lud Gluskin. Gil Dowd directed tonight's broadcast in William Spear's absence. Join us again next Sunday for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hi, you baldy. Get Wild Root right away. If you're thinking of volunteering for the U.S. Army or Air Force, here's a word of reassurance. As an Army and Air Force man, you'll become a skilled professional in a specialized field. The training you get will always be useful, not only in military, but in civilian life as well. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
My name is Jeff Regan. I get ten a day and expenses from a detective bureau run by a guy named Lyon. Anthony J. Lyon. They call me the Lion's Eye. <laughs> Jack Webb is Jeff Regan Investigator. Stand by for hard-boiled action, mystery, and thrilling adventure in tonight's story of The Man in the Door. Well, this is the way it started. The lion called about four o'clock that afternoon said he wanted to see me down at the office. I argued a while, finally told him I'd be there. Melody was sitting in front of her typewriter when I came in, putting a new coat of paint on her nails. She handed me a blank contract with no dates filled in, jerked a thumb toward the lion's den. I went in. Regan, I'm glad you got here. What do you know about architects? They draw things. I know that much, but what about bids and all that stuff? Well, they figure out what a building's going to cost, don't they? Go on. If whoever's paying for the building likes what they write down, then they're hired. A couple of architects, maybe three or four, make bids. I suppose so. Low man gets the job. Why? Our client's an architect named Dudley Hayes, an office in the Park Central building. He thinks maybe the bank that's handling his bid might try to put something over on him. Banks don't do things like that. He thinks maybe a guy who works at the bank might be taking dough to shove his bid under the counter. Why didn't you say that in the first place? Because I'm saying it now. Haynes wants us to look into it. All right, who do I see? Haynes first. We only talked to him on the phone. I told him we'd have to have a contract and retainer before we did anything. That figures. So hop over there and find out what's what and make him sign that contract and get a check. Anything else? Make sure it's certified and call me if you run into any trouble. <laughs> Dudley Haynes, architect. Park Central building. Had an office on the ninth floor. When I went in, a girl with hair that figured to be blonde right down to the roots pulled off her glasses and put out her cigarette. And she kind of eased out of her chair behind that desk, moved toward me like a panther looking for a meal. Ma, you're tall, aren't you? Well, there's nothing I can do about that. Mr. Lyon said he was sending us one of his best men. He always says that. I think he meant it this time. He's an awful liar, lady. Dorothy. Dorothy Nolan. Fit. The name or the dress? Both. What's yours? Jeff Regan. Oh. Well, now we know each other. That's nice. I came to see Haynes. He wants me to look into something for him. I know. He's expecting me. I know. Well? I hope you have to look into a lot of things. For Haynes? No. This is his office, isn't it? Mm Mm-hmm. But he spends most of his time in 902 into the hall. Makes his blueprints up there. I'll take you. You are (laughs) too. Well, we started down the hall. We got about ten feet from the frosted glass door at the end. We both stopped. We were looking at the outline of a big man behind the door. Both of us expected him to open it and walk out. Oh, he came out all right, but he walked right through it. Oh, he's been shot. Oh. Do you know him? It's my boss, Mr. Hayes. No, it was your boss, lady. He's dead. Lieutenant Salvatore Wendetti, Central Homicide Detail, showed up about eight minutes after I called. He had his whole goon squad with him and a couple of guys in double-breasted suits from the district attorney's office. They roped off the entrance to the building, got hold of the elevator operators and the man who runs the cigar stand and asked them questions. Then when Daddy looked at what was left to Haynes okay, and started man, yelling okay, into okay, a okay. phone. Okay, Lieutenant Farris, get over, but don't move until my fingerprint boys get through. Yeah. Okay, sis, where the guy lives? Uh, at the Biltmore Hotel. Where's his wife? We didn't have one. What do we tell? We didn't have any family. So no one's going to cry. Well, that makes it easier. Regan, was he your client? No, nobody's a client until they sign a contract, Sally. But you would bring him a contract to sign, and then you would do something for him. What? Well, I didn't talk to him. Sis? Uh, 
Mr. Haynes had made an estimate on a little office building in Beverly Hills. He thought that a man named Adler at the bank might be taking money from someone to hold his bid out. So he wants an investigator to look into it. Why do you think that? Well, I don't know. You work for him? Well, I don't know everything. Neither do I. Hot, isn't it? Who's Adler? Oh, did I just name him? Mm. Who else? Who else? Architects. Who else was making a bid? Well, I don't know that. Now, where are we? Uh, Kelly! Yes? Guy named Adler at the, uh, Grand, uh, National, Grand National, National Bank. Pick him up and have him down to my office in half an hour. Yes? Uh, what do you want to do about reporters, Sally? Tell him to go jump in the lake. Yes. Oh, he spelled my name wrong. How long have you two known each other? An hour. Nice. What do you mean by that? Just nice. Didn't hear any shots? No, we didn't. Tell me more about the bid. Well, what's better tell? Well, shut up. Well, the bank handles the money. Who says yes? Who says no? Well, the bank, but... But uh, what? The contractor usually tells them who to take. Ha! Huh? Who's in... Who's that in this case? Uh, contractor in Long Beach. His name is George Cantrell. Hmm. I'll say this for you, Regan. When you get mixed up in anything, you certainly get mixed up with the good-looking people. I'm not mixed up in anything. What do you say, sis? <laughs> I'll keep my mouth shut. Uh-huh. She's a smart girl, Regan. Uh, hello, honey. Won't be home for dinner. Some guy got himself killed and I'm in on it. Not long, how? Hmm. Regan? Hmm. I'll tell him. Wife says hello. Says come out to dinner sometime. Whoop. Uh, sis? Uh, how much that contract worth? Oh, on the building in Beverly Hills, about, uh, $40,000. Profit? No, overall. Break it down. Well, Mr. Haynes would have said about $12,000 if he'd gotten it. I know some guys have killed for a dime. Uh, Sam, when daddy? I'm still at the Park Central building. Get out to Long Beach and talk to a contractor named George Control. And, uh, find out what architects were making business and stuff he was gonna put up in Beverly Hills. Yeah, get the name. Okay, that about does it. Let's go. Uh, Miss Nolan? What? I have to take you down. Jeff, can you do that? Uh, you're a material witness. Well, what are you? He's a bystander with a built-in lawyer. Well, I do, Jeff. Go with him. Why do you want to spend the night in jail? I just work for Mr. Haynes. Uh-uh, no phone calls. This is a murder case. Well, Get me a lawyer or something, Jeff. Do you know a lawyer? No. Wait. Yes, I do. His name's Dave Henderson. He lives at 1648 Claremont Place. Will you inform me tell him I'm in trouble? Yeah. Check, Sally. She didn't make a phone call. I like it, too. Well, look, he may not be able to do anything for you tonight. It's almost six. But you'll see him as soon as possible? Yeah. Tell him I'm scared, Jeff. I'm scared, Steve. <laughs> Well, I stayed there and phoned the lion, told him what had happened. Well, he got mad and yelled something about me being a jinx on all our clients, and then he hung up. So I went through the classified telephone directory under attorneys and Henderson. There was a Ben, a George, a Joe, a William, but no Dave Henderson. So I drove out to the address that she'd given me. It was a blue apartment house four blocks west of Vermont over by the Coliseum. Somebody was cooking hamburgers somewhere, and somebody was all worked up over a ball game on the radio. I picked the baseball fan. So what will happen now is anybody's guess, but let me tell you that this ball game is a long way from being up. A... Hey, what did I tell you? What did I tell you? It's outside the ballpark, and they're coming in like homing pigeons. Bases are loaded, and they're all coming in. Oh, it's going to be eight to five. Come on, come on. The ball game's not that good. What's so important, Pilgrim? I'm with the ball game. I'm looking for a man named Dave Henderson, a lawyer. So what? Uh, somebody told me he lives in this apartment house. Who told you that? A lady. Huh? Does he live here? You try looking at the mailbox? No name. You cop? Private type. Huh? Does he live here? Sure he lives here. Well, where? End of the hall, 106. Thanks. So he's a lawyer, is he? With his kind of friends? Huh? What does that mean? You're young, ain't you, Curly? I got a driver's license. Let me tell you something. Don't go knocking on no doors and hear a ball game. Remember that. Yeah, I'll remember that. And you can tell them Tasty Bogart is talking to that one. And the score is 8-5 to five coming into the first half of the ninth, and this has been some ball game. Let me tell you. No six. There we are. Come on in. It's unlocked. Your name Dave Henderson? Yeah, who wants to know? My name's Regan. I'm a private investigator with the International Detective Bureau. Wrong steer gum shoe. I don't need one. Look, I'm not looking for work. I'm looking for you. What'd you say it was? A Regan? That's right. R-E-G-A-N. Regan. Regan. Learned that just an hour ago. Cute, huh? I met a friend of yours today. Dave Henderson never had a friend. She said she was a friend of yours. But I didn't say it was a friend of hers. Hey, who are we talking about anyway? Dorothy Nolan. How is Dorothy? Not so good. Thought you were a detective. I am. You sound like a doctor. Look, you sound like a guy with a chip on his shoulder. You sound like a lot of things. You're trying to be tough for you. 
No wonder you aren't in the telephone directory. I'll just skip that. She said you were a lawyer. They say I drink too much. You haven't seen me drinking, have you? She wants you to get in touch with her. The man she was working for was murdered today. She kill him? Well, they're holding her. Material witness or a suspect? Material witness right now. She doesn't want to spend the night in jail. Who does? That's why she isn't feeling so good. <laughs> she wants me to get her up. Something like that. Who's handling the case downtown? A detective named Wendetti. And where do you come in? Well, he didn't give her that one phone call. Yeah. You're sensitive. What if I said no? Well, that's your business. You know why she asked you to see me? Because I'm a guy she knows. And every guy who knows little Dorothy does a little something for her. Ever met him like that, Ruby? Sometimes. I'm just checking. Checking what? She's pretty good with the works. Eyes just right for the job. Hair just right. Everything just right. She can make you do a lot of things you don't want to do. Wait till you see her in a bathing suit. Ooh, that's something, brother. Well, they aren't wearing them in the county jail. <laughs> okay, I'll find, phone with Daddy and find out what her bond is. Look, this is a murder case. There's no bond on this. You know that. Oh, well, depends how you handle it. I'll think of something. Yeah, I'll bet you will. We don't like each other much, do we? Nope. That's the way it goes. Listen, she said to tell you she was scared. Well, some of us are scared part of the time. And somebody gets shot. And everybody gets scared. You scared? Nope. Iron Man Rick. Have a good time. Did I say Haynes was shot? No. You didn't say a thing. See you somewhere, people. Well, I stopped by Muso Frank's and had the special, and then I went on home. I tried to make a couple of calls, but when Daddy was out and the desk sergeant thought I was a reporter and he wouldn't tell me a thing about Dorothy Nolan. While I was sitting there, the phone began jumping around on the hook. Regan? Yeah? This is me. Where you been? I called your place 20 times, but I've called it once. Well, I've been busy seeing a lawyer. What do you need a lawyer for? You aren't married. Somebody else needs one. Who? Dorothy Nolan, that blonde who worked up in Haynes' office when Daddy's holding her. Good. I want you to go down and see her. What for? We can still make something on this thing if we play it smart. When I talked to Haynes on the phone this afternoon, I told him I wanted a certified check. So what? So that means there's a check for a hundred bucks lying around his office somewhere. And it's made out to international. Look, he's dead, remember? Everybody dies. Don't worry about it. We weren't even hired. We had a verbal contract. We had nothing. That check's no good to anybody but us. We didn't do anything for him. Well, buy him some flowers. Now hop down to the pokey and see that dame and find out where that check is. We can't do that. I talked to Harry Presidio and he'll give us a lead to get in. Hello? Hello? Regan, you're still there. I was still there, Hello? but I wasn't listening to the lion. I was looking at a skinny little man with one leg. Hey, Regan, you're still there. Now don't ask me how he made it inside my door. He was just there. Propped up on a pair of crutches, swaying back and forth, watching me with a couple of sick gray eyes that were so full of water you'd think they were going to float right out of his head. All at once, he went down like a busted sugar sack. He'd been shot twice through the neck with a small caliber gun, a 25, 32, I don't know. I, I found a dozen razor blades in one pocket and two dozen sets of shoelaces to go with him. There wasn't anything that told me his name, but there was a picture inside his shirt pocket. One of those things that you have taken in a penny arcade, you know, in front of phony pasteboard props. Well, a man with one leg was looking out from between a pair of painted angel's wings. And the guy standing next to him, who was smiling up at the halo, was the same man that I'd seen that afternoon. An architect named Haynes. A man who needed the private detective. A man who walked out a glass door and then dropped dead. And the one printed word above that picture stuck out like a wart on an egg that said, Happy Land. <laughs> Tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, Investigator. Here is a special and important message to every businessman listening. To every businessman, regardless of the size or the type of his business. 
Gentlemen, do you realize that the schools of this community help you every day that you're in business? That's right. For one thing, our schools teach the boys and girls of this community to cherish the human right, the free enterprise on which our country and your business are founded. With each new generation graduated from our schools, the Army defending our way of life and your business grows stronger. What's more, good teachers and well-equipped schools do a better job of developing our children's talent. The result? School graduates have become more skilled and more efficient employees. So remember, any time and taxes that you contribute to improving local schools are an investment in your own business future. Education is good business. Education can maintain our freedom. And freedom is everybody's job. And now, back to the story of the man in the door and Jeff Regan, investigator. Well, I left the little man with the one leg lying there. Wasn't much I could do for him. I wanted to wait before I called homicide. I took the picture I found in his pocket and I drove to Happy Land. It turned out to be an open-air penny arcade on 5th and Main. Smelled like all the hot dogs in the world had been made right there. There were machines all over the place telling you how strong you were, how rich you'd be, and who you'd marry. (laughs) All for a penny. I guess it wasn't much of a bargain. The only customer was a sailor trying his luck at the shooting gallery. Back in the corner, a tired-looking girl in light blue slacks and a dirty gray sweater was sitting on a stool by the hot dog counter staring at nothing. Want some pennies? Not right now, no. Oh, just looking? Go ahead. You figure out where you're going to spend your money, come back, and I'll give you some change. You got a picture gallery here? Oh. Don't tell me you're a real big spender and want to have your picture taken. Maybe. You got one? Yeah, we got one. Where is it? In there. If you really want to get your picture taken, I'll climb off this stool and take you back. I want to tell you now, if you're just trying to be sociable, you can go and fly a kite. You run the picture concession? I run the picture place and the hot dog place, and I sweep out in the morning. Oh, I wish I had better brains than to marry that slob and get myself stuck in a cheap dump like this. All right. Do you remember taking this picture? How would I know I take a lot of pictures? Well, come on, look at it. Oh, I know right. Yeah, I took it. That what sold you? When? How do you think I am? I can't remember what night it is every time a pair of drunks comes in and wants their pictures taken together. Well, try to remember, will you? <laughs> You're a real wise guy, mister. You don't want no picture. You just want some talk. You're a cop. Friend. I met the little guy in the picture once. Dusty. What was that? I thought you said you met him once. Well, we weren't introduced. I just met him. Who is he? Dusty Rhodes. He works the circuit. What circuit? Fifth and Main STEM. Business section. What kind of business? Dusty handled the razor blade and shoelace traffic. He hates pencils. What did he do when he wasn't working? What does anybody do? You went out and got loaded. Go on. And you don't know him very well for a friend. How am I going to know I'm not getting dusty in trouble talking to you like this? Nobody can get him in trouble anymore, lady. What do you mean? He was shot tonight. Oh, no. Oh, poor little guy. Do you know where he lived? Seashore Hotel. The Seashore Hotel. Oh, gee, Miss Ensick. Oh, I'm real sorry. Brother, the Seashore caters to many types of people, good and bad, just out of the pokey. Two bits a night for transients, one fifty a week for solid citizens. And sign and register. It's a law. I'm not looking for a room. Then you're wasting my time, brother. My beer's getting warm. Look, I'm a private investigator. My name's Regan. I liked you before you said them two words, brother, but you have soured me. 
private investigator means private eye, and it all means cop. And you are not welcome. Now, blow. I'm trying to find out something about a man named Dusty Rhodes. We do not ask questions, and we do not give answers. Now, blow. I was told he lived here. You find me tongueless, brother. Now, blow. Did you know him? During the last five years, I have acquired 85 pounds and a very bad heart. All right, have you in the alley right now. Oh, yeah, sure you do. Here. <clears throat> Abraham Lincoln was a very fine man, and he took a very fine picture. I seem to have found my tongue, brother. Will it be? The key to his room for a starter, huh? Uh, disallowable and punishable by fine and imprisonment. Into the hall, turn the Ben Fest to the right. Thanks. Well, I don't know what I expected to find there, outside of more razor blades and more shoelaces, with a little room full of dirty white curtains and a wire bed that sagged in the middle. I was standing there watching a neon sign advertise beer a block down the street when I thought I heard somebody behind me. Whoever it was had been drinking bad whiskey, but he was still pretty good. It landed a quarter of an inch above my right ear, and I piled up in a lamp, a chair, and a pitcher full of water. Five berries get you a look, brother, but doesn't get you a room. Besides, it's already taken, and the bed's over there. Now, come on. <coughs> oh. Hey, you didn't go to sleep, brother. You was knocked to sleep. Oh. I apologize. Why the games? Who came in after me? You're the only one. You sure? My name's Sam Preacher. Brother, I'm very sure. Well, maybe he was waiting for me, huh? I don't generally ask him, but the question is this. Why? Oh, I don't know. Unless... What's the matter? Something missing? Just a picture. You can get lots of pictures. You didn't see anybody? That makes the third time, brother, and the answer's still negative. Okay, okay. Then let's blow, buddy, huh? <laughs> Luke, this is Regan. The lion's eye. What's with you, baby? When Daddy tells me you walked into one today. Yeah, I did. You got him there? Haynes Dudley? Sure. Want to come down and take a look? He's toe tagged and salted down real pretty. Yeah, I'll bet. Them 32 slugs was just incidental. The guy had four weeks at the outside. All right, give it to me. Haynes Dudley was dying from malnutrition, alcoholism, and a couple other things with long names. Give me one long name. Diabetes. He didn't take good care of himself, funny, huh? A misspent life. <laughs> Somebody's gonna take the gas chamber for nothing. <laughs> when Daddy know this? Sure, sure. And he was wearing a brand new suit, too. We'll sew up the holes, we'll bury him in it. Well, you aren't finished yet, Luke. Baby! A guy with one leg dropped dead in my place a couple hours ago. It's after 11. I'm sorry, Luke. They connected? Yeah. Murder? Yeah. Twenty-four hours a day. Well, at the homicide office, they told me she'd been released about ten o'clock. They said a lawyer named Henderson had put up the bail and handled the whole thing. They gave me an address on her when I went out there. It was a bungalow court on Normandy, and it took her a long time to answer the door. Oh, you. Yeah, tell me how tall I am. Oh, I'd love to, but not right now. They told me you'd been out since 10 o'clock. Maybe I should have come sooner. <laughs> Dale gives me the willies. I'm about to take a shower. I was kind of hoping we could have a drink. I did better than I thought with you. I got a hold of a lawyer for you, didn't I? Yes. Well, doesn't that rate me an invitation to have a drink? I said later, I'm really tired. I, uh, I said no. Wait a minute. <laughs> well, if you're that thirsty, all right. That's better. Isn't every day my boss gets killed and I need a private detective? I need a drink. I was slugged tonight. Slugged? Yeah, right here, see. Oh, it looks nasty. Why did anyone do that to you? Wanted a picture I had. Whistler's mother? Just a picture of a couple of drunks who are dead now. Maybe whoever did it was a relative. Guess again. I don't like games. But you play them all the time. But we all, I know a psychiatrist says we can't help ourselves. You can. I liked you when you walked into the office this afternoon, but I'm not so sure I like you now. Maybe you better go. Expecting somebody, huh? What are you doing? You let go of me. Let go. 
Oh, oh no, baby. You've got real nice eyes. I want to look at him. Let go. He's crazy. Hello, Dave. We didn't hear you knock. Did you bring your piano? What's the idea? He gave me... Why don't you tell him to go away, baby? Anybody can tell we're busy. Let it go, Regan. You want to break us up? Can't you see he's just trying to make you jealous and say things? Come here, honey. No! You don't have to do that. I said let her go. Is that the same 32 you killed a one-legged man with? Over, gum sure. Don't be a fool. Stay right where you are, baby. You're first. Listen to me, Dave. I listen to you too long. He's only guessing he doesn't have any proof of anything. You can cry if you want to, baby. This is going to hurt. <laughs> She spun around and fell into a coffee table and then lay very quiet on the rug. Her eyes were open and she didn't say anything. She just lay there looking up at him. I couldn't tell where she'd been hit. He seemed to forget all about me because he walked over to her, knelt down beside her, put the gun right up against her head. This is awful close range, baby, but I can't afford to miss. (laughs) Neither could I. Well, when Daddy and I stuck our heads together and it all came out when we looked into a couple of things. You see, Dave Henderson was Dudley Haynes. And he was wanted for attempted murder and embezzling and one thing or another back in Ohio. So he figured it'd be a good idea to bump himself off. Dorothy helped him with the idea. They both went down on Main Street and they picked up an old bum, dressed him up in a new suit and shot him. I was supposed to walk in with Dorothy, and she'd identify the body, and as far as anybody knew, Dudley Haynes would be dead. Dave didn't figure that she'd be taken down. She didn't figure that she'd get scared, and neither of them figured the man with one leg was a pal of the man that they'd shot. Well, it seems that they'd looked through a lot of files, and they'd figured that a lot of murders go unsolved. Maybe they do. I don't know. Well, anyway... He sat down on that little bench up there in San Quentin last week. The one with that bucket of acid in the room. Oh, he held his breath as long as he could, but everybody has to breathe. He's buried up there with a lot of other guys that figured they could get away with murder. Dorothy? Ah, she wasn't hurt too bad. They had her in a wheelchair for the trial. She got 15 years as an accomplice. Some kind of a deal. State's evidence and all that. I don't think I'll wait for her. She wasn't that good. Jack Webb is featured as Jeff Regan with Wilms Herbert as Anthony J. Lyon. It's CBS at 9.30 next week for more hard-boiled action and mystery with Jeff Regan, Investigator. Written by E. Jack Newman and produced by Sterling Tracy. Dorothy Nolan was played by Betty Lou Gerson, and David Ellis was Dave Henderson. Lorene Tuttle, William Conrad, and Lou Krugman supported. It's perfectly natural and wholesome for some men who want to leave great wealth behind. There's a druggist in a small town in Pennsylvania who'll do that. The wealth he'll leave behind will make many lives easier and happier and finer down through the years. For he was the principal donor of an outdoor meeting place for religious services in a Boy Scout camp in the Poconos. Working with his neighbors and community activities, he saw the need of this improvement, helped to install it. That's the kind of wealth that you can bequeath to generations coming on as you enjoy the freedom of working with your neighbors for the betterment of your community. Freedom that can be anybody's pleasure is everybody's job. Music for this program is arranged by Dick Arant. Next week at 9.30, Jeff Regan, investigator, brings you another thrill-packed half hour with his story of the house by the sea. Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Pat Novak. For hire. Sure, I'm Pat Novak. 
for hire. That's what the sign out in front of my place says. Pat Novak for hire. It's the easy way because down here on the waterfront in San Francisco, you can't afford to wait your turn. If you're going to make a living down here, you got to do everything you can. And you got to be out of the hen house by sunup. Even then, it doesn't work out always because you get trouble tax free. It's like leukemia. There's nothing you can do about it. There's no way to duck it. You might as well try to start a conga line in the cathedral. I found that out Monday night when I met an old friend. It was the night before elections, and I was sitting in the office scratching married women out of an old date book when Sam Tolliver showed up. I hadn't seen him for years, but it was a nice, easy meeting. What other way is there when you're good friends? You look just the same, Patsy. Yeah. It's good to see you, Sam. Sit down. Sure. Doing well, I guess, huh? Oh, you get different stories. Where have you been? Oh, all the hard luck stops. Syracuse for a while and Joliet. That's where I come from now. Yeah? That's where they got a big prison. Uh-huh. When you came too far, Sam, you should have stopped in Oakland. Huh? That's right. If you're out here to play small robber, you better think it over. It's a tough town. Don't ride me, Patsy. I'm not, Sam. But once you start losing them, it's hard to win again. I just thought you might want to know about San Francisco. Thanks. Thanks, but you don't have to worry, Patsy. I got a smart streak. Uh, I'm here mostly to ask a favor. Yeah? Can you spare me one for old time's sake? Medium-sized. Go ahead. I want to borrow one of your boats. Did you come all the way from Joliet to borrow a boat, Sam? If it's going to hurt that much, forget it. I just asked. All right. When do you need it? Tonight? It's to pick up a package in the bay about 9 o'clock. Sure, I'll run you out. No, it's uh, it's a little different, Patsy. I can't make the trip. You'd have to do it for me. The favor's getting bigger, Sam. You'd have to pick up the package and bring it back here. I'll I'll be waiting at 10 o'clock. I guess you won't buy, huh, Patsy? I'm not impressed. It'd mean a lot to me, Patsy. It really would. And you couldn't get hurt, honest. Nobody gets hurt, honest. It's the other way I'm worried about. Well, I wish I could tell you, Patsy, but I can't. You know how it is. Sometimes you can't, but... Well, it's that way now, but... You'd be doing me a real favor and you wouldn't get hurt. That's what Henry used to tell his wives. All right, Sam. But you put out a bad story. Well... Patsy, you have to go by the China Star. She's out in the stream. Just tell them you came for that package. They won't ask. Just tell them you want the package. Yeah. Talk to the captain. I'll be waiting here at your place about 10 o'clock. And, Patsy, it's important. Don't let anybody else have it. All right. I'll see you here at 10. Thanks, Patsy. It's a big favor. We're old friends. Yeah. We're old friends. Nothing wrong with them, huh? No, there's nothing wrong with old friends, Sam, except sometimes they wear out on you. When Sam Tolliver walked out of there, I began to worry. I don't know why, because he was always a good guy. But if you leave good silk out in the rain, it'll shrink. Well, it was too late to change my mind now. I was going to get that package and say goodbye to Sam Tolliver. Only things didn't work out that way. You start with trouble and it never stops. It's like offering to buy aspirin for a two-headed boy. About 8.30, I took a boat and I started out into the bay. Halfway out into the stream, I had to give way to a tanker. After she throbbed by, I picked up the China Star, tied up at buoy 327. It was a broken-down old barge, so old I expected to find Noah hiding out in the bilges. Well, I went aboard, and they took me into the captain's cabin. It was going to be tougher than Sam thought. The old man had some questions, and he was about as smooth as a bag of fingernails. Right away, I got the idea. What do you want? I came out for a package. Who are you? What good will a name do you? 
Who are you? What do you care, mister? This isn't our dance. Just give me the package and I'll leave. Keep shouting, tough boy, and when you're all through, tell me your name. Now, look, I'm not out here to haunt your boat. You got the right face for it. I'm just passing through. <laughs> if you're running a small boat, you got papers. Let's see them. Yeah. You're too handy in your own cabin. Let's see. Novak, huh? You a Polak, Novak? Yeah, and it feels fine. How's it being a pig these days? Don't get jumpy. I just asked. Who sent you here, Novak? I'll forget you asked. Just keep the package. I'm going home. You walk home on the bottom, then. Now, look, Novak. Somebody steered you wrong. Maybe it was no questions once, but it's not that way anymore. Just want to keep the book straight. Who sent you? Sam Tolliver. You need a pencil? No, that's enough questions. You see, Novak, all you had to do was answer. You can have the package now and talk some more. I'll take it now. Where is it? On the desk behind you there. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome, Novak. The captain didn't like company. When he hit me, I dropped down to the floor like a piece of hard-working lint. The last thing I remember was Sam Tolliver sending me out to this boat. I knew then I had no more business here than second trumpet in a string quartet. I could hear voices and people moving around, but it didn't help much. You can get that kind of service in a tomb. Somewhere along the line, they moved me. Because when I woke up, I was lying in a cloud of platine on a couch in a different cabin. A class of people had improved. She was bending over me with a cold towel and a warm look. And from where I was, she had a figure like a shot of brandy on a winter night. When she said hello, you knew that all you had to do was send up a flare and relax. Good evening. Welcome back. Yeah. How do you feel? A little used up. I need recharging. Here, put your head on my lap. There. That's it. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Forget the towel. I'll struggle along this way. By the way, whose lap is it? I'm Ellen Morrow. Where's your friend? The captain? I guess so. The brave guy, Axel Arm. He's down getting your boat ready. What's he doing? Punching holes in the bottom? He'll be back in a minute. The package will be ready and you can leave. No, you keep the package. The last time I got a headache. I'm sorry about that. It was a mistake. That's what they told Marie Antoinette. By that time, her head was 40 feet down the street. What's in that package? It wouldn't help if you knew. You let me work that out, huh? Work out the answer, then. How about Sam Tolliver? Slow down, Betsy. I'm not going that fast. You're going the wrong way. I'll help you lick your wounds, darling, but I'm not going to get talky. What do you got to lose? What have I got to gain except your gratitude? I can get that any night with a couple of drinks. How is he, Ellen? How does he look? Too comfortable. On your feet, Novak. <laughs> yeah. You ought to rent that out, sweetheart. I'd sign a lease myself. I'll finish this sweet talk, Novak. You get on your way. Here's the package. No, I changed my mind about the package. You keep it. Your boat's ready. Unless you want to get tossed in like a mackerel, take the package and beat it. What's in it, and where does Sam Tolliver fit? You asked once already with your head in her lap. You want me to sit down? Well, you got brains after all. Yeah. Sorry, I thought they were all in your fists. <laughs> yeah, you're still smart. Take this package. Show him the boat, Ellen. I'm going to remember you, mister. Ellen's going to lead you by the hand through the dark. Stop beefing and settle for the simple pleasures. I will. I'll remember you. Concentrate on Ellen. You'll get a better memory. I went out on deck with a girl. And as I got to the starboard side, I noticed her hair for the first time. The way you're liable to suddenly notice a flower after a hard rain. Her hair was red, and as the orange lights of the bridge reflected against it, it seemed like a prairie fire away down in the valley, flaring up quick and then burning low again. The rest of her would have made a good prairie fire, too. It was the only good thing I could think of on the way across the bay. The water was as quiet as a drowsy caterpillar, and I had a chance to think. Why had they changed their mind about giving me that package, and how wet were Sam Tolliver's feet? Well, it must have been about 11.30 when I pulled into the pier and started on the run for my office. 
The lights were on, and I burst right in because I had a lot to ask Sam. But it wasn't Sam. What's your hurry, mister? I came here to meet a friend. That's the guy laying in the corner. You don't have to hurry. No, this isn't my friend. He doesn't look like one. I'm Sergeant Grimes from Homicide. If you're Novak, you're in trouble. Why? A guy lying under your desk, dripping like a broken ink. Well, and you trot out a question like that? Well, it's a bum caper somewhere. I was supposed to wait for a guy named Sam Tolliver. It might as well have been a streetcar. I'm not going to press you, Novak. I don't care. I'm just going to take you downtown. Well, this boy quit too late. I've been in the bay the last two hours. You can check. I went out there to pick up a package. The one you got in your arm? Yeah. It's for a guy named Sam Tolliver. Let's see. Okay. It doesn't say that. It says Mr. John Reedy, 720 Post Street. Hmm? I wonder what that means. Let's find out. We'll take it by Reedy's place. I got it for Sam Tolliver. You can buy him another. We're going by Reedy's before we get downtown. What's the matter with you? Do you want it on an 18-foot screen? I didn't kill the guy. I don't even know him. I don't even know this John Reedy. Wait a minute, Novak. I believe you. I believe every word you're saying. Except this is one time you'd be better off lying. <laughs> When we left my office, I felt as if somebody had walked through my stomach on stilts. Oh, there were loose ends bobbing up everywhere, and you couldn't get to any of them. It was like chasing a spider with a bowling ball. With all this new stuff, I forgot about the ship. Who's going to worry about blood poisoning if he's busy having hemorrhages? I began to wonder more about Sam. Where was he? And how was I going to palm off that dead stand-in? Grimes didn't seem worried. We got into his Nash and headed for 720 Post Street. It was an apartment hotel, and Reedy lived up on the third floor. On the way in, Grimes picked up a key at the desk, and we rode up in the elevator with one of those shifty-eyed little guys who'd sell his mother if he didn't have to fatten her up. When we got to Reedy's door, Grimes took over. Open up! Maybe he can't hear you, Grimes. Nobody home. Let's go in. Why? We don't know him well enough to sneak in. I rate a hunch, Novak. Okay. The light's on your side. Leave it out. Let's look around. Okay. The stray bodies belong to you, Grimes. You go look in that set of bedrooms. I'll check over here in the library. Give me a yell if you see any. All right. Novak! Novak! Two of them. I got one by the desk. The other started down the fire escape. I'm going down in front. Take this gun and stand by the fire escape. He may get trapped and start up, so keep your eyes open. I walked into the library. The window was open and the curtains were blowing over the dead man's face. It was a good thing, because you can't split the difference with a service 45. I took him by the heels and dragged him away from the window. His eyes were rolled back as if he expected somebody to tap him on the shoulder and tell him it was all a mistake. His face was contorted and frightened, maybe a little embarrassed, like a deer caught in a traffic jam. Well, I stayed at the window about ten minutes and watched the fire escape. There was no action there, and Grimes wasn't back, so I started for the door. I had company right away. Hello, Novak. You move? Oh, Hellman. It's a big gun you got. Well, ask Junior here on the floor. He thinks it's even bigger. I'll check myself. Sure, and it's going to be easy because it's right in the family. Yeah? Yeah. Belongs to one of your boys down in Homicide. Go ahead. A sergeant by the name of Grimes steamed in here and knocked down Junior, and then he beat it down to get the other guy. Uh, I don't believe it. Well, talk to him. That's why I don't believe it. There's nobody on the force named Grimes. On this one, you're all alone, Novak. There's got to be a Grimes. The guy had on a uniform. I don't care if he had on a play suit, Novak. The guy's a phony. Not from homicide, he's a killer. <laughs> That's what I meant, Hellman. I knew Hellman was right. If Grimes was on the level, he'd have booked me instead of coming up here. He came up to Reedy's with murder in mind. Even if they believed the story about Grimes, I was still on a spot. That made me accessory to murder. And I was going to look worse when Hellman found the guy down in my office. On that one, I had star billing. Oh, everywhere I turned, things were worse. I knew it was going to take a low-budget miracle to bail me out. It was like trying to give nose drops to a herd of elephants. Hellman seemed to like the idea. Hellman rolled the guy, and there was no identification. But he never works for nothing. Uh, 
A few bucks in the guy, I'll put it in the safe. The only safe you got has suspenders on it. I don't like that, Novak. Oh, you'd do anything for a buck, Hellman. If you got the right bid, you'd sell the tomb of the unknown soldier. <laughs> Thanks, Hellman. I'm getting a big list tonight. I can do all of that I want, Novak, because you're in the corner pocket now. I get a tip off from the Chronicle to come up here and I find you holding last rites. You got a bigger headache, Hellman. There's another stiff down at my place. Huh? That's right, Grimes again. He was sitting there when I walked in. Where were you? Out in the bay, picking up a package. It's right there on the desk. What's in it? I don't know. It was for a friend of mine named Sam Tolliver. He's disappeared and Grimes brought the package up here. Uh, I'll take it downtown. You better tag by the China Star. That's where I picked up the package. It's out in the bay, so you'll need a boat. Even a guy with your complex needs a boat. I'll touch all the bases, Novak. You just stay ten cents away from headquarters. You can pay your own way into the can. Yeah, well, that's what'll happen if I wait for you. I'll be standing out in the downpour. That's right, Novak. If there's a chance I want to see you get first prize. Yeah, well, I'm going to be stuck unless I shop around myself because you got locked jaw of the brain, Hellman. Yeah? That wouldn't hurt you so much, but if it spreads, you're going to be in trouble. That's what I'm waiting for. <laughs> Well, if something didn't happen soon, I was going to be about as embarrassed as a hostess with leaky plumbing. I was counting on Hellman to shake down the skipper of the China Star. If that didn't work, I could close shop. I didn't have any leads. There wasn't anything I could do but sit on my hands. It was like taking your niece to a nightclub. I had to stumble around until something showed. So I looked up the only honest guy I know. An ex-doctor and a boozer by the name of Jocko Madigan. Oh, he was all right until he found out sometimes you can feel as bad the next morning without a hangover. I toured the town and finally found him at Lupo's trying to put the vineyards out of business. Ah, Patsy, you're just in time to start the day off right. Mama Lupo, some wine for Mr. Novak. You can only have a quart. We're running low. Look, it's almost midnight, Jocko. I got to talk to you. We're not going to turn into pumpkins. You need some wine. No, I don't. Patsy, when you die, the artwork is going to be simple. On your grave, they'll chisel a picture of a pair of slacks, a hamburger, and a double malt. All right, Jocko. The final symbols of a decayed civilization, because that's as close as you ever got to civilization. A remote connection at best. Like a bookie, they love horses, but they die on a stock farm. It's the same with you and civilization. You all through, Jocko? I won't fight against your sober babble. What's the matter? There's a dead guy down in my office. A uh, friend of ours? No. Oh, that's too bad. We'll miss the wake. I'm going to get half hung by homicide. The other half is dead up in a Post Street apartment. Hellman thinks I'm the boy. Patsy, I wish you wouldn't hang around me when you've just killed somebody. You tarnish my declining years. I went out to the bay to pick up a package. When I got back to my place, instead of a friend named Sam Tolliver, there was a dead guy there and a phony cop called Grimes. How do you make the distinction? He grabbed the package and we took it up to Post Street. After a quick hassle in the dark, I'm standing over a dead guy in John Reedy's apartment. John Reedy? Yeah. Do you know him? Most people do. He's running for office tomorrow. Is he the dead man? No, I don't think so. What about Reedy? He's running for a board job. Yeah? Would anybody have a reason to work a plant on him? Maybe. What's he like? Oh, a sort of liberal by marriage. Hmm? A reactionary with a rich wife. Supposed to be a good man. How about the opposition? Oh, a lot of them are running. One is Simpson. He couldn't beat an asthmatic turtle across a tennis court. Well, we're getting somewhere, at least. If Reedy's good, the gambling dough would frame him to lose. Yes, if politicians can ever lose. A murder in his apartment would look too phony, though. Yeah, but maybe that package wouldn't. Jocko, you got to help me. I want you to check on the registration of the China Star and then nose around to find out what you can about tomorrow's election, will you? If we lived in a monarchy, this wouldn't happen. That fast double play has got something to do with this election. Now, hurry up, Jocko, and when you're through, tag by my place. I'll call you there. Have you a bottle in the house? There's a tap in the kitchen. That'll have to do. No, thanks. Outside of a child in pain, the most pathetic sound in the world is running water. Good night, lover. <laughs> I left Jocko and ducked into a phone booth. When I called Hellman, he poured out news like a rotary press. They broke open that package down at headquarters. It was full of dope. Plain garden variety. The kind a man uses to forget either his wife or secretary. I was sure then the package was a plant on Reedy. Hellman didn't see it that way. He said the two dead men were Gunsel's. Last address before San Francisco State Prison at Joliet. I needled him about that phony cop Grimes... Hellman said they just got a tip-off by telephone. Grimes was an ex-sergeant in homicide whose real name was Vic Rothery. I asked him who phoned in the tip-off, and Hellman said he didn't know the guy. His name was Sam Tolliver. 
I got out of the Chronicle morgue and looked up everything I could on John Reedy. All politicians' children sit on the floor. There was a picture of Reedy there with his family grouped around him on the floor. I pulled the clips on Vic Rothery. It was Grimes, all right. Well, that gave me something to work on, so I went on the prowl for Ellen Morrow. I found her running a dice game in a little after-hours joint on Eddy Street. You want chips, Novak? You don't want to play against yourself? Yeah, give me some. All right. See how good you are. Okay. Eight's your point. Yeah. You seen Sam Tolliver? Make your point, Patsy. That's it. Where's Sam Tolliver? Five. You're not even warm. You're not warm on Sam, either. He left me hanging with a murder rap. Your friend double-crossed you. He double-crossed you, too. Another five. You're in a rut, Patsy. He turned in Grimes. That's right, baby. They know he's Vic Rothery now. You still like Sam Tolliver? No. Keep rolling, darling. Is Grimes your boyfriend? He used to be. I'm sentimental. Where's Sam Tolliver? The Herrick Hotel. When you see him, tell him I sent you. I will if we talk that long. There, we go. there it is. Hey, come on, Eight. That's right. I guess I lose, Patsy. I guess you do. Be seeing you, baby. She changed when I left. The first time out, she was alive and breezy like the main coast in July. But now she was broken up and lonely looking. And as I walked out, I thought of an old Dixie cup somebody had used up and thrown in the alley. Well, I got down to the Herrick Hotel, but Sam Tolliver wasn't there. Maybe it was better that way. I left a note for him, a short note that even a Mongolian idiot couldn't trip up on. If Sam was going to show his hand, he had to do it soon. When I got back to my apartment, Jocko was already there. He was giving a concert for the mice. Oh, she pushed a baby carriage, she pushed a baby carriage in the merry, merry month of May. All right, Jocko. She pushed a baby carriage, she pushed a baby carriage, she pushed it for a Williams man who's far, far away. Oh, stop it, will you? Patsy, I wish you'd get rid of that radio and buy a good harpsichord. What'd you find out, Jocko? Nothing from the China Star. She weighed anchor and went to sea at a quarter to twelve. How about Reedy? Well, there's heavy gambling money against him. And there's talk about a last-minute scandal. All the newspapers had tip-offs. Where was he tonight? At a rally in the Mission District with his whole family. Well, that'd leave time for a plant. They broke open that package. It was full of dope. Oh, that makes sense. He was once under treatment for malaria. The drugs found in his apartment would make it look bad. Yeah, I'll get it. Hello, Novak talking. I hope so, because you got a lot to do. What's on your mind, Hellman? A girl named Ellen Morrow. Who killed her? Did they? About 20 minutes ago. Vic Rothery's picture was all over the place. Yeah, they were chums. You better pick up Sam Tolliver. He's at the Herrick Hotel. I'd rather have Vic Rothery. Haven't you picked him up yet? No, we're on our way out. Well, you better hurry, Hellman. There won't be any voters left. I thought Sam Tolliver was a friend of yours. Well, that's the trouble with close friends. You give them the shirt off your back so they can see where to put in the knife. <laughs> After Hellman's call, I knew we were coming up for the last hand. I met him, and we rode down to Vic Rothery's hotel. It was early morning. Just about the time dawn is too sleepy to get out of bed. In the pale light, Geary Street looked like a shabby old lady with a snootful, and Rothery's hotel was worse. Hellman flashed a badge on the night clerk, who reached over and handed us a key. It was a funny thing to notice then but the guy's hands were short and his fingers were peeled and stained yellow as if they'd been dipped in weak acid. Well, we rode up to Rothery's room. As we got out of the elevator and turned the corner, somebody ducked into Rothery's room. That was enough for Hellman. He started down the hall. Open up in there! Well, you got another customer, Hellman. Open up! Come on in. You're going to wake everybody up. Hello, Sam. Come on in. Don't mind the gun. It's loaded. You're a handy cop, Hellman. That's it. I'll close the door. All right, over near the window. Yeah. Go on. Sure. You got an answer for Rothery here? You too, copper. Over near the window. I ask you. You got an answer for Rothery here? You're looking at it, mister. You know, Patsy, I'm sorry you came. I could bounce a few off of this guy with no pain at all, but it's going to hurt on you. 
Don't kid me, Sam. I don't know why you came, Patsy. You could have left me alone. I didn't mean to put you in for this. Things went wrong and you were in, that's all. But I didn't mean to do it, Patsy. Give the man your gun. You were a good guy to me, Novak. I'm sorry you drew the deuce. I'm really sorry because... Well, you were a good guy to me. Well, I'm not anymore, Sam. You got five feet to make up your mind. I got it made up, Patsy. Now stay back. Let me try it out on him first. You've had practice. Stay back, Patsy. I'm in a hole and I'll burn my way out. You know that. Patsy, I'm in a hole. I gotta get out. Don't kid me, Sam. I was your last friend. All you got now is the road. Stay back, Patsy, please. Patsy, stay back. Oh, that gun, Sam. Uh, I must have prayed wrong, Novak. Yeah. Sorry, Sam. I'm a tough loser. Yeah. You were right, Patsy. It's a bum down for a small robber. For a while, you looked big. Not for long, though. No. You're a small-time bum, Sam, and you're better off dead. I, I wouldn't argue. I'm sorry, though. I doubt it. I guess that's right. I... I didn't try very hard. How's your friend, Novak? Let's go. A friendship's over. Hellman finally pieced it all together. He got that skipper back and put him under the lights. The story was damp, but it fit together. They were all in on a deal to railroad John Reedy. Vic Rothery headed up a bunch to plant the dope in his apartment. But Sam Tolliver got anxious and decided to get the stuff for sale. He talked a couple of buddies into it and sent me out to the ship to pick it up. The captain smelled a switch and knocked me out long enough to get word to Rothery on the beach. Rothery got the guy in my office and the other guy that Sam posted in Reedy's place in case anything went wrong. That left only Sam on the other team. Rothery wore the uniform because it was an easy way to plant the stuff in Reedy's apartment. But the timetable went haywire and he got tripped up by that tip-off call to the Chronicle. That's about the way it was. Well, Hellman asked only one question. How come Sam Tolliver headed for the girl's place and then Rothery's? I don't know. Except maybe that note I left Sam. How'd I know he'd believe a lie? Oh, it worked out for everybody except John Reedy. He lost the election anyway. Jocko forgot to mention the guy was a Republican. Novak for Hire was previously released by ABC, the American Broadcasting Company, for listeners in the United States, and rebroadcast for our men and women overseas. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education.
as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Diamond Detective Agency, a corpse to fit every pocketbook. Rick? Oh, hello, Helen, baby. Uh, let me sit down. Oh. Rick, what's the matter? <sighs> you sounded like your arches just broke. You got the right idea, baby. Oh, but your geography is cockeyed. Are you really hurt, Rick? Oh, believe it or not, I was trampled by a herd of horses. Oh, Rick, you idiot. Now, tell me what did happen. Okay, one horse. He ruined me for life. You went horseback riding? Oh, I don't believe it. Yeah, I want to see my bull legs. You actually did. Uh-oh. Took a girl to get you to ride a horse. But it was some slinky blonde. No, baby, it was a Palomino. And look, let's get off horses. I- I've had enough to last me. What's with the early call? Early? Rick, did you just get in? It's after 11. I was dreaming of you, baby. You wouldn't have wanted me to stop just to get into the office. It's probably a whole harem. Uh, Helen, you got to stop that peeking. You read the morning papers? They come out in the morning. Now, you stop that. Did you read them? Well, didn't have a bet down. Why? You on the society page again? Oh, much more exciting than that. The police commissioner's house was robbed of $50,000 worth of diamonds last night, and his gardener was murdered. What? I thought that would fetch you. Better get a paper. The commissioner's statement's written in blood. Yeah. And if things don't wind up fast, tomorrow's statement will be in Walt Levinson's blood. It'll be his case. Now, you stay out of it, Rick. This thief cuts throats. Ah, uh, yeah, I'm scared. Are you, Rick? Well, I'll come over tonight and I'll frighten you at close range. Say eight. I'll practice my knee knocking so I'll be in good form. And stay in. No nightclubs. At the sound of the castanets, Francis can open the door. It'll be me and my knees. See you tonight, baby. Bye. This is this the Diamond Detective Agency? Just like it says on the door. Come in and close it gently. My Japanese beetle's still asleep. Asleep? He's got a better union. Sit down, Mr... Uh, Burton, Phineas Burton. Uh, what can I do for you, Mr. Burton? Well, I want to hire you if it's agreeable. Well, for a hundred a day in expenses, I'm pretty agreeable. Well, that's fine. I have a package I want you to deliver to a party in Philadelphia. Mm, you can get a messenger for five bucks, or if you're hard up, a carrier pigeon for a handful of popcorn. Why a detective? Well, I'm perfectly capable of judging for myself what I need, Mr. Diamond. Now, here's $300. There will be 200 more for you after you make safe delivery of the package. Why? Why? Three-letter word meaning why you want to pay me for five days when the trip to Philly and back can be done in a few hours. Well, Mr. Diamond, I simply want you to drop everything else and take this job immediately. And that is my reason for the added payment. Oh, all right. I'll take your money. Just as soon as you tell me what's in the package, who it goes to, and why it's so important that I take it personally. Uh, well, I, I can't tell you that. Okay, it's your problem. Now, where did I leave my soap chips? Do you have to know? Of course. How can I do any washing without soap? I mean about this package. Oh, no, no. I can recommend another agency who will do it for 25 bucks and no questions. Oh, very well. Uh, Mr. Elliott will meet you at the Philadelphia Station Information Desk at 2 o'clock today. I will wire him your description and he will make the contact. As for the package, it contains some very valuable papers, which Mr. Elliott is afraid his wife will try to intercept. I see. Uh, He commissioned me to find the best man I could to bring the package to him. Oh, you must have read my ad. You'll have to leave immediately. Mr. Elliott is very anxious to get the package. Uh, You call me at the Astor when you return and I'll send over the rest of the money. Uh, Good day. It may be at that. What? Forget it. Burton left the package on my desk with the money. He was a thin guy, had a funny pot that made him look as if he'd swallowed a basketball. He pushed it out the door and waddled after it. When a guy insists on throwing money in my lap, I get suspicious. And when I remembered the robbery of the night before, I got that lousy feeling again. Now, paragraph 4, section B, rule A of the detective's code of ethics says, quote... Upon receiving money to deliver package, detective must never open the same. It is unethical. Yeah, who's ethical? Well, surprise. No wonder basketball had been nervous. At the bottom of the box were five pretty little diamonds. About ten grand worth, I guess. Of course, it may have been that Burton thought diamonds should belong to diamond, but my bet was on a frame-up. A frame that cost the real heisters ten grand out of fifty. But was aimed to get him a nice picture to fit the frame. Me. Yeah? Is this Mr. Diamond? Oh, hello, Burton. Something on your mind? Oh, I happened to be in the store across the street and I noticed you hadn't left yet. 
Uh, you will leave right away, won't you? Just as soon as I arrange things, Phineas. Well, remember, it takes an hour and a half to get to Philadelphia. I, I don't want you to be late. I'll bet you don't. Well, it was just to make sure uh, you understand. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I understand. You can dribble your basketball home now. I beg your pardon. Skip it. Bye. <laughs> Burden's call ended nearly all doubts. I was being framed all right, and the trap required my leaving for Penn Station right away. I dropped the diamonds into what was left of a quart of milk I had for lunch the day before, put the bottle on the floor by the wastebasket. Then I took the package, rewrapped it, and went out to hail a cab. I made one stop at a toy shop, then headed for Penn Station. As I entered, I saw a pair of familiar figures. Rick. Okay, what's the gag? I got the tip, but even you wouldn't joke about this case. Now, Walt, I might joke about mass murder, but never about the commissioner being robbed. Is he making speeches yet? Yeah, that's okay, Shamus. This is one time when you're one diamond too many. Why, Otis, you're becoming a wit. Eh, why not? You're halfway there. Oh, Lieutenant, he's picking on me again. You deserve it, Otis. Now, shut up. Rick, I know the tip was phony, but the commissioner was there when it came in. I had to act on it. Tip? Well, don't be smug. I've got one, too. Fifth at Hialeah. Now, don't start that. It was a tip that you were taking the commissioner's diamonds out of town. Oh, now, Walt. And don't, oh, now, Walt me. I said I knew the tip was phony, but with the commissioner taking scouts all down the line, I didn't No, 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 no. Don't apologize, Walt. I know. Come on, Sergeant. Show me a good frisk, and I'll recommend you to all my criminal friends. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, he's clean, Lieutenant. Now, Rick, let's see that package, and then you can go. This? Oh, no, no, I can't. It's secret. Don't play games, Rick, please. Oh, all right, but it's going to spoil my surprise. Well, okay. Give me your word it's got nothing to do with this case, and I won't bother to open it. No, 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 I'm hurt. I absolutely insist that you open the package right now. But, Rick, you know I trust Lieutenant you. Lieutenant Levinson, do your duty. My purity must not be suspicioned. Oh, anything to get this over with. You were, uh, hmm... What? It's only a pair of dolls. Uh, you'll be expecting maybe my gallstones? Oh, dolls. <laughs> the Shamus place with dolls. <laughs> Better read the tag, Gordis, before your ears get any longer and they draft you for a mule team. Tag? Sure. But what? The, to my beloved Otis from his Ricky. Oh. Rick. Now, don't be a grouch, Walt. The other one's for you. For me? Oh, no. I'm sorry, Walt. I couldn't resist it. Anyhow, you spoiled my surprise to Otis. It was our anniversary. What? Our anniversary? We ain't even related. Oh, you don't remember? Oh, Otis. Well, Tennant, can I go back to traffic? I can't stand much more. Oh, shut up, Otis. Rick, if we weren't such good friends, I'd... I'd... Oh, hey, now you're upset. Upset? Why should I be upset? Just because two hoods lift 50 grand in ice from the commissioner? Or because it's dumped in my lap with the murder of the gardener? Or that I'm given 24 hours to break the case and then get a tip that leads me to a friend who decides to play games and wreck my side to be on repair? Now, why should I be upset? Otis! Uh, here you are, Lieutenant. But take it easy. That's a second bottle of bike cob today. Walt, you read an apology and I make it. I'll do better than that. I'll help you if you'll let me. Well, I can sure use your help, Rick. I haven't got a single lead. You want to look at the corpse first? May as well. Has he got a record? No. And the commissioner swears he was honest. Probably stumbled onto the thieves and they had to put him away. How about the rest of the servants? They were all out. The commissioner and his wife were at a party. They'd given the entire staff the night off. But I guess perhaps the gardener returned a little early. Yeah. Well, let's go out and take a look at him. I've got a personal interest that makes me want to crack this case. Uh, client? Call him an ex-client. I'll explain him later. Come on. <laughs> Rick. Ah, nasty cut. How was it made? Well, it could have been a sharp knife, but it's a safer bet that it was a razor. Mm. Remind me not to go to his barber. What safe cracker's got enough nerve to pull his job off? Well, I got three guys that could fit the job, but not one of them has ever been known to carry a weapon of any sort, much less a razor. Correction. One dealer, that gardener, is playing a lousy joke on us. I suppose this could have been the first time one of them carried a razor. I don't buy that, neither do you. Give me the names. I want to talk to them. Maybe I can get a lead of some sort. Sure. Here they are. And please, Rick, call me if you get anything. If I can find a nickel. Bye. (laughs) 
As far as I could see, I had three things to match up. One, the careless barber. Two, the safe cracker with nerve enough to rob the police commissioner. And three, the reason why I was picked as the pigeon. I gave up the idea of hunting for Burton, the guy who came into my office. He was probably a flunky and not worth running down. So I checked the names I got from Walt, grabbed a cab, and headed for the Bronx. The first turned out to be an ex-con trying to go straight by working in a Bronx hash house. The second was likely, but he'd kissed his wife with a beer bottle and spent last night in jail. At the third address, down in Greenwich Village, I met a landlady with gin-loaded tonsils and a cute mustache. She tipped me that my third prospect, Vincent Mayer, might be playing pinochle at Pietro's, which turned out to be a cafe with a 30-foot bar, three tables, and a back room. Hey, uh, barkeep. Yeah? What'd it be, Freddy? Milk. No chaser. Milk? Who makes it? Oh, you mean like from cows. Never carried the stuff. Where can I find Vince Mayer? Why don't you ask me, handsome? Well, hello, baby. Now, do I look like a baby? Uh, no. My name's Jean. What do they call you? Take your pick. Call me Rick. Hey, you talk funny. But you're awful nice. Too nice to be hunting for Vince Mayer. He's a bad boy, Rick. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to be a hero. Where is he? In the back room. There. The guy with the light hair. But be careful. Thanks, baby. I'll buy you a palace. I figure me for a 80 mojo, 20 clubs, 20 spades, and 40 pinochle. What? No diamonds? Hey. Uh, well, well, well. Look who's here. What do you want, Shamus? Vince the Iceman, isn't it? Well, now, let's see. Sing Sing, class of 38. Where's your school tie, Vince? The name is Mr. Mayor to you, Diamond, and privates are not welcome here. It's a closed game. Yeah, Move on. Give me a reason. You want to play dead? Oh, come on, Vance. You're not going to get upset just because I think you robbed the commissioner? You did, didn't you? I told my story to the cops. I'll bet. But you didn't answer my question. And here's another. Who's your barber? You're asking for it, Diamond. I was brought up right. Now, let's get off this cat and mouse kick. I want some answers, Vince. Do you? That's right, Junior. I do. All right. Call him, Joe. Hey, what? what? Oh. Oh. All right, Joe. Stop it. Stop it. That's enough, Joe. All right, now drag him out in the alley. Uh, Vince, uh, can I, uh... Yeah, yeah, okay. Maybe it'll teach him not to get so nosy. But keep that razor in your pocket. I will, honest. This is gonna be real fun. Come on, Shamus. Here's where I do some road work on your liver. (laughs) Here, Mr. Diamond. I only wish my brother could see you. When I came to, I was curled up around a round metal object I couldn't see, and I felt as if I was smothered in a mountain of cotton. And getting out of it was like trying to shovel sand with a pitchfork. I finally managed to move and wished I hadn't, for a company of Bengal lancers began target practice on my side. So I quit trying and lay still for a long moment. Then a voice came fizzing through the cotton at me. Hey, hey, mister, are you alive? Not if I'm not, you're an angel, and this is a harp. Well, I'm sure no angel. And that's the garbage can. So I guess you're not dead. Matter for debate, Jeannie. Oh, help me up, will you? Sure. Here. <sighs> hey, can you stand? Practically anything after this. Ooh. Hey, you hurt pretty bad. Come on, lean on me. My place isn't far. I'll take you there so you can lie down. Best offer I've had today. Lead on, Angel. There. Now, how do you feel? Uh, I never use language like that in front of a lady. Oh, I'm no lady. I'm a waitress at Pietro's. I heard the noise in the back room. When you didn't come out, I took a look. Ooh. Gee, does your head hurt, baby? Like all my relatives who are inside digging for gold. With luck, I can open my eyes and they won't fall out. You know, we might have had a lot of fun together if you weren't all banged up like this. I'll take that remark up with you later, honey. I'm not usually the kind of guy who runs out on pretty girls, but I only wanted to get my hands on the gun if who tried to kick my brains out. So I took Jean's number, filed it under, uh, uh, for later investigation, and stumbled out into the street. My head was clearing, but it was as slow about it as a dummy doing a strip tease. 
Maybe that's why I didn't notice when I came out of the house that I had two guys for company. Hello, Diamond. Huh? Huh? When Pietro told me Jane had run out, I thought I might find you here. She always goes for guys like you. Well, she has taste. But I'm glad you came around. I have a few things I want to discuss with you and Joe here. Uh, hold it, Chalmers. Or I'll show you how easy it is to get rid of your troubles. Now, now, that's a pretty little gun. Aren't you stepping out of character, Vince? You're supposed to be a smart one. You're getting on my nerves. Yeah? Well, put the gun away and I'll quiet you down a little. You want me to mess him up again, Vince? And what's with you? Come to do your job over again? I may at that. Yeah? Well, you got 32 teeth, Sonny. Want to try for none? Why, you... I got some questions I'd still like to have answered. Why was I picked as pigeon? Why me? You're getting a little too smart, Diamond. Now, listen. I know you got wise to Burton, so it figures that you still got the package. Now, I got no reasons to give you $10,000 worth of diamonds. I want them back. Oh, dandy. I've got big news for you, Buster. You're not going to get them. Don't make any mistakes, Diamond. I'll use this gun if I have to. Ah, go eat a tombstone, Joe. Yeah, how's your stomach ache? Wait a minute, Joe. Now, Diamond, look, you can have a choice. You bring the rocks to me at Pietro's in an hour and we'll forget the whole thing. Or don't. And I'll send Joe with a few friends to call on you. And for the last time... For a few sick minutes, I leaned against the wall, wondering if I wanted to live. One thing I was certain of was that Vince Mayer was never going to get those diamonds back. Or was he? An idea began to percolate in my head to the tune of an old rhyme about a goose and a gander. And I got inspired enough to sit up and forget my aching ribs. When it simmered into a full-scale boil, I grabbed a cab, went back to my office, and got the diamonds out of the milk bottle where I'd hidden them. Then I headed for the village fast. I was soon banging on a door there like a drummer playing Bob. Oh, I owe you money. Hold your horses. Well, if it ain't my cripple. I got the bruises to prove it. Come on in. Are you really recovered? What? Oh, no, not that much, Angel. Then? I need some answers. What do you know about Vince and Joe? Not too much. Enough to dislike him plenty. That Vince got me canned for leaving Pietro's to take care of you. That's why I'm back home. I know he's a smoothie, and he, I think he's a big-time jewel thief. Now that much I know. How about Joe, the dog-faced boy? Ah, uh, him, he's just a punk. I, I think his real name is Fanchi or, uh, Fanchetti. Franchetti or some such thing. Franchetti? Yeah. I don't know why, but they call him Joe the Barber. Oh, Joe the Barber. Yeah. Isn't that silly? Hmm. If he cuts hair, he doesn't. But I'll lay eight to one. This guy works on throats. Thanks, Angel. You've tied up my three points. What are you talking about? Your friend Vince Mayer lifted 50 grand in ice from the police commissioner last night, and his accomplice, Joe, gave the gardener a shave. You, you mean murder? On the button. The gardener's throat was sliced from life to death. And now, baby, look. How would you like to earn $100? Sure. Is it legal? Well, uh, no. I'll take it. <laughs> Now, where is he? Will you tell me where's Rick? I know where I'd like him to be. I'm worried, Otis. Seriously. Rick is in this thing up to his ears. You mean he was in on that job? Don't be stupid, Otis. Of course not. Rick's no crook. But he's mixed up in this case somewhere, and I'm worried. He should have called me by now. Gee. Hope he hasn't tangled with that razor guy. I thought you hated Rick. Oh, you know I was just talking. I know, I know. What a mess. Rick in danger and I can't find him. The commissioner's spouting lava all over the city hall. Why the devil did it have to be the commissioner's house? You know, it's kind of funny at that. The commissioner himself. <laughs> you knucklehead. For two cents, I'd... Maybe that's him. Lieutenant Levinson, homicide. Come on, Rick. Rick, I was... Where the devil have you been? I'm taking care of some arrangements. Arrangements? Never mind, just listen. I was picked as a pigeon and some of those diamonds were planted on me this morning. What? I've traced your hoods. Vince Mayer and Joe the Barber Franchetti. Now, you come to Pietro's in half an hour, and you'll catch him with a pile of the diamonds on him. Rick, what is this? Well, Vince had it figured as a double barrel gag, Walt. First on the cops by raiding the commissioner's house. Second, by dumping a few of the rocks in my lap and tipping the police so I'd take the rap. But why you, Rick? Well, Joe's name, Franchetti. You remember, I sent his brother Tony to Sing Sing a few years back. Oh. I knew he had a brother, but until now, Joe stayed out of Manhattan. I get it. Okay, what's the play? Well, I'm. I'm going to take the package back to Vince. Give it to him in Pietro's. A 
The girlfriend will be raising so much fuss and no one will notice me. Then as Vince and Joe leave, you nail him with the diamonds. And no alibi for having him. Right. You said uh, half an hour? In front of Pietro's. Take a peek, Angel. Through the window. There's my party at the back table. Now, you know what to do. Yeah. I keep yelling until you get back to me. Right? As rain. I'll make it a good one. I got good lungs. Let's go in. Okay, over to the bar. Lock Rick. There he is now, Joe. I told you he'd show up. Hello, Diamond. You got something for me? That's right, Vince. Okay, let's have it. Hey, what's going on over there? Stop, stupid dame. Yeah, do you want the package or not? Oh, yeah, give it to me. Come on, Joe. Let's scram out of here before that dame brings her cops. Yeah. That's an easy way of getting back the ten grand, ain't it, Vince? Shut up. Come on. Take it easy now. Okay, okay. Yeah, we're okay now. Let's split up. Hold it, Vince. What? Let's have a look at the package. The uh, cops! Levinson, what are you doing? The here? package, Vince. Hey, what are we going to do? Shut up. You, uh, got a warrant, of course. Of course. Otis, take the package. Yeah, Lieutenant. <laughs> you can't arrest me. I don't even know what's in that package. It was given to me by a friend. Now, don't use the term so loosely, Vince. Why, Walt, what are you doing here? Hello, Rick. I've captured a criminal. No. Yes, and he was carrying a package of his loot. Why, I bet it's part of that diamond robbery. Hey, what is all this? Diamond, you just planted that package on me. Me? Why, stranger, you're telling a fib. You just know that's downright immoral to something. Uh, this is ridiculous. Lieutenant, he gave me those diamonds and Pietro's not five minutes ago. I didn't lift them from the commissioner. Didn't you, Vince? Why, then I must have made a mistake. You can prove your story, of course. Sure I can. Bartender saw Diamond slipping the package. Oh, now, Vince, you think that bartender was going to be watching you when a lovely girl is practically tearing up the joint? Boss, the Dame Yellen. She was a plant. Yeah, but this is a frame-up. Diamond, you can't get away with this. Please, don't talk to me. I never associate with common criminals. A frame? You dirty double-crossing copper. Look out, Rick. He's got a razor. Mm. Oh, my arm. Now, don't cry, Joe. This is for you. Oh. Ooh. Wow. What a punch you got, Shamus. Well, that does it. Come on, Vince. Otis, load that killer into the car and pick up that razor. Yellow to... Want a lift, Rick? Yeah, no thanks, Walt. I'm going to go home freshen up. Yeah, you look like you could use it. Hmm. I left Walt and headed for my apartment where I grabbed a stomach full of vitamins and planted myself under the hot shower. It felt so good I fell asleep. And if Walt hadn't phoned, I'd have probably become the only man in history to drown in the shower. Walt shocked me wide awake with the news that he was holding a thousand dollar reward for me. I gave him my nicest thank you and made a mental note to drop by and give half of it to Jean to make up for her losing her job. Around about eight o'clock, after I'd taken care of dividing the reward, I steered for 975 Park Avenue, made it with no trouble, and rang the bell to Helen's apartment. Oh, good evening, Mr. Diamond. Miss Asher's expecting you, sir. She's in the library. Thank you, Francis. Uh, how's your health? Oh, my, my health, sir. It's very good, thank you. Well, now, this may come as a shock. But, uh, Francis, uh, about the money I owe you... Oh, don't fret about it, sir. It will test... I'm going to pay you what I owe you. You're going to... Oh, dear. Oh, perhaps I better sit down. Oh, my word. Now, oh, there, there, Francis. Rick, darling, is that you? It ain't Tom Swift, baby. Come on in the library. Well, okay. But it'll do you no good, my dove. I'm a cripple, a battle-torn veteran. Well, I don't want your muscles, Rick. I'm blue, and I want you to sing to me. Oh, Helen, baby, I don't want to sing. I want Rick, to... I'm blue. I need cheering up, not be nice and sing. Well, okay, honey. How's this, huh? I can see No matter how near you'll be You'll never belong to me But I can dream Can I? Can I? 
yet I pretend that I'm locked in the bed of your embrace. For dreams are just like wine, and I am drunk with mine. I'm aware my heart is a sad affair. There's much disillusion there. Feeling blue, baby? Oh, Ricky, come here. Uh, here I am. Oh, now I'm contented. You in my arms, my bills paid off, and and my bills. Oh, for Pete's sake, I forgot Francis. Francis? What are you talking uh, about? C- come with me, I'll show you. Now, there he is. Francis, Francis, you all right? Oh, oh yes, sir. I think so, sir. Rick, will you tell me what's going on in my own home? Well, honey, I paid Francis off, and the shock of having to give back my gun and badge undid him. Oh, well, are you feeling better, Fred? Uh, not very much, Miss Asher. It's that badge and license. Will you miss him that much, Francis? Uh, well, sir, to be very honest, there's a waitress in a tea shop down the street with whom I've been, uh, if you'll pardon the expression, having a fling. Francis, uh, you? Oh, that's not the worst, Miss Asher. I'm afraid I've been a bit of a fraud with her as well. In fact, with several of the waitresses there... Now, wait, wait. Uh, Where does my badge and license enter into it? Did you hock them for crumpets? Oh, much worse, Mr. Diamond. You see, to all the waitresses of Miss Tuppingham's tea shop... I am Richard Diamond, oh. private detective. Oh, oh no. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Gene Tatum, William Conrad, Tal Avery, and Bob Carroll. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Tonight's story was written by Herb Purdom and edited and directed by Blake Edwards. See the Richard Diamond picture story in the December issue of Movie Stars Parade. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Listen tonight to NBC for a star lineup of entertainment. Every Saturday on NBC, you can hear such stellar programs as Hollywood Star Theater, Ralph Edwards' Truth or Consequences, Your Hit Parade, A Day in the Life of Dennis Day, The Judy Canova Show, Grand Old Opry, and Songs by Morton Downey. There's always a program of interest on NBC, so keep tuned here. Shortcut to Death with Fred McMurray is next on NBC. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Providence, Rhode Island calling. Mr. Dollar? Yes. One moment, please. Go ahead. Hello? Hello, Mr. Dollar? Yes? This is Dick Porter. I'd like to hire you. Porter? Uh, Dick Porter. I'm an insurance broker here. Bert Masterson at United Adjustment Bureau suggested I contact you. Oh, what's the trouble, Mr. Porter? <laughs> uh, darned if I know exactly. I just have a client who's taking out all the insurance he can get. I may be wrong, but it looks to me like he's getting ready to die. Oh, Can you help me out? I can try, Mr. Porter. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, 
Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Richard Porter, 480 Webster Boulevard, Providence, Rhode Island. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Shepherd matter. Expense account item one, $15. Airfare and incidentals, Hartford to Providence. I arrived at 2.30 in the afternoon and was in my hotel room by 3.15. At 5 o'clock, I was having a quiet drink with Porter, who turned out to be a 24-year man in the insurance brokerage business and seemed to know what he was about. I've never had anything like this happen to me, and I didn't quite know what to do about it. I'm glad I can get some expert advice from you. Well, I don't know how expert the advice will be, but I'll do what I can for you, Mr. Porter. Uh, Want another one of these? No, I'm fine for now, thank you. I'll try to explain this matter as far as I know. Two days ago, Dr. Shepard called me up and inquired about rates on straight life insurance. Mm -hmm. He's carried about $20,000 worth of policies, so ten years or better. Um, I have the figures in my office. Mm Mm-hmm. I gave him the prices for coverage, and he said he'd take $80,000, which would bring him up to an even 100000 Now, Shepard's a single man. The beneficiary on his other policies is his mother, Claire Shepard. She lives over in Pawtucket. He's only dependent. He wants to name her beneficiary again. I see. Now, where do matters stand with Dr. Shepard right now? I told him it'd take a few days to draw the policies up. He sent me a check for the first payment and told me to do what had to be done. I don't want to act on his application until I know it's okay. Yeah, sure. Well, uh, what can you tell me about Dr. Shepard? Very little. He seems to have a good practice here in town and does his share of charity work and so on. As far as I know, he's above question. Would have to be, of course, to practice medicine here. He has an apartment above his offices, owns the building, all of his equipment. You know anything about his friends? No. Now, let me understand this about Dr. Shepard. He called you. You didn't call him. He wanted to buy the insurance. Uh, You didn't try to sell it. That's about it, yes. And that's why I'm worried. Give me a hundred people and I'll show you 99 out of that hundred who will never, never call up an insurance broker and say, I want to buy some life insurance. People have to be sold life insurance. They'll go out and shop around for fire, theft coverage, automobile insurance, health, almost any kind. But straight life insurance, that has to be sold. On the other hand, suppose Shepard is that one in a hundred. Yeah, yeah, it may be a perfectly legitimate situation. Yeah, Shepard may have looked into his mirror one night and said to himself, i got to have $100,000 worth of insurance or I won't sleep a wink. Oh, yeah, it could have happened that way, Mr. Porter. But uh, I have to think of those 99 people in that 100. Sure. Sure, so do I. Well, here's to caution. Cheers. Expense account item two, $25. Deposit on a rented car which I use the following day, driving from place to place, collecting data on Dr. Charles Shepard, M.D. At his bank, I was able to learn that he enjoyed what might be called a lucrative practice, and that, like most people, he spent slightly more than he made. He belonged to a golf club where he was seldom seen. He belonged to a tennis club, which he managed to make three or four times a week. Questioning the pharmacist who had the prescription counter a half block from Dr. Shepard's building and the manager of a cafeteria across the street from same... I was unable to learn who Dr. Shepard's steady companions were or gain any information that would justify his puzzling application for life insurance. Hello? Good morning. Oh, good morning. I'd like to see Dr. Shepard, please. Oh, do you have an appointment? No, I don't. Well, may I have your name, please? Johnny Dollar. 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 Are you a regular patient of Dr. Shepard's, Mr. Dollar? No, no, I'm not. I didn't think I recalled your name. I've been with Dr. Shepard almost five years. Uh, Who recommended Dr. Shepard? No one. Well, Mr. Dollar, I'm afraid doctor's out now and won't be back until late this afternoon. Well, now, that's funny. I was standing out in front of here three minutes ago, and I thought I saw Dr. Shepard walk in. Please, Mr. Dollar, he is not in to anyone. What's your name? Why... I mistreat her. Mistreat her. Well, yes, but I'd I... I'd like to see Dr. Shepard mistreat her. Here. Oh. Insurance investigator? Yes. Will you tell the doctor that? Please? I... Yes, I... I'm sorry. I had to tell your doctor was out. 
He asked me to say that to everyone who came in. I'm afraid the doctor's been acting strangely all day. I'm very much concerned over him. I excuse me. The tall, pale brunette girl in the crisply starched uniform was certainly concerned about something. She bit her lip, forced on a wan, unprofessional smile, and looked like she wanted to cry just before she disappeared beyond the reception room to seek out Dr. Shepard. I pretended not to notice that part. One minute passed, two minutes, three minutes. No one reappeared. So I pushed the door open and I looked down the corridor leading to the examination rooms and laboratory. I had to notice Dr. Charles Shepard standing at the end of the corridor. Most of his costume was medically correct. White coat, stethoscope in one hand. But on the other hand, he brandished a thirty-two automatic. And the safety was off. Stay where you are, mister, and get your hands up. What pocket do you keep your credentials in? Left inside. I'll get him. Insurance investigator. For whom? At the moment, for Mr. Porter. Dick? Yeah. Well, here, I... I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar. I... I guess I'm very nervous these days. Oh, uh, well... Mr. Dollar, I'd like to get your address and phone number before uh, you... That's all right, Corinne. Uh, don't you think this might be a good time to go out and get a bite? Well, it's a little early, Doctor. I have some lab tests. Go ahead, Corinne, like a good girl, and uh, lock up, huh? Yes. Goodbye, Mr. Dollar. Ah, uh, yeah, goodbye. Very fine girl, Corinne. She's been with me... Five so years, she told me. Oh. <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to explain meeting you in the hallway with this in my hand. Uh, yes. Well, uh, before you try, suppose you snap the safety on. Oh, yes. Uh, I, I look somewhat foolish, I guess... You want to come in my office? Sure. You say Mr. Porter sent Mr. You... Porter told me you made an application for $80,000 worth of life insurance. We, uh, we look into things like that, Doctor. Investigate me because I want to buy life insurance? Yeah, yeah. You're a single man with few responsibilities? Well, I don't know whether to be irritated or not. Am I, am I going to get my insurance? I wouldn't be irritated, Doctor. Put yourself in the insurance company's position. They're just not used to this kind of application. Oh, you, you may get it. I don't know. But obviously you're in some kind of trouble, gun and all. Well, I... You know, the whole thing is a ridiculous mess. Mr. Dollar, my life has been threatened by a man who has definite homicidal tendencies. I suppose I've been acting very strangely lately. I, I don't know whether to leave town or give up my practice. All you have to do is pick up that telephone and call the police and tell them about it. A threat in your life comes under police business, Doctor. I know that, and I would go to the police, only... Well, it's a very delicate matter. I have a patient's welfare to think of. You can't very well treat any patient if you're dead. I suppose you sit down and tell me all about it. All right. Several months ago, I treated a woman named Forbes. A thorough examination and consultation disclosed that her poor physical condition was not based on any organic disorder, but rather upon her own emotional instability. Not an uncommon diagnosis this hectic day and age... You've heard of things like this, Mr. Dollar? Oh, I've heard of semantics and neurotics and psychotics, but I'm not a doctor. Well, let me tell you the psychotherapeutic side of medicine is by far the most challenging and one in which I've had considerable experience. Consequently, I undertook to treat Mrs. Forbes, hoping to effect a cure. Are you a psychiatrist, doctor? No, I am not. Don't misunderstand me, Mr. Dollar. In the process of treating Mrs. Forbes' physical ailments, I urged her to recount a variety of experiences... Talk to her from day to day, probing all the while for the source of her trouble. It has been my intention from the first to place her in the hands of a competent neurologist. I suspected her trouble early in the treatment. She's married to an erratic, ruthless, ill-tempered man, Paul Forbes. Oh. I made a grave error when Mrs. Forbes pressed me last week to... Well, I could only tell her to move out and divorce him immediately. That's pretty extreme advice, Doctor. I know, but I also know the advice was right. Oh, you aren't in sympathy with me, I can see, but let me tell you that any competent psychiatrist would have advised you the same. I approached her husband on the matter a few days ago. What? I explained to him that Mrs. Forbes' health, her very life, is in jeopardy, that more is involved here than just keeping intact a union which has nothing but 
legality is a binding force. And Mr. Forbes doesn't care for semantics. He doesn't care for Mrs. Forbes, Mr. Dollar. He ranted and raved and accused me of trying to break up his home, and finally he attacked me. I managed to get away. Did he threaten you then? Yes, he said he'd kill me. Who else was there? What do you mean? Who heard him say these things? Why, Mrs. Forbes was there and a servant in their home. Yes, a servant. Upton's his name, I believe. You should have called the police. I should have done a lot of things differently in my lifetime, but I didn't call the police. My primary concern is for Mrs. Forbes. Further shock and guilt complex could be totally disastrous to her. So are you going to creep around here with a gun in your hand? I don't know whether I'd even know how to use it. I... 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 Now, why the application for all the insurance? Well, I, I wondered if Forbes might get me. I wanted to be sure my mother was taken care of. I... I don't know whether anyone's ever threatened your life, and you knew for certain he'd try to carry out the threat, but that is the position I am in. Well, what are you going to do? I don't know. I'll think of something. But what about my insurance? That's up to Mr. Porter. If what you say is true, I wouldn't insure you. What do you mean, if it's true? Of course it's true. Doctor, I don't believe it. I left him standing there in the corridor, staring after me. A lonely man. Somehow not as frightened a man as he tried to let me believe. I wondered about that. I was still wondering about it when I went to sleep that night. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow... The Shepherd matter becomes a matter even the police can't handle. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Vic Porter, Mr. Dollar. Hi. Did you check on Dr. Shepard? Yeah. Uh, do I write up his policies? Well, that's up to you, Mr. Porter. Dr. Shepard's life has been threatened. What? That's according to him. And the man who threatened his life has definite homicidal tendencies, also according to Dr. Shepard. Well, I... I... Well, what do you think? Porter, I think Dr. Shepard's a liar. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Richard Porter, 480 Webster Boulevard, Providence, Rhode Island. 
The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Shepherd matter. More expenses. Item three, 26 cents. One bottle of aspirin for Mr. Porter. I felt he was going to need it. I hope you aren't trying to be funny, Mr. Darwin. I'm not, Mr. Porter. I think you've got a tough decision to make. I, uh, I know that the commission on $80,000 worth of insurance would be high. Uh, uh, sit down. Oh, thanks. Uh, Mr. Porter, Dr. Shepard told me he bought or tried to buy all that insurance because he thought a man named Forbes was going to kill him. He bought it, he said, to make certain his mother is well provided for. He was carrying a thirty-two Colt. Mm. Now, he spoke of treating Forbes' wife and of advising her that divorce would settle her health problem. Mr. Forbes didn't like that and accused Shepard of trying to wreck his home, and, well, that's about it. Now, what have we got? <laughs> well, your Dr. Shepard is either nuts or an idiot or the cleverest man alive. I don't know. I do know I believed about one half of what he told me. Maybe less. Well, what reason would he have to lie? Beats me. If someone threatened your life or mine, we'd turn to the police for help. Now, Shepard won't do that. Insists that it would probably be hazardous in the case of his patient, Mrs. Forbes. Well, I don't want to write up this policy if what he says is true. But I, I don't want to pass up the commission if it isn't true. Can you stick around town for another day or two and find out about it? I'll do what I can, Mr. Porter. Go ahead. Have an aspirin. He had an aspirin and I had a car ride. Once again, out to the offices of Dr. Shepard. The same things were more or less going on in the same way. His nurse, Miss Streeter, appeared as distraught as ever when she recognized me. There was a quick dabbing at the eyes, a straightening of the hair before she spoke. I'm... Good morning, Mr. Dollar. Hello. I'd like to see the doctor again. He was calling Mr. Porter's office trying to locate you. I'll buzz him. Mr. Dollar, do you have anything to do with why doctor's been carrying a gun? No. That's his business. In other words, I should mind my business. Well, I'm being honest. I've advised him what to do on the matter. What matter? He'll have to explain that to you, Miss Streeter. It doesn't make much sense to me. You can go back now. Okay, thanks. Hello, Mr. Dollar. Hello, Doctor. You were pretty insulting yesterday. I'm sorry about that, but we both have a problem to solve. And I get paid sometimes for deliberately insulting people. <laughs> You're a stranger. Do you want to change your story about all this? I wish I could change it. It's still a mess, a bad mess. I thought it all out last night, and I still must hold to my original thinking. I have to place my concern for my patient, Mrs. Forbes, before anything else. In other words, you won't call the police and tell them your life's been threatened. No, and you're very stubborn about that part. I don't think you comprehend the situation at all. Look, wait a minute. Let's understand each other, Doctor. If this man Forbes is all you say he is, and you say you're the expert on homicidal tendencies... Then the best thing for you to do is to prefer charges against him for threatening your life and have him locked up. Now, you could do that, according to what you've told me about Mrs. Forbes and a servant in their home witnessing his threats. I will try to explain again. I can't do that for Mrs. Forbes' sake. I just can't. She's been through a shattering ordeal. I must attempt to resolve this quietly. Now, true, I can generally anticipate a man's actions inside my office under clinical conditions, but I... Well, Forbes is different. That's why I tried to contact you today. Someone like you could approach Forbes and possibly persuade him to discard his ideas of violence. Probably do it in a quiet way, too. What does Mr. Porter pay you? Well, what's that got to do with it? I'm willing to pay you. I mean, you and I don't seem to get along very well, but I phoned Porter and he tells me you're one of the best men in your line of business. I'll pay you to go to Paul Forbes and talk to him as I've described. <laughs> I can't figure you, Doctor. Now, let you and I not get into any personality arguments. Will you do this for me for your regular fee? I was going to do it anyhow. For Mr. Porter and the fee, he pays me. I just wanted to check you first. I'll do it. But I still think it's a matter for the police. All right, let's leave it this way. You go talk to Forbes. If you think he means to kill me, then I'll call the police and prefer charges against him, patient or no patient. How's that? That sounds a little more sensible, Doctor. I took down the home address of Paul Forbes and climbed to my rented car and drove over to his home in the gilded edge of the city. A story and a half colonial with all the trimmings. Lawns, trees, Plymouth convertible, a push-button station wagon in the garage. It was a nice warm spring day and some flowers were blooming and smelling up the area in a very nice way. Flies buzzed, bees droned, birds sang. And I went up and pressed the doorbell. I should have gone butterfly catching or taken a plane to Spokane. Yeah? 
I'm looking for Paul Forbes. Does he live here? Yeah, he sure does. I'm Forbes. Mr. Forbes, my name is Johnny Dollar. Dollar? Yeah, and I came over to talk to you... You get out of my way! The front of his gun slapped against the side of my head and I went down to my knees. A door slammed somewhere and someone ran away. I twisted around trying to see what it was all about. And then I managed to get to my feet in time to see Paul Forbes plunging the Plymouth out the driveway and heading I don't know where. Oh, oh. Goodness, my goodness. What happened here? Uh, Where's Mr. Forbes? You hurt? Yeah, oh, Miss Forbes, Miss Forbes. Hey. Oh, let me help you, sir. Yeah, give me your arm. Yeah. We better sit you down over here. Okay, thanks. Oh, my thanks. goodness, my goodness gracious, sir. How did this happen? Mr. Forbes swung a gun at me. Oh, no, sir, no, sir. Oh, no, sir. No, easy, sir. Easy, easy. Yes, you know, let's sit down here. Oh. Oh. What happened here? I'm afraid Mr. Forbes attacked this gentleman, Miss Forbes. Call the doctor up and then go to my medicine chest and get some swabs and a pan of cold oh, water. Right away, ma'am. Wait, uh, the doctor isn't necessary. It just made me dizzy. Your cut. It might be deep. Well, get the first aid things and some brandy, Upton. Right away, ma'am. This is unforgivable, just unforgivable conduct. Please, I don't know who you are. Are you a friend of Paul? No, I'm Johnny Dollar. I, I wanted to discuss with your husband and something. I, I take it you're Mrs. Forbes. Yes. Oh, Upton, uh, set them right here. Yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. You feeling a little better, sir? I, I don't know yet. Hey, let me try some of that. Yes, yeah, certainly, sir, certainly. Here we go, sir. Easy now, easy. <laughs> Thanks. How does it look to you, Upton? Well, I believe it's not too deep, Mrs. Forbes. How's it feel, Mr. Dollar? No, I, I don't think it's very deep. I'll be all right in a minute. Upton, go telephone Dr. Shepard and tell him to come over here immediately. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Dollar, I can't tell you how sorry I am for this. You, you can bring suit against us. You can do anything you want to, Mr. Dollar. Paul's temper is just ungovernable these days. He could have killed you. He took the car and ran. Yeah. I don't know what's gotten into him. Two nights ago, he attacked my personal physician, threatened to kill him. And now he's attacked you for no reason at all. Any idea where he might have gone? Heaven only knows. That's what he is, Mr. Dollar. He's mad. Pauline Forbes had a right to be scared from what I'd seen of her and from what I'd seen of her husband. He was an angry man with a gun in his hand, slugging at anyone in sight. She was a distraught woman with a darkening spot underneath her right eye, and it wasn't mascara. I began to wonder who needed more looking after. Dr. Shepard, Mrs. Forbes... Or Johnny Dollar. Now, you just lie still now, sir. Uh, well, I guess you kind of fainted a little bit. Is there anything I can get you, sir? No. No, uh, just tell me about Mr. Forbes. I beg your pardon, sir? Look, I'm an insurance investigator. I came here today to talk to Mr. Forbes about threatening Dr. Shepard's life. Oh, uh, well, I, I wouldn't want to talk out of turn, sir. You you better discuss that with Ms. Forbes. Now, just one question. Did Mr. Forbes threaten Dr. Shepard's life? Yes, sir. You heard him? I did, sir. He attacked Dr. Shepard here two nights ago. Did he also attack Mrs. Forbes? Mr. Dollar, this is an unhappy house. Things have gone all wrong here these last few months. Mr. Forbes changed. Ms. Forbes... Uh, oh, I don't know. I, but please... Don't ask me to speak up against anyone. I'm just trying to find out the best thing to do for everybody concerned. What can you do, sir? Well, I didn't think anything like this would happen. Terrible, Doctor. Terrible. This about settles it. Now, I want you to go up to your room and lie down. There's no sense in your getting any more excited. I want to see about Mr. Dollar first. Oh, good morning, Doctor. Hello, Upton. Uh, let's have a look at this, Dollar. Uh, get that light. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. How is it? Well, I don't think it's anything worse than a cut. How do you feel, Dollar? Oh, an aspirin might straighten me out. I hope so. After? Yes, I'll get some, sir. <laughs> Dollar, I should have taken your advice yesterday. I'm going to take it now. I'm going to call the police and have this man arrested. He might kill somebody next time. Yeah, am I all right? Sit up. Dizzy? Yeah, a little. That'll wear off. What will they do to Paul? Well, they'll take him into custody and probably talk some sense to him. Oh, this... This is awful. You go up to your room now, Mrs. Forbes. We'll handle this. Oh, Upton, uh, take Mrs. Forbes upstairs. Yes, sir. You just come along, Miss Forbes. Thank you. Yeah. 
she is not a well woman. She looks all right to me. I wish she were. Uh, I'm going to get an x-ray on that head. Can you come by the office this afternoon? Yeah, I guess so. Uh, give me the police. I doubt if it's concussion or anything like that, but it's best to play safe. You're a safe player all the time, aren't you, Doctor? What does that mean? I don't know. Now, look here. I'm not... Hello? Uh, yes. I want to talk to somebody about a threat on my life. I... My name is Shepard. Dr. Charles Shepard. When I left him, he was reporting Paul Forbes to the police. He gave them Forbes' description and the license number of the Plymouth Forbes was driving. I didn't stay beyond that. Maybe I should have. Maybe I should never have left that house. I'm not sure, but if I hadn't left, I might have saved a life. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow... Well, the big lie is as true as little green apples. Join us, won't you, when I bite into one and spit out a bullet. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Miss Streeter at Dr. Shepard's office. Yes? Dr. Shepard gave me your hotel number. He said you were to come in for a head x-ray. Let me talk to the doctor about that. Well, he's out on house calls right now, Mr. Dollar. He'll be back late this afternoon. He seemed very concerned over... He ought to be. A friend of his banged me on the head with a gun this morning. That's why the x-ray. Well, could you possibly come in and have it made? Doctor was most insistent. All right, Miss Streeter, I'll be right over. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Richard Porter, 480 Webster Boulevard, Providence, Rhode Island. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Shepherd matter. Expense account item four, one dollar, cab fare, from my hotel to Richard Porter's office. Porter was sympathetic. You know, I feel very responsible for this, Mr. Dollar. I hired you to look into all oh, this. Oh, it'll go away, it'll go away. I've been hit on the head before. 
Hey, do you have anything to drink in here? Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> you never can tell when a snake will come up and bite you. <laughs> yeah, here you are. Mm-hmm. Thanks. I suppose you came in to give me your expense sheet now that it's all settled. Not exactly, Mr. Porter. It isn't settled for me. Well, certainly, you know I'll assume any medical expenses involved here. That no, I'm not talking in. about that, Mr. Porter. Sit down. <clears throat> now, look, there's something going on here, and we might as well have it out. You hired me to investigate a client who wanted to buy $80,000 worth of straight life insurance, right? Yes. Now, that client explained why he called for that insurance. Not to my satisfaction, but he explained it. He said a man named Paul Forbes had threatened his life. Threatened it because Dr. Shepard had advised Forbes' wife to get a divorce. I know you didn't believe this, but the facts now seem to bear it I out. I went over to see Forbes this morning to talk to him about his threats. I managed to get my name out, and Forbes attacked me, so I got this. Then Forbes ran out. Mrs. Forbes and a servant in the house gave me first aid. All the time they were doing it, they were apologizing for Forbes and his violence. Finally, Dr. Shepard came in, called the police, and told them to pick up Forbes. And the police will pick him up if they haven't already, and Dr. Shepard will prefer charges... And that, that won't be that, Mr. Porter. Not as far as I'm concerned. Dr. Shepard's story is still leaky. I'm sorry, but I think it has more credence than ever in view of what's happened. You told me yourself his wife and the servant admitted Forbes had threatened Dr. Shepard's life. Oh, I believe that part. But Shepard lies so much, you can get to believing him. What lies, for heaven's sake? Oh, for one thing, his reason for not calling the police right away. I mean, about how delicate Mrs. Forbes' condition was. She looked pretty healthy to me this morning. Another thing, he described Forbes as a man with homicidal tendencies. Now, Dr. Shepard's supposed to be an expert on behavior. And he thought that if I talked to Forbes, I might settle the matter peaceably. But Forbes attacked me as soon as I told him my name. I didn't get a chance to talk. Well, Dr. Shepard has no control he over... He felt what... pretty sure I could talk to Forbes. If you don't like that, let me go on. What reason did Forbes have to hit me? He didn't know me from a load of coal. Somebody put him up to it. Who? Oh. Who do you think? Shepard, for some reason? Shepard was the only one who knew I was going right over there. But why? I don't know. What would he gain? Uh, my business for an x-ray. Uh, now you're joking now. I suppose I am, but I got a headache. I feel off. Oh, uh, here. Uh, how about Mrs. Forbes? Oh, here. Thanks. Oh, she seemed like a genuine enough person. Not sick the way I expected her to be. Someone slugged her recently. There was a bruise under one eye. Mm, Shepard said her husband was an erratic, ruthless, violent man. Well, look, I'm stubborn, Mr. Porter. I still think Shepard's been lying to me. If for no other reason, then I think I know the breed. What's all this got to do with the insurance application? Well, that's another thing I don't know. Expense account item five, three dollars, cab fare. To Dr. Shepard's one-story building to have my head x-ray. Shepard was still out, but Miss Streeter did the honors. Almost in silence. Outside of sit still and hold it, nothing much was said. Well, the picture's okay, Mr. Dollar. I looked at it. I didn't see anything wrong. Of course, the doctor will call you when he's had a chance to see it. Swell. You must have got quite a blow. That's a nasty bruise you have. Oh, well, it's pretty good, all right. He swung his gun hard. Well, the doctor will be back about mid-afternoon. He can call you at your hotel? Yes. Well, thank you for coming in. I want to ask you a question, Miss Streeter. Yes? Are you in love with him? What? Are you in love with Dr. Shepard? Well, that's rather my own business, isn't it? Unless, of course, in your investigation of whatever you're investigating, for some reason I'm under your scrutiny. Well, I suppose it is, and I suppose I can take that to say yes. I become rather angry with you, Mr. Dollar, but frankly, you seem rather ridiculous. I suppose so. He's a liar, isn't he? I mean, Shepard. One more question. I told you on the phone a friend of Dr. Shepard's did this to my head. Now, did you ever ask me who that friend was? Well, I think you'd be curious about a thing like that, Miss Streeter. I think I have a great deal of work to do, Mr. Dollar. Expense account item six, another three bucks, some more cab fare. This time, back to my hotel, where I picked up my rented car, filled it with gasoline, item seven, $5.30, and drove out to Pawtucket. At the home of Mrs. Clara Shepard, I explained my name and business to an elderly man who answered the door. He asked me to wait a moment, then returned and said Mrs. Shepard would see me. She was a bright-looking, gray-haired woman in her mid-sixties, elegantly groomed and obviously well cared for. We went through the politenesses, then got down to business. My son applied for $80,000 worth of life insurance and named me beneficiary. That's about it. <laughs> I wonder what he's up to. So do we. You mean, so do I. 
You don't trust anyone, do you, Mr. Dollar? He said his life had been threatened. He told me he wanted to make certain you were well taken care of in case anything happened to him. Oh. He was lying, wasn't he? I haven't seen him, talked to him, even had a Christmas card from him in three years. Maybe he does worry about his poor old mother now and then. I'm flattered. What you're saying about him isn't very flattering. Oh, I don't think Charles ever thought much of me as a mother. Still doesn't, I'm sorry to admit. But then I don't think too much of him as a son. So there we are. Is it too early for a cocktail, Mr. Dollar? How do you explain him already having a $20,000 policy on himself and wanting to kick it up to a hundred? you the beneficiary? No explanation. That's why I suggested a cocktail. To my friends here... Charles is a successful doctor in Providence who calls me faithfully every day, sends me gifts, and is always assured that I am well and happy and occupied in my old age. I guess I like you, Mr. Dollar, perhaps because, with all your gruffness, you might be nice to your mother. No, Charles and I aren't close. Never have been. I can tell you this. I don't need his closeness, at least not in a financial way. If Charles were to die and I received $100,000, it would mean a rather difficult tots problem. If he were to die, part of me would die too. I'd like you to have just one martini with me, and then you may go. Mr. Dollar. I had the one martini with the tall, stately woman who struggled against tears. It was an old struggle with her, increasingly difficult, I guess, as the years kept on. We talked no more of her son or the insurance or the threat on his life. I left there about four o'clock in the afternoon. I drove back over to Providence and got to Dr. Shepard's office about a quarter to six. A broad-shouldered man in a tweed suit was in the reception room. He got to his feet when I walked in. Dr. Shepard? No. Don't I know you? Yeah, I was thinking the same. Wait a minute. Yeah, your name is uh, Dollar, your insurance investigator. Yeah, yeah. You're <laughs> Bill Phil... Crosby, yeah. Providence Police. <laughs> well, I met oh, you in New Hartford once. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know you were down here. Hey, you must be the one. This Dr. Shepard called downtown about a threat in his life and said an insurance investigator had been slugged trying to help him out of it. Yeah, that's right. Well, where is he? I don't know. I rang that buzzer there. There's no one around at all. What's this all about? Well, a man named Paul Forbes threatened the doctor's life. He slugged me. You got a pickup out on him yet? No, not yet. Try to pin the doctor down all day long. Been out on house calls, emergencies, everything else. We have to get his signature on a complaint. Mm, I thought that was all taken care of by now. Uh, well, hello. Oh, hello. Well, hello, Mr. Dollar. Hello, Miss Streeter. This is Phil Crosby from the police department. Police? I'd like to see Dr. Shepard, miss. Is anything the matter? Just want to see him. Oh, well, goodness, he was here ten minutes ago. He sent me over to the pharmacy to pick up these things. Oh. What? We had an emergency. 1213 Putnam Street. Got a note from him? Yes. May I see it, please? But no name on this, Miss Streeter. Do you recognize the address at all? Oh, no, I don't. Doctor wouldn't take a random emergency unless it were very unusual. This might be unusual, Phil. This is down by the water. How bad off do you think Forbes is? Mad, had a gun, plenty rough. I rode down in the police car with Phil Crosby. I had a feeling about the acuteness of that emergency. As a matter of fact, I had a feeling about the acuteness of everything that had happened that day, from the time a half-crazed man had slugged me with a gun. The feeling was heavier than ever when we hit the neighborhood. Come on. All right. Wait. How oh, on. Uh... 1213 Putnam Street. That'd have to be that vacant lot over there. This is 1240 here. The rest belongs to the warehouse. Yeah. Phil. Huh? That car empty on the plates. Yeah. Yeah, that's Dr. Shepard's car. Motor's still warm. Must be around here somewhere looking for the address. That's a dead end there. I better call in for some help. Fog's coming in if he's wandering around here. Yeah. Phil Crosby went off to find a telephone and request help. I stood by Dr. Shepard's car, waiting and listening and smoking. Nothing happened. No one cried out. No guns went off. 
Then Crosby drove up in the police car. Come on, report's in. A report was in, all right. We drove two blocks down the street where a small, curious crowd of people had already gathered in the cheerless fog. A uniformed man from the harbor division was standing over what appeared to be a bundle of clothes lying in a heap. We bent over it, and Phil looked up at me with a question mark. That Shepard, Johnny? Yeah, that's him. Yep, I'd say he's been dead less than half an hour. Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a liar is still lying, even though he's dead. Join us, won't you, and I'll tell you all about it. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Phil Crosby, Dollar. Were you in bed? No. Good. Put on your coat and come on downtown. Can't it wait till morning? Nope. Want me to send somebody out to pick you up? Are you talking about an arrest? I might be, Dollar. Whatever I have to do to keep you around. I'll make it under my own steam, pal. Fifteen minutes. Room 203 City Hall, okay? I may take 16 minutes if I feel like it. And maybe you'll need longer. I want a real good story about Paul Forbes. A better one than you've told so far. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Richard Porter, 480 Webster Boulevard, Providence, Rhode Island. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Shepherd matter. Swindle sheet item 7, 10 cents, one newspaper. It carried the story of Dr. Shepherd's murder and told how his life had been threatened by Paul Forbes earlier in the week. Obviously, Dr. Charles Shepherd had been lured to his death by Forbes who had telephoned him, pretended to need a physician, waited until the victim appeared, and then shot him down. The police had an APB out for Paul Forbes. All parties concerned were notified. The deceased was survived by his mother, Mrs. Clara Shepard of Pawtucket. Amen. Come right in, Dollar. Sit down. 
There were about six people in Crosby's office, among them Richard Porter, who had hired me to investigate Shepard because of a suspicious insurance application. A uniform officer from the Harbor Patrol who had discovered Shepard's body, and two other men from Crosby's staff. I told them how I had been hired, that I didn't believe all of Shepard's story about the threat on his life. I told them about Forbes slugging me for no apparent reason. I also mentioned the insurance matter had never been satisfactorily explained. Well, it's never going to be explained as far as I can see, Dollar. Oh, I'll find an explanation, Phil. You solve your murder and I'll do what I have We've to do. got it solved. All you have to do is pick up Forbes. You know that. I don't know anything. You get huffy with me on the phone and you start talking about arrest and I don't know anything. You said that when you went to see Shepard yesterday morning, he waved a gun at you, a thirty-two. That's right. It wasn't on his body. He knew Forbes hadn't been picked up. His life was in as much danger as ever. Why didn't he carry the gun? You know, that's a pretty good question, Phil. Yeah. What else? He allegedly went out on an emergency call tonight. No little black bag in his car. No little black bag by his body. What doctor goes out on any call without his bag? Oh, I wouldn't let that worry me so much. I'd find out if it was an emergency. Or he knew who was going to meet him when he went out. I thought you might have some ideas. Have you talked to Mrs. Forbes? Of course I've talked to her. She hasn't any idea where her husband might be hiding. She's sure he killed Dr. Shepard. That servant in the house is sure. He told me about Shepard being threatened by Forbes. Shepard told you about being threatened. Forbes slugged you, slugged Mrs. Forbes. Been running around town like a madman all day. But everything you say and every way you say it, it comes out Shepard was lying. I did it on purpose. I wanted to worry you to death. Yeah. Well, every officer in this town has Forbes' description and the license of his car. We ought to get him before the night's out. He's the boy. Good luck, Phil. He was a good policeman with a lot of doubts. And he was mad about them. And that's what it generally takes to get matters straightened out. I found Kareem Streeter at the morgue, standing beside the marble slab on which a late employer had been laid. She looked pale and wan in her stiff white uniform and blue nurse's cape. Her eyes were red with tears, but no sound escaped her. Then she looked up at me once, sighed, and started out of the place. Wait. Oh, no. Well, I'd... I'd like to help you. I... Can you help him? No. No, you can't. No one can. I tried. Who did it? Well, the, the police say Paul Forbes shot him. It looks that way from all they can gather. Over Mrs. Forbes? Yes. Oh. They're looking for him, I suppose? Yes. Well, there's something of a policeman, Mr. Dollar. Why aren't you out helping them or something? Please, Miss Streeter, I know we've I'll had words. I'll answer that question you asked me earlier today. What? You asked me if I loved Dr. Shepard. Yes, Mr. Dollar, I loved him. I loved him more than my whole life. <laughs> when she said that, and for some reason I don't know... I had a feeling that I was hearing the first bit of unembroidered truth I'd heard in two days. It didn't make me feel any better, but it did clear up something that had been in the back of my mind working its way to the front. Expense account item eight, six dollars and seventy cents. A steak, three martinis, and an order of sliced tomatoes. I finished eating at 2.30 in the morning. I really didn't want it, but I did want to sit down and do some thinking. After that, I climbed into my rented car and drove out to Dr. Shepard's office building. Expense account item nine, five dollars even. Bribe for watchman. I shouldn't be doing this, you know. Might lose my job over it. But since you're from the insurance company, I guess you're all right. I sure appreciate it. Eh, too bad about Dr. Shepard. Nice fella. Yeah, very nice. What is it you think you'll find? Police been here till almost an hour ago, poking around. You know if they found anything? Oh, sure. Doctor's emergency kit. Heard him say he didn't take it with him when he went out in that last emergency. Uh-huh. Uh, well, I won't be long. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm going to come right in and watch you. Shepard had been a thorough man, and from all evidence, he and Miss Streeter kept and operated an efficient file system in the office. However, he had kept no medical history of his prime patient, Pauline Forbes. As a matter of fact, in checking over both the patient's files and the card files, there was no evidence to indicate that Mrs. Forbes had ever been a patient of Shepard's. Which seemed strange in view of the fact that he told me he treated her for 14 months or better and ended the treatment by advising her to divorce her husband. What's more, he had never mentioned that Paul Forbes had been one of his patients. But an entry dated some two years before disclosed the fact that Dr. Shepard had examined, treated, and discharged Paul Forbes as a patient. These two developments supplied me with all of the curiosity I'd need for a while. Nurse Corrine Streeter's home address was duly noted on Dr. Shepard's phone book, 
Oakdale House, surprisingly enough, on Oakdale Street. Special rates for nurses. Room 205. Yes? Oh, Mr. Dollar. How do you feel? Not too good, Mr. Dollar. I only got home about 15 minutes ago. They kept me down there pretty long. Then Dr. Shepard's mother came. Do you want to come in? Yeah, thanks. It isn't much of a place, is it? I mean, I haven't straight... Well, things... <laughs> things like tonight aren't easy, I know, but... Look, Miss Streeter, I wish you'd help me and tell me who Dr. Shepard was intending to marry. Marry? Oh, I had no idea. I was in the office a half an hour ago. He'd already made arrangements for a honeymoon, reservations on the Ile de France for next June. Any ideas? Please go. I can't. Look, I'm not here to hurt you. I'm here to help. I mean, was it Mrs. Forbes? What? Look, Miss Streeter, things are all wrong about your doctor's death, about what happened before it. It'll all come out sooner or later. Oh, I suppose it will. It's awful to say this, Mr. Dollar. But Mrs. Forbes was the only person doctors saw socially this last year. And she, of course, is married. How'd they meet? When her husband was Dr. Shepard's patient? Yes, that's right. They became quite friendly. Mrs. Forbes was never a patient, but Mr. Forbes was. Now, what can you tell me about Mr. Forbes? Well, he came to see Dr. Shepard a year or two ago and stopped coming in. I believe he requested a copy of his medical history to be sent to another doctor in Baltimore, I think it was. Uh huh. But Dr. Shepard kept right on seeing Mrs. Forbes. Yes. Huh? All right. Do you have any idea why I was called in by the insurance broker? At first, I didn't. But I, I don't understand what you're trying to do. The police want Mr. Forbes. What does it all mean? <sighs> It'll sicken you, Miss Well, oh, tell me if you know. Tell me, please. It means the wrong man was killed tonight. I was pretty sure of what I meant when I said that. And I was also pretty sure that Phil Crosby and the police department had recognized the setup. It so happened I had a head start in the way of information. And though it was six o'clock in the morning by that time, I decided to use it. Mr. Dollar. Hello, Mrs. Forbes. I'd like to come in. What is it? I should have tumbled to it right away, but your husband fit the part too well. Look here. I've been through quite enough today with the police and all out looking for Paul and Dr. Shepard being killed. Stop and I... looking pained and tired. I'm the guy that's tired. I'm the one who was going to be the star witness when the state tried Shepard for killing your husband. What? Why not get a star witness for free? Why not make a suspicious insurance move so an investigator would be called in? An investigator who'd back up a self-defense plea for your doctor and get him off on justifiable homicide. Get out of here. Get out of here. I'll call the police. And you and the doctor sail to France in June and live happily ever after? What's the matter? Wouldn't your husband give you a divorce? Go ahead. If you say it's that way, Mr. Dollar, and you know everything, that it must have been that way. Only it got fouled up. Your husband did shoot your boyfriend after all, just as he threatened to. Get out of here! You can't prove any of it. Not one word of it. Oh, you're right about that, Mrs. Forbes. I can't prove anything. Not a thing. Shepard's dead, and they want your husband for it. He threatened Shepard. And they'll get him for it, and that's that. But you have something to live with for the rest of your life. Your doctor's gone. He'll never come back. Or maybe you can just have a cup of coffee and forget all about it. Get out! Get out! Leave me alone! Leave me alone! What? Yeah, that's it, Phil. That's what was supposed to happen. Shepard had it planted all over town how Forbes had threatened his life. He had witnesses. He had me, even. All he had to do was go out and shoot Forbes any place, any time. But Forbes got him first. Can people get by with this kind of thing in our courts of law? If and when you get your hands on Paul Forbes, will he have any kind of defense? Oh, he'll get him, Dollar. The other I can't answer. What you just told me can't be proven. I don't see how a lawyer can do much for a guy who threatens another man's life and then finally guns him down, do you? But it was Forbes who was the marked man all this time. He was supposed to die. If it could be proved that Forbes was a patsy, that the doctor intended to gun him down... the judge and jury, Johnny. When we get Forbes, he'll be arraigned and indicted for first-degree murder. Don't worry about that part. The rest is up to the court, out of our hands. After all, we're pretty sure Forbes shot and killed Dr. Shepard. Hang up that phone, Dollar. You still on the wire, Johnny? Hang it up or I'll blow your head off. Paul Forbes looked the part of a fugitive. His coat was ripped in several places. The knuckles on his left hand were torn and raw. There was mud on his shoes and pant legs. His eyes told the rest of the story. He was blazing mad. He had a gun. And he wasn't afraid to use it.
Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow I find out how hard it is to kill a lie. Sometimes you have to kill it twice. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is the hotel operator, Mr. Dollar. Will you cut off? I, uh... Tell him not to let any more calls in here. Come on! I was cut off, but I'd rather get some sleep now. Anybody phones, just take a message. All right, Mr. Dollar. Over there. Sit down. Put your hands on your knees. Now, just so as you and I understand each other. You make one move. Wiggle a finger, I'll empty this gun right in your stomach. You understand me? I understand you, Forbes. You're crazy. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Richard Porter, 480 Webster Boulevard, Providence, Rhode Island. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Shepherd matter. I was pretty sick of it and with it when I had Paul Forbes visit me in my hotel room about 7 o'clock in the morning. He'd used a gun in front of me once before to crack my skull. I decided I'd try to avoid that again. So I sat down and I played good. It didn't seem to please him a bit. You were out to my house about an hour ago, weren't you? Yeah, I went out to talk to your wife. I saw you. I was across the street watching. I followed you here. Fixing up another deal, huh? I don't know what you're talking about, Forbes. I followed you here so we could have a little talk. And we're going to have it, you and I. You ought to put that gun away and let them take you, Forbes. Where do you live? In Hartford, Connecticut. I mean, where do you live in town here in Providence? I don't. I live in Hartford. Where do you practice? Practice what? Are you trying to get funny with me? I don't practice anything here in Providence. I don't live here. I'm just here for a few days. Doing what? Working on an insurance matter. Insurance matter? You're licensed to practice law in Rhode Island? Oh, you've got something all wrong, Forbes. I don't practice law. I'm not a lawyer. I'm an insurance investigator. 
I tried to tell you that yesterday morning when you cracked me with that gun. I was called in by Dr. Shepard. He said you threatened his life. You're lying to me. Shepard called me yesterday morning and said a lawyer named Dollar was on his way over to talk to me about getting Pauline a divorce. You're a lawyer. I'm what I say I am. If you hadn't started swinging that gun butt around, I'd have told you why I was there yesterday. You got a billfold or something? My coat pocket inside on the back of that chair there. I think I know why Shepard called you and told you I was a lawyer. I think he wanted you to attack me and make me Shut a... Shut up! You and Shepard are trying to pull something to take my wife away from me. I know that much. And now you're trying to pull something to get out of this jam. You're wrong, Forbes. I don't know anything about trying to take your wife away from you. You know I didn't kill Shepard. How do I know you didn't kill him? You threatened him. Half a dozen people have attested to that. I know you had a reason to kill him. I know every time I've seen you, you've had a gun in your hands and you've been swinging it at somebody, particularly me. You know who did it. You're in on it somewhere. You know who killed Shepard and you're going to clear me. You're going to tell me, Dollar. I'm going to whip it out of you. You're going to crazy. Go! All right. Get on your feet. He sat in the chair just the way I propped him there. His eyes looked dull and lifeless, as though he were already dead. I couldn't think of anything brilliant to say or do, so I rummaged around my suitcase and pulled out a bottle. Then I found a pair of glasses in the bathroom and poured a couple of drinks. When I came on out, he hadn't moved from the chair. He looked crumpled like a worn-out suit of clothes. He made no effort to look at me when I tucked the glass in his hand. Here, try this. Go on, go on, drink it. Why don't you call the police? Now, you say you followed me here to have a talk and find out what's what. Now's the time to talk, pal. This thing isn't the best conversation piece in the world. Leave me alone. Call him in. You have something going for you here. This gun hasn't been fired. Do you have another one? No. No, Dollar, I didn't kill Dr. Shepard. I wanted to more than anything in the world. But I didn't kill him. Now, look, I want some facts. So let's start with last night. Where were you when Shepard was shot? How do I know where I was? I uh, I don't even know what time he was shot. All right, let's start with yesterday morning. You slugged me, ran out of the house, jumped in a car, and what happened? Go on, take it from there. I drove over to Dr. Shepard's office. I was going to have it out with him. He was breaking up my home. Well, go on. Did you see him? No. I parked down the street from his office... And then I saw him jump in his car, and I followed him. He came back over here. I knew my wife must have called him to take care of you. What happened then? I went over to the park and sat and tried to figure things out. You don't know what I've been through this past year. All right, go on, go on. Then I went to a bar. I was hungry. I hadn't eaten all day. I got a couple of sandwiches, and then I had some drinks. I don't know how many... Anyhow, the, the more I drank, the more hopeless everything looked. Did you call Shepard? Yeah. Yeah, I, I called him from the bar. Any idea what time it was? Must have been around five or six. What difference does it all make? I'm cooked and you know it. Go on, will you? You call Shepard. Then what did you do? I told him I wanted to talk to him about everything that had happened. I told him where to meet me. You mean you wanted Dr. Shepard to come down and meet you so you could kill him? Maybe I did have that in my mind. I don't know. On the phone, he sounded so calm and said we could talk it out and straighten it out like gentlemen. Did you talk to him? No. I didn't see him at all. I waited an hour and he never showed up. I called his office back and the answering service said everyone had gone out for the day and I, I didn't know what to do. I got back in my car and turned on the radio, and that's where I heard I was wanted for murder. Dollar, I didn't do it. I swear I didn't. I had reason enough, but I didn't. I knew all about the others, but this was wait serious. Minute, wait a minute. What others? Pauline's always had other friends. <laughs> friends. I, I guess... <sighs> I, don't know. I, don't, I don't guess I love her anymore. I don't know. I don't think she ever loved me. But I needed her. I needed her more than anything this last year or so. 
And at times I, I did love her the way it once was. And I found out what was going on between her and Shepard. She wanted a divorce. I wouldn't give her a divorce. If I had let her and Shepard get away with it, it would have been too much to take, to ask. Oh, this doesn't make sense. Even though you didn't love her and she didn't love you, you wouldn't stand still for a divorce action? It sounds stupid. I just told you. I needed her so much this last year or so. So much. Still doesn't make any sense, Forbes. Why didn't you let her go? She knew she didn't have to divorce me. She knew it wouldn't be too long. What? Shepard gave me a year. Another doctor in Baltimore, 18 months. Leukemia. Don't you see? She would have been free. They could have waited until I was dead at least. Just that, until I was dead. Couldn't they? Well, couldn't they? Expense account item 10, $2, sleeping pills. I fed them to him along with a cup of hot chocolate. He looked pretty worn out, and within 15 minutes, he was sound asleep in my bed. Item 11, $4.16, one long-distance phone call to a Baltimore clinic where I spoke with a Dr. Franz Mueller. Dr. Mueller confirmed what Forbes had said. Forbes was doomed with an incurable ailment. Item 12, 20 cents, another phone call, this one from the hotel lobby to the coroner's office. I learned that Shepard had been killed by 32 caliber slugs. Forbes' gun, a 32, had not been fired or hastily cleaned. His story was checking out. That left just one small item to be cleared up. Expense account item 13, $4. Taxi fare from my hotel back to the Oakdale home. Special rates for nurses. Hello. I thought you'd be back to see me. Somehow I'm glad it's you, Mr. Dollar. Go ahead. That's an old story. Terribly old and corny. I applied for a job as Dr. Shepard's nurse five years ago, and I fell in love with him that very day. I've loved him every day from that time on. Five years. Go on. I don't know when it was when he started up with Mrs. Forbes. I knew she was trying to get a divorce. I knew Mr. Forbes wouldn't stand for it. Then one day... Last week, I guess it was. I heard Doctor talking to her on the phone. He said, there's a way to get rid of him. I knew he was talking about getting rid of Mr. Forbes. Did they discuss the part about Shepard getting Forbes to threaten his life in front of witnesses so he could shoot him down when the time came? No, I didn't know that until yesterday morning. So long ago, it seems. You came to see Doctor, and then you left. I overheard him on the phone again. He called up Mr. Forbes and said Mr. Dollar was coming over to talk about the divorce action. And he knew Forbes would be upset enough to attack me. Doctor was very good about anticipating what people would do in given situations. <laughs> Even me. I was in the office when Mr. Forbes called last night. I saw a doctor put the gun in his coat. I knew he was going down to meet Mr. Forbes and shoot him. So I followed him. He was walking around in the dark looking for Mr. Forbes with a gun in his hand. I ran up to him and pleaded with him not to be crazy, that Mrs. Forbes wasn't worth it. Then he said he was going to kill me, too. We struggled. The gun went off. I don't know how many times. I can help you, Corinne. He didn't mean to kill him. He meant to shoot you. When all these other details come out, the most they can charge you with is second-degree justifiable or manslaughter. No. You're nice. But I can't get off. Huh? I guess the police haven't found her yet. I went over and killed Mrs. Forbes an hour ago. Expense account item 14, same as item 1. Transportation back to Hartford. The next time you have a doubtful insurance application, Mr. Porter, settle it yourself or call someone else. Don't call me. As far as I can add up, and I'm not going to recheck the figures, expense account total is $485. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, 
now here's our star to tell you about next week's intriguing story. Next week, the case of a lonely heart that found plenty of company in the nearest morgue. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Gene Bates, Virginia Gregg, Russell Thorson, Parley Bear, Herb Ellis, Barney Phillips, and Lawrence Dobkin. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. Hello, Yukon 28209. Yes, this is Candy Matson. Heat that baby on the tree. Uh, fix those dolly tracks. And look out for that cable, it's hot. Mallard, what in the name of the San Francisco Police Department are you doing up here on Telegraph Hill? Working, Candy, in the name of the San Francisco Police Department. Here? With these people who are making the movie? Yeah. How about that? Me, a lieutenant in homicide, and I'm assigned to riding herd on these Hollywood characters. Oh, it's better than murder. I'll take murder any day. (laughs) What are you doing around here? I did some shopping at Speedy's this morning while I was pinching the avocados. They told me that there was a Hollywood gang over by Coit Tower shooting some scenes for a movie with a San Francisco background. They might just as well have stayed in the studio. They brought their own lawns, prop trees, fake bushes, the works. (laughs) If it ever snowed up here on Telegraph Hill, they'd have brought some of that along, too. (laughs) (laughs) You've never worked in Hollywood, Mallard. Only God can make a tree, but Hollywood presumes to improve on them. (laughs) What are they doing now? Uh, Just getting ready to shoot a scene, I think. Oh, been rehearsing it all morning. Mm-hmm. What's it all about, you know? As far as I can figure, it's a story about San Francisco right after the gold rush. Look at all the costumes. Very authentic. Looks like they'd been shipped around the horn. <laughs> By the way, Mallard, do you know who's in the picture? Some lush tomato named Cherry Dana and the Colorado boy, Buff Arnold. Arnold? D- did you say Buff Arnold? That's right. Why? Oh, forgive me, Mallard, dear. I... I knew Buff Arnold when he didn't have a place to house in. He professed to carry a very warm torch for me. Uh Aha. So that's why you so casually dropped by. An old flame, huh? Don't be ridiculous. I didn't even know the guy was here, let alone still in pictures. A likely story. (laughs) All right, quiet, please. Let's have quiet. Quiet. This is a take. All set, Mr. Dix. We're ready. Good. Okay, Cherry, we'll roll this one. Take a chance on it. Just remember to keep up against those trees. We don't want any shots of those modern buildings below the hill. Oh, remember, Red. Where is my old pal, Buff Arnold Mar- Mallard, dear? By me. Judging by what's been going on, he's not in this particular scene. Mm-hmm. All right, stand by. Roll him. Scene 47, take 10. <laughs> Mm-hmm. 
Wait a minute, wait a minute. Cut, cut. Oh, where's that coming from? Out on the bay, Mr. Dix. A fine thing, a present-day steamer whistle in an 1850 picture. Hold it. Ames, yes. let me know when the fool ship is tied up. We won't shoot the scene until it's docked. Yes, sir. Oh, darn it. I was hoping I'd see some action. Well, I'll give you some action. Come on, walk around with me, Candy. I'll show you all the sights. Sights like what, for instance, Mallard? Oh, all the lights they brought up here. They must have a thousand of them. Undoubtedly to wash out the wrinkles on the leading lady's face. And talk about props. It must have taken a whole freight train to get them up here. Well, I have to have them. Uh, uh, for instance, look, uh, right up there. Hmm? Where, Melly? Uh, up, up there, above. In that tree, hanging by their necks. <gasps> oh, Mallard! <laughs> Don't jump like that, Cupcake. Oh. They're only dummies hanging from those ropes. Three of them, they, they look so realistic. Well, I must admit, they really do. I understand they use them in a scene where they recreate a lynching in Portsmouth Square. Recreate, did you say? Yeah. Maybe you're right. Take another look, honey, but a good look at the one in the middle. What are you trying to... Try me for lard. That one in the middle is no dummy. You're no dummy either, boy of mine. How many times have you looked up there? Well, just a couple of times, but the last time I looked, the one in the middle wasn't an ex-human being. With that, I tossed the whole thing in your lap, Mallard. I promote you back to homicide. Oh, why didn't these characters stay in Hollywood? It is a bit of a shame, isn't it? Cluttering up our lovely Telegraph Hill trees with gently swaying corpses. Come on, Mallard. Let's give the director a slight touch of apoplexy. <laughs> The National Broadcasting Company presents Candy Matson, Yukon 2, 8209. It's funny how sometimes when you're lazy and want to do nothing except live the good, pure life, trumble, trouble comes up and belts you over the head with a vengeance. Well, that's the way it happened to me. I'd just finished a deal that took me three weeks to crack. I made some good money out of it, banked it, and sat back to relax. When I heard about the movie company on location on the other side of the hill, my curiosity got the better of me. As of that moment, my contemplated relaxation was at an end. Period. Paragraph. I literally walked right into trouble because there was Mallard and cut down. Okay, Mr. Dix, take a good look at him. You recognize the gent? I recognize him, yes, but I don't know him. He was one of the extras we used in a scene yesterday. Did he come up from Hollywood with you? I'm pretty sure he didn't. I think he was hired here locally. Uh, wait a minute. Who's this young lady? I don't want any outsiders in on this. Don't no, fret your little head, Mr. Dix. Aside from being a material witness, she's a well-known private investigator. Ah, excuse me. I didn't know. That's all right. No need to apologize. Some of my best friends are movie directors. Uh, who would keep the roster on your personnel? My assistant, Bill Ames. Is he around? Well, I'm right here, Lieutenant. Oh, good. Can you give us any dope on this fellow? Oh, golly, uh, I'm afraid not. I've seen him, but I wouldn't know his name from Adam. How about the payroll? When do you pay off the extras? Yeah, that's a thought. We pay off at 5 o'clock tonight. Why don't we come back then, Mellard? We can check off the names against the pay vouchers. There's one thing extras like to do, and that's get paid. The name that doesn't show up is our friend the corpse. Okay, we'll let it go like that. What do you pay off? Room 873, Montfair Hotel. Well, make sure everybody's there, unless they want a little trouble thrown at them. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Dix. You can go on with your shooting now. Ah, uh, no, no more today. It's too unnerving. Ames, knock it off. Call will be for 8 o'clock tomorrow morning, sharp. Right, Chief. Uh, break it up, everybody. 8 o'clock tomorrow morning, in costumes. And that means 8 o'clock, understand? Not morning. You mind waiting here for a moment, Caddy? I want to put in a call to the coroner's office for a wagon. Sure, that's all right. Go ahead. Good. It'll only be a few minutes. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mr. Dix, pardon me. Yes? Can you tell me where Buff Arnold is staying? What uh, what do you want with Buff Arnold, young lady? I used to know him when he was playing bit parts in Hollywood. Oh. Did you uh, work in Hollywood? I did a little time down there, sitting around in agents' offices. You know, uh, you're a sharp little cookie. <laughs> Say, all of a sudden I've got an idea. I'll bet. <laughs> no, no. On the level, believe me. I have a small part coming up that'd fit you to a tee. Good-looking gal, wise, supposed to work in her father's store selling supplies to the miners. Can you uh, act at all? I used to shoot a fairly sharp mess of dialogue. Do you live close by? Right over there, one block, penthouse on the top. Hmm, all the better. 
As soon as your policeman friend removes the deceased there, uh, why don't we go over to your place and uh, look at the script? You know something? I've got an idea. That's the idea you had the idea about. Okay, I'll look at the script. But for your information, Mr. Dix, I'm interested only in playing a part in your picture. Mallard came back, and I told him what had developed with Dix. He shot me a look that had more question marks in it than a government income tax form. I assured him I could handle the situation, and he left with the body, still clad in its 49er prospector's outfit. Dix issued some final orders, took me by the arm, and we strolled over to my place. Ah, charming, but positively charming. Thank you. What a gorgeous view. How long have you lived here, Miss... Oh, now, isn't that silly? I don't even know your name. Madsen. Candy Madsen. Candy Madsen. Never have I heard a name match a personality so completely. <laughs> I'm Reginald Dix. Uh, just call me Reg. As you say, Reg. Uh, would you like a drink? Oh, splendid. Soda highball? I think I can scrape one together. <sighs> this is absolutely enchanting. I'm going to ask to make all my pictures in San Francisco from now on. I don't think you'd go wrong. Uh, of <laughs> course, it'd be a little rough if you were making a picture with an Indian background and needed shots of the Taj Mahal and the Himalayas. Oh, simple. I'd change it to the Ferry Building and Twin Peaks. <laughs> Very good. Here you are, Reg. <sighs> Thank you. I can use this after that messy discovery up there on that tree. Well, here's to crime. Uh, that's a charming toast. Now then, about this part you were speaking of, I don't even belong to the Screen Actors Guild anymore. Oh, mere detail. I'll call the studio tonight and have them arrange your membership. As simple as that. You know, I think if some of your bright boys got together, you could win the war in Korea without half trying. Oh, let's not be snide, my dear. Mm -hmm. oh, excuse me a moment. Someone at the door. Uh, certainly. Whoever it is, though, uh, send them away. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Hi. But now that we've established our highs, is there something I can do for you? I'm Cherry Dana. Is Mr. Dix here? Oh, why, yes. Uh, would you wait here, please? I will not wait here. I want in. Now, just a minute. There I'll you get... are, Ed. You have a short memory, haven't you? Cherry, what are you doing here? Uh, I'm having a conference. So I see. I hate to mention it, but this happens to be a private home, Miss Dana. I'll have to ask you to leave. Oh, don't be boring. You lured my director up here, and I'm going to see that some little local wench doesn't put the squeeze play on him. Why, you pampered brat, get out of here right now, or I'll show you how a local wench can back up words with action. Oh, now hold on here, both of you. Um, Cherry, I resent this intrusion just as much as Miss Matson does, I'm sure. I'll bet. What about me? You said you were going to drive me back to the hotel. Oh, very well, it slipped my mind. Oh, I'm sorry, Candy. I dislike scenes of this sort. We'll discuss... Our business, uh, later. Good. Uh, I find now that I'm extremely interested. Good afternoon, Miss Dana. I'll see you later. I was so mad I was boiling. If I'd been a thermometer, Quicksilver would have been streaming out of my ears. I did the most natural thing, took a shower, and little by little I simmered down. Actors and actresses are like anybody else. Most of them are darn nice people just trying to make a living. But one ham, like Cherry Dana, can ruin the picture. Just as I was getting dressed, the ferry building siren blew its top, indicating 4.30. I had to step on it if I was going to be at the Montfair at 5 in time for the payroll sequence with the extras. So I stepped on it and found myself in a minor mob scene outside room 873 at the Montfair Hotel. Mallard spotted me, grabbed me by the arm, and took me inside the room. I really didn't expect to see you, Candy. Hmm? Why not? I thought perhaps you were discussing contract terms with Dix by now. Big Hollywood star and all that. Oh, Mallard, cut it out. All right, ladies and gentlemen, as I call out your names, step up fast and sign the voucher. Anderson, Robert, Apperson, Lou, yep. Bennett, Bert, Beverly... Faye, I studied the faces as they stepped by the cashier's table set up in the room. They were all types. Anyone could have been a, a villain, a dance hall girl, a hero, an ingenue, or just plain extra. The roll call droned on in the background. The whole thing took about ten minutes. And suddenly, we were alone. Ames, the assistant director, the girl who had done the actual pain, Mallard, and myself. Well, that's it. Who's missing, Ames? You're in for a bit of a shock, 
How do you mean? Nobody's missing. Everybody listed on our payroll, checked in, and was paid off. What? That's right. Did you recognize every person who'd been paid off? I'm pretty sure I did. Well, this is a fine kettle of nothing. We have an extra who's working in the picture, and yet he isn't. So he ends up hanging by his neck from a tree on Telegraph Hill. Who was the Joker? The Joker, the one you can play wild. Are you sure they're all paid? Well, positive. Double-checked with their guild cards and signatures. Well, isn't this cute? Oh, excuse me, please. Hello? Yes, this is Ames. Oh, 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 yes, Cherry. What? He's what? Great Scott. What's the matter, Ames? What is it? You're white as a sheet. Dix. He's just been found shot to death in his room. From San Francisco, the National Broadcasting Company is presenting Candy Matson, Yukon 2, 8209. Reginald Dix, well known Hollywood director, shot dead in his hotel room. We were looking for developments. We got them, but not the kind we expected. Mallard led the way up to the suite that Dix had been occupying on the top floor. There was a mob around the door, and my boy Mallard soon dispersed them and instituted some semblance of order. Dix was sprawled out on the balcony overlooking the bay, and an ever-widening pool of blood showed that he'd been hit in the chest. Cherry Dana was pacing the room, smoking a cigarette. Ames stood in the middle with his jaw flapping. And who should be in the room, too, but my old pal from my days in Hollywood, Buff Arnie. Candy. Candy Matson. What a place for a reunion. Yes, isn't it? How are you, Buff? Ill. Terribly ill. If I have to step into the other room, I hope you'll understand. Reg was a great friend of mine. Sure. Sure, let's go in the bedroom. Uh, you look sort of green. Mm. Besides, I have a few questions I'd like to ask you, Buff. It's a deal. Anything to get out of here, let's go. Wait a minute, Candy. Who is this guy? Buff Arnold Mallard, the fellow I was speaking about. Where were you going? In there. He doesn't feel too good. The closest he's ever been to blood is a bottle of ketchup in color. Okay. Don't let him out of your sight. I have a flock of questions and need a flock of answers. As you say, Miller, dear. And don't get carried away yourself. This the bedroom? Yeah. Well, Buff, you seem to be doing all right. Mm, a lot different than when I knew you in Hollywood, Candy. You look swell, Buff. Too darn swell. Hmm? What do you mean? You bring back too many memories. You look mighty good yourself, Candy. You're no longer a plump little kid just out of high school. You're downright pretty, gal. In the good old days, I'd have jumped through hoops to hear you say that. Got any hoops handy? I'll say it again. No soap. Maybe we could revive some of those memories, Candy. Not a chance, Buff Boy. Things have changed. Hollywood and everyone in it, including you, are a part of a dim, sad past. And instead of just plain Buff, that's a rebuff. Very cute. I haven't heard the gag pulled since yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me, did you hear about the body that was found on Telegraph Hill this morning? I sure did. Now, poor Reg. I told him this picture had a jinx on it before we left the studio. Little things have happened right from the start. Like what? Well, in the first place, I wasn't even supposed to be in the picture. They were going to give it to some new kid as a build-up. A week before the first day of shooting, he up and disappeared. He hasn't been heard from since. When they shoved me into the breach. Then the assistant director tripped and fell off a catwalk, broke both legs. Mm. He had to be replaced. Anything else, Buff? Yeah. About that time, Jerry Dana whipped herself into a batch of temperament and walked off the lot. Held up production a week. Then the luggage for San Francisco was rerouted somewhere else. Never has caught up with us. Now the body this morning and Dix just now. Certainly sounds like a jinx. By the way, how do you and the great Cherry get along, Buck? Hmm? Fine, fine. I try not to see her except on the set. Come here, Candy. Oh, just I... let me hold you in my arms once, just once. I want the feel of someone who's truly genuine. 
You're still just a little boy, aren't you, Buck? Okay, Arnold, I'd like to, uh... <clears throat> well, pardon me. I hate to break this up. Uh... But I want to talk to you, Mr. Arnold. <laughs> It was a fine time Mallard picked to walk in. And then I got to thinking, maybe it was a fine time. He was due to have a little fire set under him. As I walked out into the other room, the boys in blue had arrived, and they were swarming all over the place. Ames was no longer present. Neither was Cherry Dana. I wasn't going to give Mallard the satisfaction of an explanation, so I eased out the door and went down to the lobby. I asked where Ames was staying and went back up to his room, 672. A knock on the door produced results. Just a moment. Oh, Miss Matson. Uh, something you wanted? Yes. May I come in? Why, I... Yes. I was just lying down. This thing about Reg has knocked me for a complete loop. It seems to be quite a shock to everybody. You've been with Reginald Dix for a long time, haven't you, Ames? Well, off and on, yes. A good number of years. How about La Dana? Cherry? Mm -hmm. oh, I've known her extremely well, even before she became a top-flight star. Can you give me any idea who might have had it in for Dix? If you can, you better spill. The truth will come out sooner or later, Ames. It always does and things of this sort. I've only one little thing I can tell. I've already told it to your lieutenant friend. Oh? And what's that? As I got back from Telegraph Hill, I dropped by Reg's suite. Wanted to talk about tomorrow's shooting. As I drew near his door, I heard loud arguing. Arguing? Who were the opponents? Reg and Cherry Dana. Mm-hmm. And what were they arguing about, Ames? You. So that's it. Tell me, is Cherry the kind of woman who would turn killer on an impulse? It's hard to say. She has a terrible temper. Mm -hmm. Does Buff Arnold fit into the picture in any way? I don't know. He's a sly one, that Arnold. He plays his cards in strictly a commercial manner. May fit into the picture. He and Reg were never too friendly. I see. Oh, thanks, Amesy. I'll leave now. And you'd better lock your door. The way things are going, you might wake up to find yourself dead. I went up to Cherry Dana's suite, but I drew a blank there and no answer. So I went back to the scene of the murder, Dix's rooms on the top floor. Mallard was just leaving... He shot me a look that would have knocked out a North Korean tank at a thousand yards and started to brush on by me, but I would have none of it. Now, just a moment, boy blue. Come on back to that over-21 level. Just because Buff had his arms around me is no sign we were playing a scene from Romeo and Juliet. I don't think I've seen that close a grip even in professional wrestling. Oh, cut it out. What'd you turn up in there? Anything at all? No, not a thing. Can't even find the murder weapon. Got any ideas? Lots of them. We've already taken Miss Dana into custody. I had a hunch it was leading in that direction. Uh, uh, incidentally, did you ever hear of a Christopher Seema? He's been a bookie around town here for several years. Christopher Seema? No, can't say I have. Why? Uh, he was the boy who was hanging from the tree. Oh. According to our files, he dabbled in everything from gambling to blackmail. Seema. Seema, that, that name rings bells somehow, Mallard. Uh, one other thing. <laughs> this isn't... Personal, you understand. Yeah. But stay away from Buff Arnold. We've got our eye on him, too. Little things were suddenly clicking way back in my mind. Awfully vague, but the old processes from years before were coming to life ever so slowly. Mallard had work to do, plenty of it, down at the Hall of Justice, work in which I was included out. I went outside on California Street, watched him get into a squad car with two of his men, and I waved him a goodbye. That was when I had another idea. Dix's suite. The cops were through with it. The body had been removed. But I had a hunch that was the key to the situation. Knowing the manager of the Montfair, it was no trouble at all to get a key to Reg's suite, and that's where I headed, up to the top floor. I let myself into the darkened room, closed the door behind me. And with the lights of the city way below seeping through the balcony window, I found a place in back of the settee and sat down to wait and think. The balcony window being opened, the roar of the city traffic underneath came gently through and helped my thinking. And that's when it hit me. Seema. 
Several years before I had served my term in Hollywood, there was an actress named Vivian Seema. The same face as that of Cherry Dana. Now the clouds were beginning to lift, and at the same time the door opened in the suite and the silhouetted figure of a man entered the room. Blast the luck. Okay, Buff. Relax. What the... This is Candy. Come on over here by the settee. Hurry, I'm expecting company. What are you doing here, Candy? You've got the wrong page of the script. That's my line. What are you doing here, Buck? Honestly, you've got to believe me. I I left my lighter here this afternoon. I was afraid the police would find it. Naturally, I can't afford any bad publicity. It ruined my career. I believe you, Buck. You always were fond of that career, weren't you? Don't answer. Just keep quiet. What's up? A guy named Seema, if I'm right. Shh. <laughs> Since Reginald Dix didn't like him. Wait a minute. I think I hear someone coming along the hall. <laughs> the door slowly opened and closed again. The dim light from the hall showed the form of another man. Then the dark figure moved slowly but surely across the room. It stopped for a second or two, as though listening for something then moved again to the balcony, out onto the balcony, and whoever it was grabbed the ledge above, hoisted his feet up onto the iron grill work, and hung over the city. That's when I acted. Okay, Ames, stay right where you are, in that position. What? You think I'm a fool? Candy's out on that ledge. He's ducked around the outside on that ledge. I'm a fool. Quick, Buff, go down the hall and get out of the fire escape. Cut him off. Okay, where are you going to do it? Go out on that ledge after him. You better come back, Ames. You're cut off at both ends. Oh, no, I'm not. Not with this gun I've got. That's the same gun you killed Dix with, isn't it? Very clever hiding it up on this ledge out here. No wonder Mallard and his boys didn't find it. Look out there on the city, Ames. One misstep and you go off into space. Think it over. You better come back. Not on your life. I'm coming after you. I'm down at the other end, Candy. Good. Now we've got him. Yes. Yes, you have. Obviously, this is the end. Perhaps you don't know what it is to love. Perhaps you don't know what it is to be scorned. I do, painfully so. This is the end. But I'm not going to go alone. You're going with me, Miss Matson, like this. No! No, the recoil. It'll knock you right out of the neck. Oh! Just a matter of jealousy. Is that right, Candy? That's right, Miller, dear. The same thing you developed when you walked in on Buff Arnold and me. Okay, okay, so I was burned up. Tell me more. It was the name Seema that did it, Mallard. Uh, do you know what that is? All right, I'll play quizzes with you. What's the name Seema? Seema is Ames, spelled backwards. Uh-oh. You see, that was Ames' real name. At, at one time, he had married Cherry Dana under the name of Seema. When she began to be big in pictures, she divorced him. But he carried the eternal torch. Silly, she wasn't worth it. Of course not. Because she collected men. Reginald Dix, not because she loved him, but because she was fading in pictures and because Dix was the only one who could keep her in front of the public. Logical. But what about the Seema hung up in the tree on Telegraph Hill? Uh-huh. There we have the plot. The Seema up in the tree was Ames's brother, a ne'er-do-well. The night that Ames arrived in town here, he looked up his brother, got a bit tight, and told him what he'd done. Caused the original leading man to disappear, shoved the original assistant director off a platform, breaking his legs. In general, did everything he could to sabotage the picture. Then he pulled the strings to get himself named as assistant director so he could be near Cherry. Love and jealousy. Mallard, I'll get to that in time. Cherry had vaguely promised that she'd remarry Ames. But when he saw his own brother was going to blackmail him, he went crazy. That's when he strung him up with the dummies in the trees. From there, it was just a step to knock off Reginald Dix and have a clear track for himself. I'll go back to what I said to begin with. Why did these characters from Hollywood have to come up here to San Francisco and louse up our scenery, as well as our police department? Oh, to heck with your police department. That's the last time I'm going to climb around a ledge hundreds of feet in the air. Not so strange. Buff Arnold was out on that ledge, too, wasn't he? Oh, Mallard, sometimes you make me... 
That reminds me. I have a date tomorrow night. Sure. With Buff Arnold. No, no. That's tomorrow morning. I'm driving him down to the railroad station. Date for tomorrow night? With you, Mellor, dear. We're going to see a Roy Acuff movie. Oh, Candy. Roy Acuff. Monarch of all the cowboys. Yeah, monarch of all the cowboys. I'll see him with you. And if that isn't love, I don't know what is. Listen again next week at this same time. For excitement and adventure, just dial... Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. Heard tonight for Hal Burdick as Reginald Dix. John Grover as Ames, the assistant director. Mary Milford as Cherry Dana. Kurt Martell as Buff Arnold. And included in the cast was Ken Langley. Henry Left plays the part of Lieutenant Ray Mallard. The program stars Natalie Masters as Candy and is written and directed by Monty Masters. Sound effects are created by Bill Brownell and Eloise Rowan is heard at the organ. The characters in tonight's play were entirely fictitious. Any resemblance to actual people is purely coincidental. Tonight's engineer was Clarence Stevens. The program came to you from San Francisco. Dudley Manlove speaking. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. Standard of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. Death in Fancy Dress, another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice, danger's my stock and trade. If life's tossed you a wet blanket and you're trying to stagger out from under, call on me, George Valentine. Write full details. My dear Mr. Valentine, because of a hobby that's dear to my heart and certainly innocent enough, I've received several threats on my life of late. I'm aware that this can't be of world-shaking importance, but it is a confounded nuisance to me. If you decide to take pity on me and come to my rescue, please drop in at my apartment, the Hampshire House. Apartment at the Hampshire Towers, tomorrow at 2 o'clock. Would you verify this appointment by phone? Sign Lloyd Bascom. Oh, um, dear old Bascom, whoever he is. Several threats on his life and he loses composure completely. Well, at least he did admit it was a confounded nuisance. I suppose if some scoundrel sprayed him with a shotgun, our friend would say it was a blasted annoyance. Yeah, well, what intrigues me is this gentleman's hobby. What does he collect, atomic secret? (laughs) Hey, you know, Brooksy, I've always wanted to find an exciting pastime for my spare moments. Go on, Angel, verify the man's appointment. Well, here we are. My trophy room, uh, you might call it. Mr. Bascom, all I see is a lot of junk. (laughs) Yes. Now, take this particular piece of uh, junk. A broken wine glass. The one with which Lucy Graham plunged her coming out party into a fur. She practically gouged Tony Warren's eye out with it while she was deep in her cups. Uh I bought it from the caterers. As you see, I have it all neatly tagged. The occasion, the date, etc. And this uh, 1945 license plate, Mr. Baskin? Uh, Oh, yes. The very proper and respected Mrs. Arlington Mackenzie was dragged into court on a hit-and-run charge. That's the plate off her Duesenberg. I bribed her chauffeur to get it. Oh, it was a beautiful scandal. Ah. Well, I can see where this sort of thing wouldn't make you the most popular boy in your set, Bess. I could not help being born with a silver spoon. But there's nothing to prevent me from reminding my friends of their more scandalous escapades. Now, look here. This lovely lock of red hair. A very lurid story goes with this. If you like, you gentlemen can retire to the smoking car. (laughs) No, this little affair was quite well publicized. Celeste Dupre, the nightclub singer who was accused of the murder of Malcolm Gardner, the broker. 
She was acquitted. Dear me, I wonder whatever happened to the dear girl. Now, over here... Yeah, well, uh, we get the general idea, Bascom. This is your private wax museum of dead scandals you like to keep alive. Oh, well put, Valentine. I must remember that phrase when I show off my collection at my next party. You mean you deliberately keep bringing up all this? Oh, pardon me. I'll see who's at the door. Huh. Man after my own heart. Yeah. If you're not careful, Angel, he'll cut it out and put it in his collection. What surprises me is that Mr. Bascom's been allowed to go on breathing this long. What's the matter with you, Renu? I didn't come here at all. What is the matter? Have you lost your mind? Sure. Yes, maybe I have. Stop it, Reynolds, you fool! Many times I didn't kill you! Come on, boys, break it up. You heard me, Frank. Get off of him. Get out of my way. Now listen, Buster, don't make me hang you up to dry. I'm a peace-loving man. What else have you got here that belongs to my wife, Bascom? I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yes, you do. You see, I found those letters you left under the Christmas tree. Very well, you found them. I'm as good as my word. I promised Donna I'd let her have them back as a present. But too bad you had to find them. The package wasn't addressed to you, Reynolds. Never mind that. I burned them without telling her I saw them. That's too bad. Donna must be very distressed at my breach of faith. Now, Reynolds, if you don't mind, I do have company. Oh, don't mind us. I don't know how much Donna paid you for them. Lord knows she's the one with the money. I don't care. But if you have anything else of hers that you can hold over her, I swear I'll break your filthy neck. Just remember that. Oh, dear. See what I mean, Valentine? No. Suppose you draw me a diagram. You've already earned part of your fee when you haul Reynolds off me. That was on the house, Bascom. Uh, what do you mean? I think he means it's no go. If you want protection, you better call out the National Guard. To put it another way, I don't like your idea of fun. I don't like your museum, and I particularly don't like you. Now, wait a minute, Valentine. Let's get going, I... Brooksy. I don't want to be late for my paper route. Hey, hold it a minute, Angel. What is it, George? Anything wrong, Reynolds? What? Oh, I... I'm uh, just sitting here trying to calm down. I had a few drinks before and... Yeah. Yeah, you look in pretty bad shape. Hey, let me have the wheel. I'll take you home. Hop in the back, Brooksy. Really, Mr. Reynolds, you didn't have to bother inviting us in. Well, the least I can do is offer you and Mr. Valentine a drink. Say, look, Reynolds, uh... Don't worry about that little scene about Baskin's going any farther than us. Thank you. I, uh, I'm not in the habit of washing my dirty linen in public. Uh, just make yourself comf comfortable there in the drawing room. I, I, I'll call Donna. Yeah, thanks. George, I don't know about I you, know, but... I know, I know. I'm not too comfortable either. We'll just waltz through the formalities and blow. Darling. Over there. Huh? Look. Oh. Yeah. Come to think of it, Valentine. Donna said she Hey, wait a minute, on. Reynolds. Uh, could we go across to that room for a minute? Huh? Why? What's the matter with you two, anyway? Why are you standing there like I that? I just think it's better that you don't come in here right now. What are you talking about? What happened? Please, Mr. Reynolds. Get out of my way. Let me in here. Donna. Donna. Take it easy, Reynolds. Don't. But she... She's dead. dead. Here, you better sit down. No. Oh. No. Oh. Ask him drove her to this. Might just as well have pulled the trigger himself. I felt like killing you before, now I will. You can't do that. Let go of me, you... How can you look at her lying there and say that? Let go of me! Somehow Bascom will get what's coming to him. Not Bascom. He never does anything he has to pay for. The law can't punish him, that's why I've got to do this myself. Sorry, Reynolds, i got to hold you right here till you pull yourself together. Brooksy, call Lieutenant Riley. All right, Valentine, here it is. Yeah, Lieutenant. Between the medical examiner's report and my amateur sleuthing, it's just what you thought it was when you walked into that room across the hall. Suicide, pure and simple. Well, I wasn't questioning that. What? Then what were you questioning? Why did you drag me into the case? Just for old Lang Syne? Oh, well, it just seemed a good idea at the time. It isn't easy, Lieutenant, to know that a man has driven a woman to suicide and not try to do something about him. Okay, Valentine... I know your heart's in the right place, but... But look, chum boy, why don't you grow up? There's a lot of slimy characters in this world. But, Lieutenant Riley, we know Bascom was blackmailing Mrs. Reynolds. Oh, do we? 
All I know is she wrote him some silly letters and he was gallant enough to return them to her as a Christmas present. If anything, that makes him out just uh, ginger peach. You know, I'd give a lot to get something on that guy. Go to it, young boy. Go to it. But remember, keep it legal. Now I gotta mosey along. Oh, Reynolds. Uh, leaving, Lieutenant. Uh, yes, yes, there's nothing more for me to do. I'm sorry about everything. Well, so long, Valentine, and good luck. So long. I suppose I should thank you for holding that before, Valentine. I, I don't know what I would have done. Skip it. But there's something else, Reynolds. Yes. Nobody can go racketeering with other people's lives without making at least one bad slip somewhere along the line. It seems there are others who feel like you do and would like to see Bascom dead. I want to find out why. What's that? I want you to hire me to look into our friends, past and present. See if I can find that one little slip. Is it a deal? I, I suppose so, sure. Okay, you got yourself a dollar a year, man. <laughs> it may take you years. That's okay, Reynolds. This is going to be a labor of love. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word from a wise motorist. Can you imagine driving around the world not once, but four times without an engine repair? Well, in actual mileage, one man has driven even farther than that on compounded RPM motor oil and without an engine repair. His name is George M. Hollingsworth, an insurance agent in Bakersfield, California. Here's what Mr. Hollingsworth said. Quote, one of my cars has gone 123,000 miles on RPM without engine repairs, unquote. And lots of Western motorists have told us they've driven seven and eight years on RPM without engine repairs. Thousands of others have learned that RPM pays its own way many times over. For RPM is compounded to stop carbon trouble, to guard engine hot spots left bare and exposed to wear by ordinary motor oils, and to keep the whole engine system cleaner. Try RPM motor oil tomorrow. Get it at any standard station or any independent Chevron gas station where they say and mean, we'll take better care of your car. And now back to tonight's adventure, George Valentine. Your would-be client turns out to be, among other things, a blackmailer responsible for the suicide of one Donna Reynolds. So in a complete reversal, you find yourself pitted against the gentleman determined to find just one slip-up somewhere in his checkered career. If you're like George Valentine, you're as patient as a terrier watching a gopher hole. But you get nowhere, except to Lieutenant Riley's office down at headquarters, where you've been rudely summoned. I think you know this gentleman, Valentine. I wouldn't admit it to anybody but you, Lieutenant. Hiya, Baskin. How are you enjoying your incursion into my life? I've had pleasanter assignments. What do you want with me, Riley? Well, <clears throat> as you know, uh, we're a close little family down here at headquarters. Uh, you better give me the next line. I forgot my cue. Sergeant Olson downstairs told me that this gentleman would like to swear out a warrant against you. Oh. Uh-huh. So I thought we'd better talk it over first. Now, uh, Mr. Bassett... You're doing very well, Lieutenant. Go ahead. Uh, yes. <clears throat> Complaint number one. Illegal entry. Valentine, have you been prowling around in Mr. Bascom's apartment? Well, I never. Yeah, An yeah. apartment? Why, I thought it was a museum. Such fascinating exhibits, broken wine glasses, old license plates. I thought it was open to the public. So, as I remember, I did drop in. Uh, yes. <clears throat> Complaint number two. Questioning Mr. Bascom's friends and causing him unwarranted embarrassment. Oh, no, that's, that's not fair, Lieutenant. Sure, I talked to a lot of people who knew this, uh, gentleman. But not one of them would admit to being his friend. Come now, Valentine. Let's not have a battle of wits. You're so unequipped. <laughs> Touché, Mr. Baskin, touche. Cliché, Mr. Valentine, cliché. What the devil's going on here? In two words of two syllables, Lieutenant. If he doesn't stop bothering me, I shall expect that warrant to be served. I think that will be all. Yeah. Lieutenant. Did you get that? Can you tie that monkey? Uh... Now, look here, Valentine. We've, we've broken bread together. Mrs. Riley likes you 
Well, like a son. Yeah, and I think of her every time I hear an Irish tenor. I told you to keep it legal when it comes to Bascom. He and the commissioner have mutual friends. I gotta find a lead. There's gotta be one. Well, why do you keep saying that? Just because of some letters between him and the late Mrs. Reynolds, this, this drawing room character suddenly becomes Jack the Ripper. What have you found, anyway? Oh, nothing much, Lieutenant, nothing much. We checked most of the people on those tags in his collection. They all hate his guts, but won't say anything. <sighs> okay. Okay, but remember, pal, I warned you. Hello, Lieutenant. May I come in? Oh, Brooks. Sure. You told me to meet you downstairs. Yeah, yeah, I know. Sometimes I'm just an old chatterbox. What'd you find out, Angel? Well, the last anybody heard of Celeste Dupre was okay. two years ago. She was working in Jake Swansea's cocktail bar out on Fulton Boulevard. Celeste Dupre, how's she mixed up in this? One of her beautiful Titian locks is in Bascom's collection of mementos. Remember, she was accused of murder once? I was going to stop by at Swansea's new club. I thought I'd better talk to you first, Don. Good girl, Brooksy, good girl. We'll go over and have a talk with Jake right now. Swansea says for you to wait in the bar. He'll be right down. Okay, thanks. Come on, Brooksy, let's go. Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter, George? Wouldn't that be Reynolds talking to himself at that corner table? Oh, yeah. Looks like he's drowning his sorrows. Coming up for the last time. Yeah, better see if I can get him out of here. Hello, Reynolds. Huh? Don't you think you ought to go home? Oh. Valentine. Would you like us to call your cab, Mr. Reynolds? What I'm doing, I can do better right here. Thank you, Miss Brooks. Now, you know, getting crocked isn't going to help anything, Reynolds. Tell me something, Valentine. Did you get anything on Bascom? Skeleton up in the attic? Trunk full of counterfeit thousand dollar bills? When do I come to his trial? Okay, Reynolds, you win. But take it easy, will you? Hey, is Swansea waving over here at me or you? Oh, I think that's our cue, Mr. Reynolds. Look, Valentine, if Reynolds is a friend of yours, maybe you can get him home. He's been here like that every day. Oh, he'll snap out of it. Look, Swansea, maybe you can help me. Sure, sit down. Can I get you anything, Miss Brooks? No, thanks. What can you tell me about Celeste Dupre? Well, Swansea. Cigarette? Uh, you didn't answer my question. Why don't you leave that kid alone? Didn't she have enough trouble back there being accused of murder and everything? Didn't she work for you once? Yeah. After it happened, I was the only one to give her a job. What if you want anything? It's on the house. Sit down, Swansea. Now, I asked you, what happened to Celeste Dupre? Where do I find her? Can't you see? I don't feel like talking. You know I'm going to find her sooner or later anyway. And when I do, I may come back. I want to know why you didn't tell me. Okay. But don't build any fires under. Make that a personal favor to me. I don't like to see anybody hurt, Swansea. Red lives at the Shelby Arms. Only now her name is... Sealed Dawson. Police? Not exactly, Celeste, or do you prefer Seal? Does it matter? Now, my name's Valentine. I'd like you to answer a few questions. Just whom do you represent? In this case, Valentine, as much as anybody else. I can't keep you from asking questions. Why did you give Lloyd Bascom a lock of your hair? What did you... And when did he give you for it? He usually pays for mementos like that. I... Why don't you leave me alone? I hate to come at you from left field like that, but sometimes it gets results. Oh, during my trial, Bascom asked me for a lock of my hair. I, I didn't see any harm in giving it to him. Uh-uh. The one I saw looked like a recent acquisition. But we'll let that rest. No, it's not too bad. What do you mean? Well, you've done pretty well for yourself, Celeste. This teepee you live in must run you quite a nut. What do you do for a living? I model clothes. <laughs> the wampum a model gets wouldn't rent a doghouse in this neighborhood. Now, suppose we get out of... Excuse me. Hello? Yes. Yes, that's right. I didn't expect you to call. Oh, you should. Take your hand off the phone. Say what I tell you, Celeste, and I'm not fooling you. Valentine just left. Go on. Uh, Valentine just left. What's that? Now tell him you want to see him. Get right over here because it's important. No, nothing's wrong. But I wish you'd come over. Yes, very important. Goodbye. 
I believe you would have hit me if I didn't play parrot for you. Could be, Red, could be. I'm not on my best behavior these days. You don't know who that was. Could have been my cousin from 29 Palms. However it was, Celeste, I'll be waiting downstairs in front of the house to greet him. You didn't waste a minute getting here, did you, Baskin? Valentine, I... You look so grief-stricken. Celeste didn't cross you. She had to say what I told her. Oh, dear, you're turning into quite a problem. Yeah, well, let's go up and join Celeste. We have a lot to talk about, you and I. Including why you called her to see if I was here. Uh, you first, Baskin. Yes, I could stand a drink of that. As I recall, when we first met, you were wondering what became of Celeste to pray. Oh, that... Well, there you are, Baskin. Hey, Reynolds. I was waiting for you. I'm going to kill you. Don't hey. Don't drop it, Reynolds. Stop that. Let go of me. He's getting away. I got out of him here. You let go. One of those bullets nearly had my name on it. You hurt. I didn't expect you. Come on, it's just a scratch. Now let's get out of here. Cops will be flocking around here any minute. Yeah. I'll talk to you later. Take it easy, Brooksy. All the pieces of the puzzle are there, but it's still a puzzle. All right, but hold your arms still. Bascom is in the middle of something big. It may be genteel, but it's against the law. Now, what could it be? Do you think that... Ouch! Hey, look, Angel, stop fussing, will you? It's only a scratch. Well, it could have been more than that. Darling, why don't you let this thing ride? Somebody's going to make a little hole in you yet. Uh -uh. Anyway, Reynolds isn't going to rest till he gets Bascom, and there's nothing you can do about it. Think of him, hiding there in the lobby, waiting. If only... Sure. Sure, that's it. Just like that. Wham, sorry. Are you off on another tizzy? What is it now? Go on, Brooksy Beater. Take a walk for yourself. Buy yourself some saltwater taffy. Will you get off the banter wagon and tell me what this is all about? If you want to find out, meet me at Lieutenant Riley's in about an hour. Now go on. All right. I don't like taffy. Do you mind if I make it cough drops for this cold? <laughs> Oh, Brooksy, baby, you put your finger right on it. Ooh, you doll. Hey, operator, let me have the phone number of Jake Swansea's Club 18. Look, Valentine, you could have come over to the club if you wanted to see me. Oh, no, Swansea, you wouldn't want anything like this to happen in your club. I... Hey, what? What is that for? What's the play? I gotta get you in the mood to talk about the tie-up between you and Celeste and Bascom. You say around town you're a little buzz-headed. And I never believed it before. Come on, out of your talk, or do we have ourselves a game of ping-pong first? I don't mind. Oh, no, no, you no. want a blood man, Jake? You keep him up there. I know, what about it, Swansea? What about it? Uh, smart guy, huh? I'll put my knee right through you if you don't open up. All right, all right. Okay. Just lay there. Catch your breath. Hey, what do you want to ask me? First, I'm going to tell you. Yeah? What? You're not just mixed up in blackmail, Muster. There's murder involved. Go on. You know about it. You profit by it. That's being an accessory after the fact. They lock you away for that. Yeah. I see what you mean, Valentine. Okay, now you're being bright. If you play it smart, maybe they'll go easy on you. You win. I guess this calls for a drink. Yeah, Swansea. And a little trip down to headquarters. Okay, Swansea, okay. You've been very eloquent. Just wanted to be helpful, Lieutenant. Oh, yes, yes, I know. Well, now you can join Mr. Dupre uh, in the other office. Oh, Sergeant... Send Bascom in here. I'm right here, Lieutenant. Well, well, sit down. Thank you. Oh, very time. You look a mess. Fighting again? <laughs> yeah. But it was worth it just for this one little occasion. Bascom, you met Celeste during a trial. What of you? You were looking for mementos for your collection. You didn't get one until some time after. 
Well, you and she got to know each other uh, rather well. But don't expect any comments from me. You're spinning this fairy tale. All right, then, Bascom, shut up. So sorry. In fact, you and Celeste became so chummy that somehow she found herself in a perfect spot. You had arranged all the unpleasant details, Bascom, and she could sit back and blackmail you groggy. And Swansea was just the boy to see that you paid off. Come on, son, come on. Get to the point for the man. The murder. The murder? Oh, you know all about that, Bascom, don't you? After all, you worked it out. Deliberately fancy, but very neat. Classic picture of suicide, motive and all. Yet it was murder. Lieutenant, I'm beginning to resent the unrestrained use of that word in connection with me. Yeah? Well, I'll just take my chances on your being angry with me, too, Mr. Bascom. I'm holding you on suspicion of murder. On what evidence? With what Miss Dupre and Swansea will have to say, I'll risk being wrong. Mr. Reynolds just arrived, Lieutenant. Oh, yeah? Well, I suppose he ought to know what's been going on, so we uh, haven't come in. I should like to call my attorney, Lieutenant. Uh, there'll be plenty of time for that. Come on in, Reynolds. You missed the fireworks. Why? What's happened? Well, this should give you some satisfaction. We're holding Bascom for the murder of your wife. What's that? Did you say murder? Yes. Oh, Sergeant, take this guy away now. Huh? All right, come on now, this way. Oh, wait a minute, hold it, Sergeant. I don't want you to make two trips. Uh, what's this, Valentine? Don't rush me, Lieutenant. Tonight, when you were pouring shots at Bascom, you were really trying to kill me, Reynolds. What are you saying? Why would I do that? You didn't follow him to Celeste Place, as you said. You couldn't have. You were already inside the lobby. Miss Brooks reminded me of that. Then everything fell into place. I still want to know what reason I'd have for doing anything like that. What about it, Valentine? A man will do anything to get away with murder, Lieutenant. It was Reynolds who killed his wife. Oh, oh! will you stop it, Brooks? Oh, be still. You're just a big baby. This is nothing but a little iodine. Oh, a little iodine, a little iodine. <laughs> Lieutenant, do something. She's torturing. <laughs> oh, you live, chum boy. Fine thing. I fix your arm and you have to go and get into a fight. Yeah. Uh, I guess people never will learn. I mean about murder. If they want to kill, why don't they just bash somebody over the head without being fancy? Why, what a fine way for a lieutenant to talk. Oh, they'll get caught, sure, sure. But think of all the trouble they'd save. Oh, but don't forget the creative touch, lieutenant. Means a lot to a man like Bascom. Think of the setup. Months back, he introduces his charming pal Reynolds to the wealthy Donna. She marries Reynolds all according to the plan. Ouch! Oh, quiet, Junior. Then it's all a build-up to our entrance, ain't you? We were there to witness the clash between the aggrieved husband and the supposed blackmailer. And all the time, the poor woman was lying home dead. No threats on Bascom's life. No letters for Reynolds to burn. No blackmail, no nothing. Just a plain, unsimple murder. Reynolds gets the money from the estate. Divides it with Bascom. Then Swansea and the girl get their cut from him. That's it, Lieutenant. Mm. Don't tell me you're through, Brooksy. Yes, sissy. I can see that when little George falls off his scooter, I'll have to render first aid. Uh, what's that, little George? And hmm? when his baby sister tumbles out of her high chair, I'll have to... Oh, George Valentine, sometimes you get me so mad I could... Oh, I oh, could... oh, 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 Brooksy. Oh, what? That's no way to talk to the father of two children. With 1949 just four days away, probably you've got your list of New Year's resolutions well started. But how about putting this resolution near the top of your list? Why not promise yourself to get the most out of your car? To do this, make sure you ask for Chevron Supreme gasoline, the premium quality gasoline that you can get at all standard stations and independent Chevron gas stations. The reason Chevron Supreme allows your car to do its very best is that it's fortified with high-octane blending agents. These blending agents give your car smoother acceleration on the straightaway, smoother power and extra power on the steepest hills. Also, Chevron Supreme's climate tailored to each different altitude and temperature zone in the West. Tailored to give you fast starts and speedy pickup in stop-and-go traffic. So for best motoring in 1949, why not make a resolution right now to give your car peak performance 
by getting Chevron Supreme gasoline at independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. Next Monday night, a new case for George, murder and one to go. Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Jay Novello as Lloyd Bascom, Louis Van Ruten as Reynolds, Gloria Blondell as Celeste, and Ken Christie as Swansea. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter, your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week for Murder and One to Go on Let George Do It. Remember, next week, those listeners who are now in standard time states will hear this broadcast one hour later. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. My name's Jeff Regan. I get ten a day in expenses from a detective bureau run by a guy named Anthony J. Lyon. They call me the Lion's Eye. Jack Webb is Jeff Regan. Investigators, stand by for hard-boiled action and mystery and thrilling adventure in tonight's story of The Lady with No Name. The next time you're out for a drive, pick up Olive Street along about the 700 block. You can't miss it. It's a big building, made out of white granite. The Cosmopolitan Building. The man who built it is doing a long run up at San Quentin for graft. Anthony J. Lyon, the guy I work for, rents an office in that building. International Detective Bureau, Suite 308. A couple of rooms with a connecting wastebasket. The Lyon has the only desk in the office and a typewriter that Remington dropped from their catalog back in 1915. Well, I walked in last Tuesday at 10 a.m. The office was full of taboo. She was a tall girl, very pretty, wearing slacks and a coat that must have set the mink population back 20 years. But she still looked cold, like she'd never get warm again. The lion had one arm around her shoulders. He knew by this time that coat was the real article. There wasn't any music, but he didn't seem to mind. Come in. Not much room to dance. We got trouble. She's your date. This is one of my operators, Mr. Regan. How do you do, Mr. Regan? Now, tell him exactly what you just told me. Yes. It's all right. May I sit down? I feel strange. Of course. Come here. Thank you. Get this, Regan. I don't know where I live. I don't know my name. Yeah? I want you to find out who I am. You heard that, Regan? Heard what? It's a verbal contract. She just hired us. Oh, you're out of your mind. And you're a witness in case anything comes up. Please. Please, I, I don't feel well. I, I'm perfectly willing to pay you. You'll just find out who I am. Well, look, lady, there's a cop on every corner. I couldn't go to the police. You got here. Quit pushing her. This is our case. I was afraid. I found this in my purse. Mm-hmm. 32 caliber, Smith & Wesson. Been fired. There's three gone. What are you doing with that, miss? I don't know. It's just been used by you. I don't know. Well, where'd you get it? I just found it in my purse. Remind you of anything? Uh, no. You take it. Now, look, miss, I know you don't feel well, but there are certain questions you'll have to answer. I just want you to find out who I am. It's terrible this way. It's... Uh... Fainted. Yeah, 
You always had a way with women. Help me bring her around so she can sign that contract. She hasn't got a name, remember? We'll give her a name. Jane Doe's good enough. I guess so. What do you mean? She's dead. The lion just stood there. He looked sad, like a water buffalo caught in a drought. Well, when she rolled onto the floor, her purse went with her. It cracked open, and the stuff inside spilled out on the rug. There wasn't anything to tell us who she was. No comb, no makeup. Nothing but a house key and a receipt for a cab ride dated that day. There wasn't even a label in that mink coat. Nothing to go on. I might as well have tried to walk to Catalina. I told the lion to phone the coroner's office, and I hopped over to the cab company. They told me that the receipt came from meter 212, driven by a man named Servey. He worked the call box at Hollywood and Western. He was a little guy. I figured he got the job because they ran out of big uniforms. They double-crossed him on that cap. If it wasn't for his ears, he'd have been wearing a snood. Uh, uh, sorry, bud. I got a fare. Where is he? Under the floorboards? I got a fare. Yeah, you said that. Where? Uh, in there, eating. Your flag's up. I'll pull it down. Happy? You Johnny Serby? Whose nose are you? They told me I'd find Serby in this hack. Who told you that? Cab company. They don't know any more than you do. Now look, if I... never mind the Nick, jokes. Just give me the straight out. lines. Nix, will you? Cut out this company uniform. Well, they're going to get it back if you don't open up. Get it out. All right. Louise pulled out three weeks ago. She took all the furniture with her. You can collect from her. I'm not the finance company. No? Here. Oh, private people, huh? Well, who's getting caught? Did you carry a brunette in a mink coat sometime this morning? Maybe. Where'd you drop her? Downtown, six and grand. Where'd she live? Ask her. I'm cruising in from the fair. Where'd you pick her up? In Burbank, Hollywood Way, and Kensington. The fair's in Pomona. You took the long way. I like to drive. It's company gas. Yeah. She was nice, real nice. You know what I mean? Real class. Okay. Ah, oh, wait a minute, will you? Yeah. We didn't go anywhere, but time's up. That's five even. Fast meter. Hey, you want me to tell you about the guy? What guy? Tall, dark head, uh, brown sport coat, movie type. Go on. He was chasing her when she caught my cab. He looked like a match. Was it? Ask him. Is that all? She got in, we drove away. Right here. Thanks. No tip? Like you said, we didn't go anywhere. <laughs> Ever have somebody drop a key in your lap and say, go find a door? Well, I drove out to Burbank and I began looking around for a good lock near Hollywood Way in Kensington. I figured that key I'd found in Jane Doe's purse would have to fix something. I made my letter on the 10th house. There was a for sale sign on it. I didn't see anybody around, so I unlocked the door and it went in. Outside of something that smelled like tar and kerosene, the place was empty. I was just about to turn around and leave when a brown sport coat slid into the room. Movie type. When he walked over to me, I knew he drank the right kind of scotch. Gonna use your GI loan? Just looking. Gotta buy it to steal. No, the lady won't like it. Your wife? Girl in a mink coat. You make that kind of dough? She got it from somebody else. Uh, you Hollywood guys. Where'd you get the key? I borrowed it. She won't need it. What's your name? I didn't have a chance to ask her. Oh, you're kind of slow, aren't you? Sometimes. We'll see how fast you can hit the door. No, I just got here. Yeah, now you're leaving. Cab driver says he knows you. I'm friendly. I talk to everybody. Said you were doing a chase scene. Could be. He was pretty. They all look good in mink. It's not the house. What do you want? Well, we could start with a name. It's Dameron. Not enough. That's all you get, wise punk. Now beat it. You'll give more at homicide. I don't see any bad. Now, look, we can play games some other time. A cab driver put the finger on you as the last man to see that girl in mink. You talk like she's dead. You call it. Too bad. There's a lot of fur coats in L.A. and a lot of guys chasing them. You got nothing. That's what they always say downtown, but you'll talk. I don't figure on leaving, but you're going on your way right now. Better open a window, Dameron. You're sweating. Keep talking, sunshine, or we'll make one in that far wall. You got help in the back room? Quit scratching around. It doesn't mean anything to you. It didn't before she pulled a fade in my office, but it does now. Out by a new carpet. 
I don't know who let you out, but it's bedtime. You've been talking about a dead girl who doesn't even know her name. Now go back and finish your dream. You got all the questions. Now let's fill in the answers. I'm fresh out of box taps. There's a door you. No, not yet. I'm going to get what I came for. Little man, that's a promise. <laughs> You're out of condition, Dameron. You're in a great position to throw that line. Oh, you got talent, mister, but it's still raw. Come here. <laughs> <laughs> Now, come on, get up. I'm not through. That's where you're wrong. It's a big luger. Makes the same size hole. All right, punk, you got a name? A lot of them for you. Oh! School isn't out yet. Just answer. It's Regan. Okay, Regan, let this sink in. Forget you ever saw any dame in a mink coat. Forget you ever saw me. That won't be hard. Look, Junior, you just lost the round. Now, remember what I told you. Have a memory lapse. Is that clear? You made your point. Now, blow. You always use a luger? Close work. Well, and that 32 doesn't fit. What 32? The one that the girl was carrying. You got it? No, I gave it a homicide. Good, good. It saves me a trip downtown. You're not worried? No, I'm very happy. Huh? Today's my birthday. That's the reason you're walking out of here. <laughs> thing looked as phony as an undertaker in a white derby. Well, I went back to the office and the lion was sitting there with a bottle of beer and a sandwich that looked like a couple of end tables. He stopped chewing when I came in. What's her name? It's still Jane Doe. You've been gone four hours. Movie? They don't open till noon. All right, where you been? A vacant house in Burbank. I trailed it up from that cab receipt. What'd you find? A guy named Dameron. What'd he say? Nothing. Shy? Tough. That way you got the egg on your chin? I was nervous. When you gonna learn to be nice to people? He had a gun, too. Tell me more. That's all. Yeah. I like this. It's got possibility. All right, take off your saddle. The race is over. When the coroner's boy showed up, they told me why she dropped. That's easy. She died. It's poison. Without an autopsy? Something about her color. It isn't official, but we can work on it. Suicide? Murder. Why murder? They feed themselves iodine and sleeping pills, but they don't take allicine. What's that? A hot drug with a petrol base. It burns. Homicidal handler. Sure, homicidal handler. Only we got things to do. We got a stake in this. You made her the client. We're going to give her service, dead or alive. What does Wendetti say? I don't pay Wendetti. We find out who she is. All right, you try. Her picture shows up in the paper. She drops dead in our office. How's it make us look? They sent in the first string when she died. You'll clear this up before homicide does. They'll lift your license. We won't need it. What do you mean? I still got exhibit A. What? Smith and Wesson, 32 caliber. You're withholding evidence. I forgot. Give it to him. All right, now give him a call and tell him. That was five hours ago. You'll make the call. All right, I'll tell Homicide. They'll give me a break. That's what Dillinger thought. Give me the gun. They've got Jane Doe's prints on the wire. They'll have the answer in ten hours. Cut that in half, Regan, and we've won the championship. You'll have to give the cup back. You cheated. When I left the lion, he looked happy, like a guy who just figured the mystery melody. I had the gun with three bullets gone that Jane Doe had been carrying in her purse, the lion in back of me, the police department in front. That left me about as much chance as a blue peanut on a wedding cake. I knew that if I walked into homicide with that thirty-two, they'd hold on to me like a season pass. I had to find out who it was registered to, so I gambled and I went down to the city hall. I went in the Temple Street entrance, room 11, personnel division. If I pegged it right, I could get the dope on that gun without getting involved. I figured wrong. Can I help you? You in charge here? Lunchtime, yeah. All right, whose name matches these numbers? Small arms? Yeah. What authority? I just bought it. Want to know if it's clean? Yeah. Caliber and make? It's a 32, Smith and Wesson. Okay. Smith and Wesson, huh? 32, 32, 32. Yeah, right here. Got the weapon with you? No, why? No rule. No gun, no vitals. I got it. Here. Okay. Purchased August 1929, factory reblue job 1931, owned by American Trust and Loan, permitted to Dale W. Curtis. Thanks. I'll have to ask you to wait. Why? No rule. Got to run them all through ballistics. Anything special? Maybe. Found a guy floating around Silver Lake this morning, full of 32s. Who? Working on it. Have to ask you to wait. No, I can't. I haven't had lunch yet. Stick around. We may invite you. I don't like your food. Oh, don't worry. You can have anything you want the last day.
You are listening to the story of the lady with no name. Tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, investigator. If you are a graduate registered nurse, please listen carefully to this important message. 29,000 nurses are needed to join the new Army Nurse Corps Officers Reserve. If you're a registered graduate nurse between the ages of 21 and 45, drop a card for complete information to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. And now, back to the story of the lady with no name and Jeff Regan, investigator. There it was. The clerk took Jane Doe's gun and closed the door marked ballistic. I figured he couldn't be too sure about whether that thirty-two would match up, but I didn't want to wait around to find out. He left the vitals card on the counter. I spun it around and I got the address of Dale W. Curtis. It turned out to be a one-story frame that stood in the way of the new freeway they're building. The movers were just jacking it up and I caught the last carload of people leaving. They told me that Curtis hadn't lived there for seven years. They did give a number over on Manzanita off Fountain, where I might be able to find him. It was an apartment on the second floor. From the looks of the place, it figured that the OPA had a fight on their hands. I rang the bell and waited. I don't know whether it was a lighting effect in that dim hallway, but when she opened that door, I expected to see those thousand ships slide down the ways again. She was a... Wearing some kind of a filmy thing that made a spider's web look like burlap. She had a voice that stole over you like a pint of Irish ale. I didn't expect you until tonight. I broke my watch. Come on in. I'll see if I can fix it. I'm great for the Swiss movement. Yeah, it shows. My name's Marlowe Curtis. I want to see your husband. He's not here. Do you expect him? No. Where is he? Up north. Business trip? Yeah. He sold out. Oh, what kind of business? Ask the warden. Huh? The old Curtis is in the prison cemetery. Been there five years. Sorry. Don't say. He deserved it. You're going to drown in those tears. I'm still burning back. The right color, wrong occasion. Soda? What? Your drink. How do you want? Well, you're mixing. There. Now, isn't that better? I don't know. It's my first drink. You'll get another. The weather's changed. There's nothing here. You're quick. Must have a good straight man. Yeah, you. You get top billing. What's your name? Regan. You test it? Maybe. The rest of me. Sergeant. I'm due for a promotion. You'd make a better lieutenant. Come here. If I had anything to do with you, the captain. Yeah, sure, until you snag your colonel. You're nasty, too. Did I pay for my drink? Get out. Tell me about this nail file. You got that out of my purse. I had one hand free. You two-bit shadow artist. Ooh. Now get out. Hello? Yes, he's here. Yeah? Uh, this you, Regan? Uh, you don't know me. I've been lucky so far. They should never have taken that gun down to the city hall. You get around. You shouldn't be up there in Marlowe's apartment. You gonna run my life? Now, I told you what you shouldn't do. Here's what you're gonna do. Look, Buster, don't crowd me. You're gonna forget all about today. A girl forgot a lot of things today and she dropped dead. Got the idea? Suppose I don't buy it. They want a partner for that gun. Dameron give you the nickel? He gave me a dime. I got one more call to make to the city hall. All right. Suppose I lay off. I got something for my piggy bank. You're no petty girl. Hang it up and get out. You know, Regan, I could have really liked you. Yeah, Marlo, that's why I'm scared. Well, you can see how things were. I felt like a short girl with a new look. No matter how I tried to break it down, I figured to cop the leading role. A Jane Doe walks in her office and drops dead. She has a gun that probably talked to a couple of people. A cab ride receipt takes me to Bill Dameron, a guy with a talkative gun. I end up in Marlowe Curtis' apartment for a lot of punctuation marks. Everybody talks but the people. Well, I knew I'd have to begin to move before homicide tagged me, so I 
Hopped down to the Times and I checked the morgue file. I pulled the clips on Dale W. Curtis. Marlowe didn't lie. He was dead. The old papers didn't mean anything, but the banner headline on the night final put one piece of the jigsaw in position. It told about a treasury department agent named Shields. I found him in Silver Lake. He'd been shot three times with a thirty-two. Now I knew where Marlowe's nail file fit. I started to leave when I caught the last paragraph. It said, Unidentified man turns in the murder weapon. Police are seeking his whereabouts. Yeah. This is Lyon. I've been calling your place for two hours. I just got home. Gonna give yourself up? It was your idea. Who's Jane Doe? I don't know. Why? You got a badge, you try. Look, Regan. You're hot. Every prowl car in town's looking for you. Yeah. You better start filling this in or they're gonna get you. Now listen, big shot, you're in this too. <laughs> Not from where I sit. I gave you the gun. Now send me some dough over here. I don't have enough for your pay. I need some money for cab fare. No petty cash in the office. Don't lie to me. What about that money you got out of Jane Doe's purse? What do you mean? She could have never got up there without cab money. Well, she must have lost it in the elevator. Look, I haven't got time to play games. Now send it over. How much do you need? Ten bucks won't break you. Where are you going to, Yuma? I'll expect it in an hour. Goodbye. Hello. Hello, Dameron. Always like your door. I wouldn't stop you. You'd crawl under. Come on in, fellas. It's drafty out there in the hall. You got a parade permit? Rodney, say hello to Regan. I already did on the phone. What about Slim? Hi, you Grogan. His name's Regan, isn't it, Big Mouth? Oh! Sitting right next to Rodney when he made that call to you, it was perfectly clear to me. Wasn't it clear to you, Big Mouth? Oh. Rodney told you to lay out, but you just had to get out of that newspaper, didn't you, Big Mouth? Yeah. Rodney, Slim. Slim on the bed. All right, my go. Now, Regan, once more, they got a gun downtown. They got a dame and her prints are going to fit it. They got a stiff and that gun's going to fit him, okay? I'll lay you off. Uh, you said that before. Rodney Slim, hold his hands. <laughs> now, Regan, I know you understand me. I said all the right words. Maybe my punctuation's bad. Lay off. <coughs> Period. Lay off. <coughs> Period. All right, leave him in the bed. on the floor. That's fine. Now he won't have to change his bedding. Dameron was good. When I got up, my face looked like a relief map of Death Valley. He was wearing a signet ring. He left out all the water holes, but the mountain ranges were rising fast. I figured I was safe now. That guy in the personnel office had never recognized me. Well, I was standing in the kitchen giving myself the cold water treatment when somebody knocked. I figured that was a switch, so I opened the door. It was that hacky, Johnny Servey. He had an envelope in his hand. Yeah? Hi. Remember me? You give up cab work? Oh, I found this under your door. Here. Thanks. Football? What do you want? Well, you asked me about a dame in a mink coat today. Now, I'm asking you. I don't run a meter. Well, I figure all this might help. All of what? Well, I get to thinking about it, see? And then I think some more. Right, come on, get to the point, will you? Uh, you played a hand, now I'm playing a hand. Go on. Well, dames mean trouble, and mink coats, they mean double trouble. Yeah. Is it worth five if I remember another guy? Maybe. Well, he's all over the papers now. I've seen him. Who? Shields, the guy they fished out of Silver Lake. Where? He was out in Burbank this morning, early. Thought you were at Pomona. I was, I was, but... Well, I guess I wasn't exactly cruising, I... I got a friend who's out that way. You know what I mean? When was this? An hour before I pick her up. This guy they find in Silver Lake is walking around that house. I'm looking for a store for oh, breakfast. All right, you eat. Well, that's it. After breakfast, I hop in my cab, and that's when I pick up the dame and mink. Why'd you bring me all this? Well, I figure we got somewhere this time. How do I get my tip? I gave him his five bucks, and he left. Then I opened the envelope he'd handed me. It was the money that I'd asked the lion to send over. Two five-dollar bills. Well, I looked at it, put it back in the envelope, stuck it in my pocket. So far, all I could see that I got out of this thing was a good beating from Dameron. The question still stood, who was Jane Doe? Well, I knew my next move. I wanted to hop over to the Treasury Department and see if my two matched their two, and maybe between us we could come up with four. I didn't have much to go on. It was just a hunch. I took Marlowe's nail file with me, and... I walked in the front door of the federal building. I showed my license to the chief agent. That's right, one of our agents, Shields. They have the murder weapon down at Homicide. I know. 
All we want is the man that pulled the trigger. Well, I got an idea. I'll listen. What's wrong with these $5 bills? You can't spend them. I figured that. Where'd you get them? How bad are they? Lousy paper, rotten ink, terrible engraving job. You could do better with a rubber stamp outfit. Where'd you get them? Any of these been floated? We picked up a few. Were shields working on it? That's as much as I can give you. Well, where'd you get them? Well, the girl faded out in our office this morning. She was carrying them? Yeah. What's her name? That's what I gotta find out. Uh, Jane Doe, huh? Well, that's what we called her. So does the paper. Hmm? Same girl? Yeah, that's her. Any identification? Not yet. They've been running a picture for hours. Well, I'm short on time. You're the guy. Wait a minute before you hit that button. Yeah? Your addition's good, but you haven't got all the figures. Don't make book on that. You're the number one boy with me. You think I'd solo in here? You might. No, no. I got an ace. All right, so you keep your nails clean. Now, look at it. It's a nail file. They cut dum-dums out of shields. Who told you? A second-story apartment with a deep voice. How did you know? You're holding the file that cut the grooves. You use it? I can give you the guy who did. Dum-dum makes a big hole. Ask Shields. Move the tip of a 32 slug. It'll spread from here to Kansas when it hits. You can do it with a nail file. Maybe. Where's that apartment? No, I'm too close to quit now. I can't let you go alone. I got a big car. Well, before we go, mister, if no one belongs to that file, you belong to the gun. In that case, I'll have a lot of time to do my nails. Well, it was a long shot, but that's all I had. The agent just sat there on the way over. He didn't say a word. Well, I figured he didn't believe me, but it was a short drive to find out. We hit Manzanita Street just after the dinner time rush. It was quiet, and everybody was eating, or they'd gone out for the evening. We climbed the stairs to Marlo Curtis' apartment. I told the agent I wanted to go in alone. He didn't like the idea, but I explained to him that I expected friends and somebody should cover me from the outside. Well, she looked even prettier than I remembered her. One tear was just about ready to take that last plunge across her cheek. What do you want? I brought you a paper. I've seen it. You know the girl? Yes. What's her name? Too late. For you, maybe. I gotta know. You wouldn't understand. Try me. You're still looking for things. No, not this trip. You didn't think I could cry, did you? No. I learned. Weeping over a nail file? I said you wouldn't understand. It split a slug in a treasury agent. I don't know. Well, I do, sis. You filed the grooves. Shows you how many times you can be wrong in one day, Regan. Kind of cramped behind that screen, Dameron? Small apartment. Yeah. Always wanted to get the girls a bigger one, but Marlowe's getting tried. You're wrong, Dameron. Not anymore. You've been around Regan too long, Marlowe. Now you got a mouth just like his. Big. I just figured out what he's been trying to do. You putting brains on the market, too? Jane Doe, you've been looking for with Evelyn. Your sister could have been a rich woman. Not with the kind of money you printed. What are you playing this scene for? I didn't count on murder. Evelyn forgot things. You killed her. It was no good. She couldn't tell the fives from the ten. I'm going to identify her. You know where that leaves me? Sure I do. And I'm going now. You'll have to walk through this Luger. Is that the same gun you used on the Treasury agent? You and Regan hardly got acquainted, didn't he tell you? Your sister did that for me. You lied. Ask Regan. Nail file. That's right. Dum-dums. Evelyn wanted to be sure. You're rotten. Now get out of my way. Marlo, don't try it. I'm going out that door. Not standing up. It was a real photo finish. Just as Dameron pulled the trigger, the agent kicked the door open and threw a couple of fast ones into him. I'd call it a dead heat, but you'd have to give the agent the edge. His first slug cut Dameron down like a blade of grass. I figured the second was for shields. Marlo wasn't in a hurry anymore. Bacon. I'll call the doctor. No, Father. I thought too big now. They're hurt, baby. Yeah. I got a bigger. I almost made it. It was a good try. Now the damper. It's all used up. Good. Regan. They got bad as him. No, baby. You just played on the wrong team. He was. Let's go. Yeah. From here on, it's a monologue. Well, it was hard to figure. It was like trying to throw a saddle on a porpoise. I gave what I had to homicide, and it unbuttoned something like this. 
The girl who pulled a quick exit in the office, Jane Doe, was Marlowe's sister, Evelyn. She was front man for Dameron's bad money. She helped him pass it. The treasury agent, Shields, got a little too close, so Evelyn pumped a couple of dum-dums into him. She did it for Dameron, and then he slipped her the poison. He figured this stuff would work best, but she lived long enough to take that taxi ride to the office. Well, it didn't begin to make sense until I got down to personnel. I didn't think to check it before, but when I handed the clerk that gun, I noticed the tip of the slugs were grooved. Then over at Marlowe's, I picked up that nail file. It was full of lead filing. From there on, it was a fast reel. Dameron filled in the rest in the fight with Marlowe. Too bad about Marlowe. We might have had something. That's what I don't like about this business. We can't build friendships. Jack Webb is featured as Jeff Regan with Herb Butterfield as Anthony J. Lyon. It's CBS at the same time next week for more hard-boiled action and mystery with Jeff Regan, Investigator. Written by E. Jack Newman. Produced by Sterling Tracy. The role of Bill Dameron was played by Charles McGraw. Yvonne Patey was Marlo Curtis. Marvin Miller was the Treasury agent. David Ellis, Stacey Harris, Lou Krugman, and Bernice Barrett supported. Original music for this program is by Dick Arant. Bob Stevenson speaking. Jeff Regan Investigator is heard every Saturday over CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. get ten a day in expenses from a detective bureau run by a guy named Anthony J. Lyon. They call me the Lion's Eye. Jack Webb is Jeff Regan Investigator as CBS offers you hard-boiled action and mystery and thrilling adventure in tonight's story of The Lady with Too Much Hair. It's Suite 308 in the Cosmopolitan Building on 7th near Olive. The letters on the door say, International Detective Bureau, Anthony J. Lyon, President. They used to be in gold, but the Lyon scraped them off one day and made some kind of a deal with Fort Knox. Oh, it isn't much of an office. One room the size of a cigar box, and it smells about the same. There's an overstuffed chair in one corner with a loose spring that's a menace. Right over it, there's a crack in the ceiling. But the lion doesn't seem to mind. He says the place is rigged for comfort. Well, that's where I was at 5.25 last Wednesday night. The lion was sitting behind the desk looking at himself in a mirror. What he saw should have scared him. A pair of shoe button eyes mounted in a head like a Spanish onion. You know, Regan, I don't feel like I used to. Neither do the Republicans. I think I've got that middle age look. Uh, just the spread. He's getting a little scarce on top. Change your shampoo. I shouldn't be getting bald at my age. I'm only 39. Your addition is kind of bad, isn't it? Uh, I guess it's because I got so much worry. None of this business takes a lot out of a man. Takes more out of your clients. They get good service at reasonable rates. Mm, well, I've heard the commercial. Regan, cancel all arrangements for tonight. You're going to be busy. Doing what? That's the trouble with you, young man. Too hasty. Learn how to relax, like me. Tell that to your ulcer. Ever hear of a lady named Hazel Carr? No. Well, you're going it. She's a businesswoman, and we got business with her. What kind? Later. When? Anthony J. Lyon, international detective. Yeah. 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 1302 Beachwood. Right away, Mrs. Carr. Okay, there's the kickoff, Regan. Who's playing? You and a red-headed guy. Hop over to this address and hide behind a tree or something. I forgot my beard. You'll see a red-headed guy coming out of the house in about 45 minutes. Get a real good look at him. Why? He's the guy you're going to study so you'll know him any time you see him. Where does Hazel Carr fit? She's inside the house. After you spot the guy, go in and see her. Fill in the rest. She'll give you all you got to know. Now get moving and stay on the ball. I work for you. How can I get off? Well, I left the lion sitting there, and I drove out to the Beachwood address. 
Turned out to be a corner house stuck on the top of a hill, and it figured a good rain would wash it down the drain. Well, I parked across the street and lit a cigarette. Watched a kid on a bicycle throwing newspapers. His aim was real good. He got them all on the roof. I watched him finish the block, and that's when my knee action began to suffer. A heavy guy in a trench coat had his foot on my running board. He had a big face, and he turned it sideways and stuck it in the window. What's the matter, buddy? Out of gas? No, my foot fell asleep. Oh. How about a light? Want a light? Got one. Okay. Out of fluid, anyway. Well, pull your head out of here before you lose it. It's all right. I always carry a spare. Come on, beat it, Buster. You spoil my view. Oh. Peeking, huh? Maybe. You say maybe. I say yes. All right. What do you want? Same as you. You're looking. I'm looking. Whose side you on? Depends. On what? Whose side you're on. See ya. That was when the front door of the car house opened and six feet of pinstripe gray came out on the sidewalk. His 200 pounds was topped off with a bush of red hair and he had a face to match. It had a flushed look, like a high school boy at a burlesque show. He started down the street. The guy in the trench coat crossed over the other side and moved after him, kind of slow. Then they disappeared around the corner. Now, he was playing his hand, I was playing mine. I climbed out of my car and walked up to the door of the car place. The bell sounded like something that should have been in Buckingham, but the woman who answered wasn't any queen. Yes? My name's Regan, International Detective Bureau. Oh, Lion's Arm. Please come in, Mr. Regan. I'm Hazel Carr. All right. You saw him, I suppose. The redhead? Rather large, isn't he? The Dons are missing a bet. Sit down, Mr. Regan. May I offer you something? I'll try a story. We'll get to that in a moment. What's wrong with right now? We have other things to discuss. You have a dark suit, I suppose. Yeah, I got it on. Well, get it pressed. You're going out tonight, Mr. Regan. I'm already booked. Then disappointed. You see, from now on, you're working for me. Come on, strike a match, lady. I don't like the dark. You're going to meet the 710 at the Union Station. My daughter Phyllis is coming in. She's been at an eastern school getting finished. How'd she turn out? Just a vacation. She's dying to see Hollywood. She should have a young man. Well, I'm no escort bureau. I want more than an escort for Phyllis. I want a man with authority. She play that rough? That redhead you saw. He thinks he's in love with her. We all make mistakes. But he's impetuous. Follows her all over. He even threatened her. He says he'll kill her and himself if she doesn't marry him. Well, either way, he loses. I don't care about him. It's Phyllis that worries me. She's so young. Mm Mm-hmm. But I don't want her to know that things are so bad she needs protection. You must remember that. Maybe she'll figure it out herself. Don't let her. Anyway, I've wired her that a young man was going to meet her at the train to show her around. A nice young man. Can you act the part? I'll try. See that you do. Who's that boy out in front in the trench coat? I don't know what you mean. Okay. Anything else? Her major reservations for dinner dancing at the Grove. I'll show her a good time. You're paying the bills. And keep her occupied until I figure out a way to get rid of that redhead. Murder might work. Think about it. Call me after you pick her up. Sure. Now, you you better go. Okay. Oh, uh, Mr. Regan. Yeah? Here. What's this? Emily Post. Read up on your manners. Well, I figured she wasn't telling everything, but it was her play. I headed for my place to clean up before meeting the train. It took a little time bucking traffic on Franklin. At Gower, I played tag with the truck driver, trying hard to crease my fenders. It was about 6.15 when I pulled to a stop in front of my apartment. When I opened the door, I smelled cigar smoke. Somebody was over for a slumber party. A short, stocky guy with a stub crammed in his face was sleeping on the bed. He must have been having a real good dream, because he was tough to wake up. Hey, come on, buddy, hey. Come on, the alarm just went off. Oh, hiya, Regan. Guess I dozed off waiting for you. Pajamas in the top drawer. What are you using? Like a scratch. Yeah. So kind of late last night. You should have stayed home today. Had to see you. What for? Oh, you know what's a pretty crummy mattress you got? Well, I'll put in for a beauty rest. <laughs> yeah. Do that, Regan. All right, punk, let's get to it. He's off, he's off, Pilgrim. I'm still shaking the sand out. Well, get up and start talking. Easy, easy. Name's Moe. 
I'm a friend. Convince me. I'm going to. Hey. You get something to drink around? Maybe after the talk. I guess. Who sent you? Your insurance company. I'm paid up. And not in the collection department. What else they got? Friendly service, goodwill. Getting close to Christmas. Yeah, I'll send you a card. Don't want no card. Just want the pleasure of knowing I did you a service. Name the kind. Guys going to meet trains. Have accidents sometimes. Santa Fe's not going to like you. But I figure you will. Giving you how to stay healthy. My doctor tells me vitamins. Mo says it's a wrong dope. Skip the train and take in a show. I don't like popcorn. It'd pay you to learn. You want to tell me why? You got enough. How about that drink, friend? You didn't earn it. Suit yourself, Keeper. But being nice is really a knack with me. I'm pretty nasty. That won't get you an argument. I'd even hit a guy two feet shorter than me. Yeah, I'm turning pale. That's a good color for you, Regan. Stay that way. <laughs> He chewed on the cigar a couple of times, and then he went out to find a spittoon. Oh, the whole thing had a crummy look like a box of stale crackers. I tried to figure whether he was working for the redhead or grubbing around on his own, but not enough scenes were in to make it a full picture. Well, the car woman was writing the checks, and I was still trying. So I cleaned up, threw on some fresh clothes, and made it to the Union Station a little after seven. The super chief was just coming in. The station master, who walked with a slight list, took her name and said he'd bring her to me. And then I fought my way to the restaurant, and the waiter brought me a cup of coffee. He was a skinny little guy with a lot of neck muscles. I guess he got that way from talking so much. Are you going someplace, mister? Just been. Oh, that fun? It wasn't bad. Sugar? No, thanks. Oh, that's no good for you anyway. Gives you diabetes. You know, mister, I gotta go someplace myself sometime. I got a suggestion. I've been working here 12 years, yeah. People come, people go. Pete Brody stays on forever. Cream? No. That's uh, just as well. It's sour. <laughs> you know the farthest place I ever go, mister? That first door to the right. Uh, I, I... Are you Mr. Uh, Regan? Yeah. I believe you're waiting for me. You got a name? Phyllis Carr. That'll do. Well, the darling, aren't you going to ask me to sit down? You can handle that yourself. Oh, thank you. Where's your baggage? Uh, we'll have to pick it up. Are you going someplace, lady? I just got in. I've been figuring on going someplace myself. I was just telling your friend here. Get us some get, coffee. I, but I... I've get been... it. Okay, okay. I'm just being friendly. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to adore it here. Town full of mashers. Yeah, you'll get along. I'm much older than I look, you know. Carry a sign. Well, you don't seem very happy with me. I'm dreadfully sorry. You're much better than I expected. Your mother thought different. Oh, she's a dear. I thought at first she might pick me one of those children from UCLA. Well, they'll grow up. But darling, who can wait that long? I want to have fun while I'm young. Look, what kind of school do you go to? All girls. Well, that explains a little. And it's very progressive. Here's your coffee, lady. Oh, thank you so much. Ah, oh, don't mention it, lady. Yeah, like I was telling your friend here before. Uh, where are you going, Mr. Reed? I figured on going... No, to... not you. Me. Ah. Me. Oh, the phone your mother. Say hello to the dear for me. I'm going to say a lot more. Now, you sit right there till I get back. Oh, whatever you say, darling. I'll be making myself more beautiful. Save that for the redhead. Where'd you hear about him? News gets around. You're more my type. Uh, you better settle for UCLA. You don't want to wind up an old maid. <laughs> wasn't appealing. Nursemaid to a junior miss, trying hard to work up a sweat. The curtain wasn't down, but I was ready to call off the show. I scratched around for a nickel, and I found the phone booth between the newsstand and a broom closet. There was some old gal inside with a waffle for a hat, having a private filibuster. When she finished, I went in and started to dial Hazel Carr. That's when I spotted that redhead in the pinstripe working his way through the crowd. He had an eager look, like an English setter flushing quail. I threw the receiver back on the hook and started for Phyllis. As soon as I stepped out of the booth, the thunder broke. Somebody threw two slugs into the redhead and his light went out. The crowd began to gather, so I went back for Phyllis. It was hard going. I was moving against the grain. Hey, hey, watch out where you're going. What? I heard the shots just come out. Look out. Hey. Hey, you. 
some excitement outside. Hey, mister. Call homicide. I've been working here 12 years, seen a lot of things. Where'd she go? One day a whack chased the major all no, over the place. Oh, listen, hey. now listen. That blonde sitting over in the corner with a high meter reading. Where'd she go? Hey, you're spilling the cork. Oh, now see what you've done. What happened to her? Leave me alone. Give it to me. She went out. When? Well, just after you did. Before or after the shot? I, I don't remember. Well, think. Before. Yeah, yeah, before. I, I remember watching the way she walked. Did she get a date? Uh, she tried, but she said she was going steady with a red-headed guy. Well, things weren't going to get any better at the Union Station. Homicide would be down there scratching around. So I used the back door of the restaurant, picked up my car, and went out to the lion. When he opened the front door, he had a bottle of beer in one hand and a chicken sandwich in the other. He looked unhappy, like a beaver with a loose tooth. Regan, where you been? I've been looking all over for you. Did you try missing persons? Called your place three times, nobody answered. You know I was working. That's what I called you about. I got something to tell you. Well, wait your turn. What's the matter with you? In trouble again? No, you are, big shot. Another bum client. International detective never had a bum client. Well, those two women just spoiled your record. You've been drinking. You better call homicide and get us off that hook and then turn back Carr's retainer. Regan, what are you saying? You heard me. But it's unethical to return money. When Anthony J. Lyons... Oh, stop it, will you? Word. You quit giving blood when you find out somebody would pay for it. You're out of line. Every time you cut yourself, you make a beeline for the Red Cross to get it back. International detectives under obligation to Mrs. Carr, and we're going to see a truth. All right. You hold her hand in the gas chamber. Now, what does that mean? That's where she's going to be after the police get through. What? What happened? That redhead got himself a free ride to the morgue. It looks like her daughter, Phyllis Carr, called the play. You're out of your mind. Look at this telegram. Uh, let me see. It's from Phyllis Carr in New York. She just ran away from school with a Princeton man. You are listening to the story of the lady with too much hair. Tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, the investigator. Commissions are still available in the Army Nurse Corps. Graduate registered nurses between the ages of 21 and 45 may qualify for service with this fine organization. Nurses may request active or inactive status. Those on active status enjoy the same privileges as regular Army officers. Those on inactive status may continue their civilian nursing duties, but stand ready to serve in time of emergency. If you are interested in joining the Army Nurse Corps and believe you qualify for a commission... Apply to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. And now, back to Jeff Regan, investigator, and the story of the lady with too much hair. Well, it all made sense like a girdle on a Siamese twin. Started out with a redhead and a pinstripe and wound up a nursemaid job with a girl named Phyllis. While I'm in a phone booth, somebody throws a couple of sleeping pills at the redheaded guy. The smoke cleared and Red's doing the big sleep in Union Station and my date somewhere else. The lion makes it a Sunday special with a telegram that says everything is off. Well, it didn't take 20-20 vision to see that the girl in the station was a substitute or the telegram was a phony. Well, it was easy to figure my next move. I went across the street and I found a booth way over in the corner. I was two drinks into the house when the skinny guy in the trench coat eased down beside me. Hi, Regan. Think it all helps? You get around. So do you. Still following people? I gave up. You? You got something to say? I'm just here for a friendly drink. Try the bartender. I like conversation. What kind? All kinds. Bourbon and water. I don't look so worried, Regan. I'll pay for my own. You're going to make a night of it? I can't. Got things to do. Got to find a man who shot a man. What man? The one I followed. The one you watched. Any idea? Yeah. Who? You. Bum joke, Regan. Well, why'd you follow him? My business. Besides, I lost him in a traffic jam. Here you are, mate. Thanks. Well, here's to the newspapers. Uh, seen this one yet with pictures? All about our friend. Fine murder story. No, I work the crosswords. Oh, give me crime and lots of it. You know why? No, tell me why. It's sin, and sin is here to stay. All right, you said your piece. Hmm. Unknown assailant fires two shots into traveler at Union Station. Listening? It's an old story. Think so? He got his red hair dirty on the floor. Uh-uh. Wrong caper. Well, I'll catch up later. This guy was different. 
Oh, bald, like a boiled egg. Crazy, give me that. See what I mean? The guy in the picture ain't got red hair, got no hair. What's your angle, Buster? Like I said, I read paper. Why? I thought maybe you belonged to the barber's union. <laughs> Well, it turned out to be an even trade. I took his newspaper, and he got my ice and the drink. Well, I went back to the office and sat down and tried to figure it out. It was all crazy, like an Eskimo with a popsicle. I started by calling Hazel Carr's house, but the nickel came back. The phone book gave a business address, so I drove out there. It was a pink stucco job out on Olympic right after you pass Redondo. A red neon sign told you that Hazel Carr Incorporated specialized in hair pieces. Nobody answered up front, so I slipped around to the back door. The door opened into a workroom. I scratched a match. Somebody had been looking for something, and it wasn't dandruff. Every wig in the place was torn apart. It was just about then that I heard a step, and then a flashlight jumped out at me, and I smelled a cigar. It was Mo. Hi, Regan. Well... Sleeping beauty. I'm awake this time. I'm impressed. Tell me more. Stand still, Regan. This alarm clock goes off. It's already rung. I didn't do it. Body in Union Station. Chamber of Commerce gets upset. I'm from Florida. Figure to bring up the orange crop? Didn't do this either. Spit out the seeds. Regan, you're not friendly. You got here first. I'm here all the time. No, you're trying too hard, Mo. I work here. It's a serious business. We make billiard balls happy. All right, so you work for Hazel Carr. Say something with hormones. You're learning nothing that's not in the trades. Why'd you snatch the redhead's toupee? You make me tired of saying I didn't. Couldn't meet his installments? The count you'll get credit. What's in that toupee? You've asked enough questions, Regan. Relax, buddy. You'll burn out your coils. You're in the way. They told you once. I was born on the second honeymoon. Well, happy birthday, Junior. Ooh! I was lying face down in a pile of Santa Claus beards and yak tails. When I rolled over, there was the lion. He was shaking like a polar bear in a French bathing suit. Wake up. We huh? gotta wake up. Ooh. I could hire a detective for the price of you. Get a midget and he'd starve to death. We got a client. She needs you. What are you, Silent Arrow? I'm a nursemaid with you around. She called the office. Gonna have another daughter? I told you it's legitimate. She didn't know nothing about the phony. Where is she now? 1629 Locust Avenue. Why? She's in the middle of a smuggle. You sure? It adds up. She pays the bill. She's straight. How'd you meet her in the first place? I got a right to a private life. Not at your age. <laughs> oh, I left the lion standing here and I climbed in my car. I made a couple of right turns in the wrong zone, but I found the address all right. 1629 turned out to be a two-story Monterey number in the middle of what looked like a golf course. Hazel Carr owned this place, too. She must have been selling toupees to Crosby's whole stable. I parked the car, and I headed for the lights that were on downstairs. I took the front steps two at a time. Oh! Well. Wow. Well, if it isn't UCLA. I just got in from Berkeley. Oh, don't be bitter. I'm not. Where you been? Jealous? You're fickle. Just when I'm in college. Lucky student body. I didn't know you noticed. Well, skip it. It was a lousy act anyway. It's good enough to fool you. Going somewhere? I got a date. If it's with Mrs. Carr, don't bother. I sent for you. You better try again. Your boss just got a phone call. Well, if I put on one act, I can put on another, can't I? You didn't kill Red. Uh, it's not important. Yes, it is. Come on back inside. We're going to have a threesome. I like it better at the zebra room. You could find a dark place. That'll come later. Uh-uh. I'm leaving. No, you're not. Inside, <laughs> sis. You don't have to coax me. Where is she? Uh, Mrs. Carr. Look, it wasn't me. She's been dead a long time. So's your alibi. I've only been here for five minutes. You're lying. I'll make you listen to me. Look out. Drop it. You pick up that gun and I'll break you in two. Oh, stop it. Get me a drink. Some over there. All right. Look, I didn't kill him. Not either one of them. Sure. You don't believe anything. Depends on the source. Here, this will slow you down. Thanks. 
All right, now let's start talking. You got me into it. Mo? Maybe. Say yes. Don't be personal. You get me out of the way so he can plug the redhead and snatch the toupee. Mo is impulsive. That's all. Forget about him. But the toupee was empty, so the two of you have to scratch around some other places for it. Hell, I wrung my fingers through your hair. Let's stick to the subject. I wish you would. Did the redhead know he was carrying an empty load? Nobody did, except Mrs. Carr. It was a smuggle, and she was holding out. It's a mistake for a woman, don't you think? They had a trio, and she wanted to sing solo. The boys weren't smart like you are. Maybe she was worried about her daughter. Maybe she wanted to go straight, and the boys didn't want her to. You're wasting our time. Let me show you where I fit in. No, you're on the wrong floor. There's a way to fix everything. You're an accessory. I can become essential. You'd get lipstick on my expense account. Come here. Oh, break it up, baby. You scratched around every place. You still can't find the goods. I think I found it. You figure the old lady used me as a safety deposit box? Where else could it be? All right, supposing I got it, what next? Do I have to draw a diagram? You might as well be realistic about this thing. What's it worth? $50,000 of the white stuff. I don't like to dream. You look like you could use one. I'm extra. Meet the contract there. Oh. Oh, yeah, this act figured to do it. Mo. You had a good memory. Mo, baby, I... Skip it. Stand still, Pilgrim. I, w- I was trying to get it for I you. heard the song. That Regan might like to hear the chorus. Oh. <laughs> Mr. Bet Regan. You should grab an offer when it's hot. <laughs> Don't be sad, Pilgrim. She smiled at all the boys. Come on, let's get out of here. You'll look better with slow paralysis. Well, I had about as much chance as a clean towel in a boarding house. When the muscle said move, I had to be polite. I guess he figured the car place was too crowded and he wanted new scenery. Well, we went out to the street and he steered me for his car. It was a black job with white sidewalls and there were two suitcases in the back seat. But all his bags weren't packed. He was missing a small package, and he had the idea it was over at my place. When we got there, it was about midnight, but it wasn't too late for him to go to work. Now, isn't this better, Regan? Home sweet home. I never liked it anyway. Moo. I got a lease. Those things can be broken. Want me to show you how? No, I'll struggle along. You make things hard on yourself. Now, do something the easy way. Get me the stuff. You're wasting your time. I got lots of it, you ain't. Well, I haven't got it. Mo thinks you have. Well, and he's pretty dumb. You... That's on account I don't like your choice of words. Buy me a dictionary. You're going to get yourself two big holes in your middle if you don't lay that stuff in my hand. <laughs> Sorry I had to do that to him, Regan. Well, I forgive you. I just came up to get my newspaper back, and he was acting nasty. The little guy in the bar. My boss doesn't like it when I shoot people. Uncle Sam, huh? Mm-hmm. Narcotics. I tried to tip you off before, but you weren't listening. Somebody should have tipped Mo. Weren't you watching? I just did. <laughs> was all over fast, like a short beer in a cheap saloon. They took him away in a basket, and all I had left was a spot on the rug. They had a good thing until Hazel Carr got anxious and decided to pull out. Only she wanted to be clean and have the stuff, too. That's what started the scavenger hunt. The only thing straight in the whole corkscrew was the part about the daughter needing protection. But I guess she got it back at Princeton. The stuff? Oh, it finally turned up. Hazel Carr had found herself a good place to hide it. The Fed spotted it the first thing the next morning when he saw the lion. How could he miss? The lion looked awful in that red toupee. Jack Webb is featured as Jeff Regan with Herb Butterfield as Anthony J. Lyon. It's CBS at the same time next week for more hard-boiled action and mystery with Jeff Regan, Investigator. Written by Larry Roman and Jackson Gillis. Produced by Sterling Tracy. Included in tonight's cast were Mary Lansing, Ken Christie, Sidney Miller, Lorette Philbrandt, and Ed Barrier. 
29,000 nurses are needed to join the new Army Nurse Corps Officers Reserve. For the first time in history, qualified nurses have the opportunity of receiving commissions in the regular Army Reserve. These nurses will remain on inactive status, ready to serve their country in time of emergency. 4,000 of them, if they wish, may choose active duty. All nurses who receive commissions will benefit from the opportunity for specialized training offered to them by the Army. Inactive reserve status will not interfere with a nurse's civilian life. If you are a registered graduate nurse between the ages of 21 and 45, drop a card to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. Original music for this program is by Milton Charles. Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. Murder and One to Go. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice, dangerous my stock and trade. If life's giving you so much punishment you're buckling at the knees, you need my help. George Valentine. Write full details. <laughs> Dear Mr. Valentine, do you remember Carol Gordon? Once she was as glamorous and famous as any movie star you can name today. Then some 18 years ago, when talkies came in, she faded out of the limelight. Dead? Perhaps. But if she isn't, I must find her. The only clue I have is that someone thinks he saw Carol Gordon about a year ago, down on Skid Row. The enclosed check is a return. Retainer, and if you succeed in finding her, there will be a substantial bonus. Sincerely yours, Henry Crichton. Uh, Henry Crichton, business management and artist representation. Carol Gordon. Ah, uh, 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 careful! Don't say you remember her, Brooksy. You'll give your age away. Well, I don't remember. Two world-shaking events took place in the twenties: the stock market crash and Carol Gordon. Her autograph always gets you two of Wallace Reed in the trade. And now Skid Row. Well, maybe this Mr. Crichton knows of a small part for her. Well, if he's gambling with $250 just to play Good Samaritan, I'd like to shake hands with that gentleman. And if he isn't, it might be a good idea to find out what's on his mind. Mmm. Pretty swank. Ah. Courier and Ives Prince right out in the hall. The Dorset Building. The agent's paradise. The house the 10% goes. George! Hey, I think that's coming from our client's office. Brooks, oh. He's dead! He's dead! In there! Oh, oh so All right, now, sister. All right, take it easy. Get hold of yourself. Uh, what? Well, Try to calm down. Who's dead? Mr. Crichton, I just came back from lunch. I found him lying there on the floor. The fire poker next to him. His head is... Won't you please call the police? Valentine, I know you were put on this earth to keep me from being bored, to see that I don't fall into a rut. But uh, please, let's keep this murder nice and simple. But take another look at this letter, will you, Lieutenant? You must admit Crichton might have been killed because he was determined to find Carol Gordon. Miss Brooks, I used to be a Carol Gordon fan. Why, it got so Mrs. Riley wouldn't let me go to the movies when her pictures were playing. Why, Lieutenant? But nobody's even thought of that woman in years and years. Crichton dead, Lieutenant. Well, being just a plodding, unimaginative copper, I'm going to have to stick to facts. Namely, Crichton got his head bashed in with a poker from which all the fingerprints were carefully wiped off. Oh, that's quite a fact to be stuck with. There was a struggle and the plug of the electric clock on the desk was pulled out of the wall. Now, that sets the time of the murder at 12.35. And a half a dozen people saw Miss Jackson, Crichton's secretary, in the coffee shop all through the lunch hour. A lieutenant, I understand Crichton had quite an imposing list of clients. Yes, sir, and I'm going to talk to every one of them. 
No flights of fancy for me, pal. Uh, oh, incidentally, Valentine. Yeah? Uh, how are you going to go about tracing uh, Cal Gordon? Obviously, she doesn't want to be found. And she probably doesn't look anything like she used to. And Skid Row is a pretty big place, you know. George, I think the lieutenant is trying to imply that it's going to be like looking for a needle in a haystack. Well, what's so hard about finding a needle in a haystack? Well, huh? that's what I... What? All you do is get a magnet. The needle comes to you. Now, look, Mr. Gabrenian, what'll it cost me to have you run this picture in your movie house tomorrow afternoon? You mean you're going to pay me, fella? What's wrong with it, fella? Oh, nothing's wrong with it, Mr. Gabrenian. It was a super colossal production back there in 1928. Yeah, Romance in April, starring Carol Gordon. Never heard of her, fella. You? In the movie business and never heard in of... 1928, your... I was running a coffee pot. I wish I was still running it. Well, anyway, well, you wouldn't mind showing this picture for... Uh... Fifty dollars, would you? There's just one thing we ought to tell you, Mr. Yeah, I knew this was coming, fella. Uh, there's no sound, no music in this picture. It's uh, a silent. It's up to no, huh? You don't think for a moment I'd talk you into anything that would damage the reputation of Gabrenian's cameo theater, the gym of Skid Row? Are you kidding? I don't even advertise the picture we're playing. I just hang out a sign, soft seats, open all night, 15 cents. Oh, oh. Then this ought to be right down your alley. The slumber of your selected clientele won't be disturbed by any noises coming off the screen. Just a little piano music for mood. Yeah, lady, you might got something there. This is a gal who knows all the angles. Yeah. On her, they look good, too. Too bad the cameo ain't barbecue house like it used to be. You're a real nice filly, lady. Why, thank you, Mr. Gabrenian. I don't know whether to blush or whinny. Huh? What's that? Uh, <clears throat> now, what about it? Does romance in April play here tomorrow? It plays. Money in advance, fellow. No objection to me selling the tickets? You sell, but remember the tickets are numbered. I'll know just how many people go in. Oh, you're a trusting soul, Mr. Gabrenian. <laughs> you said it. Yes, sir. Here's your ticket, sir. Go right in. Oh, thank you. Well, business is pretty slow, darling. Uh-huh. Well, you can't say Mr. Gabrenian didn't advertise the revival of Romance in April. Yeah, with the late Mr. Crichton's money. So far, your magnets attracted nothing but the usual Skid Row characters. Maybe the whole oh, thing... Oh, wait a minute. Hold it, Brooksy. Can you tell me if the features started yet? In just a few minutes, sir. Good. One, please. Thank you. George, didn't you recognize... Yeah, Brooksy, yeah. We're beginning to draw a better class of people. Anthony Chapman, the movie heartthrob. Now, what would he be doing in a place like this? And trying to look inconspicuous. An interesting question, Angel. I bet the answer's even more interesting. I called up before, young man. I understand romance in April goes on at 2.15. Is that correct? Yeah. You've got two minutes to make it. Just like to be sure, time is money. Fifteen cents? Is that correct? And I understand the picture runs an hour and twelve minutes. Yeah, that's correct. Someone else out, Sonny. <laughs> a little man in a big briefcase. Brooksy, what's your guess? Vice president of a bank? A successful insurance salesman? Or just a lover of the silent cinema? Uh, you know, I got a definite feeling we started something here. But what? Hey! Oh. Look what we've got now, George. The carriage trade drawing up. Now I'm sure we ought to change prices before six. You can call for me in about an hour, Ralph. Yes, ma'am. One seat in the loge, please. Loge? I uh, doubt if we can build you one at a moment's notice. What? Oh, well, whatever you've got. Thanks. Thank you. Hmm. I'd say that was about $5,000 worth of mink on the hook. Hey, look, a Brennan actually opened the door for her. I don't blame the man for being overwhelmed. Looks like all kinds of people don't mind coming to this popcorn cove to see romance in April. Uh, one ticket, please. It's 15 cents, isn't it? Yeah, and you're just in time for the picture. Let's see, 11th, 12, 13, 14, 15. Hope you don't mind the pennies. That's all I have. Oh, they add up just the same. They are. I hope you enjoy the picture. Yeah, I'm sure I will. I take it you're a Carol Gordon fan. Yeah, 
And her severest critic. Did you hear that, Brooksy? That's an angel, I think. Carol Gordon? Oh, that couldn't be, George. Well, I could be wrong. But there was something about her eyes. But she seemed so old and pathetic. Come on, Brooksy. Cabradian can take over the box office now. We're going inside and make sure. Must have broken Gabrenian's heart to hire a piano player for the day. That girl on the screen, Angel. Look at it carefully. Don't you see some resemblance between her and the woman we saw before us at the box office? Mm, sorry, George. I can't talk myself into it. Mm, yeah. Maybe I am punching a little too hard. Oh, she was beautiful, wasn't she? Even in that costume with a waistline down to her knees. And not a bad actress to compete with these titles. Ellen looked at the faded flowers and thought of the waste of her own life. <laughs> oh, brother. No! No! Oh, no! Oh, a waste of life. My life! What did I do? It was Carol Gordon. What happened? Come on, stick with me, Brooksy. Get out of here. It's right down the hall here, folks. Yeah, see, Brooksy, I told you she didn't just vanish. We were about giving up hope, mister. We've been over this block with a fine-tooth comb for the last hour. Hmm. can imagine the places you've been in, miss. Now, this here hotel don't rightly belong down in this neighborhood. Why do you know we change bed sheets and towels twice a week? Yeah, well, bully for you, but what, what did you say was the name she was using? Uh, Ethel Mills. That is, if it's the woman you've been describing... And you know, funny thing. What's that? Huh? Well, about 20 minutes ago, while I was away from the desk, somebody left a bottle of champagne for her. Champagne? Yep, yep. All wrapped up fancy, too. Brought it right up to her. No other hotel around here gives room service like we do. Well, uh, here it is. Hmm. She's in there all right. And I think I know what happened. What do you mean? Well, if Ethel has the bottle around, it don't last long. Well, something might have happened to her in her frame of mind. Yeah, we better take a look, friend. Yeah, that's right, young fella. Don't want anything bad happening to the reputation of the hotel. Uh-oh. Mm, I'd like a light. Well, don't just stand there. Where are those towels you're so proud of? All right over there. there oh. Come on. Oh. Try to sit up. I... I can't. It hurt. Mm. Usually she don't oh. feel like that until the next day. Oh. And the bottle's only half empty. Seems somebody left a card with it, too. Let me see oh. that. To Carol Gordon. On the day of her triumphant return to the screen. Oh. Wait, this wet towel ought to help her. No time for that, Brooksy. We have to get her to a hospital. But, George, she's only... Only been poisoned. Oh. One sniff of this bottle will tell you that. Oh. Poison? Somebody else followed her here from the cameo. Somebody who wants to see Carol Gordon dead. Return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about winter driving. If you find the January days are kind of chilly, don't forget, cold weather is rough on your car, too. It may mean a lot of grinding starting wear, an extra drain on your car's battery. But a sure way to get fast starts, to keep your battery from working overtime, and to keep operating costs down, is to use Chevron Supreme gasoline. For well, this high-octane motor fuel has special blending agents that give fast starts and speedy warm-up every time you use the starter. Besides lending a helping hand to your battery, Chevron Supreme gives fast pickup in traffic, smooth acceleration, and the extra power that makes your car great on hills. It's a premium quality gasoline, and it's climate-tailored for each different altitude and temperature zone in the West. That means you can depend on it the year-round for fast starts, and smoother, extra power wherever you motor. Get a tank full of Chevron Supreme gasoline tomorrow. Get it at standard stations and at independent Chevron gas stations, where they say, and mean, we'll take better care of your car. At 
And now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Someone hires you to trace down an old movie star named Carol Gordon. Even before you can get started, your client is found murdered. You pick up from there and finally locate the once famous beauty in a cheap Skid Row hotel. The payoff there is that someone's tried to kill her, too. If you're like George Valentine, you won't rest till you find out why murder is singing such a merry song of mayhem. Valentine, I don't care where you've got Carol Gordon. Get her down here to headquarters. Well, you can't blame Lieutenant for hiding her out when she left the hospital. Somebody's out to get her. Now, look, chum boy, I'm not too sure the lady didn't try to poison herself. Yes, yeah, so you've been saying, with bullheaded regularity. Well, you forget the elevator boy in Crichton's building. He recognized Carol Gordon's picture, put her right on the seat of the crime. Now, guilty conscience. I want to talk to her. Uh-huh. Maybe you got an answer for those three strangely out-of-place characters who showed up at the revival of Romance in April. Oh, Tony Chapman and Miss Ferris are both movie people. Maybe, maybe morbid curiosity brought them down there. Who knows? Uh-uh, Riley. It seems a little more than coincidence that just when Crichton hired me to find Miss Gordon, those two should decide to take in one of her pictures at the cameo. Well, Also, uh... both Chapman and Miss Ferris were managed by Crichton. And what makes it even more screwier, they just became engaged to each other. And yet they show up at their theater at different times. I don't care how it sounds. Chapman has an alibi for the time of Crichton's murder. The attendant in the garage of his apartment house vouches for the time. As for Miss Ferris, well, as far as she's concerned, she has no motive. And the mousy little man who showed up at the revival. The one with a briefcase under his arm. I told you I saw him hanging around the hospital, too. Okay, okay. If and when we find this little gnome, I'll talk to him. In the meantime, you get Carol Gordon down here and fast. Here you are, Miss Gordon. My car is parked right over here. There's, there's really nothing I can tell the lieutenant, Mr. Valentine. Well, you just tell him the truth, Carol. And if he growls at you a little, don't let him upset you. Okay, here we are. The three of us can fit into the front seat. Oh, I, I know my story sounds a little weak, but I did drop in to see Henry Crichton on a personal matter. Once we were good friends. When I found him like that, I didn't stop to think. I hurried down the stairs and out of the building. Yes, yeah, sure, I understand. I don't know if I can turn around here on the hill. I think it's the quickest way back to headquarters. What's the matter? Oh. Hey, George! We're rolling down the hill! Somebody's been monkeying around with the brakes. They won't hold. Oh, try to keep it straightened out, George. We're going faster. We're going up on the sidewalk. Hang on. I'm going to crash. Oh. It's too close for comfort. Oh. Everybody all right? Oh. What about you, Miss Gordon? I'm just shaken up. Good thing I picked out a wooden fence. What happened? Looks like somebody tried to get all three of us this time. Yes, doesn't it? Oh, oh, wait a minute. Huh? What's the matter? You see that Miss Gordon gets to headquarters. I just spotted someone I want to talk to. Okay, George. Hey, let me through here, will you? One side, please. Hey, you, come back here. A few questions I want to ask you. No, 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 no. Let go of me, please. I, I don't know anything. There's nothing I can tell you. Now, look, Buster, I've been dreaming about you in that briefcase. What makes you pop up all over the place? Well, I, I've been following you just to see that Miss Gordon was all right, that nothing happened to her. Come on, come on. Who are you? The name is Moody, sir. Walter Moody, you see? Here, here is my card. Walter Moody, 6th Street Grammar School, principal. I don't get it, friend. I am the oldest and the most faithful member of the Carol Gordon fan club. I venture to say the only member after all these years. Are you kidding? Oh, she was a fine actress. I have a great big shelf just full of scrapbooks. Her pictures, almost every line that was ever written about Miss Gordon. Hey, you know, this is just cockeyed enough to turn out to be useful. I beg your pardon. Would you help Miss Gordon if she were in real trouble? Oh, I'd do anything, sir. Anything. Okay, Mr. Moody. Let's begin by taking a look at that five-foot shelf of yours. You mean... Carol actually used to correspond with you, Mr. Moody. Oh, yes. <laughs> My, personally. I used to send the information in a newsletter to fans all over the country. Hmm. This must have been a big event in their life, according to this communique. My dearest number one fan, something has happened here today in this beautiful little town. 
that's made me the happiest girl in the world. Soon I hope to be able to tell you all about it. I've always been curious about that, Mr. Valentine. What did she mean? Hmm. Eudora, California, December 9th, 1929. You know, Mr. Moody, I may be able to satisfy your curiosity. Nineteen twenty-nine, December. Yep, I'm right here in Marekas. December 9th. Ethel Mills and Anthony Switzer. I can remember them two very well. Well, first couples are married as Justice of the Peace. Anthony Switzer could be Tony Chapman. Why not? Huh? Look here, son. What's all the shooting about, anyway? Mm, what do you mean, Pops? Well, just last week, a fellow was here. Named Crichton. He's with a young lady. <laughs> Long, blonde hair. He wants the same information. I think you've really given me something to wedge with, Pops. Thanks a lot. Naturally, I can't deny it, Valentine. It's a matter of record. Maybe you didn't deny it, Chapman, but you certainly have done everything to keep your marriage to Carol Gordon a secret. Don't make me out a heel, will you? When talking pictures came in, Carol simply disappeared. After a while, I thought she was dead. You know, it would be a terrible shock to your fans, Chapman, to find out that you let your wife simply disappear when she may have needed you. Don't I know that? And now engaged to beautiful and blonde Miss Ferris. No one can say I haven't tried to find my wife. When I heard about one of her pictures being shown, I even went to the theater thinking she might turn up. Uh-huh. And when she did, did you follow her and leave a bottle of champagne so she could celebrate her triumphant return to the screen? Uh, but... What? I don't know what you're talking about. I lost her in the crowd after she ran out. It... You know, Chapman, you'd fit in nicely as the murderer of Crichton if you didn't have such a perfect alibi. I've been through all that with the police. The attendant downstairs in the garage saw me drive in at 12.30. Yeah, I know, I know. You told him you weren't locking the car. Which I always do, but I'd lost my key. Still haven't got around to getting one, as a matter of fact. Okay, Chapman, okay. I'm just checking. Anyway, now I can work out something with Carol. Get a quiet divorce. Maybe... Tony, I've been waiting hours for you down in the lobby. What in the world uh, is Oh, Valentine, I'd like to meet Arlene Ferris, my fiancé. Tell me, Miss Ferris, do you make it a practice to become engaged to men you know are married? What? Why Tony. did you have to do that, Valentine? Arlene didn't know, and there's really no reason why she should. The whole thing might have been smoothed over. But you did know about Carol Gordon, didn't you, Arlene? You must be out of your mind. You and Henry Crichton paid a little visit to Eudora shortly before he was murdered. Arlene... Now, what was the deal? Were the two of you going to shake Chapman down after I located Carol? This isn't true, is it, Arlene? Why should I deny it? Seemed a very good idea at the time. Good Lord. Do you think I was infatuated with your worn-out boyish charm, your toupee, what? the caps on your teeth? Shut up, you... Who do you well, think you are? Well, if you two are, are going to have an emotional wing-ding, you probably want a little privacy. Good day. Hey, Lieutenant. We can use this office and back of the garage. Go on in, Miss Gordon. Tell me, Valentine. Why a garage? Why didn't you call up and ask me to meet you in a Turkish bath? Oh, 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 please, Lieutenant, the ladies. Ah. Now, what's this all about? Well, I didn't think you'd have any objections to Miss Gordon making a phone call. Oh, for the love of Mike, why couldn't she have done it from my office? It wouldn't have worked that way. Oh, I... I don't know if I can say the things you told me, Mr. Valentine. I hate Tony. Hated him ever since he didn't lift a finger to help me. When he knew I was desperate. But just do your best, Carol. As an actress, your best is better than you think. I'm sure of it. Okay, here's his number. I'll dial it for you. Well. Hey, I'm... Oh, all right. Hello. Tony? This is Carol. Yes, I know this must be a shock to you. But listen, dear, let me do the talking. Tony, I've been unfair to you all these years. I should have come back and let you have the divorce. It must have been dreadful for you. Couldn't we do that now, quietly, so that no one need ever know? Then you'll be free. Yes. Uh, meet me in five minutes on the corner of State and McGovern. Please hurry. Goodbye. 
Oh, you were wonderful. Yeah. That ought to get Mr. Chapman down here in the garage with the speed of light. Light? <laughs> Why don't you try shedding some once in a while, Valentine? There shall be light, Lieutenant, I hope. Now, you ladies stay here in the office. Come on, Riley. Here's Chapman's custom job over here. Well, what do I do? Just stand here and admire it? What the... Come on back here, Lieutenant. We want to see this act without being seen. Now, why'd you do that? Just a pious hope. And if I'm wrong, I'll... Wait a minute. There's Chapman. Get back in his car. Lieutenant must have locked it anyway. Well. Having trouble, Buster? What? I'll take those keys. This one in particular. The one you said you'd lost. Your fancy alibi. Let go of this. Remember your manners, Chapman. Let Chum Boy have the key. What, what is this? A frame up? Oh, famous last words. Ah, that's the trouble with elaborate alibis. People are so forgetful. Or to say it another way, friend. You just put the finger on yourself. George Valentine will be back in just a moment to explain his reasons for naming Chapman as the killer. Meanwhile... Quite a few folks have the impression that the only values an artist knows are color values. But not so with artist Ren Wicks of Beverly Hills, California. When it comes to economy and car operation, Mr. Wicks knows the value of RPM motor oil. Here's Mr. Wicks' statement, quote, It takes a lot of things to keep a car running. One thing is good motor oil. That's why I selected RPM years ago. It reduces wear, cuts repair bills, unquote. RPM motor oil will save wear in your car, too. will bring a new economy to your car operation. For this premium quality motor oil was developed precisely for modern high-speed engines. Chemical compounds in RPM keep your entire engine cleaner. They protect those finely polished, close-fitting parts. Protect them from corrosion, gum, lacquer, and carbon. If your car is about due for a drain and refill, give it a new lease on life by getting RPM motor oil. Remember, it's better for your car and for your pocketbook. Get RPM at independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. How did George Valentine come to suspect Chapman? Right at the moment, that's a question that's also troubling Lieutenant Riley. Valentine, if I played hunches like you do, I, I'd be laughed out of the department. I have to stick to facts. Well, that's the advantage I have, Lieutenant. When a hunch doesn't pay off, there's only Angel here to do the laughing. Oh, I only snicker. How long are you two going to talk shop? For instance, the one hunch about running Carol Gordon's picture brought a lot of other things to the surface. Chapman must have come down to the cameo all ready to follow Carol if she showed up. He and his lethal champagne. Yeah, he also made a scooter out of my car. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, quite a mechanic. Old lover boy even knew how to stop the clock in Crichton's office at the right time to make his alibi stick. George, I still don't know why you hunched Arlene out of the picture. Oh, she had too good a deal with Crichton, blackmailing Chapman to spoil it. Everything would have turned out as planned if Chapman hadn't found out what his business manager was cooking up. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, don't be so depressed, Lieutenant. I'll try to teach George a healthier respect for facts. <laughs> you shouldn't be bothering your lovely head with facts, Angel. Not with your corner on the market when it comes to figures. Why, darling. Oh, just stating a fact, sweetheart. Oh, you can say the sweetest things, dearest. <laughs> well, I've got a great big hunch my stomach can't stand much more of this, so goodbye, kids. <laughs> Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Brooksy. 
Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Jeanette Nolan as Carol Gordon, John McIntyre as Chapman, Virginia Gregg as Arlene, Howard McNear as Moody, Louis Van Ruten as Gabrenian, and Dick Ryan as the manager. The music is composed and presented by Eddie Dunstetter. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Standard of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. The Corpse on a Caper, another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice, danger's my stock and trade. If the world has you spinning on your head, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. My dear Mr. Valentine, mine is no world-shaking problem, merely a grim and unpleasant duty. One of my girls here at Cliffbriar College passed away several days ago. Her body must be accompanied to her home in Mexico City. If you're available for this assignment, please phone me at the school this afternoon. Then you can meet Miss Burke. Miss Burdick, our resident nurse at Idlitz's funeral home this evening, and make the necessary arrangements. Yours very truly, Julia Dunham Stoner, Dean. I don't know about you, Brooksy, but I'd rather be on a slow boat to China. Cliff Briar College. Golly, I wonder how old the poor girl was. Do you think she had a boyfriend, George? Think of how he must feel. They probably uh, would... let's think of the problem at hand, Angel. Do we take this or not? Who are you kidding? You've already made up your mind. Well, somebody has to do it. The law says that a corpse must have a chaperone. <laughs> then, of course, there's Mexico City. Hmm. Yeah, I'll bring you back a couple of maracas as a souvenir. We'll talk about that later, senor. Shall I give Dean Stone a ring? Ah, uh, Mexico City. Land of sunshine. Senoritas with flashing eyes. You shut up. <laughs> Here's the burial permit and a copy of the death certificate, Mr. Valentine. Okay, Miss Burdick. You'll need those when you get to the train tomorrow. How old was she, Miss Burdick? Consuelo Banales was 19. I know. You're probably thinking how much she had to live for. A great deal, Miss Brooks. She was beautiful, had more money than she could possibly use. Everything. Miss Banales is all fixed up for the trip. Looks real beautiful. If you want to, you can go in the back and see for yourself, Miss Verdick. That won't be necessary, Mr. Idlitz. I better go across the street and get me a sandwich. The way work's been coming in these days, hardly get a chance to eat. If it would only level off over the years. Uh, Mr. Idlitz, you'd better go and hurry back. We have a few things to talk about. And this is the wrong season for business. Don't understand it. Be back in a few minutes. I suppose every occupation has its hazards. Death certificate. Uh huh. Date one four forty nine. Cause of death: cerebral hemorrhage. Natural causes: attended deceased from November eighteenth, nineteen forty eight, to January fourth, nineteen forty nine. Last visit: January fifth, nineteen forty nine. So, Elwood Dryden, M.D. Doctor Dryden is sort of college physician, although he lives off the campus. I see. He's been away the last few days. Must be on a case. Mm-hmm, I see. Now, here's a check to cover your expenses, Mr. Valentine. Consuelo's family will take care of your fee when you get to Mexico City. Uh, please let Dean Stoner know when you come back. Yes, I'll do that, Miss Purdy. Good night. Uh, look, Brooksy. Yes, George? Sit down and browse through the mortician's journal. I'll go and see if I can hurry Mr. Idlitz along. Well, all right, but please hurry, darling. Despite the potted palms, I can think of a cozier waiting room. What is this? 
What hole did you two guys creep out of? Yeah, you two men, what are you doing in my funeral parlor? And why have you got that young lady bound and gagged? Button your lip, or button your shirt on. That Danny. gun doesn't frighten me. I'm going out and call a policeman. Hey, wait a minute, you get... Oh, I could, couldn't hold myself back. Who is that character on the floor? Well, he was the undertaker. Oh, the cold cook, huh? You, what are you doing here? Who are you? You're just talking up your sleeve, Buster. Till you take that gag out of that lady's mouth. Me? Nobody's got more respect for women than me. I think all of them like my own dear mother. Go ahead, Danny. Take the thing out of her, yep. George. Shut up. I just did that to show you I got a respect for womanhood, lady. Now back to you, Jack. What are you doing around here? And why did you heist the body? Huh? He's been raving about somebody stealing Consuelo's body from the back room. Didn't door. I tell you to keep still? Come on, Jack. What did you do with her? The name's Valentine. What's the name they got under your pinup picture in the post office? Hey, you want us to give this guy a good slammer for cracking wise? The name is Bo Scarby. You're the only one been flitting around here all night. And Consuelo, she ain't here anymore. You're running a fever, mister. I was just hired to go with the body back to Mexico. She ain't going back to Mexico. She's gonna stay here and get buried right next to my dear mother. Go ahead, keep running. I'll try and listen. Even though she did walk out on me, she's my wife. You get the swing of it? No, no, I don't. She's just a college kid. She's only been here from Mexico a couple of months. You're not in her league, friend. She gave me a wrong name. Ginger Santos. But I found out who she really was. And I read about her dying up here in the college. You get the swing of it? Oh, brother, the only thing I'm getting is a headache. All right, Danny. I will hold the gun. I've got work to do. George! Tell them, tell them anything. We'll start easy. First with a mouth full of finger. Oh. <laughs> get the swing of it, Valentine? And then he was holding back. Hey, what do you want me to tell you? I don't know anything. This is crazy. Danny, let yourself go. George! All right, all right, all right. Little Consuelo went up to heaven, yielded up the ghost, joined the choir, invisible. Is that what you want to know, Scarby? You want us to go on, boss? This guy's beginning to talk out of his ears. Uh, no, leave him alone. Do listen to me, Valentine. Yeah, yeah, you're coming over fine. You know where Consuelo is, but you won't talk. Okay. But I'm going to be hip to everything you do from now on. You get the swing of it? Yeah. Come on, Danny. Don't move, George. I'll try to get over to you. That might be a little awkward, Brooksy, tied to that chair. I think I can make it of brave boys. Oh, darling. Oh, I'll have you out of this in a minute. While you take care of Mr. Eidlitz, I'll call Lieutenant Riley. Yeah, but what about you, George? Me? I'm just a big snoop, a little old Paul Pry. Oh, darling, how can you joke Body, when you're... body, who's got the body? And why? Valentine, when I got the message that you were here at the funeral parlor, I quivered like a bird. Hmm. I said to myself, oh, no, 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 it couldn't be. But then again, it might. Oh, shame on you, Lieutenant. You know you don't mean that. Even though I look it, I'm not quite ready for Mr. Eidlitz's back room. It would take you, chum boy, to come up with a capering corpse. But look here. Naturally, we're going to do everything we can to find who stole the girl's body. But now, what else is on your mind? Murder. Oh, what? Now, wait a minute. Just look at what we've got on our hands. Somebody waltzes in the back door and trips out with a corpse. A notorious hoodlum comes to claim it so he can bury it next to his dear mother. A typical Valentine shindig. The girl in question comes from a wealthy Mexican family and is presumably married to said mug, giving a false name. And she's supposed to be going to college all the yeah. time. Yeah. And finally, this death certificate. What do you mean, finally? We've looked at it enough. The doctor who wrote this hasn't been around for a few days. In fact, not since the morning after the girl died. Well, the man's got a right to get out of town on a case or to go to a convention or something. And not leave any word? I will skip that. Now, how's this for the neatest trick of the week? The certificate is dated January 4th. Well, last visit, it says, January 5th. 
the day after Consuela died. Well, that's right. Well, it might have been a slip of the pen. Or a mistake, Lieutenant. Purposely made to draw attention to this certificate. To say there's something screwy about it. Well, I know this is going to hurt. But just what are you driving at? Let's go looking for Dr. Elwood Dryden. Uphill, downhill, and all around the mulberry bush. <laughs> Oh, uh, here we go. Especially in and about the canyons near Cliff Briar College for wealthy young ladies. Lieutenant! Yeah. Quick! Over here! We found something! Come on, this may be it. Yeah. Take it easy. Look out there. Oh, that car must have jumped the side road right down into this gully. Get the door open there. Hey. Good and dead, all right. Go ahead, Joe. Well, there's not much left of the car. George, look. It's got a medical license. Plate. All right, Brady. Let me get in there. Okay, Lieutenant. Better send for a tow car. Oh, holy smoke. Uh, you were right, Valentine. Yeah. The identification tag says Elwood Dryden, M.D. Uh -huh. A very convincing picture of an accident, except for that little hole in his head. Powder burns. Fired at close range. Well, then you were right about it being murder, George. Okay, okay. You call the shot, Valentine. Now let me see if I can match you. Yeah? Somebody made the doc sign a phony death certificate at the point of a gun so there wouldn't be an autopsy on the girl. Then they let him have it. Yep, that's the way I see it, too. But if that's the case, there were two murders. Uh-huh. A double header. <laughs> Return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about modern methods. Not so many years ago, the problem of lubricating your car's engine was fairly simple. Nearly any straight mineral oil would do the job well and economically. But today, nearly every car on the road needs a specially compounded motor oil. Otherwise, engine efficiency would drop way down and repair bills would stop piling up. And that's where RPM motor oil comes in. Perfected by engineers at Standard of California, RPM assures longer engine life, cuts repair bills to the bone. Its chemical compounds prevent rust from attacking the interior of your engine. They fight off carbon and lacquer trouble, put a stop to corrosion, prevent crankcase foaming. Perhaps most important of all, RPM sticks to engine hot spots left bare and exposed to wear by ordinary motor oils. And wherever you drive in the West, you're never far from a fresh supply of engine-saving, money-saving RPM motor oil. Get RPM tomorrow. Get it at independent Chevron gas stations and at standard stations where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. And now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Reluctantly, you take the job of escorting the corpse of a young woman to her wealthy family in Mexico City. But the body is stolen. Two gangsters work you over. And the doctor who signed the death certificate is found murdered. In his place, you'd probably describe these homicidal shenanigans just as George Valentine did. A double header. Yes, and also find yourself in the room of the late Consuelo Bonales at Cliffbriar College. Brooksy, if we're going to believe Senorita Benales lived in this room, we'll also have to believe she was using someone else's fingers. What's that, George? These fingerprints we got off that silver hairbrush don't match the ones on this passport. Well, still, the picture here goes with the girl in the funeral parlor. Mr. Idlitz identified. Well, you can substitute a different picture, but you can't change fingerprints. But why the melodramatic masquerade? Why should another girl take Consuelo's place and end up on a slab in a mortuary? And where's Consuelo? <laughs> hey, one thing at a time, Angel. But you're right. The big thing is why. Why a wealthy and beautiful young lady from Mexico would let anyone else fill her nylons? Well, we could kick that one around for days and not get anywhere. Well, suppose we get a jump on the wild goose season. Hmm? Beat it down to headquarters and make it like Matahari with the boys in the fingerprint division. See if there's anything in the files that will give us a name to go with the prints. Oh, uh, Mr. Valentine, Dean Stoner told me that you were up here and wanted to see me. Oh, yeah, just a few questions, Miss Burdick. Take care of that little matter, will you, Brooksy? Oh, I'm on my way. Now, uh, would you know, Miss Burdick, when Dr. Dryden filled out that death certificate? Why, the night Consuelo died. The Department of Health got it in the mail the next morning. Mm -hmm. According to Lieutenant Riley, when you walked in, you found Miss Bonales dead. That's right. 
I saw the light and wondered why she was up so late. First, I thought she'd taken an overdose of her pills. Pills? What pills? She suffered terribly from migraine headaches, and Dr. Dryden was prescribing for her. Oh, I see. Those are the pills in that bottle on her night table. But Dr. Dryden decided differently, huh? Cerebral hemorrhage. Uh, just one more question, Miss Burdick. Uh, what sort of girl was Consuela? Mr. Valentine, all our students are supposed to be paragons of virtue. Genteel young ladies from the best of families. <laughs> but off the record. Off the record, Consuelo was a paragon of everything but virtue back in Mexico. Madcap heiress, beautiful and bored, that sort of thing. <laughs> Her parents expected Cliff Breyer to exert a chastening influence. But why should anyone want to make off of the poor girl's body? What is this all about, Mr. Valentine? <laughs> it's going to take a matter, Harry, to find that out. What's that? Oh, uh, don't mind me, Miss Burdick. Brass knuckles and a sleepless night always makes my mind wander. Yeah, Brooksy, I'm still on the phone. Well, I'm just trying to think. Now we know the Cliff Briar girl was Ginger Santos. And that's the name Consuela Benales gave that mug Scarbeck when she married him. Yeah, well, look, I'll meet you over at Max Weiner's as soon as you can get there. Well, you know, the theatrical booking agent. Yeah, so long. Yes, Ginger Santo, the Mexican dancer man. Yeah, thrown in the pokey once for dancing in an illegal gambling joint. Uh, my files here are all mixed up. I gotta tell my secretary about this. <laughs> uh, who am I kidding? Who's got a secretary? <laughs> Same old man. <laughs> wait a minute, wait. Uh, I remember. Ginger Santo, sure, especially Mexican hat dance. Now we're getting something. <laughs> Only Ginger doesn't dance around the hat. Huh? She makes with it like Sally Rand makes with the fan. Yeah, well, never mind the colorful details. Max, where is she? How can we find her? Uh, let me see. Three months ago, she was in the club reader. And uh, now I think she's dancing out around Brewster in La Casita. Good or something. boy. Uh, come to think of it, that's also a place where you can lose some money. <laughs> and I don't mean a part cheesy. Okay, Max, send me a bill for the info. Sure, I'll have my secretary do that. <laughs> there I go again. Who's got a secretary? Uh, better slip me a ten now. What a tragic waste, Miss Santos. What? I said, what a waste. You sitting here alone at the bar. Where did you come from? Why didn't you get here sooner? I take it that uh, you wouldn't scream if I joined you, Ginger. What do you think? Hey, Ginger, is this guy giving you any trouble? Yes, the kind I like. Go away, Carlos. No, wait. Get me another drink. Look, you had too many already. Reynolds wouldn't like it. You still got your dance to do. If my eyes are a little bloodshot, nobody will be looking at them anyway. Besides my headache. Okay, but this is the last one. Headache? Yes, but no matter. A little excitement always cures that. And you look like the kind of man who could provide plenty. By the way, what's the man's name? Valentine. George. I mean, who are you? Oh, just say I'm a ballet domain. That means... Don't patronize me. I know what the word means. But aside from being a lover of the dance, what else can you suggest for excitement? What do you think? <laughs> I like you, Valentine George. You look like the kind who let a girl walk on the outside. In other words, a mug, a bruiser. You go for the type, don't you, Consuelo? What? Consuelo? Uh, here's your drink, Ginger. Just leave it there. What was that you just said? Well, just providing a little excitement. Tell me, how does it feel walking around with a dead girl's name? You're crazy. How does it feel to know that a guy like Bo Scarbeck is looking for you? What? You gave him Ginger Santo's name when you married him. Shut up, shut up. Is it exciting enough to know that the girl you let take your place, her body is gone? Or isn't that news to you? What's the matter? You lost all your steam? Get away from me! Stop calling me, you! <laughs> Playing it that way, huh? What right have you to talk to me that way? What's going on here? All right, everybody, quiet down. It's just a little argument. Get back to your tables. What's the matter with you, Ginger? You know I don't like things like this happening in my club. He was bothering me, Mike. Talk to him. Don't give me that. 
isn't a man you can't handle. If there were, you wouldn't admit it. Mr. Reynolds seems to know you, sister. You better talk to him, Mike. He mentioned something about eyelids. Oh? Uh-huh. How would you like to step in my office, fella? Well, when there's no choice, I never waste time arguing. Come on, Buster. Let's go see your etchings. Valentine, I get the picture. Now, let me do some talking. Go ahead. It's your deal, Reynolds. I'm a gambler, a businessman, not a murderer. I'm too smart for that. Uh-huh. The worst that can be said about me or Ginger... You mean that... Consuelo. Let me talk. The worst is that we did something to keep the other dame from being shipped to Mexico so Consuelo's folks wouldn't find out the truth. Now, Reynolds, there's more to it than that. All right. So the kid pulled a fast one on her people. Hired another girl to take her place so she could play it high, wide, and handsome on her own for a while. She's dynamite. She can't stand being cooped up without exploding. Where have you got the body of the real Ginger Santos? My boys stashed it away. But they'll see that it gets back. With a little diplomacy, things get squared again. <laughs> oh, you write a nice story, Reynolds, except for the happy ending. You seem to forget. Well, hello, Scarbick. For a while, I thought you lost my trail. Get out of my way, Valentine. I just seen her outside. She's not dead at all. You and Reynolds? Why? Oh, now, come, boys. Let's not forget social amenities. Reynolds, I want you to meet Bo Scarvick, also a very tough guy, but more important, Consuela's husband. Husband? Why, that? And, Bo, this is Mike, your successor and your wife's affection. Yeah, I know. And me even wanting to bury her next to my dear mother. Anyway, I break this guy in half. Please, but don't. I've caused enough trouble. Get away from me. Can we come in and do your charge admission? Now, just a minute. Uh, You missed the best part, Lieutenant. This is the end of the third act coming up. Is this Consuelo, George? Yep. And Mr. Reynolds, who does her body snatching. They're all yours, Lieutenant. Now, just a moment, Lieutenant. Uh, Quiet, quiet. We'll then scramble you down at headquarters. And before morning, we'll know which one of you killed Dryden and that girl. Just to make sure you're not disappointed, Lieutenant, Brooksy and I will bring Nurse Burdick along. She'll have something to say that'll quench the deal for you. All right, bring her along. Oh, uh, one minute. There's uh, something festering in my soul. What, George? Oh, uh, Scarbick, I've got something for you. Huh? Yeah. And if you like it, send Danny. You're out. Oh, uh, pretty good, Valentine. Uh, but cut it, cut it. <laughs> All unfested now. You all right back there, Miss Burdick? I'm quite comfortable, Mr. Valentine. You know, Brooksy, the irony of the answer to this whole thing is something only the murderer is going to appreciate. What do you mean, darling? Well, just think of it, Miss Burdick. Somebody forced Dr. Dryden to sign that fake death certificate. Yet he had the presence of mind to write it in such a way that it put the finger right on the killer. Yes, it is a fabulous piece of irony, isn't it? Yes, but it's going to be wasted on the lieutenant, George, when he finds out you've been keeping it all to yourself. <laughs> oh, he'll get over it. Uh-oh. Oh, the left rear tire again, George. Yeah, sounds like it. Well, may as well get prepared to go to work. Take my coat, will you, Brooksy? I'll put it on the back of the seat. Okay, George. Well, how does it look back there? Oh, not too bad. Well, I'm not changing any tire on the top of the pass. We'll have to wait till we get down. You're not going to get down, Mr. Valentine. What's that? George... The gun, she took it out of your pocket. Hey, what is this, Miss Burdick? Has this business affected your mind? Start the car, please. You know what's going to happen now? At the very top of the pass, I'm going to kill both of you. And roll the car down into the valley. And what's left, no one's going to go looking for two little bullet holes. Miss Burdick, don't be a fool. You don't turn around like that, Miss Brooks. Wouldn't you like to know why I killed those two? I know about Dr. Dryden. But what did you have against that Santos girl? Nothing. She was just a common, vulgar nobody. But her death was useful. When is murder ever useful? When it can get you all the things you've never had. I've been a nurse all my life, taking care of everybody else. And these last years, catering to those spoiled, brainless young ladies who have everything money can buy. Now, wait a minute, listen, Miss Burdick. If I explained to Lieutenant Riley you had a chance to kill us and didn't, I'm sure he'll give you a break. Sure he will. Keep driving, Mr. Valentine. Life could have been very pleasant... With the money, I would have blackmailed from Consuelo Benali. That's all zeroed out now. All right. But it was worth the risk. I knew I had to do what I did ever since I found out about the Santos girl and Consuelo changing places. You fools, can't you see? I had to get rid of the stand-in. You did. 
They'd met regularly. They met again that night, the night I killed Ginger Santos. That school nurse, I persuaded her to let me give her a routine injection. But it was the same drug she was taking in the pills for her migraine. George, we're almost at the top. Yeah, but... Now, wasn't that a clever scheme for a dowdy, unimaginative nurse? The death could either be called an overdose of sedative or murder. I made Consuelo believe I could testify I saw her poison Ginger Santos' drink at the roadhouse where... Stop the car, Mr. Valentine. Yes, and I even thought of a motive for Consuelo. Ginger was blackmailing her because she knew about the gangster husband. Have you got it all out of your system, Miss Burdick? <laughs> I had to tell someone. It was a beautiful plan, even though it didn't work. I thought of it all by myself, and I went through with it. Just as I must go through with this now. No, I don't want to do this. But I must. I must. It's... It's empty. Yes, Miss Burdick. You don't really think I would have tempted you with a loaded gun. George, you mean that Hold you... your horses, Angel. Just as soon as we deliver Miss Burdick to Riley, I'll tell you all about it. If your car takes a lot of coaxing to get started, if it's logy in traffic, if it drags on hills, then it's hardly giving you command performance. And to get this from your car, get Chevron Supreme Gasoline. Special blending agents in this premium quality gasoline command fast starts, command smooth acceleration, command the extra power that makes your car great on hills. And because high-octane Chevron Supreme is climate-tailored, you can be sure of command performance from your car in each different altitude and temperature zone wherever you drive in the West. Ask for Chevron Supreme tomorrow and enjoy motoring at its best with your car giving command performance every mile. You can get Chevron Supreme gasoline at standard stations and at independent Chevron gas stations where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. I think it was mean of you not to tell me you took the bullets out of that gun. Have you given away? Uh-uh. Darling, I was thinking. Mm. Why didn't Dr. Dryden just go ahead and sign that death certificate? There was no reason to suspect it wasn't an overdose of those pills. Oh, but that's what I meant by the irony, Angel. Well, I thought you were just making conversation. Part of your act with Miss Burdick. No, Ginger was playing her part like a trooper. Consuela's medical records said she suffered from migraines. So Ginger pretended she did, too. Well? Well, I had those pills analyzed. You see, Dr. Dryden realized there was nothing wrong with Ginger, so he was prescribing sugar pills for their psychological effect. That's what Miss Burdick didn't know. Oh. And when Dr. Dryden demanded an autopsy, she was forced to kill him. I got it. Mm. Hello? Oh, yeah, Lieutenant. What's that? Huh? Well, sure, I guess so. <laughs> it sounds okay to me. Yeah, Bye. Well, what do you know, Angel? The lieutenant came through with a job for me. Well, since when did he become a booking agent for you? Well, the Benali's family wants me to escort Consuela home once she gets her annulment and everything straightened up. Consuela, you don't say. Yeah. Mm. Mexico City, land of sunshine. Senoritas with flashing eyes. That's right. Lieutenant Riley, this is Brooksy. Yeah, well, George wants me to tell you we can't take that job. I've suddenly become allergic to hot tamales. Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Brooksy. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Jeanette Nolan as Miss Burdick, Tony Barrett as Scarbick, Barney Phillips as Reynolds... Junius Matthews as Idlitz, Peggy Weber as Consuelo, and Jack Crucian as Max. The music is composed and presented by Eddie Dunstetter, your announcer, John Heaston. 
Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. that gun away, Mr. Harper. Get in the car, do you hear? Well, we'd better do as he says, Jerry. Okay. Not in the back seat, in front. You're going to drive. And if you don't, I'll kill you. I'll kill you both. Mr. and Mrs. North, starring Alice Frost and Joseph Curtin. Listen as Pam and Jerry solve the mystery, Dead Giveaway. The theory that you can judge people by the kind of friends they have is not necessarily true. Take Pam and Jerry North, for example. They have a friend named Clara Kendall. She's not a close friend, true, but she's a friend nevertheless. So what kind of people would you say Pam and Jerry were if you judge them by dowdy, middle-aged Mrs. Kendall as she stands white-faced and trembling, talking on the telephone? But my dear Mrs. Kendall... Don't my dear Mrs. Kendall me, Dr. Cowles. Do you realize that your incompetence has endangered my life? Nonsense, Mrs. Kendall. Your brother My is... brother is insane. Mrs. Kendall. Dangerously insane. That's why I placed him in your sanitarium, Dr. Cowles. No, Mrs. Kendall, that is not why... You... I'm not going to discuss it with you any further, Doctor. Now, are you going to notify the police of Charles' escape, or aren't you? But it's not necessary to notify... Then I will. Mrs. Kendall, will you please... The fool... Philip? In here, Clara. What was that all about on the telephone? It was Dr. Cowles. Cowles? Oh, yes, the sanitarium fellow. What did he want? Not more money, I hope. Philip, Charles has escaped. Oh, no. <laughs> Not again. <laughs> you know, I, I don't think Charles likes it there. Philip. I can't say I blame him. The Middle West never appealed to me as a place This to... is no joking matter, Philip. Charles has been gone two days. He could be here in New York by now. Oh, why in the world would he want to come here? He hates me. Well, what do you expect? You have the poor old devil declared mentally irresponsible. You have him committed to an institution. Then you get control of his money. <laughs> do you think he should love you for that? My goodness, Claire, you can't have everything. Stop it, Philip, stop it. Charles is dangerous, you know that. I know nothing of the kind. The worst thing I know about him is that he slobbers when he eats. If he ever gets the chance, he'll kill me. Oh, Claire. He will. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Where's my coat? Are you going out? Yes. Where? Just out. I have an appointment. A business appointment? Oh, don't be bitter, dear. Please, Philip, don't go. Don't leave me here in this apartment alone with Charles. For oh, heaven's sake, Clara, stop being so silly. Charles isn't within a thousand miles of here. They'll find him just the way they did before, curled up, sound asleep in a haystack not two miles from the sanitarium. Now, look, I'm already late, so... What time will you be home? I'm not sure. Late, probably. Will you be here for dinner? No, I... Philip! Oh, so... <laughs> Let go of me, Clara. Clara, let go. Please, Philip, stay home with me. I'm frightened. Let go. Now, will you please... I know where you're going, Philip. I know. You're going to see her. Her? Who? Vivian. Vivian? Yes, Vivian. Vivian Ames. You didn't think I knew, did you? But I do. I know all about... You don't know anything because there's nothing to know. You're a liar. And you're a silly, suspicious, neurotic old woman. You get don't. out! Do you hear me? Get out! Yes, I hear you. Then pack your things. You keep them, Clara. You paid for them. Don't think you're ever going to come crawling back. Oh, don't worry, Clara. You haven't got that much money. <laughs> <laughs> Hello? Uh, Mrs. Kendall? Yes? Uh, this is Pam North, Mrs. Kendall. I-, I wonder if I could drop by and talk to you for a few minutes. Oh, what about? Uh, about serving with me on the finance committee of the Women's Club. Uh, I'd like to make it around four o'clock, if, if that's convenient for you. Uh, well, I'm sorry, Mrs. North, but I couldn't see you today. I... 
Mrs. Kendall. Oh, I'm I'm sorry, Mrs. North, but I thought I heard something. Um, what time did you say you wanted to see me? Well, about four o'clock. Uh, but if you can't... No, no, then... no. Four o'clock will be fine. I'd love to see you. <laughs> oh, that's awfully nice of you. Bye. Goodbye. I didn't hear anything. I couldn't have. I... I just didn't... Let... I did. Someone came in. Philip, he came back to... Philip? Is that you, Philip? No, Clara. It isn't Philip. Charles! Hello, Clara. Charles! Go on, Philip. Then what happened? Oh, nothing, darling. Clara told me to get out. I took her to word. Here I am. You didn't admit anything about us? Of course not, Vivian. Well, then, it probably isn't as serious as you think. I wouldn't be surprised if Clara's calling all over town right now, frantically trying to find you to ask you to come home. Well, it won't do her any good if she is. I'm through. Now, Phil. I am, Vivian. I mean it. For the first time in four years, I feel like a young man. You are young, darling. But you don't feel young married to a woman nearly 15 years older than you are. When she pays your way, you don't even feel like a man, young or old. All right, Philip. So you're through. Now what happens? When Clara gets a divorce, we'll be married. On what? I'll get a job. Doing what? Well, you, you sound like you think I can't get one. Oh, of course you can. You'll have to. But what kind of a job will it be? And how much will it pay? Well, how should I know? But then I'll it... tell you, Philip. Based on your business experience so far, you could make $50 a week, if you're lucky. At that rate, we could just about pay the rent on this apartment. Of course, we couldn't eat, buy any clothes. Well, or... We wouldn't have to live like this. But I like living like this. And if I can't pay for it any longer, you'll find someone who can. <laughs> I thought you loved me. I did. When you were a man. A man? Yes, Philip. That's what Clara's money made you. A smart, attractive, self-assured man. I don't care what you felt like. That's what you were. Well, now look at you. Without her money, you're nothing but a frightened little boy. I'm sorry, Philip, but there's no use kidding ourselves. No. <laughs> no, I guess not. Now, look, darling. Go back to Clara. You can. She'll take you back. I know she will. And then we no. can go on. All right, Philip. But you're being a fool. Maybe. Where are you going, sir? I'll be back. Yeah, that's right, ma'am. The candles are in 318. Oh, thank you. Here we are. Turn to your left, third apartment on your right. Thank you very much. Three sixteen, three eight. Well, that's funny. Door's open. She must be in. Mrs. Kendall. Where in the world could she be? Anybody home? <laughs> Mrs. Kendall, uh, are you here? Uh, Mrs. Kendall? <gasps> Mrs. Kendall. Mrs. Kendall! Hello? Jerry. Oh, hello, darling. Oh, Jerry, something horrible has happened. Pam, what's the matter? Over where? Clara Kendall's apartment. Uh, what is it? What's happened? Clara Kendall's been murdered. What? She's strangled, I think. I, I had an appointment with her, and when I got here, the door was open. I walked in, and I saw her lying on... Pam. Pam. Jerry. 
Darling, I just heard a noise. There's someone else in the apartment. There's someone... No! Pam! Sure, I got a pass key to the Kendall apartment, but that don't mean I can let in just any Tom, Dick, and Harry. Can't who... you get it through your head that Mrs. Kendall's been murdered? That's what you said. And something's but... happened to my wife. Here's the third floor. Come on. Look, mister, I think we ought to call the police. Oh, but I told you I've already called them. Or my secretary did. They'll be here in a minute. Now, are you going to unlock the Kendall apartment, or do I have to take okay, the Okay, buddy, okay. Let's go. This is the key. Here's 318. Open it. Okay, okay. Hurry, will you? I'm hurrying. There. Pam! There's the telephone. Pam! Hung up just like it should be. Well, come on, let's look and... Hold it. What? Listen. I don't hear anything. That's Pam. Pam! Sounds like she's in that hall closet. The key's in the door. Pam, darling. Are you all right? Just hold me for a minute, darling. Sorry. Oh. Oh, darling. I've never been so frightened in my life. What happened, sweetheart? I was talking to you. I, I heard something. I, I started to turn around. Someone grabbed me from behind and dragged me into this closet and locked me in. Did you see who it was? No. It was a man. That's all I know. Where's Clara Kendall? In, in the living room. Well, let's go in and... Jerry! Bill! Hey, what's all the excitement? Didn't Jerry tell you on the phone? I had Miss Brown call while I got over here, Pam. And uh, all Miss Brown said was for me to get to this address right away. There's been a murder, Bill. It's what? Clara Kendler, a friend of mine in the women's club. She's been strangled, Bill. I, I found her body. It it's on the couch in the living room. Well, uh, let's have a look. Uh, this way. There she is, on the couch over by the whip. Bill. Jerry. She's gone. What are you standing there looking at me like that for? You, you can see for yourself she's gone. We've got to do something. Is uh, this the couch she was on, Pam? Yes. You're sure? Of course I'm sure. You don't think I imagined it, do you? Oh, of course not, dear. Well, you, you could at least say it with a little more conviction, Jerry. Clara Kendall is dead, I tell you. And I didn't imagine it any more than I imagined that someone grabbed me and locked me in that closet. Well, let's have a look around the apartment. The telephone. I'll get it. Hello? Philip? No, this is the police. The police? Who's calling? I, I'm Vivian Ames, a, a friend of the Kendalls. What are the police doing there? What, what's happened? Well, we're not sure, Miss Ames, but we think Mrs. Kendall's been murdered. What? Oh, you... You're joking. Clara can't be dead. Oh, how do you know? Because she just walked out of my apartment not five minutes ago. That's all I can tell you, Lieutenant. What time did Mrs. Kendall arrive here at your apartment, Miss Ames? About four. That's impossible. Well, it, it might have been a little after four. It's I don't... still impossible. Damn, dear. Well, it is, Jerry. At four o'clock, Kara Kendall was lying no, on No, it. no, no. Take it easy, Pam. Oh, that must be Philip. Mrs. Kendall's husband? Yes, I, I took the liberty of calling him at his hotel after you said you were coming to talk to me. I hope I didn't do wrong. No, not at all. Oh, excuse me. Bill, that woman's lying. Oh, please. Pam. She is, Jerry. She must be. Let me handle this, Pam. Oh, Philip, this is Lieutenant Wigan. Hello, Mr. Kendall. And you know Mr. and Mrs. North. Hello, Bill. Oh, yes, hello, hello Pam. Pam. Jerry? <laughs> now, what's this wild story Vivian gave me on the telephone? Well, Pam says she saw your wife lying in the living room of your apartment strangled to death. Now, Miss Ames says your wife was here in her apartment at about the same time Pam says she saw the body. Well, obviously someone is mistaken. Or lying. Well, why should I lie about a thing? Uh, like just that? a moment, Miss Ames. Well, I assume you searched the apartment, Lieutenant? Of course. But uh, someone could have carried the body out of the apartment, uh, out the back way while I was locked in the closet. Locked in the closet? Just after Pam saw Clara's body, some man grabbed her and locked her in the closet. Uh, Mr. Kendall, Miss Ames says she called you at your hotel. Now, uh, 
Does that mean that you and your wife had a... Well, Claire and I had a quarrel, that's all. Oh, it must have been rather a serious quarrel if you moved out. Oh, but it wasn't, not really. That's... Well, that's why Clara came to see me. To see if I knew where Philip was so she could get in touch with him and then make up. And you told her where Mr. Kendall was? Yes. She said she'd call him right after she kept her date with her brother. What? Her, her brother? Well, that's where she was going when she left here. Good Lord. What's the matter, Phil? Clara must be out of her mind. To see your brother? Yes. You don't understand, Lieutenant. Charles Harper's been in a private sanitarium, a, a mental institution in the Midwest. Mm. We just found out today that he'd gone away from the place two days ago. Is he dangerous? Oh, he is to Clara. She's the one who had to have him committed. He hates her for it. Once he threatened to kill her. Then why should she make a date to meet him? I don't know. We've got to do something. Yeah, well, there's only one thing we can do. I'm going to headquarters and get out a bulletin on Harper... Uh, Jerry, you and Pam take Kendall to his apartment. Okay, Bill. And you can give me a description of your brother-in-law on the way downstairs, Kendall. All right, Lieutenant. I'm coming with you, Philip. Oh, come on, Pam. Let's... Hey, Pam, what's the matter? Darling, this is crazy. Everyone's acting as though Clara Kendall was still alive. Oh, sweetheart, isn't it barely possible that you were mistaken? Jerry, you mean you're taking Vivian Ames' word against mine, even though you've got proof that she's lying? What proof have I got? What proof? For heaven's sake, didn't you hear me when, when I told you she was? You can pull up right in front, Jerry. Right. Clara's got to be home. She she has to be. Please, Philip, you mustn't get your... But if anything happened to her, I'll never... It's her car. What? It's her car. The one right ahead of us. It's Clara's. You sure? It's just like hers. Well, let's have a look. Then maybe Clara's home. Maybe she stayed. And maybe she didn't drive her car today. But she did. She told me she was driving. It is Clara's. That's her license number. Yes, it's Clara's. And she's in it. What do you mean, Jerry? Look on the floor of the back seat. <gasps> oh, Jerry. <gasps> Clara. Clara! No, Phil, don't touch her. She's dead. Close the door. Clara. Now, look, Philip. Go up to your apartment and call Bill Wigand. Pam and I'll wait here. Oh, all right, Jerry. Uh, you'd better go with him, Miss Ames. Oh, yes. All right. You see, darling, I was right. Clara was killed up in the apartment and, and then carried down to the car while I was locked in the closet. That still doesn't jibe with Vivian Ames' story about seeing Clara after you found her. I don't care. Vivian Ames... Oh, hold it, hold it, dear. We've got company. Excuse me, but you're in my way. I want to get in my car. Your, your car? Yes, mine. Mine. It's my car. Everything she owns is mine. She? This car, her apartment, everything. It all belongs to me. She stole it from me. My money. She stole it. Now, get out of my way. I'm sorry, Mr. Harper, but How do you know my name? Well, we don't, but... You call me Mr. Harper. Why do you call me Mr. Harper if you don't know who I am? Now, look, we... You're from there, aren't you? Uh, there? That place. The sanitarium. That's where you're from. Yeah, she lied to me. She said I didn't have to go back, and I won't. I won't. Oh, take it easy, Mr. Harper. You don't... Look out, Jerry. I won't. Put that gun away, Mr. Harper. We're not Be going... Be careful, darling. Get in the car. Now, now wait a minute. Get you... in. Uh, we'd better do as he says, No, Jerry. not in there. In the front seat. You're going to drive. And if you don't, I'll kill you. <laughs> All right, I'll be right over. Thank you, Lieutenant. I mixed you a drink, darling. Here. I don't want it. Now, don't be nervous, darling. I'm not nervous. Oh, but you are. All right. All right, so I'm nervous. Why shouldn't I be? We took a big chance moving Claire's body down to the car, running the risk of Pam North spotting me as the guy who locked her in the closet. But we had to give you an alibi for the time Clara was killed, didn't we? I'm not sure we have. Pam knows you're lying about seeing Clara at four o'clock. And Jerry and Lieutenant Wagon probably know it, too. Well, they don't know anything they can prove. And that... Unless, of course, you really didn't see Clara's brother leave the apartment this afternoon. Did you see him, Charles? I told you I did. You told me a lot of things, but... But what? Oh, for heaven's sake, Philip. You know you can trust me, so why don't you be honest? 
Why don't you admit you killed Clever? Don't you ever say that again, Vivian. You understand? Don't you ever say that again. Jerry, we're going much too fast. Please, slow down. Don't talk to me, darling. You know as well as I do that the man who's really driving this car is in the back seat. And every time I try to slow down... Faster, I'll really... drive faster. You see? Uh, please, uh, Mr. Harper, we're going too fast already. This road is like a sheet of glass, Harper. Do as I say, go faster. If we ever start to skid, Harper, we'll all... Jerry, be... Jerry, we're skidding. You're telling me... Oh, stop, Jerry, stop. I can't stop at this. Jerry, we're going to... Look up, Pam. Yeah. Pam, darling, are you all right? Uh, I think so. How about you? Yeah, I'm okay. Here, let me help you out. Uh, oh, easy now. Uh, I'll be all right as soon as I stop shaking. Uh, Hopper. Darling, you may be hurt pretty badly. Look, there's a gasoline station up ahead. Get up there and get some help and then call Bill. Right. I'll stay here with Hopper. <laughs> through, please. Now, come on, folks. Stand back. Stand back. Let us through. Right, here we are, Bill. Oh, over this way, Miss Ames. Come on, Kendall. Well, you've got yourself quite a crowd here, haven't you? Yeah, everybody loves an accident, Bill. Where's Harper? On his way to the hospital. How badly was he hurt? He'll live. I hope so. At least long enough to pay for Clara's murder. But he says he didn't kill Clara. Did you talk to him? Yes, Bill, while we were waiting for the ambulance. Harper says he saw Clara just after Philip left the apartment at two this afternoon. She told him she wouldn't have him sent back to the sanitarium. And if he came back about five, she'd have a certified check for the money she took from him. He's lying. He killed Clara because he's the only one who could have killed her after she left my apartment. Uh, Miss Ames, if you saw Clara Kendall after four o'clock this afternoon, uh, why did you call her apartment? You mean when I answered the phone, Pam? Yes. Uh, called to talk to Philip. But you told us before that you knew Philip had quarreled with Clara and, and gone to a hotel. Well, I... So you knew Philip wouldn't be at the apartment, didn't you? Well, Miss Ames... All right, Lieutenant. Uh, Mrs. North wins. I, I didn't see Clara this afternoon. I just said I did to protect Philip. Philip? Well, he went back to the apartment at 3 o'clock and found Clara dead. He telephoned me. I, I went over. Charles Harper had killed her. We knew that. But Philip didn't have an alibi for the time she was killed. And well, after that stupid fight he and Clara had, I was afraid the police would think he was the murderer. So the only thing to do was move Clara's body and try to make it look as though she'd been killed later. So you're the man who grabbed Pam and locked her in the closet, huh, Phil? Yes. Well, we knew she was going to be there at four, and well, we thought we could get Clara's body out before then, but we couldn't. That's why I had to lie about Clara being my apartment. How did you know I was going to see Clara at four, Miss Ames? Well, Philip told me. Well, then Charles Harper didn't kill Clara. How do you figure that, Pam? Because Clara would have been dead when Philip went back to the apartment at three o'clock. She was? Oh, oh, no, she wasn't. She was alive. Alive enough to tell you that I was going to be there at four. She's the only one who could have told you that. Philip. Oh, you fool. Why didn't you tell me Clara had... Shut up. Shut up. It's all your fault. I didn't want Clara's money. But you did. <laughs> you did. Come on, Kendall. And you too, Miss Ames. What are you arresting me for? You'll probably be charged with being an accessory after the fact. And that's a mighty polite name for your kind of woman. Mr. North speaking. Oh, hello, it's Jerry. Oh, hello, dear. Darling, on your way home this evening, will you stop in a stationery store and buy me a bookkeeping ledger? A bookkeeping ledger? Oh, what for? I was re-elected chairman of the finance committee of the Women's Club, remember? Oh, yeah. Well, we're starting a new fiscal year, so I'll need a new ledger and a bottle of black ink. Black a... ink, huh? Well, it sounds like you did a good job of managing the club's finances. And the other thing I want... Uh, I wish you could do as well with our personal finances, dear. We've never wound up in the black at the end of the year. Jerry, dear, will you let me tell you the other thing I'll need? Uh, how, how do you account for it, Pam? Why can't you manage our money just as well as you manage your club? But I do, darling. What do you mean? That's what I'm trying to tell you. 
I'll need a bottle of red ink, too. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. Beat it, you two. I don't talk to strangers. Well, uh, we're not strangers, exactly. I- I'm Mrs. North. Beat it, I said. Well, you don't have to get tough about go it. Go on, go on. Scram and don't come back. The only place I want to see you is in the morgue. Mr. and Mrs. North, starring Joseph Curtin and Alice Frost. Listen as Pam and Jerry solve the mystery, The Death Trap. A few miles uptown from where the Norths live, in the cellar of an old brownstone apartment house, a woman sits at a table playing solitaire. Her hair is blonde, platinum blonde, and her eyes are sultry. Behind her, an anxious young man is nervously pacing the floor. You're going to wear out those shoes, Benny. Won't be the first time. What the devil is keeping Nick? Give him a chance, will you? He's got to check the whole setup before we can lift a finger. What for? Don't he think I know how to case a job? Look, Beanie, Nick don't trust anybody when it comes to a kidnapping job. It's the way he works. Careful. You like it, I suppose. I like staying out of jail. I like a meal ticket that's nice and steady, too. What's the matter with me? I'd be the best meal ticket in the world if you'd only let me. I'd give you anything you wanted, Flo. Anything. Sure. For a while, you would. For as long as you wanted me. Ah, oh, stop it, kid. You're dreaming. What are you doing? Using my head. When you get to be my age, you don't run off with the little boys that fall in love with you. You stick to somebody solid. Somebody that's been around for a long time. Like Nick. And how long are we going to go on like this? Making love behind his back. Aching to be alone together and having him put his fat paws all over Watch. you. What? <laughs> He's back. That's you, Nick? Yeah, me. Well, how'd, how'd you make out? Set up okay? Looks pretty good. Looks like you had it figured right about the old man's money, too. Well, what kept you? He was getting worried. About me or your share of the setup? Oh, don't say that, sweetie. You know you're the only guy in the world for me. Sure, I know. Got a kiss for Papa? Mm. Well, let's not stand around smooching all night. Let's get the car and put this show on the road. Car's outside, Benny. We're rolling 20 minutes. What are you carrying? Automatics. One upstairs and one on the hip. Ditch him. Huh? Ditch him, I said, and take the silencer. Uh, I don't think we'll have any trouble with this old guy, but if we have to shoot him, we better shoot him quiet. <laughs> I'm glad we decided to go to the early movie, Pam. I don't think I could have sat through the late one. Well, if I'd have known you were so tired, dear, we wouldn't have gone to the movies at all. Uh, have you got your keys? Mm-hmm. Mr. North. What's that? Oh, it's Mrs. Rowland, dear, across the hall. Mr. North, did you happen to see my husband when you came upstairs just now? Why, no, Mrs. Rowland. Is he outside? Well, I don't know where he is, Mr. North. He said he was just going down to put the car in the garage, but he left here almost an hour ago. Well, maybe he stopped off someplace on the way back. Oh, no, I'm sure he wouldn't do that. You know, he hasn't been well lately, and with all the work we've been doing these past few weeks, selling things and making arrangements, to live down in Florida. He's been getting to bed very early. Oh, I'm sure nothing's happened to him, Mrs. Rowland. It's only a few blocks from the garage. Oh. There. I'll bet that's him calling now. I hope so. Will you wait? I'll see who it is. Yes, yeah, sure. Mrs. Hello? Mrs. Rowland? Yes? Are you alone? What? Yes? Who is this? Never mind. Just listen and don't do any more talking. It's about your husband, and it's important. What? Don't talk, I said. Your husband's with me. He's been kidnapped, and as soon as we can get together on the door, we'll let him go. In the meantime, keep your mouth shut. But he's not... I told you to keep your mouth shut. Don't say a word about this to anybody, and if you call in the police, we'll kill him. No! Remember what I told you, Mrs. Rowland. Sit tight and wait for my call. I'll be in touch with you later. Hello. Hello. What's wrong? My husband... 
My husband, he's been kidnapped. <gasps> done it, Mr. North. You, you shouldn't have asked Lieutenant Wigand to come here. They warned me not to call the police. Well, you didn't call them. Jerry did. Oh, if they find out, they'll kill George. No, no, don't you worry about that, Mrs. Rowland. I was very careful about coming here, and I made sure that no one saw me. Well, what's the next move, Bill? Tracing that phone call? Well, no, you can't trace a local call, Jerry, not after it's completed. That's why I was so anxious to know when your husband left this apartment, Mrs. Rowland. Well, I, I told you as near as I could remember, Lieutenant. He left about 9.30. And the kidnappers didn't call till about 10.30. Which means that it took them almost an hour to get where they were going. If they called as soon as they got there. Oh, wouldn't you? Now, if you wanted to keep Mrs. Rowland from getting anxious and going to the police about her husband, wouldn't you call as soon as you could? Yes, I suppose so, Bill. But I still don't know what you're driving at. Well, figure it out, Pam. The call was local. The driving time was at least a, a half hour more. Uh-huh. And with a kidnapped man in the car, they wouldn't dare risk going over any big bridges. Well, this is, so what does that mean? That their hideout is probably in the Van Cortland area or, or upper Manhattan. That sounds like a good lead, Bill. Oh. Well, it's only a hunch right now, but bright and early tomorrow, my men are going to check every public phone booth from Dykeman Street up. <laughs> What are you doing, Nick? Why don't you turn the light off and let the old man get some sleep? He'll get sleep when the ransom door is in. And so will we. Well, what are you fitting him with those bandages for? You taking off the adhesive tape? I'm not taking anything off. I just want to make sure he can breathe underneath the gag. You all right, Grandpa? Sure, he's okay. Well, he don't look so good, Beanie. Maybe that thing's choking him. Oh, quit babying him, will you? You shut up. You want this old guy to croak on us? Okay, okay. I'll take it off for a while and give you a whiff of fresh air. There. You better pop. Yes. Yes, thank you. Maybe we ought to give him a drink of water. Oh, for crying out loud. Now, look, why me? Huh? Why me? Why did you have to pick an old man like me? I- I'm sick. I've worked hard all my life, and now that I've got enough money to live on for a few years, you're going to take it away from me. Oh, listen to him. I just want a little place where we can take it easy for a while and have a little fun until we die. All right, Pop, that's enough talking. We've sold everything we own. He said that was enough talking, No, I've Pop. got to tell you, because I, I don't care what happens to me anymore. If you take that money, there won't be anything left. Are you going to shut up? No, I'm going to fight you. Even if you kill me, I'm going to fight you every way I'm... you You had it coming to him. Now maybe he won't talk so much. Darling, I wish you'd tell me what you expect to gain by all this snooping around. We've been in every diner, bar room, stationery store, and soda fountain. Now, and... now, don't be discouraged, dear. We've got to cover all the public phone booths in this uptown area. Why? Bill Wagon has 30 policemen out doing this job. Well, it won't hurt to have 32. Oh, don't you see, darling? There's so much territory to be covered, and there's so little time to do it in. If anything should happen to Mr. Rowland, I'd never forgive myself. Okay, not... let's try the next one. Only if we keep going into all these bars, pretty soon I'm going to have to have a drink. Well, not in this one, dear. It doesn't look sanitary. Pam, he heard you. Cleanest spa in the town, lady. Oh, wow. I wash every one of these glasses with my lily white hands. Well, uh, we, we didn't I'm mean to... I'm not kidding you, mister. I'm a bug on killing germs. I got disinfectant all over the place. Yes, I, I smell it. It smells good, don't it? Nice and clean. I put it in the mop water all the time. Believe you me, this place, this place here, gets a good going over. Well, uh... As soon as I close up at night, I chuck all them bums out of here. I wipe off the tables with ammonia, sprinkle cockroach powder in all the corners. Mm. You, You'd be surprised at all the dirt and filth that accumulates in just one day. And if you don't do nothing about it, well, you get mice. Now, uh, what do you have to drink? We don't care for anything to drink, thank you. We're looking for some information. About a phone call that might have been made from here about uh, 10.30 last night. Do you happen to remember if anybody walked in here and used your phone about that time? A, a man with a slight accent. Oh, uh, Greek or, or Italian. Gosh, you, you got me, lady. Uh, at, uh, at 10.30 last night, we was all watching the fights on television. Wait a second. Uh, was this bird a short, stocky guy with black hair? Oh, we don't know what he looks like. We just know that he speaks with an accent. 
Well, now that you mention it, I, I think this guy did talk kind of funny, and he, uh, he, he acted kind of funny too, like, uh, like he didn't want nobody to see him, you know? No kidding. You know where we can find him? No, no, I don't even know what his name is. Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter? That guy looking in the door. You see him? He's the one I was just telling you about. The one who made the phone call? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Richard, we've got to find out who it is. Oh, excuse me. I, I didn't mean to bump into you. That's okay. You looking for someone, mister? No. Are you? Well, not exactly. Hey, where are you going? What business is it of yours? Uh, well, uh, we're strangers around here. We thought you... Sorry, lady. I'm in a hurry. Oh, wait a minute. Take your hands off me, bud, or you won't have any. Well, you don't have to get tough. Don't I? I don't like your looks, mister. Now beat it and beat it fast, or you'll wind up with a slug in you. Nick should have been back by now. It don't take this long to walk down the block and put in a phone call. What's he telling that old lady? How we want the ransom, I guess, and when to have it ready. Even so, it don't take no 40 oh, minutes. Oh, sit down, will you, Beanie? You're wearing out the floor again. What else is there to do? Want me to play nursemaid, old man Roller? You might go in there and see if he's okay. It was a pretty hard sock you gave him last night. Ah, he got over it. Yeah, he got over it. And you didn't. You're just as jumpy as you ever were. Well, well you can, that stuff. The old man had nothing to do with it. I'm, I'm jumpy on account of you. What did I do? What do you always do? Sitting there with that tight dress on, blowing smoke rings in my face. I'll, I'll jump right out of my skin if you don't put your arms around me. Don't, honey. Nick will be back in a minute. Oh, you're a great one. You say you're nuts about me when we're alone. You say I make love to you like nobody in the world, but you still won't run out on him. We need him, be For what? We'll net at least 15 Gs from this hall, and with that kind of roll, we can go anywhere we want, baby. Just the two of us, we could burn up the whole world. Oh, honey, if you get me started... Oh, don't push me away, sweetie. You know you've got a yen for me. And you know you're going away with me, too. Just as soon as we finish this job. Oh, baby, if you just wouldn't lose your head all the time. Don't worry, Flo. I'll take care of you quick. <laughs> what took you so long, Nick? I thought you were coming right back. I couldn't. I ran into trouble. What kind of trouble? With the old lady? No, oh, I didn't call the old lady. Didn't get a chance to... What are you talking about? The job. The whole job. It's no good. Somebody's on to us. Are you kidding? Sure. I'm laughing my head off. Now, get ready. Pack up some of your stuff, Flo. We're all pulling out Wait of here. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What's going on here? Try to make a phone call on Dykeman Street. You'll find out. Cops? All over the place. Asking a million questions, too, in every barroom, drugstore, and soda fountain. I almost got picked up. That don't mean nothing. Don't be a chump, kid. They're too close for comfort. We're getting out of here. What about the old man? Leave him. Let him go back to his wife. I don't care where he goes as long as we get away. Nick, you're crazy. This job is practically in the bag. All we got to do is set Stop up... Stop arguing, will you? You got to beat it, I tell you. And lose all the dough we could get from the old lady? You'll lose a lot more if we don't get a move on. Dough ain't important to us right now. No, huh? Well, it is to me the most important thing there is, and I'm going to get it, too. You'll get it in the neck if you don't do like I tell you. Put your head on and go on down and get the car. I ain't leaving the old man. Okay, then, stay. Come on, Flo, you ready? She ain't going, Nick. Huh? She ain't going. She's staying with me. What did you say? Ask her. What's this all about, Flo? What do you mean you're staying with him? Well, I didn't want to tell you this way, Nick. But if you're walking out on the job, maybe Beanie and me can swing it ourselves. I'm not talking about the job, Flo. I'm talking about us. Well? Four and a half years, Flo. Four and a half years, and you'd split up with me on account Nick. of... Get away from me, you lousy... Take it lousy. easy, Nick. Yeah, I'll take it easy, all right. I'll take it so easy. Put that gun down. It's okay, Flo. You just wanted to make it plain to me. Now I know you ain't going with me. That's him, Bill. I know it is. I'd recognize that face anywhere. Are you sure, Pam? Are you sure this is the same man you bumped into at that bar uptown? Mm-hmm. 
Because this picture was taken several years ago. It's the same man, all right. Have you got a record on him? Oh, yeah, we got a long record. His name's Hadris, Nick Hadris, alias Joe Nicholas, alias Nick Haynes. Well, if you've got a line on him, the rest ought to be easy. We know he's in that uptown area somewhere. And if you pick him up, you can make him tell you where they're holding Mr. Rowland. That's right, Bill. All you have to do is locate Nick Hadris. Well, I'm afraid that's not enough, Pam. We've located Nick already. Oh, and he won't talk? He can't talk. By the time my men got to him, he was dead. No. Murdered? Mm-hmm. They found his body on the bank of the Harlem River. I don't know why, Lieutenant. I don't know why you can't find out where their hideout is. With all the men you've got working on this case, you'd think... Well, now, we're doing the best we can, Mrs. Rowland. I... I don't know how I can make you understand that. Bill, let me talk to her. No use talking, Mrs. North. They've done something to my husband. Something must have happened to him. Otherwise, they would have called me. Almost a whole day has gone by, and they haven't even tried to reach me. Well, you did get that postcard this morning telling you how much money they wanted. And they asked you to draw it out of the bank and have it ready. I know, but that postcard was mailed last night. Mrs. Rowland, let me call the no, doctor. No, no, please, I'm all right. It's just that I keep thinking about him, if he's warm enough. They let him rest. They give him enough food. You know, there's certain things that he can't eat. Starchy things. They just don't agree with him. Well, I'm sure that they'll wait. Oh, no, wait a second. Don't answer that phone yet, Mrs. Rowland. I want to switch on the recording machine and flash my boys on the line downstairs. Now, yes. if that's one of the kidnappers, keep talking as long as you possibly yes, can. Yes, we yes. may be able to trace the call. All right, you can pick up the receiver now. Hello? Mrs. Rowland? Yes? get the money in small bills like we told you on the postcard? Yes, I I went to the bank this afternoon. Okay, then get this straight. Follow these instructions and nothing will happen to your husband. Is he all right? You haven't heard him, have you? Listen, you, I'll run a knife through his back if you don't get these orders right. Now, this is your last chance, lady. All right, all right, I, I'll do anything you say. Okay, listen and listen careful, because I'm only going to say it once. Stick that money of yours in the shoebox and take the white plane subway out to the end of the line. Come alone, do you hear? After you get off the subway, go two blocks north and one block west. Wait there on the corner for me. I'll drive by in the car at two o'clock this morning. Now, you got it? Well, Two uh... o'clock sharp, end of the White Plains line. Two blocks north, one block west. But my husband, how do I know that he... Hello. Hello. No, it's no use, Mrs. Rowland. He's hung up. What about the call, Bill? Was there time to trace him? Uh, just a minute. I'll check with the boys on the other end of this line. Hello, Eddie. That tracer come through yet? Was there time? Oh, good for you. Have they got it, Bill? Do, do they know where the call came from? Yeah, but I'm afraid it won't do us much good. <gasps> this call was made from Grand Central Station. Now, look, men, this is a big job, but it's got to be done to protect Mrs. Rowland. I'm staking out this entire area around where she'll be meeting the kidnappers. Now, no cars are to be stopped, but... If anybody drives past this red line on the map after a quarter of two, nail him. If we don't catch him going in, we'll grab him going out. What are we going to do about the old man, Bean? He looks to me like he's getting ready to pass out. What do I care what he's getting ready to do? As long as his old lady shows up with that dough. You think she will? She better or there won't be nothing left of him. All right, come on, kid. Time to get ready. Ready for what? It's only 12 o'clock. You don't have to meet Mrs. Rowland until 2. Well, I'm going to change the plans around a little. Just be on the safe side in case there's cops around. She's expecting me to drive up to that corner at 2 o'clock, only uh, I'm going to fool her. I'm going to have the car parked there instead, an hour ahead of time. Hey, that's a pretty smart dodge. Mm -hmm. I got another one, too. I ain't even going to be there to pick up the dough, on account of they might be expecting me. Huh? Well, if you don't pick up the dough, how are we going to get it? That's simple. You're going to get it for me. Pam, we're going to get soap waiting out here in the rain just to see what's going to happen. Did Bill tell you we could stand on the side of the street? If we keep in close to the building, we can... We can't be seen from the corner. Well, I hope that kidnapper shows up early. I'd like to get the sober with. So would Mrs. Rowland. Is she there yet? 
Yes, she's just coming up to the corner. Where's Bill? He's down the street away. If we see anything funny going on, we're to call him. Say, there is something funny. What? That parked car over there. I never knew there was a woman sitting in it. Neither did I. She must have been slumped down in the seat or or we'd have seen her. How long do you suppose she's been there? I don't know. But I'm going to find out. Pam. Hurry, Jerry. She started the motor. Hey, wait a second. Just a minute, young lady. What's the matter? Well, that's what we'd like to know. Uh, How long have you been parked here? Just a little while. I had a dizzy spell while I was driving, so I pulled over to the side to rest for a minute. Is this your car? Of course it's my car. Who are you? Why are you asking me all these questions? Because there's a police officer down there. Police there... officer? Hey, what are you doing? Help you! Get away from that Jerry, car! Jerry! Oh, brother, she almost knocked us down. Well, oh, don't stand there, Jerry. Get Bill Wagon. Hey, Bill! Uh, that car, Bill! Go after that car! Hiya, baby. Did you get the dough? No, oh, nothing. We're hot, Beanie. Red hot. What are you talking about? That place up there was a trap. Cops were waiting for us. Cops? How did you get through them? How do you know they didn't tell you here? I don't. I just drove as fast as I could and left the car right out front. You crazy halfwit. What's the idea of leading them to me? What the devil did you come back here for? I don't know, honey. I was scared. I wanted you to help me. How can I help you if you bring the cops? I ought to bust you in the nose. Please. Shut up and get out of the way. What are you doing? Looking outside. Got to see if we can make a break for it. Anybody out there? I don't see anybody. Not yet. Wait, wait. Wait, two cops coming around the corner. Two more up the street. I told you, you shouldn't have come back here. Well, where else could I go? What could I do? Anything, anything at all but what you did. Hold it up. Hold it up in there. They got us, Beanie. They got us for good. Not me, they ain't. I still got an ace in the hole. The old man. Roland. You heard me. Go on back in the kitchen. Bring him out here. Quick. Open up, I said. Open up or we'll break right through. Get away from that door, copper. You try to bust in here and I'll kill the old man. I'll blow his head off. I'm warning you, copper, if you want the old man to live back up from that door. Get your men out of here. Don't be crazy. I haven't got a chance. Get him out, I tell you. Get him out or I start shooting. Flo, where are you? Coming. Well, you want me? Haven't you done enough already? Shut up. Mr. Rowland. Come on, copper. Quit stalling. Either you get your men out of here or I plug Roland. Now, which is it? Make up your mind. Wait. I'll wait three seconds. One. Now, look. Two. Beanie. Three. <laughs> Mr. Rowland, okay, lady. It's Beanie that ain't so good. Good heavens, what happened? Listen, no, she shot him. Shot him again and again. I'll take that gun, young lady. Go ahead. I don't need it no more. Mr. Rowland, are you all right? Here, let me help you. No, no, no. I I just want to get out of here. You will, Mr. Rowland. We'll all get out. Bill, is it all right if we take Mr. Rowland out to the car? Sure, sure. His wife must be worried sick about him. Well, we'll see you out there, Bill. Yeah. I just want to talk to this young lady for a minute before we go down to headquarters. He was no good, Copper. No good at all. Is that why you killed him? Yes, it must be. Funny thing about Beanie, he could just touch me and I'd feel like I was on fire. But he was just no good. No good at all. <laughs> We're on the front page of this morning's newspaper, Jerry. Oh, really? Does it say something about the kidnapping? Of course. Tells the whole story, dear. About the way we tracked down the first clue up in that bar room where we bumped into Nick? Well, uh, no, it, it doesn't say anything about that, dear. No? Oh, I suppose it plays up the car angle, the way we found that flow woman and tipped off the police about it. Well, uh, no, it, it doesn't say anything about that either. Oh, that's funny. Let me see that paper. No, don't be disappointed, darling. After all, they had to give the police some credit. Some credit? Well, I don't see our names mentioned at all. Oh, oh we're there, darling. Huh? Where? It, down at the bottom. Uh, see? Oh. After a harrowing experience which lasted some 32 hours, the victim, George P. Rowland, and his wife, Margaret, returned to their apartment at approximately 3 a.m. They were driven home by some neighbors across the hall. Next week, more adventure of Mr. and Mrs. North. Starring Alice Frost and Joseph Curtin. 
This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. Adventure, intrigue, mystery, romance, starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall. Together in the sultry setting of tropical Havana and the mysterious islands of the Caribbean. Bold Venture. Once again, the magic names of Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall bring you Bold Venture and a tale of mystery and intrigue. The next time I come to the bank to make a deposit, sailor, I'm going to pay somebody to stand in line for me. Yes, Slate. Well, the things a man has to go through. You'd think the bank would figure out a better way to handle their customers instead of making them wait half the morning. You picked this line. I wanted to get in the next one. But no, you had a system. Stand in back of a filly with the slimmest ankles because they move. How was I supposed to know she's been saving pennies for 20 years? What are you pushing me for? The teller's waving to you. You're next. Oh. Good morning, Philippe. One of these, Senor Shannon. You wish change for the parking meter again today? We wish to deposit $14 today, Philippe. I do not believe. Is it yoke? Show him, Slate. Yeah. Here. 14 bucks. Come on, come on, Philippe. I got things to do. Still, I do not believe. Still, is it yoke? Two deposits on consecutive days. This has not happened with you before, Senor. What are you talking about, Philippe? Uh, I was just surprised, that's all. Yesterday, a deposit of $1,000. What? What $1,000? Senor, I received the transaction myself. A man came, gave me $1,000, and a deposit slip made out to your account. As is shown here, enter on your record. He was a short man, wasn't he? With wings and a wand and pointed ears. A tall man. What struck me immediately was his lack of wings and wand. Now, if you please, I will enter the $1,000 in your passbook. Gracias, señor. Let's get out of here, sailor, before this whole joint goes up in a puff of smoke. Mario. Mario, open up. Come on, kid, open up. It's Johnny. Been asleep, kid? No. No, I, I had no sleep. Well, I brought us something to eat. Here's a couple of sandwiches and a can of soup. No, I, I have no hunger. You're a growing boy, kid. You've got to eat. Come on. I'll heat up the soup. Johnny, you say to me you are my amigo, my friend. I am, kid. I'm your good friend. Maybe the only friend you've got. Why you bring me to this port, Marielle? Make me live in shadows? Make me to walk at your side like a dog? That's a fair question, kid. Then answer me. If I brought you into Havana in the bright sunlight, they'd machine gun you on sight. Like they did your father before you. I'm not afraid of them. Let them know I'm here. Let them know I've come to avenge my father, to finish his work. Look, Mario, your old man died in the gutter at my feet. He was my friend. His dying bought me a byline. It was the first one I ever had. Political figure assassinated. Eyewitness account by Johnny Thomas. I contacted Shannon, Mario. He'll get you into Havana in the still of the night. You spoke with him? Well, no. I just watched his mouth drop open at the bank when the teller told him that he had a thousand dollars that he never had before. He knew your father. He loved him. A thousand bucks? (laughs) That makes the heart grow fonder. 
So let's eat, kid. I'm starved. Let's ask King Moses if he sees it, too. Uh, he won't see it. I know he won't, but let's try. King, King, come here for a minute. Yes, Miss Saylor. What is it I can do for you? Take this bank book. All right, now open it. Very good. Now look on the last line on page one. What do you see? If you would have come to King Moses, I would have gotten the money for you somehow. I am your friend, and I will come to visit you often and play my guitar to you. I will get it. Shannon's place. What? Mr. Shannon, please. Oh, yes, Mr. Shannon is here. It is for you, Mr. Shannon. A long-distance call. Oh, that Queenie, I told her not to call me. I'd call her. Give me the phone. Hello, Queenie. You got your thousand, didn't you, Shannon? Oh, who is this? I'll tell you tonight. You want to earn that grand, Shannon? I've got an idea you do. All right. Tell me how. Just take a walk tonight. Main Monument. About 11. Goodbye, Shannon. The Main Monument by Tropic Moonlight Slate. Monumental, isn't it? You noticed it too, huh? Hey, maybe this will be our guy, sailor. You better be. How long can you wait for someone who slips you a thousand bucks? Hmm. You think uh, all your life would be overplaying it? Would you happen to be looking for two suddenly rich people, mister? I would. The money makes a happy bulge in your pocket, doesn't it, Shannon? Mine, too. Who do we have to kill for it, mister? And uh, will you issue the gats? <laughs> this will be the easiest bundle that you ever made, Mr. Val. You know our names? You give us money. The bank opens at nine. Be there. You can have back your grand. Let's go, sailor. Now, listen to me. I'm Johnny Thomas. I scribble for the papers. Maybe you've seen my stuff right next to the comics? Oh, I have. Good, too. That's why you shower bills on us? Because you found someone who reads you? Because I want you to get a kid into Havana. A kid by the name of Mario Carrara. Carrara. The name register? Carrara. Mm, Carrara. Hey, a man by that name was murdered a while back. A man I liked, admired. Mario's his son. He's at Mariel waiting for you. Pier 12. Do it for two grand and a man you liked. At four this morning? I got the kid out of Havana so he wouldn't die too. What makes him want to go back? Because he figures he's got a mission, you know, a grail. Sometimes that happens to a good kid. Duck, sailor, duck. Get, get the kid, shut. Get, uh... They killed him, Slate. They shot him down. Yeah. Yeah, that's what they did, sailor. That makes two dead. Maybe we can keep a third one alive. Into my office, senorita. Senor. Now look, Inspector LaSalle. I have been looking. I look at you, I look at Senor Shannon. What I see is invisible, nevertheless there. Violence. The shadow of a dead man's body. Por favor, in. What did you drag us down here for, LaSalle? We told you what happened. We didn't miss a detail. Johnny Thomas phoned me and said... What is Senor Thomas to you? He deposited a thousand bucks in my bank account. Because he is sending you through correspondence school, eh? Because he wanted Slate to do a favor for him. All favors that cost a thousand dollars or over can be illegal. This I had to write 100 times upon the blackboard when I went to the police academy. Why don't you stop pinching your own cheeks and listen to us? I put both palms upon the desk. I smile kindly. I lean forward slightly and I ask you a question. I say please and I ask. Please. How did the name of Mario Carrara intrude into your conversation with Senor Thomas? Please. Let's not get childish, LaSalle. You know as much about Mario as I do. You know his background. You know who his father was. And if I remember correctly, you liked his father as much as I did. Senor, we of the police are never mixed with politics. 
The axiom is the one concerning the keeping of the clean nose. I permit myself no opinion. Opinion or not, LaSalle, you'd better face it. There are political gangsters in Havana like there are any place else. Mario's father was a good man. You're not giving him credit, sailor. He was a lot better than that. Otto Carrada was assassinated. Havana wept for him, which included me. And the murder of Johnny Thomas is something else to weep about. Because it's all part of the same thing. I will tell you something, Senor Shannon. You are Americano. You are here in Cuba by the grace of my government. You will not meddle in matters political. To me, it's not a matter political. As far as I'm concerned, two men died. Two good men. They were murdered. That's something to meddle in. You want to tell me anything else, LaSalle? No? Wave goodbye to the inspector, sailor. You sure Thomas said Pier 12, State? Yeah. The machine gun jotted it down for me. We've been waiting here on the Bold Venture for over an hour. Look, it's it's almost dawn. I don't look for anything but the kids, sailor. At dawn, we can see any time. I'm not so sure. This could be our last one. Maybe I ought to go into Marielle and try to find him. Maybe the kid overslept. Maybe he's dancing somewhere. No, Slate. We wait here. If you went looking for him, the boy might get hurt. You might get hurt. Yeah. Well, maybe I better keep it the way they wanted it. Hey, look, sailor, that power boat is circling in toward us. Maybe the boy's on it. Maybe he's... Ahoy! Bull Venture! Ahoy! Yeah? Hold out your hands, Shannon. I've got a package for you. Catch! Got it! Open it, Shannon. And hold it close. It will break your heart. What's in it, Slate? A hat. The initials M.C. Mario Carrada? You think it's his hat? I don't know, sailor, but this... This blood, it's still wet. Throw it away, Slate. I don't want to look at it. Yeah. Let's get out of here. I don't think Mario's going to keep our appointment. stars Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, and the second act of our story. Mr. Slate, Lady Sailor, they go to the bank to deposit fourteen dollar to fill the blank. At the window they get a gratuity, a thousand dollar community property. To earn the money is a very small matter. To bring to Havana a person unknown grata. They sail to the port and wait for the boy. But he hot with blood make tears no joy. You're right, King. It makes tears. Carrado was a fine old man. They cut him down in a busy street. The tourists gathered round to watch him die. Now his son. Guy yells, here, catch. He throws me a hat soaked with a boy's blood. Do not try to bring back a dead boy, Mr. Slate. It will only give you more anguish. Who says he's dead? If he is or if he isn't, King's right. Leave it alone. Tell me how I do that, sailor, because I'd like to know. I really would. Give it to the police, to LaSalle. You still haven't told me how it'll leave me alone. (sighs) Yeah, that's how it always is with you, isn't it, Slate? How it's always going to be. So I can get up in the morning and shake hands with myself and say, How do you do, Slate Shannon? Glad to meet you. King said it, Slate. How will you bring a boy back from the dead? What's with you and King? You dead happy? I'm going to look for Mario Carrada. Don't wait up for me, you two. I couldn't take it. (laughs) 
How do you feel, Mario? Mario? I, I have a thirst. The, the blood I have lost. You return to Cuba. I cannot permit this. Did Water. Slate Shannon bring you back here to Mariel? No, senor. Is that... You will not speak Spanish. You will forget even the language of this country. Else you will die. Comprende? Comprende? Yes. Yes, you understand. Now, Mario, you came to Havana to avenge your father's killing. To kill me? No. No, no, it's not so. It is so. Slate Shannon. What plot have you made with him? Nothing. I, I swear it on, on my father, I swear. Permit me but a sip of water. You see, oh. of course. <laughs> you are a good boy now, Mario. You have forgotten how to speak Spanish. Huh? I like you. I will give you the water. If you tell... What the Spanish word is for water? The word, Mario. What is the word? For the water, the word. Agua. You remember the Spanish word. Suffer a little more until you forget. Perhaps until you die. down, Senor Shannon. You look quite pale, quite worn. Yeah. I am, LaSalle. The only other time I have seen you so is the time when we picked you up after an all-night clam bake, because you were cracking the clams too loud. <laughs> yeah, I remember. Yeah, that was quite a party. One of the clams bit back. I was looking for Mario Carrada. Every place I know. Everyone who knew him. He's not there. Nobody knows him. I told you before, senor. Before, I was supposed to pick him up in Mariel. Before, it was a big political secret you wanted no part of, remember? This I have been trying to tell you. I still have no part of it. You have been friendly. Goodbye, senor. Not even if he's dead, maybe. Murdered, maybe. Why do you say such a thing, senor? Why? Come in. Senor Juan Miguel... To what do I owe your presence? Sambi LaSalle, it is that I have come for Mario Carrada. So? This man also wants him, Senor Miguel. This man, Slate Shannon. Just for the record, Senor Miguel. What do you want, Mario? To uh, make amend to him for the dying of his father? To welcome with open arm the boy to Havana? To convince him that I did not murder the splendid man who gave him birth? But you were acquitted of this charge, Senor. They said you were innocent. Ah, uh, see, but in the eyes of the boy, I want to read my innocence in his eyes. I'm just scratching, McGill. I, I don't know if the boy is dead. Maybe you'd know, being so close to his father and all. I advise, senor, let me look for the boy. Then perhaps you will live to welcome him into my arms. Adios, senores. Adios. Hmm. Juan McGill... Thumb through his biography for me, LaSalle. Oh, he is an honored man in Havana, senor. He was the political enemy of Horta Carrada, but as you heard... He's... Permit me, is this where it is to register for a room? Single or double? Single would be pleasant. I can give you room 2B right down the hall. Hot and cold running water. And a stall shower which you can squeeze into with the jet in 2C. And if you stand on the bed, you can see the ocean. Room 2B will be very pleasant. Well, there's the pen right in front of you. Just sign the register. Gracias. I am sure that I will enjoy it here. Hey, you write pretty big, don't you? Took up three lines on the register. So that you can read my name and address? I'm afraid you'll have to carry the baggage yourself because... This baggage I always carry myself. We charge for guns according to their caliber. What is that, uh, 32? Well, that'll be 50 This cents. gun does not frighten you? Even when I release the safety catch? All right, I'm frightened. And I'm curious. What do you want? To do you a favor... To take you to Mario Carrada. 
Move, senorita, or you will see him through sightless eyes. What do you mean, sailor's not here, King? She's supposed to be working the desk. Did she tell you where she was going? No, Mr. Slit. I was shopping for the kitchen the whole time. I have no idea what idea came to Miss Saylor. Yeah, she and her girlish whims. Why does she do things like that? If it will make you feel any better, Mr. Slate, we got a new guest. It says here in the register. A gentleman from Marielle. Marielle? That's where I was supposed to pick up Mario. Let's see that register. Juan McGill. I wonder what he's doing here in my hotel. He's registered for room 2B, Mr. Slate. Why don't we ask him? Yeah, why don't we? Come on, King. Senor Miguel. Senor. Give me the pass key, King. Huh. He's not in. Hmm. Hasn't been either from the looks of the room. Just the way I left it when I made it up. The way he wrote his name in the book so no one could miss it. And his address in Marielle. And the fact that Miss Salo is suddenly not among us. I will make you a thermos of something hot, Mr. Slate. You will want it for the boat trip to Marielle. Miguel! Hey, Miguel! Who is? Slate Shannon. Open up. Hey, where... It was behind your back, Shannon. Try real hard, Slate. Open your eyes. Uh, Come on, one more try and you'll make it. Uh, yeah. Don't try to move your arms. They're in back of you and they're tied. Your legs, too. We make neat bundles. Uh. Where are we, sailor? What is this? I can give you a vivid description. We're in the only fish cannery in the port of Marielle, and we're tied up after hours. What are they going to do to us? Can us? I've been sitting here looking at you for the last couple of hours, wondering how you look filleted. I don't think you look good. Never pass inspection. When Miguel took you away, did he introduce you to Mario? Mario's over there. Dead. Shot. Oh. Miguel? Yeah. First he gave Mario a speech on politics. Then he shot him. Miguel's saving us for the ocean, huh? Because we're not Cuban. He doesn't want to be connected with any murdered Americans. Hmm. Fish cannery, huh? What makes you so dreamy about a fish cannery? Just about a conveyor belt. You see that switch? Mm Mm-hmm. It says off. Well, ease over to it. I'll try. Yeah, that's it. Now, it's right in back of you. Now, reach up. A little higher. Can you make it? I'm trying. It hurts. It's an awfully cold ocean, sailor. Reach. Did you bring a fish to can, or did you just come here for the ride? I'm going to try to use the edge of this conveyor belt for a knife. Slate, be careful. That thing can cut right through your hand. (laughs) Yeah, I'll keep it in mind. Yeah, I made it, sailor. Wait a second, I'll untie my feet. Okay, sir. Hey, did you turn off that switch? No, Slate. He did. With one hand, Shannon. I needed the other to hold the gun. You disappointed me. I thought that you would die without a struggle, a clean death. Don't let it worry you. <coughs> Duck, sailor. You or me, Miguel. Stupid, oh, stupid, oh. Uh, now, now pull that trigger and you'll blow your heart out. <coughs> pull it. Go ahead. Huh, you just temporarily saved your own life, Miguel. When are you going to stop fooling around and untie me? (laughs) Yeah, I like you better this way. Come on, Slate. 
These cords are cutting into my ankles. And I'd be a fool to let anything happen to those ankles. Hand them up to me, sailor, then I'll take you home. Slate, it came. What did? The reward. What are you talking about? What reward? For capturing a criminal. Don't you remember? The owner of the cannery said he was going to send us a reward because he got so much favorable publicity. People are eating his tuna like crazy. He's a lucky fellow. What's he send us? Tuna, shredded, grated, filleted, breast of, and creamed. A dozen cans of each. That's a real genuine reward, all right. I've got a reward for you, too. (laughs) <laughs> because I was so brave and swashbuckling? Because you were so nice about my ankles. You really like them, huh? Better than canned tuna. What's the reward? Come here. Like that? Figure out a way to can that stuff, sailor. I'm a hungry man. <laughs> And so our two stars, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, have brought to a close our latest Bold Venture story. Special music was composed and conducted by David Rose. May we invite you to listen again next week at this time for another exciting adventure starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall together in Bold Venture. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell means mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. You want Mr. Wolf to what? Mr. Wolf will do nothing of the sort, Archie. Mr. Wolf is thirsty. Hold on for a moment. Uh, the bottle opener is in the left hand drawer of your desk. Thank you, Archie. Mr. Wolf, I've got a man named Denby on the phone. He wants you to umpire a card game. The man is insane. He's offering a fee. The answer is no. I know nothing of card games, nor do I wish to learn. Okay. Well, the answer's no, Mr. Denby. Sure, I'll ask him again. After he finishes the beer he's working on. Goodbye. People appall me. The fantasies they indulge in. Bah, what on earth made that maniac think I might consent to preside at a card game? Well, seems he expects one of the players to be deaf. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the bulkiest, balkiest, smartest, and most unpredictable detective in the world. That chair-born genius, Nero Wolf, Created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. not attend, but the card game went on anyway. At the home of a Mr. Stephen Denby. Well. Jean? Yes? The custom? Mr. Piper? Hmm? I think we're ready to begin, eh? I'm ready. Yes, Jean. You always are. How I like that remark. I'll have to decide later on. Yeah, please do. The custom? It's all right with me. And Mr. Piper? I, uh, I brought a deck. No, as host, I shall supply the cards. Uh, before we play, I examine them, yes? Of course. Here you are. Chuck. Here, yeah, Mr. Denby. You will remain outside the door until called. No one is to enter this room under any circumstances. Got it. Lucasta? The cards look all right. Thank you. Now then, 
Shall we make things absolutely clear? You mean, should you make a speech? I don't mind. But uh, make it short, huh? I shall. The four of us seated at this table are joint owners of the Candy Club, a rather successful institution devoted to the sale of food, liquor, entertainment... And the gambling. And games of chance. For some time now, we have all resented sharing the profits. Some of us have attempted to buy out the others. Uh, Denby, you needn't babble on. No one wants to sell. We know that. True, true, Mr. Piper. Which is the reason for this little game of cards? One hand shall be dealt to each of us. A hand at poker. Whoever wins gets the club. The others retire as gracefully as they can. Agreed? That's why uh, yes, we... agreed. Very well. The cards are shuffled. I'll place them in the center of the table. Bacasto... Would you like to... I cut. Good. If nobody minds, I'll cut them too. After Mr. McCastle. Nobody minds. Happy now, Mr. Piper? Let's get going, huh? Very well. Unless Jean would care to... Oh, We're all crooks here, which sort of cancels out any funny business with a card. Very well. We shall all draw a card in turn until five cards are drawn by each player. Shall we start, Jean? Sure. Gasto? Okay. Mr. Piper? Yes, of course. And myself. We just keep going in rotation. This is fun. Fun? No, no. There's too much money which rides on these cards. That's what makes it fun. Uh, would you mind keeping quiet? I'm nervous. We all are, one way or another. I think we all have our five cards now. We all got them. Very well, then. In the same order that the cards were dealt. Jean? A pair of threes. Lucasto? Nothing. Mr. Piper? Kings. Two. The light! Piper. No, well, what? <laughs> Hey, I don't like the same stuff, eh, mister, but will you take your elbow out of my back? I'd be delighted to, Mr. Goodwin, but it's not my elbow. I don't care if it's your tibia maximus. Just take it away. Chuck wouldn't like that. Well, we have company. Mind if I look around? Keep uh, right on walking, pal. Well, that would be Chuck behind me, huh? And you are... Uh, my name is Denby. You may remember it. Oh, yeah, yeah. You phoned a couple of hours ago about, about a card game. Now, look, just what is your boy poking in my back? I think it's a 38. You're not sure? It might be a 45. Chuck, is it loaded? Make a funny move, pal, and you'll find out the hard way. Yo, wait a minute. It's just a passing curiosity. Uh, where are we going? My car. Get in. If you insist. I guess you do. Okay. I'll drive, Chuck. Car bulletproof? No, it's hardly necessary. Chuck shoots first. Well, it's a saving, I guess. The only thing is, I uh, I hadn't figured on taking a ride. I told Mr. Wolf I was going for a walk. He disapproved. You're but... going for a ride. Isn't that a little corny? No, there's a minor difference. Usually, the uh, guest, shall we say, is killed at the conclusion of the ride. In this Let's case, let's not make the difference too minor. Huh? You will survive the ride. It's what comes afterwards that might kill you. You see, Mr. Goodwin, my friends and I have a little mystery to solve. You want me to solve it? No. We want Mr. Wolf to solve it. In order to do so, he must leave his house and come to mine. He has to in order to find the solution quickly. Why? Why? Neither my friends nor myself have any desire to improve our acquaintance with the police. Therefore, we want the mystery solved before the police are even called in. Hence our need for Mr. Wolf. Hence our detaining you. Detaining is a pretty word in the circumstances. Now, this is my home, Mr. Goodwin. Oh, well, I don't like the architecture. I think I'll stay out. Get going, pal. On second thought... Mr. Denby, what makes you think Mr. Wolf is going to leave his house and come here? You. Unless he does so, he will lose you. Forever. 
The door, Chuck. Okay. Mr. Goodwin, may I introduce you to my associates in business and in poker? To your right, Mr. Lacasto, a charming but impulsive fellow. Hello. He's only the stooge. Where's the fat fellow? In time, Lacasto. The lovely lady whose back is to you is Jean. Jean something or other. She's always changing her name. Hello. Hello. And the gentleman facing you is Mr. Piper. How do you do? Uh, is he exclusive or just... Hey, he's wearing his red carnation a little low, isn't he? Over his heart. Except that's no carnation. That, Mr. Goodwin, is blood. Lifeblood. Archie. Oh, Pa, he's always taking walks. Come in. The door's unlocked. Are you? Yeah, you're Wolf. Having made a magnificent discovery, suppose you remove your hat? No, come on. I beg your pardon? Mr. Denby wants to see you. Mr. Danby can see me here. Here ain't where he wants to see you. Here, at the risk of minor monotony, is where he'll have to see me. Don't you want your boy Goodwin to keep on living? No one has ever been able to discourage him. Mr. Denby will. Ah, Archie's in custody? No, in Mr. Denby's house under a gun. I don't have to believe that. Take a look at this. Hmm, a wallet. Archie's wallet. I shall accompany you. And permit me to warn you that if Mr. Goodwin has been harmed, nothing short of murder will satisfy me. It's getting late. Wolf isn't here yet. Maybe he doesn't worry about you, Goodwin. Well, he could have been delayed. Maybe an orchid needed a pollen transfusion or something. Besides, only the good die young. Then you must be very, very good, Archie. That remark I didn't care for. We sit here and wait for the fat one, but in the meanwhile, the police... The police will come when we notify them. But they will not like the delay we make to notify them. I say we waste time. I say the fat one will not risk coming. You say entirely too much. Is that so? Maybe I kill you myself. Picasso, put that gun away. Yes, darling Archie should have a chance to live. Not long if Wolf doesn't come. Stop looking so pleased. Are you afraid to die, Archie? Yeah, well, I'm not looking forward to it. It's so final. <laughs> Besides, I didn't eat a hearty dinner. And it... Oh, the Marines have landed. Who is it? Chuck, with Meryl Wolf. Let him in. Shut the door, Chuck. Stay outside. Archie? Hello, Mr. Wolf. Oh, am I glad to see you. I regret I cannot say the same thing. But I asked you why I couldn't you stay at home instead of taking those confounded walks. I warned you it would be dangerous. Yeah, but Mr. Wolf, it wasn't the fresh air that got me. It was Denby. Mr. Wolf, I knew you wouldn't come here without some sort of pressure. I thought the method I used would be most effective. Would you really have killed Archie if I hadn't come? I would have had no choice. I would have been stuck with a witness to an unsolved murder. Suppose I cannot solve it. I should be forced to apply the same logic to two witnesses. Mm-hmm. Mr. Wolf, you really came here to save my life, huh? Nonsense. I came here for a fee, Mr. Denby. I have a check for $1,000 already made out. Clear it up. You forget. I left my home. I traveled unprotected through the streets of the city, exposed to motor accidents, to fresh air, too. You offer me $1,000. Will $2,500 do? Barely. Archie, will you take the check? Now, I presume you want me to find who killed the gentleman at the table, the one facing me, huh? His name is Mr. Piper. The name is no importance. Will you all sit at the table in the same position you were at the time of the shooting? Of course. Jean? Picasso? Good. Now for a look at the wound. Hmm. The lights, I should imagine, went out for a while when the shooting occurred. They went out. Yes. Of the three of you at the table, which one had the best motive for the murder? We all have the same motive. The club. Helpful. There was no one else in the room at the time? No one. The door? Locked. With Chuck on guard outside of it. So much for that. The windows, I notice, are closed. 
They were closed when the murder took place? They were closed. The window panes are all unbroken, which eliminates the possibility of the shot being fired from outside of them. Unless one of them was raised and lowered. That wouldn't have been possible. The windows are secured by catches. Archie, will you check that? Okay, Mr. Wolf. I shall for the moment assume that the windows are neither lying nor untrustworthy. Does anyone remember anything unusual occurring at the time of the shooting? Well, someone whispered Piper just before the shot. Indeed. You all heard that whisper? We heard it. Man's voice or woman? Well, I... I can't say, uh... Whisper doesn't reveal much of anything. The windows weren't open, Mr. Wolf. Which leads to... The uh, fact that it had to be one of us in this room. But which one, Mr. Wolf? The murder weapon. Ah, yes. Yes, yes. Has it been moved? Nobody touched it. It's laying on the floor where it was dropped. Interesting. If you look closely, you would observe two oil spots staining the rug between the revolver and the lady's chair, indicating... Uh, who sat at the right of Mr. Piper? I did. Why? Mr. Danby. Yes? If I were you, I would turn Mr. Lacasto over to the police. You are a liar. I, I... warned you about that gun, Lacasto. <laughs> Was it necessary to shoot Mr. Lacasto? In the arm, yes. He was reaching for a gun. He'll live, however, till the police take him away. What do I tell them? You could point out the angle of the wound. As you notice, Mr. Denby, the bullet entered Mr. Piper's heart from the right. Yes, so it did. Therefore, whoever sat to his right, well, that was Locasto. Archie, you have a check? I have it. We may as well leave. Uh, Mr. Wolf, you're sure Locasto shot Piper? I have indicated the evidence. The rest will be up to the jury. Come, Archie. Uh-huh. Uh, Jean. Yes, Archie. Now that my life expectancy has increased, what are you doing tomorrow night? Archie? I got a scram. Lancaster 7583. I'll be ringing your bell. Oh, Mr. Denby, you better do something about Lucasto's arm or he won't live to be executed. You see, the executioner likes them warm before he chills them. Homestead looks very nice, Mr. Wolf. Yes, Archie. You should stay in it more often. Yeah, but you never get to meet babes like Jean that way. You never get kidnapped either. Nor would I have had to leave my home in order to rescue you. Yeah, well, you earned a nice fee, fast. Indeed? You seem doubtful about it. Positive, Archie. I know. I have not as yet earned my fee. Huh? You mean Denby might not turn Lucasto over to the cops? Of course he will. The trouble is, you see, Lacasto did not murder Piper. No? <laughs> he just thought a bullet in the heart might be good for Piper's rheumatism, huh? As it happens, Piper suffered from asthma. <laughs> That's beside the point. Fine. Mr. Wolf, I'm going to take it for granted that you know who did kill Piper. I'm also going to take it for granted that you won't tell me until you're ready. But why turn Lucasto over to the police? Two reasons, Archie. First, I had no proof against the real killer. Secondly... We had to supply a scapegoat in order to be permitted to leave the Danby home. You were unarmed, helpless. Go ahead, rub it in. Nonsense. It was an interesting problem. I enjoyed it. It was, huh? Well, to me, it's still in the present tenses. Which reminds me, as old Dr. Tidmouse said, there's always a future tense. And in that future tense, Jean. No, Archie. Oh, Mr. Wolf, stop. That girl's got a love for blood that appeals to the ghoul in me. Besides, did you notice what she does to a dress? Archie, I was merely about to say that I have no objections to your dallying with the girl. Oh, I don't believe it. My ears need overhauling. I objected only to the future tense. Why not call her now? Yeah, well, I won't pretend I understand this sudden enthusiasm on your part about my love life. Probably there's some foul scheming motive at the bottom of it. But who am I to look a gift horse in the mouth? Now, let's see. Her number was, um... Lancaster, 7583, of course. <laughs> this is the most beautiful bar and grill I've ever seen, Archie. Drank, you mean? What? Uh, never mind, never mind. All right. 
Archie, did anybody tell you you were beautiful, too? Well, a girl here and there has mentioned it. Oh, were they liars? No. Nah. Tell me, Jean, how did you ever get into the gambling den racket? Because I'm a crook. Well, I suspected that, but... Uh, I want another drink. You've had enough. I want another drink, and when Jean wants another drink, no gentleman who is a gentleman... Jean, get down. Oh, let me go. I don't want to climb under the table. Don't stay on the here until the barrage stops. Ah, I guess the war's over. All right, Jean, get up. No, now I'm here. I like it. I'm going to stay here for months. And Monday. Jean, do you realize that somebody just tried to kill you? And I thought you had such a nice, honest face. No, 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 not me. Somebody out in the street. I don't know why, but Mr. Wolf will. Come on, pour yourself together and let's go see him. The nice fat man? All right, I like him. You do? Why? Because he'd make such a big corpse. <laughs> Plus Jean. What made you think I wanted her here? Well, she's one of your fans. <laughs> she thinks you'd make a lovely corpse. What was the reason for bringing her here? She was shot at. Did you expect her to be? I expected her to be killed. That's why I sent you to her. It didn't occur to you I might be killed too? It did. I was willing to take the chance. You were willing? <laughs> oh, Mr. Wolf, Jean's a little under the weather. Splendid. In vino veritas. Watch your language. I mean the people in their cups often tell the truth, a proverb of some antiquity. Who shot at you tonight, Jean? Well, I don't know. I, I didn't see. Has it occurred to you that you might just as easily have murdered Piper as not? But Lucasto killed Piper. You said so yourself. I lied. Furthermore, why the attack on you if Lucasto was the murderer? Well, I... I don't know. Did you also not know that Lucasto escaped from jail earlier this evening? You're making that up. Why should I? Mr. Denby turned him over to the police, but Lacoste managed to get away before being jailed. That's not cricket. Incidentally, Mr. Denby will be joining us at any moment. I expected you to bring Jean Archie. Therefore, with the exception of Mr. Piper, who is resting in the morgue, and Mr. Lacoste, who is at large, we shall have all the participants in the card game. With them, perhaps, we can deal a new hand, hmm? Archie? Okay. Maybe it's the morgue to tell us Piper escaped. Oh, wrong again. Come in, Mr. Denby. Mr. Wolf, I'm upset. I heard over the radio about Lucasto's escape. He'll try to kill us all. Why? Well, because we can testify that he murdered Piper. Truly. I beg your pardon? Lucasto did not kill Piper. But you said that he did. The only evidence against Lucasto was the angle of the entrance of the bullet that lodged in his heart. May I remind you of the whisper you all heard in the darkness preceding Piper's death? The whisper that said Piper? Precisely. We must assume, then, that Piper turned his body in the direction of the whisper. Therefore, the angle of the wound would be wrong for Lacoste, but the correct one for... Whoever sat opposite Piper. I sat opposite him, but that doesn't mean I killed him. Wait, you must have. Once he turned, the bullet must have come from opposite him. Only possible way. That means you, Jean. No. No, it's a frame. May I interrupt for a moment? Mr. Denby, if our present analysis is correct, it must have been you who whispered to Piper. Did you? I... I hadn't thought about it before, but... I... Denby, you're lying. No, he's not lying. Continue, Mr. Denby. Well, when the lights went out, I wanted to tell Piper something. He, he turned to me, and that's when he was shot. Archie, you've taken all this down. In my prettiest shorthand, Mr. Wolf. Good. I, I don't know why you're doing this, Denby. Maybe you think if I take the rap, you'll get the club. But remember, Lacasto's still free. He's gunning for all of us. But it'll be you. Especially you he'll want. Maybe you can talk a jury into sending me up for something I didn't do, but you won't live to gloat about Go it. Oh, shut up, Jean. You killed Piper and... Who, who's that? This is, of course, the murderer of Mr. Piper. No comments? Archie, the door, if you please. But you said I was the one who... What kind of idiocy is this? Archie, I said the door. Okay, but shall I ask him in or sock him? You will act as the situation demands. Yes, sir. But for once, I'd like to know what the situation is. Raise him, Goodwin, and keep him that way. Now back up into the living room. 
I don't back up good. My gears... You want it here? Uh, never mind. I'll strip a gear. Archie, what are you doing? Just what the situation demands, backing up. In case your knowledge of armaments has failed you, our little friend Chuck here is pointing a thirty-eight revolver at me. Won't save him from the chair. Maybe not. But it could give me quite a pain in the stomach. Chuck, what do you think you're doing? You double-crossing louse. Gentlemen, if you So please. you thought you'd run to the fat dick and pin it all on me. I'd then be... You don't know what you're talking about. We haven't even mentioned you. You sure of that, huh? Then why did Wolf phone me and tell me you were about to sing? Wolf phoned you? Yeah. Said you were getting ready to feed me to the electrician up the river. Oh, he was making a stab in the dark, Chuck. Trying to start something. That's so, Wolf. Archie, will you read Chuck your notes about Mr. Denby's statement regarding the whisper? Well, that doesn't mean... It could be misunderstood. Read me the notes, Goodwin. Here it is, I quote. When the lights went out, I wanted to tell Piper something. He turned to me and... That's all I need to hear. Chuck, you were selling me out after hiring me to knock off Piper. You dumb gunman. Now you've given Wolf what he wants, a confession. I was trying to pin it on Gene. That's what you say now. It's kind of late, though. Too late for you. No, no, no. Goodbye, Mr. Denby. Nice shooting, Chuck. Stay put, Goodwin. The rest of you, I'm leaving. The police wouldn't approve. Better let me have your gun. Huh? Wise guy. You know something? I've been thinking. Can you think? If I was to knock off you and Goodwin, me and Gene could split the club between us, and nobody would ever know who killed Piper. Very whimsical, Chuck, but if you don't mind... Archie, don't be an idiot. Well, if I have to get shot, I prefer it to happen when I'm moving forward. Archie. Okay, come and get it, Goodwin. March right up nice and easy and take it. I'm coming. <laughs> Does somebody mind telling me why I don't fall down? Ooh. I've been shot. Well, that's not the way to talk to a man who's just been... Hey, Chuck is lying down. He... Is he dead? Well, there's been a mistake. I didn't shoot him. He shot me. Archie, stop blabbering. Neither of you shot the other. As a matter of fact... I shot the Chuck. Lucasto. Lucasto, Archie? Well, I thought he escaped. No, I'm not crazy. I do not escape. The fat one, he phones the police to tell them how I'm innocent. Yes, I had the police announce the escape, however, for reasons of, uh... Should I say strategy? <laughs> Well, on account of there are no bullet holes in me, you can say whatever you like, Mr. Wolf. Thank you, Archie. That announcement helped heighten the tension our murderers were under. And then they explode. The fat one, he says to me, Locasto, wait in the next room. Watch careful. Maybe there's trouble. I watch. And now? <laughs> now there's no more trouble. <laughs> Well, the place looks a lot tidier now with all those bodies removed, huh? Indeed. Okay, I'll get I... you the bottle of beer. But first, make with an explanation. The case was crystal clear, Archie. Maybe, but I'm no crystal gazer. Sure, I know. Denby had things arranged in advance with Chuck in case anybody held a better hand than his own. Piper did. So Denby whispered to Piper after kicking the light switch and set him up for a shot by Chuck from the doorway. The angle would provide evidence against Lucasto. True. However, we had only Denby's word for it and Chuck's that the door was locked. All right. We know, but you knew before Denby and Chuck blew up. How? The oil spots on the rug, Archie? Well, they only showed the gun had bounced when the murderer threw it away. Spattered oil, very well-kept gun. They showed more than that. Where were those spots in relation to the gun? Think back, Archie. Spots in relation... Oh, Sure. They were between the gun and the door. Therefore, the gun must have been thrown from the door. Bounced twice, staining the rug before reaching its final destination. Ah, I get it now. That told you who'd fired the gun. But there wasn't proof enough, so you set up a nice atmosphere of suspicion and had the boys give each other away. <laughs> All right, Mr. Wolf, you're a genius, and uh, you may have your beer. Thank you, Archie. As for me, I'm not a genius, but I remember a phone number. <laughs> so if you'll excuse me, Mr. Wolf. You're excused, Archie. Thanks. But before you call that number, may I remind you that Jean is a girl of macabre tastes who appeals to the goo in you. <laughs> sure you may, but why bother? In order to be able to warn you that uh, <laughs> a ghoul and his money are soon parted. <laughs> Good night, Archie. 
You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program. In the cast were Gerald Moore as Archie Goodwin, and Betty Lou Gerson, Jay Novello, Howard McNear, Barney Phillips, and Bill Johnstone. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolf and Archie will bring you The Case of the Calculated Risk. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Portions of the following program are transcribed. The National Broadcasting Company presents Dick Powell as Richard Diamond. Private Detective. Roberts. Hello, Walt. Hi, Rick. The show? Not yet. Fisher is covering the service entrance. We'll go in. Hunt the horn if you spot anything. Right. We'll get out here, Otis. Get the car out of sight. Like old times, Rick. Yeah, but I don't miss them. Somebody always gets shot up. Here's another exciting half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Hand it snaps out of yourself, strolling down the great white way. Look, thanks, Bob. Uh, but just I... sending this card with your name and address. Look, friend, thank you. Hey, but Mr. I... Diamond, please. You don't know me, but I know you. You used to be a cop. I done time. That's how I know. See? Okay, okay. Heard you was a private cop. Now I came to your office to see you, but I was too early. Now look, what what is this? Please, please, you gotta take this card. I think I'm being tailed. Little men with the nasty old sledgehammers. I'll call you later. Take the card. I told you. Take that... the card here. Take it. Phone you later. Diamond Detective Agency. Mary had a little lamb. She hit it with a stick. She could have gotten 20 years. Instead, she came to Rick. Oh, are you really that good? Well, uh, I got the inside on who knocked off Cock Robin. Well, good for you. Hi, Helen. Hi. Did you just get in? Mm, yeah. Kind of late, isn't it? Oh, uh, well, I don't know. Are late on a case? A half a case. Alone? Uh, the funniest thing happened to me on the way to the office. Alone? No, I was leading patrol number three of the Brownies. I mean last night. Were you alone? Don't you want to hear what happened to me on the way to the office? I want to hear what happened to you last night. <laughs> oh, now relax, honey. I was with Walt. Honest? Honest. We played poker. If you don't believe me, stop in at the 5th precinct. Walt's hired a voodoo witch doctor to shrink his head back to normal. Well, all right. Now what happened to you on the way to the office? Oh. Well, the darndest thing. Some little guy comes out of the crowd and snaps my picture. Snaps your picture? Yeah, you know, one of those sidewalk photographers. Then he creeps up to me and gives me a card like he was passing a pound of radium and tells me to hang on to it until he calls. Said he was being tailed. Well, who was he? Who knows? He knew me all right. Well, what's on the card? Oh, uh, nothing much. Got it right here. Just a place for your name and address. Were well, you supposed to send it in and get your picture back? That's right. Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter? Well, there's something stuck in the middle of the card. Hmm. Didn't see it before. Well, Rick, hurry up. Find out what it is. Oh. Hey. Well, 
Well, stop with the mystery. What is it? Oh, it's a, it's a negative. Small negative. Oh, we couldn't have developed your picture that quickly. No, it's uh, too small to make out what it is. Hold it up to the light. Honey, I am. Just looks like a, oh, a bunch of people on a street. Oh, why don't you have a print made of it? I got a better idea. Why don't you hang up the little old phone and give my friend the frightened photographer a chance to call? I'll call you later. Brute. That's later, dear. Bye. Well, that's the way it started. I hung up the phone, turned around in my chair, and held the negative up to the light again. Couldn't see a thing that made it unusual. The more I tried to figure it out, the less sense it made. My better judgment started chuckling, but somewhere down in the middle of my stomach, a little alarm started ringing. I had that lousy feeling again, and no matter how hard I tried to talk myself out of it, I knew something was wrong. That little alarm kept sounding off, and believe me, I felt pretty foolish when I realized it was a phone. Yeah? Mr. Diamond? Oh. Been taking any more pictures? How'd you know it was me? Scientific police methods. Hunch, and I recognize your voice. Find the negative in the card? Yeah. What does it mean? Don't want to talk over the phone. Come to 222 Bleecker Street, apartment H. You want me to bring the negative? No, no, no. Hide it. If they stop you, you don't want to have it on you. If who stops me? They'll kill you, sure, if they find it on you. Well, one thing was certain. The little photographer sure knew how to get me interested. I started out of the office when I remembered he'd said to hide the negative. So, loving a good melodrama... And being the type who sits home Sundays to listen to Sam Spade, I found a piece of adhesive tape, put the negative back in the card, pulled out a desk drawer, and stuck the negative on the bottom of the drawer. Then I closed the drawer and headed for Bleecker Street, apartment H. I waited a few seconds and then gave it another try. Yeah? I'm looking for the guy who lives here. Oh, you are, huh? Yeah, short little guy, takes pictures. He does, huh? Well, your name's Einstein, isn't it? Nah. Look, I just want to see the little guy who lives here. Louie! Hey, I found some knishes in the icebox. Oh, that's swell. And somebody out here wants to see George. Some liver waste, too. Huh? Somebody wants to see George. Oh. Well, maybe it's a guy he called. Hiya. You want to see George, huh? I want to see the guy who called me. If his name's George Swell. Oh, uh, shall I let him in? Yeah. Come in. Thanks, Toto. Uh, his name's Tony. He called me Einstein before. Funny. Uh, George is in the other room, right over there. Thanks. I seen you before. Goody. Used to be a cop. Yeah? Private eye now. Hey, what the... That's George. See the one you want? Name's Diamond, ain't it? Look, dreamy. Is he sleeping one off? No, he's dead. Who killed him? I did. I helped. Okay, you helped. Uh-uh, I wouldn't, Chalmers. Yeah, I got a rod in my pocket. Had it on you all the time. <laughs> Pretty good, huh? He sees a lot of movies. Uh, I'll just take your gun, Chalmers. Be careful with the holster. I knitted it myself. Funny. Are you hungry, Chalmers? Not a bit. You, Tony? Oh, I'm starved. Put him to sleep while we have lunch, huh? Sighting Hey, now. Louie. Huh? Let's heat them knishes. I like them that way. Yeah. I hope they're potato. While the Rover boys loaded up on liverwurst and knishes, I slept it off. The one with the pug nose and the steel wool complexion called Tony had tapped me right behind the ear with his gun... And it took me a pint of blood and 15 minutes to find my way back. When I finally rolled myself into a sitting position, I lifted my sore skull and looked up at my two lovely playmates. Hey, Tony. Uh Uh-huh? You got liver waste on your chin. Oh, thank you, Louie. Oh, how you feel, Shamus? Like a lark. (laughs) He is funny, you know? Uh, We want the negative, Shamus. I don't know what you're talking about. While you was napping, we taught to join a party. It ain't here. It ain't? Nah. So we figure, seeing as how George called you, maybe you know something about it. How'd you know George called me? Oh, we hired him just as he was hanging up. He went for a gun, so we knocked him off. Where's the negative? I don't know. Maybe he's got it on him, Louie. 
Fine out, huh? Oh, still, sure, miss. <clears throat> Here's his wallet, catch. <clears throat> no, nothing else. Mm, nothing much in the wallet. Hey, here's a bunch of cards. Diamond Detective Agency. Hey, get a load of the fancy printing. Yeah, fancy. And maybe he's got it in his office. How about a Shamus? Look, you two broken down comics. Anything in my office, the termites have got dibs on. And I still don't know about a negative. Uh, Louis, shall we go over there? Yeah, we gotta find it. What about the Shamus? How long did you put him to sleep before? Fifteen minutes. Mm hmm. Yeah, 15, about 20 minutes to get to his office. Half an hour in a case of joint. 22. This time, make it an hour, huh? Hey. Right. <coughs> sure that's good for an hour? Oh, sure. But if you're worried, I'll give him another 10 minutes just to be safe. <coughs> You know, it's little things like that that can get awfully monotonous. And if you're not conditioned, sometimes you end up with a few loose bolts. Tony was a man of his word, all right. An hour and ten minutes later, I was stumbling around the room trying to comb the cobwebs out of my eyes. This also can be somewhat of a problem, especially when your eyes have come loose and rolled back in your head someplace. Well, I leaned over, shook my head a couple of times, got the eyes rolling around until I felt them drop into place, then I found my way to the phone. Sergeant Otis. Well, don't worry about it. They'll find a cure someday. Oh, no. What do you want, Diamond? Your other head. I'm going bowling. Someday, Shamus, I'm... Someday, Sergeant, you're going to find your true niche. And Ringling Brothers will have to find you a mate. Now, put the lieutenant on the phone. Do. Oh, now, what do you want? How's your head? Don't you shout at me. Well, it's your own fault. Who in the world drinks old-fashioned stingers? I do, and I'm sorry. How do you feel? Eh, numb. Take some orange juice, Tabasco, and three raw eggs. Walt, please. It's great. Makes you sick as a dog. Look, Walt, if my head is the wrong size, it's because it was beaten that way. Oh, no. Have you gotten kicked around again? I got so many walls, I look like an advertisement for puff rice. What happened this time? Get over to 222 Bleecker Street, apartment H. Why? Because I got a little old corpse for you. Oh, not today. Not today. Please. Take some orange juice, Tabasco, and three raw eggs. Oh. Oh, uh, weak mind, weak stomach. What's the police force coming to? Hello, bright eyes. Oh, can't you lower your voice a little? Well, go on in, Otis. Oh, oh sure, sure. Pelican feet needs an engraved invitation. Well, shut the door. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, no, you... <laughs> oh, what did I do? Relax, Walt, relax. You don't look so bad. I think I like you with a purple face. You said there was a corpse here. Where is it? And save the gags. A dead man is in here, laughing boy. You don't have to be nasty. Coroner should be here any minute. Huh? there's the victim. Who is he? Otis, take a look. Uh, yeah, Lieutenant. Yeah, Lieutenant, yeah, Lieutenant. His name's George Phipps. I went through some of his things while I was waiting for you. Here's his wallet. George Phipps? Uh, let me get a better look. Know him? Get out of the way, Otis. But you said... Yeah, I, I know him. Ex-con. Got sent up just about the time you went on the force. He remembered me. What do you do? Drop circulars on Sing Sing? <laughs> Otis. It wasn't that funny. Uh, yeah, Lieutenant. What? Uh, no, Lieutenant. Otis. Oh, what, Lieutenant? Shut up. The rest of the boys from Homicide finally arrived, along with the coroner, and I briefed Walt on everything that had happened up to that point. George Phipps had been shot in the back, and the boys found the slug on the other side of the room in the wall, so Walt asked for a complete report as soon as possible. Then we climbed into the squad car and went back to Walt's office. Now, what about that negative? You think it's still in your office? I don't know. I'll go over later and check. I think you can identify the two gun-ups who worked you over? Drag out the files. Well, if these two guys knew George Phipps, maybe they did time with him. Could be. One's name was Tony, huh? Well, Tony Payton did time at Sing Sing, and he sounds like your description. This looked like your boy. Let's see. Well, you little dickens, you. You win the butterscotch cake. I'm right. You certainly are. 
This guy is a sure cure for insomnia. Okay. Let's see if we can find out about the other one. Here's the report, Lieutenant. George Phipps was shot with a thirty-eight. Hey, Tony Payton put me to sleep with the end of a thirty-eight. He did, huh? Would you mind finishing the report, Sergeant? Not at all. Uh, been dead about two hours. Phipps started working for the Speedy Photo Laboratory four days ago. Has about four photographers working for them. Yeah, you know the kind. Take your picture on the street and give you a card. Yes, I know the kind. Sir. What's the address of this photo lab, Horace? Uh, down 36th Street. Walt, I'm going over to my office, see if the negative's still there. Well, you've got to identify the other mug that works you over. Oh, I don't know his name or anything else. Take an hour. Well, I'm going along. I want to see this negative. Then let's go. You want me to drive? I can make it, Sergeant. Oh, shame on you, Walt. You know he just wants to turn on the siren. <laughs> This is sure a mess. They really did a job in your office. Any negative there? No. Didn't think it would be. Swell. Now what have we got? Well, I don't know about you, but I've got an idea. You go on back to the station. I'll check with you. Where do you think you're going? To the speedy photo lab. It's not quite six. Maybe I can get there before the close. And what do you think you're going to find there? The negative's gone. Sure it is, but it was developed there. You think maybe there's a print? No, well, that picture was probably taken of somebody on the street. They don't print up those things unless somebody sends in the card. Somebody must have. So there's got to be a print. Phipps only worked for them for four days, so the picture had to be taken in that time. Yeah? Let me talk to Lieutenant Diamond. Sure, but who's there to show you how? It's for you, Walt. Oh, yeah? Nobody ever says hello. What? Oh, nothing. I mean, yeah, yeah, I got something. Uh, we just got a report on a stiff in the river. Thought you'd want to go check. Oh, sure. In the river, huh? Yeah. Anything else? No, that's all. Well, good. I'll just go rent a little old rowboat and sail merrily up and down until I find the crowd. What's the address, your hornhead? Oh, uh, 682 River Street. Thank you, Sergeant. What's the matter, Walt? Uh, I gotta go check on a homicide. Come on. It's on the way to the photo lab. I'll drop you off. <laughs> We climbed in the squad car and cut across town. In front of a small white building on 36th Street, Walt let me out and headed for the river. I went into the speedy photo lab and flashed the badge just long enough for the guy in charge to think I was a legit officer. Then I went through the list of people who had been mailed pictures in the last four days. The speedy photo lab must have been heading for a quick collapse because there were only seven names. I wrote down the addresses and started to check. The first four were strikeouts. But the fifth was good for all the bases. Yes, what can I do for you? Mr. Andrew Troop? Yes. Did you receive a picture from the speedy photo lab? Why, yes. What's this all about? May I see it? Well, I don't know. Uh, here's the badge. A policeman? Now, now, don't get excited. Everything's all right. Well, I can't help but get excited. A real live policeman. How wonderful. Oh, dandy. You see, I'm an amateur criminologist. I'll send you a magnifying glass. Now, may I see the picture? I'll get it right away. A real policeman. I may break out in a rash. He got the picture all right, along with his correspondence course from the Find a Clue Detective School. And while he explained his advanced theories on police procedure, I took a good look at the snapshot. He was, of course, the reason for the picture. He was walking along toward the camera, puffed up like a park pigeon with his eye on some popcorn. But there in the background were my two sweet skull crushers, Tony Payton and his friend. But nothing seemed wrong. They were simply walking out of a building, one on either side of a short, stocky man with a large briefcase. Is that picture a clue of some sort? Well, I don't know. Uh, do you mind if I take it with me? I'll see that you get it back. Not at all, not at all. I thought you policemen worked in pairs. Well, we, uh, we usually do, but my partner got sore and gave me back my class rank, so we're not speaking. Goodbye and thank you. I got it, Walt. I don't care what it is, I'll trade you. Otis for whatever you got. Here's the picture. Oh, this is swell. Well, now what's the matter? Two homicides in one afternoon, that's what's the matter. Hey, uh, who was the guy in the river? Worked for a brokerage firm. Disappeared four days ago with $200,000 in negotiable securities. Let's see that picture. Mm, all right. Now, here's the guy who the picture was taken of. 
Type who works in the pillow factory. Well, there's Tony Payton in the background. Mm-hmm. The gorilla next to him is his partner. I know him. That's Louis Russo. Three times Louis... What do you see? Holy, I... No wonder. No wonder what? That guy, that guy between Tony and Louis. The one in the middle, the one with the briefcase? Yeah, yeah, that's the one we just fished out of the river. Oh. Oh, then they accidentally got their pictures taken just before they killed the man with the security. Sure, Peyton evidently saw Phipps take the picture, remembered him from Sing Sing, couldn't go after him until they took care of the guy with the security. Sounds good. Phipps developed the picture and saw what he had, got scared and came to me for help. That must have been... Oh, what do you want? We located Tony Peyton. Where? Over in a broken-down hotel on 25th Street. Come on. Fisher and Robert showed the clerk Peyton's picture. And the clerk said he was registered there under another name with another guy. Fisher and Robert staked out? Uh, yeah, across the street. Uh-huh. Get the car and step on it. Uh, Lieutenant... Yeah, yeah, the siren. <laughs> Roberts parked up ahead. Pull up by him, Otis. Right. Roberts. Hello, Walt. Hi, Rick. They show? Not yet. Fisher is covering the service entrance. We'll go in. Hunk the horn once if you spot anything. Right. We'll get out here, Otis. Get the car out of sight. Yeah. Like old times, Rick. Yeah, but I don't miss them. Somebody always gets shot at. Get going, Otis. Okay. Ready, Walt? Yeah. Let's go. Clerk. Well, that's right. There's not going to be any shooting, is there? Not if we can help it. How late are you usually on? Uh, till midnight. Is there a room around here, a closet or something we can wait in? Oh, well, nothing close to the lobby. Look, if there's going to be any shooting... What about the elevator? Well, what about it? Can we turn the light off and wait in there? Well, yeah, I guess so. Good idea. That part of the lobby's dark. Wouldn't see us until they were on top of us. Well, they just live on the second floor. What if they use the stairs? They won't get that far. Come on, Walt. Oh, what do you want me to do? What you do every night. Oh, sometimes I play the radio. Okay, if I play the radio. All right, but keep it low. I sure hope there isn't going to be any shooting. Where's the light switch? That's not it. Oh, where the... Okay. Is there a stool over there? Hey, that's too loud. Hey, lady. Hey. Hey, yeah? Turn it down. Yeah. What are you doing? Getting that stool. That's it. That's a bright remark. Where's your partner? You think I better make a guess? <clears throat> I'll make it a good one. Rick, not in front of taxpayers. I'm not a cop, and this guy gave me my lumps earlier. Now, where's your partner, Tony? Someone coming in. That's Louie. Cop is Louie, Bennett! Watch Tony Walt. I'll go after Louie. Get the one. He's coming your way, Roberts. Stop, Louis. Stop. Okay. Get me to a hospital, will you? All right, all right. Sorry about the horn, but he slipped fast. Get him an ambulance. I'm going back in with Walt. Sure. My shooting. Okay, Rick? Yeah. 
Let's go, Tony. Gee, I didn't think there was going to be any shooting. Well, you never know, do you? Rick. Hmm? I'm getting a little tired of you getting your face all bruised up. You're getting a little tired. Well, you know what I mean. I worry. You worry and I ache. I'll trade you. If I could, I would. You little doll. I know you, but honey. I know. As long as we're going to give away your worry and my sore face, let's give them to someone who deserves them, hmm? Otis. Oh, he's got enough trouble of his own. Yeah. Have you ever seen those feet? There's not a shoe store in town that carries a size. Rick. It's true. He can only get one pair a year. Why only one pair? Takes four months just to lay the keel. <laughs> oh, there it is. I might as well answer it. Louis Pool Hall. <laughs> Louis Pool Hall, snooker billiards and straight pool. Now you stop that, Helen. Helen? Look, I don't know what you want, Mac, but the name's Gay too. Now don't give me that. When you picked up the phone, I heard a piano. Well, of course you heard a piano. What do you think this is? A crummy joint or something? We got high class entertainment. Anybody that runs eight straight billiards gets a free beer and a song. <laughs> oh, yeah? Well, Gertrude, would you mind telling me who does the singing? You mean you ain't heard? We got the world's greatest lyric baritone, Clyde Cat. He's crazy. <laughs> oh, no, for Pete. No, 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 Clyde. Wait a sec. I'll get him to warble a number. Hey, Clyde. Oh. Yeah, Gordy. Flex your tonsils. Sure. The bird with feathers of blue is waiting for you back in your own backyard. You'll see your castle in Spain Through your window pane Back in your own backyard Oh, you can go to the east Go to the west But someday you'll come Weary at heart Back where you started from You'll find your happiness lies Right under your eyes Back in your own backyard There, you see what I mean? Now, look, I want to speak to Rick. Don't know him, don't know him. Maybe he works in the bowling alley. But, but, but... Oh, you'll have to excuse me, Mac. My brother what runs the joint is real skinny, and some jerk just chalked up his head and is using him for a cue. <laughs> now, you wait a oh, minute. Oh, I can't, Mac. I can't. He's liable to get a concussion. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't you want me to talk to him? Well, do you really want to know? Yeah. Because I wanted you to hear exactly what you're beginning to talk like. I talk like that? Not close. Oh, now, come on. I mean it, Rick. You associate with so many of the guys that talk out of the corner of their mouth that you're beginning to pick it up. Oh, well, honey, if you're going to get square on me. Now, do you see what I mean? Honey, if you're going to get square on me. Well, all right, all right. You want a little proper diction, huh? Well, it certainly wouldn't hurt. <coughs> Darling. <laughs> oh, yes. Come closer. Oh, how nice. Oh, not that close, darling. You're fogging my glasses. Sorry. Nothing. Better. Much. Shall we? Love it. Oh, Ronnie. Oh, Cynthia. <sighs> hey, it works. i got to remember this. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Ed Begley played Lieutenant Walt Levinson. Also in the cast were Wilms Herbert, Francis Robinson, Byron Kane, Gene Bates, Tony Barrett, and Jack Crucian. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Today's show was written by Blake Edwards and directed by Russell Hughes. Portions were transcribed. Dick Powell currently may be seen in the motion picture version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. This is Eddie King inviting you to be with us when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. (laughs) 
Here's an important time change reminder for Richard Diamond fans. This is the last Richard Diamond broadcast in this time period. Beginning April 5th, you will hear Dick Powell as Richard Diamond at a new time on Wednesdays. Check your local newspapers for the exact time, and be sure to tune for Richard Diamond on Wednesdays, beginning April 5th. Next Sunday at this time, over most of these same stations, NBC will present Voices and Events, the exciting chronicle of today's happenings throughout the world. Tune here next Sunday for Voices and Events, and be sure to hear the next thrill-packed adventure in the life of Richard Diamond, one week from Wednesday, over most of these same NBC stations. Next, hear James Melton and Harvest of Stars on NBC. W. Fitch Company presents Dick Powell as Private Detective Richard Rogue. In Rogue's Gallery. Rogue speaking. Well, tonight we meet a sort of an unusual girl. Her name is Muriel, and she's quite a personality. The name of the story is Murder with Muriel. But before we get into our story, here's Jim Doyle, the man from the Fitch Company. Are you looking for a smooth shave, men? Then try Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream. It'll give you the kind of shave you want because 40 years of experience have gone into the making of this product. Fitch's No Brush contains a special skin conditioner ingredient that takes the work out of shaving. You won't have to struggle and scrape against stubborn whiskers because the skin conditioner prepares your face beforehand. It holds the whiskers up so your razor can zip them down closely and quickly. Even against the grain of a tough beard, your razor will glide swiftly, never nicking or scraping. Pitches No Brush is a boon to sensitive faces because it lubricates gently, keeping that tender skin from being irritated. After this quick, easy shave, your skin will feel cool and refreshed. Wonderfully smooth. And if you prefer a lather cream, try Fitch's Brush Cream. It forms a rich, abundant lather when applied with a brush. This lather stays moist all during the shave. Fitch's Brush Cream also contains the special skin conditioner for sensitive faces. Fitch's Brush and Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream are available in handy 25 and 50 cent sizes. For a shave you like, switch to Fitch. Thank you, Jim. Now I'd like to tell my story. Okay, here's Dick Powell as Private Detective Richard Rogue in another personally conducted tour through Rogue's Gallery. I was sitting at my junior executive type desk one day a few months ago, trying to get a studious gander at the racing form for the next day. I had planned to attend and contribute a quick 48 bucks outside to the improvement of the breed of thoroughbreds racing at the track. 48 bucks, that's uh, six across the board, eight races, six eights. That's right, uh, 48. Well, anyway, I was working on a case for an insurance company. And they had assigned a big company detective with his brains at his feet to help me. His real job was to watch me. And he did. His girl was mad at him, and he spent all his time writing torchy poetry to her. I didn't mind that. But the big goon read it to me. That made it personal. Hey, listen to this one, will you, Rogie? Oh, no, I'm busy. Can't you see, Joe? (laughs) This'll put her in her place. Listen. Gee, Cupid stupid. His dart in my heart, I trusted. Now, my heart's busted. He sent me an Aphrodite, who's awful flighty. Don't trust Cupid. He's stupid. (laughs) That's a dilly, ain't it? I'm going to send it to Rose Special Delivery. Mm. That ought to bring her right back to you with a club in her hand. Why don't you give the dame up, Joe? Oh, you don't understand, Rogie. I love her. Oh, I'm looking for Richard Rogue. Yeah? What do you want? I've got a message for you. I want to talk to you. Uh, Privately. Okay, okay. Come on in here. Uh, 
Look, I'm a busy guy today. What do you want? What's your name? I'm Joe Layton. Have you had a letter from Duke Dickerson? No. Nope. You know him, don't you? Well enough to lend him money. That answer your question? Well, he needs some dough. Tough. He still owes me. He's got some stashed in a tin box out in the valley. He wants it. He wants us to get it for him. Go on. He's planted the dough out in the valley. Yeah? Get to the point. Well, uh, he's mailed half of a map to me and the other half to you. A map showing just where the dough is buried. We're to go get it together. I get the 2500 he owes me, and you get the 100 he owes you, plus 1000 for the job. And Duke gets the rest. Okay? Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. I'll take a drive out in the valley for 1100 skins any time. But I haven't got the map yet. Well, he mailed it day before yesterday. It should be here. Well, it isn't. Drop around about noon tomorrow. Maybe it'll come in the morning mail. The Duke needs the dough pretty bad. He's got himself in a bit of a jam in Kansas City. We'll get that dough tomorrow, huh? There's something about money I like. I think maybe it's the feeling of power it gives me when the rent is paid. Anyway, this, uh, this spook shoved off, and I went back into the outer office where Joe Black was poisoned, penning some more poetry. The phone rang, and I thought twice before I answered it. It was almost six o'clock, and I had plans for that evening. But I finally gave in to its yammering. Rogue Detectives, Richard Rogue speaking. Hello, Mr. Rogue. I must see you right away. Hmm, sorry. It's a matter of life and death, Mr. Rogue. I'm afraid. What's the matter? What's your name? Muriel Scott. Please, come to the Rialto Theater. I can't be seen talking to you. I'm in the aisle seat, center aisle, three rows down from the rear of the theater, on the right-hand side of the center aisle. The seat next to mine is vacant. Please meet me there as soon as possible. Please, hurry. Okay, wait there. Who was that, Rogie? Oh, now, look, Blackie, it was private business. Why don't you run along home now and get some rest? Oh, no. The boss told me to stick with you. And that's what I'm going to do. You're tricky, you know. We don't trust you. Oh, look, I... Oh, hello. What are you doing here, Urban? Just dropped in to ask you a few questions, Rogue. Good evening, Lieutenant Urban. Hello, Blackie. Go wait in the hall. I want to talk with Rogue. Yes, sir. Oh, now, what's on your mind? You know a guy by the name of Layton? Joe Layton? Hmm. Yeah. Name sounds familiar. Why? He just left here, didn't he? Well, he's been here. What's that to you? What do you want to see you about? Well, I don't see how that could possibly affect you, old man. He came to see me on private business. That's all the talking I'm going to do. How'd you know he was here, anyway? I just took a card off him. He had your name and address on it. What did he want to see you about, Rogue? Well, he didn't mention your name. How come you to be shaking Joe Layton down? Is he pinched? No, no, he isn't in any trouble with the police, Rogie. I picked him up about a block from here a while ago. He'd been robbed and murdered. Well, this was a fine time for Joe Layton to get dead. Just when he meant 1,100 bucks to me. I went down to the morgue with Urban to look at the body. What I really went for was a quick look through his personal effects. There was no sign of half a map. That's all I wanted to know. Urban put me on the fire for a while, trying to get me to tell him all I knew about Layton, but I didn't crack, and I left about 10.30 to drive back to my office. My shadow Blackie was right behind me. When I walked into the office, the phone was ringing. Rogue Detectives, Richard Rogue speaking. Mr. Rogue, you didn't come to the theater. Oh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, Muriel. Something else came up that demanded my immediate attention. But I now. must see you right away. It's a matter of life or death. Uh, but I can't. There's, there's a $500 fee waiting here for you for just a few minutes' work. Please, Mr. Rogue. Huh? Oh, where are you? I'm at the Shady Glade Motel out in the valley. You know where it is? Oh, sure, sure. I've passed it a thousand times. Will you come right out? Please. Cabin number four. Uh... You say there's $500 waiting there for me? You got it there? Yes. Please hurry. I'm frightened to death. Well, I just had 1,100 skin shot out from under me. And I decided I couldn't afford to be too temperamental about a sure 500. So I ran down the stairs to my car and took off for the Shady Glade Motel... And the lady with the seductive voice. 
It was a long drive from my office, and I spent my time trying to figure out how I was going to get in touch with Duke Dickinson and deal myself back in on that buried treasure deal. I couldn't tell whether Blackie had managed to tail me on this trip or not. There was so much traffic on the pass. Well, uh, anyway, I pulled up at the Shady Glade and knocked at the door of cabin number four. You're Mr. Rogue? Yeah. Come in. Well, uh, get it off your chest, lady. Please, sit down. Okay, but uh, I'm in a kind of a hurry. Let's make this as brief as possible. All right. Would you care for a drink? Well, I'd love one. But look, you were tearing your hair out a half hour ago. I got here as soon as I could by breaking a few speed laws. Now, before we get social, what's the deal? I'm in trouble, Mr. Rogue. I'll take it from here, Muriel. Huh? Oh, oh, a reception committee with artillery, huh? Well, how about giving me a quick rundown on what's the deal? What do you want from me? You know a man by the name of Joe Layton? Yeah, I knew him. And I know what happened to him. You wouldn't want it to happen to you, would you? I don't insist on it. Get out of here, Muriel. I'll stay. Get into the other room. Go on. All right, Chef. All right now, Rogue. Let's get down to business. You had company today, didn't you? Layton was up to see you. That's right. Everybody seems to know that. What do you mean? Well, the cops came to see me later. Took me down for a little questioning. You see, they knew Leighton called on me, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When you shook him down for that map, you should have taken that card with my name and address off of him. And he can't think of everything. I want your half of that map, Rogue. I don't have it. Don't lie to me, Rogue. Just give me your half of the map. I don't have it. But even if I did, name me a reason why I should give it to you. Where is it? I don't have it. That's all I know. I'll give you $5,000 for it, Rogue. Huh? <laughs> Why should I sell it to you? I had to kill a man for half that map. I don't want to have to kill you unless it's absolutely necessary, Rogue. Believe me, I hope it won't come to that. Now, look, pretty boy. I don't have the letter, and killing me or keeping me here won't make you much of a score. Where is the letter? Why should I tell you? Ah, let's face it, chum. There's is it no... in your office? I haven't received it yet. It'll probably be in the morning's mail tomorrow. This is not getting anybody someplace. I'll do the worrying about that. Yeah? Well, while you're worrying, take a look behind you. You got company. Oh, no, no. I'm surprised that you try to run that old bluff like that on me. <laughs> you think it's a bluff? Hey, Blackie. Drop that gun, mister. I couldn't miss you from here. You better drop it, pretty boy. My friend Joe Black is a very nervous type. Yeah. Drop it. Okay. Now, well, that's a nice guy. Look, Blackie, I'll hold a gun on this citizen. There's a girl in the bedroom. Go get her. All right, Rogie. What are you going to do with me, Rogue? I haven't made any plans yet. You'll be taken care of. Don't worry. Why don't we keep this to ourselves, Rogue? There's play. Hey, Rogue, there's no Damon here. What? The window's open and she's gone. I, I heard a car pull away just as I came in here. Oh, that's fine. That's great. Well, well, it isn't my fault, Rogie. I, I did what you told me to and... You, you got away, huh? That's right. She got away. But we've still got the main attraction. That's you. Look, Rogue, there's no reason why we can't make a deal. I'm perfectly willing to cut you in for half the money. Uh, <laughs> how big of you. You have to watch those generous impulses, Shep. Next thing you know, you'll be giving away the sleeves out of your vest. Hey, Blackie. Uh, yeah? You just declared yourself in on five bills, okay? Sure. What do I do? Shake him down. I want half of a hand-drawn map. There's no point in us working against each other, Rogue. Shut up. Yeah. I'll get it for you. Keep your hands away from your pockets. Yeah, just keep them up in the air, and I won't have to break your thick skull. Uh, toss me his wallet, Blackie. Uh, quit squirming, you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there. There you are, Rogie. And a nice wallet it is, too. Uh, uh, maybe you'll let me have it, huh, Rogie? Uh, after you've taken a map out, of course. <laughs> oh, that's what I love about you, Blackie. You have such big ideas. Ah, well, quite a bit of dough here. And a driver's license. Glad to see that you're a law-abiding citizen, Chef. Oh, now, here it is. A little piece of paper worth 25 grand. Now, look, Rogue. Suppose I work with you. Just cut me in for five grand. A little late for that, Chef. Blackie. Yeah? I'm afraid our friend Shep might be a burden. Uh, you better put him to sleep for a while. Uh, you mean like this? Oh. 
You're so enthusiastic, Blackie. Now, let's get him tied up and slip him under a bed until we need him again, shall we? Of course. Uh, hey, uh, hadn't we better call in the cops, Rogie? Well, I didn't want the cops in on this deal yet. They get so inquisitive about murderers. I knew that Shep was as safe as a royal flush against three deuces. So I left him there, all tied up like a bow tie. I gave Blackie the slip and went to my apartment to get a little sleep. I opened the door and walked in, into a surprise party. Hello, Rogie. Where you been? What are you doing in my apartment, Urban? Waiting for you to get home. You got a warrant? Oh, now, Rogie, are we going to get technical? What do you want? You decided to tell me what you know about the killing of uh, Joe Layton? No. You might be making a mistake, Rogue. You know, sometimes you need a guy like me. What are you working on? I don't report to you, Urban. Go away. I've known you for a long time, Rogie. You're declaring yourself in on Leighton's murder. I don't think you did it, but uh, I think you know more than you're talking. Now, look, I've got a stake in this case. If I crack it, I'll let you know in time to get your picture in the papers. Will you settle for that? You're on the level, aren't you, Rogie? Well, you know I am. I've worked with you this way before, haven't I? Have I ever given you a bump pitch? No. Good night, Lieutenant. Good night, Richard. You have any ideas of slipping me a double cross, Rogie? Forget it. I've got a cell waiting for you, and I'm not above framing you. Remember that. I knew Urban wasn't kidding, and I had an impulse to call him back and tell him about the murder I had put away for him in that motel. But I thought better of it. As the door closed behind Urban, I heard another door open behind me. Hello, Mr. Rogue. Muriel. Why, honey, this is... Put up your hands. I'm going to get that map if I have to kill you. We'll return to our story in just a moment. But first, I'd like to tell you that glamorous women the country over are using Fitch's saponified shampoo for greater hair beauty. Here's what lovely Bess Meyerson, recently awarded the title of Miss America of 1945, told us in an interview. A long time ago, I discovered that part of being beautiful was being clean. So I keep my hair clean by shampooing it as often as I feel it needs it. I use Fitch's the Ponified Shampoo because it does not dry my hair or make it difficult to manage, no matter how often I shampoo it. Yes, beautiful women everywhere use Fitch's Saponified Shampoo. It does not dry the hair because it's made from mild vegetable and coconut oils. Even in hard water, it gives lots of rich, fragrant lather. It cleanses efficiently and gently. And here's a feature all women will cheer. Fitch's saponified shampoo contains its own patented rinsing agent. This rinsing agent works with the plain rinse water to make your hair sparkling clean. No particles are left to dim the luster and highlights of the hair. Best of all, you won't need to bother with a special after rinse. Give your hair a treat. Use Fitch's saponified shampoo. You can get a professional application at your beauty or barber shop or ask for an economical bottle at your drug counter. Richard Rogue is involved in an affair concerning $25,000 in buried treasure. There's a girl in the affair named Muriel Scott... And right this minute, the lovely Muriel is an uninvited guest in Rogue's apartment, where she's holding Rogue at the end of a forty-five automatic. I love girls, especially girls with Muriel's gifts. She had the kind of a figure that you'd like to add to your income tax, and a little baby face that made me want to hold her on my lap and tell her a story. But that gun changed everything. It ruined the intimate, romantic atmosphere that I would have preferred. Take your revolver out of the holster and drop it. Come on, I know how to use this gun. Okay, okay. Now back away from it. You know, uh, I have a strange feeling that you've lived through this before. I have. Keep backing. Okay. Mm. Now what? Sit down. Thanks. How'd you get in here? Through the window. The one of the fire escape. <coughs> now... What time is the first mail delivery at your office in the morning? Oh, it's about 9.30. I heard you tell Shep that the map would be there in that mail. I'm expecting it. Good. I'll get it then. What did you do with Shep? He's okay. Is he in jail? 
No, he isn't. I want my hands on that dough before I yell to the cops. Uh-huh. I want my hands on that dough, too, and I'm going to get them there. Are you, uh, comfortable? Yeah, don't worry about me. Look, baby, I, I want some coffee. How about you? Just stay where you are. Oh, but look, beautiful, it's only 11.30. It's 10 hours before the mail arrives. I can stay awake 10 hours at $2,500 an hour. Easy. Mm-hmm. Ah, it's too bad you're so hard to get along with. You're a very beautiful dame, you know it? Yeah, I know it. Just keep your seat, Mr. Rogue. I don't know whether you're going to like coffee the way I make it or not, Muriel. It'll be all right. Are you sure you don't want me to hold the gun while you make the coffee? Go ahead, make the coffee and stop talking. Uh, okay, okay, beautiful. Yeah, but you'd better, better listen to my proposition. Ah, we could do a lot together with 25 grand. Ever been to Rio? More toast? Thanks, Reggie. You know, you make pretty good coffee. And you make pretty good toast, Angel. Lots of butter. Don't you know that costs points? We won't need them in Rio, will we? No. <laughs> ah, we're going to make beautiful music together, baby. You know it? How did you ever get mixed up in a deal like this, anyway? Oh, he came through Pittsburgh. Mm, I know the town well. He spent a lot of money on me, and I thought I was living. Ah, you're too nice a girl to go around pointing guns at people. What did you do with that cannon, anyway? I left it on the kitchen table. Oh. You comfortable? Uh-huh. A few more hours, and I can go pick up that money, huh, baby? Yeah. Twenty-five grand. You know something, honey? What? I can just barely remember Shep. It's nine o'clock, honey. Let's get going, shall we? Oh, we we'll just about make it, huh? Yeah. Hmm? Oh, I hope that map's in the morning mail, don't you? Well, it will be. Don't worry. Come on, I'll help you with your coat. Mm-hmm. Hey, where'd you get it? It's a nice mink. Shep stole it for me. He was a petty larceny guy, wasn't he? Ah, let's not think about him, Angel. Come on. We we're on our way to the office in that letter. And Rio? Could be. Over here. Now, you stay in the car. I don't know whether there'll be any cops up there or not. And if I'm not back in five minutes, shove off. And I'll meet you in the lobby of the Hotel Bellevue in an hour. Oh? You're not going to take me to the office with you? No. Then leave me the half of the map you took from ship. I want to know you're coming back. Oh, sure. Sure, baby. Uh, here you are. Now, are you happy? Yes, I'm happy. Hurry, though, will you? I'll be back in a minute, beautiful. If I'm not, remember what I told you to do, huh? I'll be in the lobby of the Bellevue if you aren't back in five minutes, right? If that letter was in my office, I had this case whipped like Simon Legree had Uncle Tom. Then my wishbone was in my throat as I rode up to my office. The elevator had always seemed slow, but this morning it seemed to be going backwards. With just a few more breaks now, I'd be back at home, home base like the third fleet. I walked into the office, and there sat my shadow, Joe Black. I pitched him some fast double talk about ditching him last night, ran through the mail, found the letter from Duke Dickinson with a map. While I was jumping up and down and clapping my hands, I told Blackie what I wanted him to do. And then Muriel and I took off for the treasure hunt with a spade. Are you sure this is the right path? Sure. I've got the map right here, haven't I? Look, uh, look up ahead. There's the big rock he's got on. See? Uh-huh. And uh, there's the tree. Look, Rogie. Oh, the gun. You put it back. Do you have any plans about taking this money yourself? Oh, will you cut it out? Put that I rock back in I just want you bag, to know I've still got it and I can oh. use it. Oh, but look, baby. Remember me. Oh, I suppose I'm a chump. I'll put the gun away. Just for you. You big, handsome cutthroat. <laughs> Oh, 
Well, I paced off the location of that hidden treasure, just like it said on the map, feeling a little like Captain John Silver as I did it, and then I exposed my poor, aching back to the unaccustomed labor of making a hole in the ground with a spade. I will never be a fan of digging. I like my spades five at a time, preferably running from the ace down to the ten with a lot of dough in the middle of the table instead of in the middle of the pasture. But I dug. Richard, are you sure you're digging in the right place? I'm sure. We sighted in on that tree and that big rock. And if that petty lozenzy crook of a Duke Dickerson thinks this is funny, I'll personally hit... Hey. What? Hey, hey, pay dirt. Hear it? Yes. Hurry, Rogie. Dig it out. Well, do you want this shovel? I'm digging as fast as I can. There it is. See the top of it? Be there. Be there. 25,000. Well, baby, there it is. 25 grand. You want to count it? Let me have it, Rogie. Here, baby, you, you take care of it for a while, huh? Put it in your bag and let's get back to town and celebrate. Beautiful? All right. Just hold that pose. <laughs> Both of you, hold it. Hey, hey, what is this? Shut up. Give me your bag, lady. Come on, lady. I don't want to have to shoot any holes in that pretty dress you're wearing. Come on, give me that bag. No, I won't. <laughs> Next time I slap you with this rod. Now, give me that bag. Get your hands away from that coat there, mister. Thanks. Now, march. You look familiar to me, tough stuff. Yeah? Maybe I'd better put you away, huh? Hmm. Duke Dickinson must have sent out a bullet into all his friends. Shut up. Lay down on your faces, both of you. Now! <laughs> Shut up, lady! I just shot a couple of holes in your tires, that's all. Now, just take it easy and don't move until I'm out of here. Thanks for the dough. Come on in the office, baby. Now, buck up and stop crying. I don't suppose you're going to pay any attention to me now that the money's gone? You'll probably forget me as soon as you can. Oh, baby. <laughs> oh, hi, Urban. Hello, Rogue. Who's this? A cop. What's he doing here? He's here after you, baby. Oh, oh Richard. He wouldn't turn me into the... Hate to interrupt, but uh, what's the score, Rogue? Uh, this little girl helped to kill Joe Layton. <laughs> The guy who worked with her is under the bed at cabin number four at the Shady Glade Motel. How could you do this to me? After all the things you said and... and... It's... Well, it's... It's uh, not easy. But you see, baby, I don't approve of murder. Especially not in this neighborhood. Gives a block a bad name. Oh, no. No, Richard. Better take her away, Urban, before I take her away from you. She's a beautiful oh, girl, isn't she? Richard. Oh, Richard. Just... Well, that's the story. Of course, you recognize my old friend Joe Black as a hold-up man. You see, I figured that when Muriel and Shep went on trial, I would have less explaining to do if they thought some stranger had finally come up with the 25 grand. I gave Joe his 500 like I said I would. He beefed a little, but he took it. And then I took the 100 Duke owed me and 1,000 for the job that was agreed on, and... Then I took the 2500 that Joe Layton was supposed to get and sent it to Muriel's mother. Layton didn't have any use for it in the morgue. And I sent the rest to Duke in Kansas City. Made a nice score altogether, but... Oh, I still wake up in the middle of the night when I dream of Rio and Muriel. And that trip we were going to take. The money's spent, but the dreams linger on. They're wonderful. This is Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you noticed that I didn't get hit on the head in tonight's story. It was nice for a change. I hope you like the yarn. Ray Buffum wrote it, Lee Stevens composed and conducted the music, and D. Engelbach produced and directed. I want to remind you to make a date with us the next Thursday night. We're going to get mixed up in a strange affair about a photograph. We call it photo finish. Be on hand for the developing, will you? Thanks for listening, and good night, all. Now, here's Jim Doyle. Don't forget to tune in again next Thursday, same time, same station, when you'll again hear Dick Powell as Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. 
Remember, if dandruff is your problem, ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. Removes dandruff the first time it is used. Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo is the only shampoo whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance companies. This statement can be made by no other shampoo. Ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug counter, barber, or beauty shop. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H. The Equitable Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Tonight's file, The Sorrowful Swindler. Before opening tonight's file, it is my pleasure to bring you season's greetings from the Equitable Society. This week at the Equitable Society in the lobby of our home office building, we have decorated one of the tallest Christmas trees in New York. And this very afternoon, as we gathered round this tree and the sound of the traditional carols echoed through the halls, there was one pleasant thought that kept coming to our minds. We thought of all the homes in this country that are celebrating Christmas more merrily, more securely. We thought of all the children to whom Santa Claus will be more real, because someone in that home had the forethought to purchase life insurance. And we of the Equitable Society and the Equitable Society representatives all over America are happy to have done our share in bringing that kind of happiness to so many American homes this Christmas time. And so to each of our three and a quarter million members and to the other millions of Americans who enjoy this radio program, we of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States wish a very Merry Christmas and a very Happy New Year. And now to the file on the Sorrowful Swindler. With America virtually on the eve of celebrating her first peacetime Christmas in several years, the topic of crime seems hardly in keeping with the mood of the day. But then there is a negative kind of relationship between the two. Because it can be said truly that the doctrine of crime is the direct antithesis of the philosophy of Christmas. One is the religion of taking. The other, the religion of giving. And to the criminal, Christmas time is no more than just another time in which to ply his profession of cheating. Ply his profession of cheating. As demonstrated in tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Several years ago, during another Christmas season, a man using the alias of Colonel Weatherford and a companion in larceny were speeding eastward on a crack train headed for New York. You know, Colonel... Yeah? I still can't figure out how come we leave Chicago so quick. I think, Michael, we may sum it up in one word of two syllables. Like which? Police. You mean they were hep to us? They would have been, Michael, shortly after that check I cashed began to ricochet. Yeah, but suppose they get an idea we caught this train and they got the New York police waiting for us when we roll into Grand Central. Please, Michael... I'd rather not have to wrestle with that remote contingency for the moment. Huh? Allow me, if you will, to revel in a vision of the unbounded joy of my dear Valerie when I show her the fruits of this little mission to the West. You ain't going to give her the whole five grand. 
Valerie has demanded a mink coat of Santa Claus. And Valerie, my dear Michael, knows who Santa Claus is. Have your tickets ready, please. All right, get them right here, Colonel. May I check your ticket, please, madam? Oh, yes. Here's my ticket right here. Thank you. What time do we get to New York in the morning, Mr. Conductor? Nine o'clock. Well, I do hope my daughter is there to meet me. Sweet little old lady, ain't she? Yeah. You may keep uh, this part, madam. Oh, thank you. Oh, just a minute, please. Yes? I wonder if you'd help me. I have some stock certificates with me, which may be very valuable. Colonel, I'm listening. I'm kind of afraid to keep them in my berth with me tonight. Well, I'll be back directly, madam, and uh, we'll make some arrangements, I'm sure. Oh, thank you very much. Michael, I think Donder and Blitzen and the other tiny reindeer are about to make a landing on our own roof. Since crime never takes a holiday, neither does your FBI. And at about the same moment that the pompous gentleman on the New York-bound train became stock certificate-minded, Special Agent Barclay in the New York office of the FBI was handed a teletype from Washington. What does it say, Alan? Well, Jim, there goes my Christmas shopping push with Marjorie today. Oh? They want us to go to work on a swindler. Oh, anybody we know? No, he's avoided federal violations up to now. Well, what's the up to now? He put over a fraudulent deal in Denver a few days ago by posing as a United States attorney. Uh oh. He may have stopped over in Chicago, but they believe he's headed for New York. Oh, is this his home? He's got a record here. Well, who is he? Several persons, it seems. Colonel Josiah Weatherford and about six others. Well. Here, look this over and let's get busy. Right. While you're digesting the teletype, I'll check with the New York police. And also put a cover on railroad, plane, and bus terminals. <laughs> I didn't quite catch the name. Weatherford. Colonel Josiah Weatherford. Oh, yes. Uh, well, I'm Mrs. Greeley. How do you do? Uh, will you please sit down? Thank you. I came primarily to apologize for staring at you as I did. Oh, I didn't think anything about it. You see, you look so much like my own dear mother. Oh, then I feel quite honored. She passed on last March. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. This is to be my first Christmas without her. It'll be most desolate. Yes, I know it will. <sighs> you live in New York, Mrs. Greeley? Oh, no, no. It's too big a place for me. I'm just going there to spend Christmas with my daughter. How fortunate for your daughter. Oh, uh, I suppose that you live in New York? Well, I sort of divide my time between Chicago and New York. Oh. I have an investment business with offices investment in both... Investment business, did you say? Yes. Well, then maybe you'd know about my stock certificate. I beg your pardon? I mean, uh, know whether they're any good or not. No. Oh. Well, I don't know. May I see them? Oh, dear. I've already let the conductor put them away in a safe place for the night. Oh. You see, I was going to have them looked into while I was in New York. Uh, I could do that for you. You see, my husband has been dead about ten years, and I didn't know he'd left anything like that till... So the other day I was rummaging around in his old desk, and well, there it was, a thousand shares, all tied together. A thousand shares of what? A Lodestar Mining Company. What was that again? Lodestar Mining Company. Lodestar? That's what I thought you said. Do you know something about it? Uh, well, it's not listed on the exchange anymore that I know. Oh, then, then you mean it's, uh, it's no good? I wouldn't say that. I want to look it up for you. Oh. You will let me serve you on this, won't you? Oh, I'd be very glad if you would. Especially since that's your business. Well, now, you just leave everything to me and I'll be talking to you again in the morning before we get off the train. Oh, thanks. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> well, how'd you make out? Santa Claus is not merely knocking at our door, Michael. He's trying to break in with a pack full of gold.
Special Agent Farrell speaking. Morning, Jim. This is Alan. Hey, say, where are you? Grand Central, waiting to cover the Manhattan Limited when it gets in. Good. I was just going to have to hop over there myself. What's up? Well, Weatherford's on that train. How do you know? A teletype just came in from Chicago. He passed a bad check there yesterday. And a ticket agent at LaSalle Station remembers selling Weatherford and a man with him space on the Manhattan. Then I better run. It's about to pull in. Right. <laughs> Yes, sir, Mr. Barclay. A man of that description occupied space in car 254. Then what happened to him, Porter? Well, uh, he and the fellow with him got off at Harmon this morning. Uh Uh-oh. I sure wish I'd have known earlier. Well, we didn't know ourselves in time to be prepared for that trick. Well, thanks anyway. Uh, Oh, say, uh, uh, wait a minute. Yes? There's somebody might know something about him, and maybe she's still in the station. Who? A little old lady who had the space across the aisle from them. Oh? This man gave me a note when they got off at Harmon to give to her when she got up. What does she look like? Well, her name is Greeley. She's about five foot two, gray hair, and she's wearing... Michael. Yeah? Valerie's waiting in the apartment here for me. I prefer to see you alone. Yeah, I prefer the same thing. I'll wait for you downstairs. Splendid. Valerie? Valerie! I'm in here. Valerie, my darling, come here. Wait a minute. Not so fast. But, my dear, aren't you glad to see me? I don't know. How was your trip? How was it? Look, my sweet. Yeah. Five thousand dollars. Let me see one of the bills. They're genuine, every last one of them. Oh, my darling, I am so glad to see you. I have <laughs> missed you so much. Uh, uh, and now I can go right down this very day and get my mink coat. Oh. Um, well, you see, Valerie. What's the matter? Well, naturally, you're going to get the fur coat, Valerie. That's right. But tomorrow will be ample time. What is my sweet? I'm waiting for the hook. What is it? I merely want to retain possession of the money for the balance of the day. Go on. For five dollars a share, darling, I can pick up a thousand shares of Lodestar mining stock from a party who doesn't know their true value. Have they got any true value? Have they? Lodestar merged a few years ago with Rocky Mountain. Each share of Lodestar is still exchangeable for one share of Rocky Mountain, worth today one hundred dollars. Dollars a share. You mean put out five thousand and get back a hundred thousand? Exactly. Look, a mink coat on the back is worth forty in the window. Nothing doing. Well, darling, you can't. You buy. just dreamed this up to keep from coming across. I swear you. I didn't, Valerie. She's going to call me any minute. What? She? Now don't get excited, my dear. Don't get excited. It's a little old lady, a Mrs. Greeley I met on the train. She has the stock. Oh yeah. That's probably Mrs. Greeley now. <laughs> Colonel Weatherford speaking. Oh, hello, Mrs. Greeley. Are you at your daughter's now? No. No, she lives in the country and she didn't get my telegram until this morning. Oh, but she'll be in for me this evening. Oh, I see. Uh, it was snowing, so I took a room in a little hotel not far from the station to wait for her. Of course. Well, Mrs. Greeley, I have some good news for you about your stock. Oh, you have? How would you like to have $5,000 in cash for a Christmas present? $5,000? That's right. Now, you just give me the name of your hotel, and I'll be right over in a few minutes. You mean we'll be right over. Alan. Yes, Jim? Well, I mushed over as soon as I could. Good. I think this is our best prospect of getting a line on Weatherford. Mm -hmm. The Greeley woman checked her bag at the station, huh? Yeah. You got anything out of the conductor? Mrs. Greeley gave him what she said was some stock certificates to keep safe for her last night. Oh? Weatherford was across the aisle and saw it all. I see. Ten to one, he's trying to pull a swindle on her for that stock. Well, I hope she comes back for her bag before the job's done. Yes, but she checked it two hours ago. And a lot can happen in two hours. Weatherford? Yes? Uh, if the Lodestar Mining Company is out of existence, I, I don't see why the group this young lady represents 
wants to buy my star. Oh, you should make that clearer, Colonel Weatherford. Uh, the group still controls the Lone Star Company's property, Mrs. Grady. Oh. And they're going to start operating again. And they're willing to pay five, five, let's say five dollars a share for all the old outstanding stock. Well, maybe I'd better hold on to mine, and maybe it'll be worth more after a while. Oh, oh, explain it to her, Colonel. It may be years before it's worth a cent more, Mrs. Greeley, and after all, five thousand dollars is a lot of money. Uh, well, uh, well, I'll trust your judgment, Colonel Weatherford. Good, I'm sure you won't regret it. Do you, uh... Have all that money with you? Yes, here it is. Five thousand dollars. Fifty one hundred dollar bill. Gracious me. Now, if you have the stock, please. Oh, of course, yes. It's right here in my handbag. Splendid. Yes. <laughs> yes, here we are. Mm -hmm. And now I want you both to put up your hands. What? What's the meaning of that gun? Oh, it merely means that I know as much about Lodestar as you do, you old swindler. <laughs> and I wish I did have some of the stuff. Well, now, look here, you, you can't... You asked her if she didn't want $5,000 for a Christmas present, didn't you? But, but I... Well, haven't... I'm not going to give up my mink coat uh, this uh, evening. Uh, 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 be nice now. And back into that closet over there. Both so young. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe somebody will open it before Christmas. <laughs> Crooks don't qualify as men of goodwill, do they? So let's leave them for a moment while I tell you about someone you like. A man who is bubbling over with the contagious good humor that infects all good people this time of year. This week at the Equitable Society, I met a senior vice president coming out of the building. He was carrying a regular pyramid of packages in his arms. And just as I said hello to him... Something went wrong with the middle of the pyramid, and half of his packages fell out of his arms and slid to the floor. Serves me right, he laughed as I helped him to pick him up. Just what I deserve for putting off my Christmas shopping till the last minute and then trying to do it all at once. He paused and chuckled. And I'm the man who's spent his life telling folks not to put things off. My business in life is telling folks not to put off buying the life insurance protection they need. Well, I said, that's not such a bad way to spend your life, is it? We smiled and answered, saying, Yes, there are a lot of people in this world who are much happier right now because someone from the Equitable Society kept urging a husband or father not to put off buying life insurance. And believe me, that's a pretty pleasant thought for a fellow to entertain this time of year. Well, as I said goodbye to him, the thought came to me that it'd be a very fine thing if all members of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States had the same opportunity to know the officers of their society that I have. Could get to know the sincerity and human understanding that they put into their daily work managing the life insurance of three and a quarter million Equitable Society members. I've met all these men. And I've yet to find any stuffing in any one of their shirts or any brass in any one of their hats. No matter how important their jobs are, their doors are always open and their time is always at the disposal of members of this Life Assurance Society. You see, the officers of the Equitable Society are the kind of men who take pride in the thought that this week and every week for 86 years, the Equitable Society has been building security for you, your home, and your country. And now back to the file on the sorrowful swindler. There is a saying that no one is so easily swindled as a swindler. And the victim intending himself to commit a crime, can ill afford to complain to the law. Therefore, being denied recourse to the law, he usually takes matters into his own hands and generally with the same net result. Both are caught. At the moment, however, the little gray-haired confidence woman is trudging through the snow away from the hotel with $5,000 in $100 bills. 
while behind the locked door of the closet in the hotel room. But, Valerie, darling... Don't darling me, you financial wizard. Nagging me is not going to get us out of here. You'd just be glad it's a closet where there's not room enough to swing at you. Michael's waiting just outside the hotel. Sure, probably building a snowman. But he's surely seen the woman leaving by herself. Oh, of course, of course. He probably helped her across the street. You'd think he'd suspect something and come up here to see about us? Oh, no, that calls for thinking. Valerie... If you'll help me push against the door just once more, I'm sure we can force it. I should knock myself out getting you out of a closet. Look, you're in here, too. You got us in, you get us out. Very well. Five thousand and get back a hundred thousand. Please. Can't miss at the same. Oh, for heaven's sake, Valerie, shut up. Come on. Let's get out of here quickly. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, I'm warning you, I'm getting a mink coat tomorrow, or else... Or else what? Or else the police are going to learn where you got that 5000 in the first place. But, Valerie, darling, you can't... You heard me? <laughs> it's the mink or the clink. Well, it doesn't look like our Mrs. Greeley's coming back for a bag. She only checked it a couple of hours ago. Give her time. Yes, but in the meantime, this weather hey, could have... This looks like our little lady now. Yeah, uh, seems to fit her description all right. And she's going over the baggage counter. Come on. No, wait a minute. What? For one thing, somebody's trailing her. Huh? Look over there. And according to the conductor's description, that would be Weatherford's pal. Yeah, you're right. And item number two, do you know who our Mrs. Greeley really is? No. I had dealings with her a couple of years ago. That's an old-time operator who's known as Larceny Annie. What? So far as Weatherford and she are concerned, I'd say at this point it's a question of who has done what to whom. Well, then let's pick them up and ask some questions. And miss getting Weatherford? Hey, look, there she goes. And a shadow, too. Come on, Jim. Let's make it a convoy. What good is it going to do to come back here to the apartment? Michael wasn't in front of the hotel, was he? So what? Darling, please. Patience and fortitude. Probably saw the woman leave and suspect... Oh, just a minute. Hello? This is Mike. Say, what's going on? Where the devil are you, Michael? I seen the old lady leave the hotel by herself, and I said something's crazy about this. Where is she now? I'm in a telephone booth at the State National Bank. I said, where is she? She's standing in line with a deposit slip and a fistful of dough. Oh. What happened? We've been robbed, Michael. Yeah? Don't take your eyes off her until she holds up somewhere and then call me, do you hear? Sure, I If you slip up, Michael, it'll be a cheerless Christmas for you and me. What do you mean? Did you ever spend Christmas behind the bars, Michael? Not yet. Then do what I tell you or you will. Here comes Larson and his shadow back from the phone. He must have contacted Weatherford. What do you make of all this? I'd say that Weatherford has now learned how it feels to be swindled himself. He took somebody for the money first, and now Annie's taken him. Yes, which puts it up to us to take them both. What's your idea? You stay here and keep your eyes open. And you? If Weatherford's pal saw me talking to Annie, what would he probably think? Well, that you were a confederate of hers, maybe. That's all I wanted to be sure of. What? Maybe this will do the trick, Jim. Come, darling. Let me help you trim the Christmas tree. You better get out and trim somebody for that mink coat. I tell you, I'm waiting on a telephone call from Michael. I'm surprised he can even use a telephone. You should not disparage Michael's intelligence, my dear. Ha! Providence beat me to it. Michael is a simple soul, but a loyal one with a great amount of common sense. And on occasion displays a flash of superior intelligence. Maybe you ought to be working for him, then. May I fix your cocktail? No, and don't try to soften me up because I'm... Yes? It's me, Colonel. Well? I done what you told me. Where is she? You better meet me quick, corner of Madison and 91st. There are four corners, Michael, you know. Yeah, but I'll be standing on just one of them, boss. East side, downtown. You better hurry. I'll be there right away. 
You mean we'll be there. Then come on quickly, my dear. Now you shall have that mink. Here you are, sir. Uh, <clears throat> Valerie, my dear. Okay, okay. Here you are, driver. Oh, thanks, miss. All right, where is he? Uh, right over there. Michael. Oh, hiya. Where's the woman? I've done a good job of trailing her. You ought to be proud of her. I said, where is she? Right in that brownstone house. Well, what are we waiting for? Lead the way, Michael. Okay, come on. Went right in here, the ground floor. This better work. Please, my dear. Yes? Greetings, Mrs. Greeley. Well, come right in. Go ahead, darling. Hmm. Michael. I dare say you're a trifle surprised to see us again. Well, as a matter of fact, Colonel Weatherford, I am a little surprised the way things turned out, but we rather expected you'd come here. Who's we? Yes, what do you mean? What she means, Weatherford, is that you're uh, all under arrest. What? <laughs> what is this? We're special agents of the FBI. Huh? This is an apartment that we used on another case. It was also convenient to bring Mrs. Greeley here for questioning. We hoped you'd follow her. You mean she's working with you? Oh, not willingly, Colonel. But as you know, this is the Christmas season, and it's full of surprises for everyone. And now, your FBI would like to take this opportunity to wish for all of you a Merry Christmas and a happy, peaceful, and prosperous New Year. And through your continued support and cooperation, it will go on protecting your right to enjoy them year after year. Before we tell you about next week's thrilling case from the files of your FBI, a word about a man worth knowing. To your FBI, you look for national security. And to the Equitable Society for the Financial Security of Life Insurance. In the past 86 years, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States has weathered four wars and seven major depressions. During that time, over five and one-half billion dollars have been paid to policyholders. This tower of strength, security, and stability is represented in your community by a man whom hundreds of your fellow citizens know as their good friend, the Equitable Society agent, who, like your FBI, is dedicated to the protection of you, your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Murder on the High Seas. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Society's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Programs in this series of particular interest to servicemen and women are broadcast overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlson. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. Now this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time for This is Your FBI.
This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Pat McCracken, Johnny, returning your call. Oh, hi, Pat. How Southern California? My vacation on expense account, I love it. Well, don't overdo it. Just because the Jolly Roger matter interfered with that vacation you'd planned is no Now, reason. wait a minute, you promise, full expenses. <laughs> okay. When are you coming back to Hartford? As soon as I clear up the Lamar case. Want okay expenses on it now? Huh? Lamar? Yeah, Pat. This is a case that'll make your hair curl. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Lamar matter. Expense account? Ah, forget it. I'm on vacation. As far from Hartford, Connecticut, center of the insurance business as I can get. Yeah, I'm in La Jolla, California. And I'm staying in a big, ritzy motel called El Crescenta. Alone. Oh, there is a girl down here. A lot of them, in fact. But one in particular. Bonnie Lamar, her name is. Sounds like somebody in show business, doesn't it? But she isn't. Tall, five feet eight, brunette, pretty as the devil. And I gave her the line that my so-called business back east consists of nothing more exciting than running a filling station. How can you afford to come all the way out here to California for a vacation? To say nothing of staying at the El Crescenta. Rich uncle, Vonnie. Died and left me a couple of thousand to do with as I see fit. This is the way I see fit. Only a couple of thousand. Mm-hmm. Gee, that's too bad. A couple of hundred thousand, I might really fall for you. Oh, Vonnie, how can you? Hmm? Well, here I thought these last three days and evenings with you were due solely to my overwhelming personal charms. Your charm has nothing to do with it. Kiss me again, anyhow. With money around, who needed a couple of hundred grand? Yeah, the gal was just about all anyone could ask for. And I don't mean for just a quick vacation time romance. I'd spotted her the minute I'd landed here at this hotel. More like a guest ranch by the seashore. Beautiful, modern cottages set around a big green lawn with a swimming pool in the center big enough for the Olympics. Carports beside the cottages loaded with Eldorados, Continentals, and a handful of foreign sports jobs. And a beautiful big dining room and a building set up to look like an old clipper ship. And food and service worthy of Oscar of the Waldorf. And what was I doing here? On expense account, remember? Yeah, I'd spotted Vonnie the night I arrived from San Diego after clearing up the Jolly Roger matter and set my sights for her immediately. Naturally, I wondered what so attractive a girl was doing alone here. She cleared that up for me at dinner the second night. I still don't understand why Daddy hasn't arrived yet. Oh? He's supposed to join you on this vacation? We always spend our vacations together. At least we have since Mother died a few years ago. You're an only child? Yes. Really, a foster child... Just as we were about to take our plane, some crisis or other arose at the plant. <clears throat> so he made me come along and wait for him. Lamar Metal Products. Lamar Metal... Oh, yeah, yeah. Aircraft components, isn't it? South Bend, Indiana? Yes. You know how crisis can arrive in a business like that. Sure, I imagine so. Government orders and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, you'll probably hear from him before. Oh. Hey, waiter, would you like to get a... Senorita, a telegram for the lady. Oh, Excuse me, John. Sure. Here you are, Peter. Gracias, Peter. Oh, dear. What's the matter? It's from my father, and I don't like it. Listen. Must delay departure a few more days. Doctor's orders. Oh? Nothing to worry about. Stay there in La Jolla until I join you, love Daddy. Oh, that's too bad. But doctor's orders. There's nothing wrong with Daddy. He had a new insurance examination just a month ago. 
They gave him a clean bill of health. Uh, what company? Um, Try Mutual something or other, but what difference does it make? There's something wrong about this. I'm sure of it. Oh, why don't you phone him? Yes. Yes, I will. My cottage is right next door here. Come on. It was none of my business, but the name of Try Mutual rang an old familiar bell. Yeah, I'd handle a lot of cases for them. Anyway, she wasted no time in putting through a call to her father's private number in South Bend. Yes, operator? Thank you. I don't know why I didn't go to my own cottage to make this call. Mm, my pleasure. I guess I'm a bit upset by this wire. I don't blame you. There's nothing wrong with Daddy. There can't be. Well, maybe he just made the mistake of mixing too many oysters with too many martinis. Hello? Hello? Daddy, what's this telegram you sent me? Oh. Oh, I see. Oh, well, you had me scared for a few minutes. Oh, yes, fine. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Yes, if you must know the truth, I have. Johnny Dollar. Uh Uh-oh. Very. Careful, gal. Oh, he says he runs a filling station, but I don't believe him. (laughs) I'll tell you all when you get here. And hurry, darling, please. All right, Daddy. Good night, dear. Oh, thank goodness. You don't know how close your guess was, Johnny. Oh? It was just a slight case of indigestion. Plus the fact he wanted another day at the plant. Well, good. Then let's go back to the dining room and see what kind of indigestion we can accumulate. Well, that started it. Three days and nights of as much fun and relaxation as I've had in years. A wonderful place to stay, a private beach that I'll wager is second to none on the Pacific coast. Swimming, water skiing, skin diving, sailing, everything. Oh, this was it. Or so I thought. Oh, why make any bones about it? I'm a sucker for romance. And believe me, it wasn't hard to be serious with Bonnie. Johnny. Yeah? This is nice, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I... I... I don't believe in love at first sight. Do you? Uh, no. No, I, um... But it is nice, isn't it? Hey, whoa, gal. Mm Hmm? It'd be much too easy to fall in love with you, Vani. And I mean the forever kind. Well, would that be so terrible? You've you've got one big strike against you, you know. Johnny, what? M O N E Y, money. <laughs> you lose. Huh? I have nothing except what my father gives me. You know, allowance and for clothes and things. And <laughs> you know. So you see, I'm just as poor as you are. Only you aren't. Or you wouldn't be staying at a place like this. Another thing. You know absolutely nothing about me. <laughs> I know you don't make a living by running any old filling station. Johnny Dollar at the sign of the Flying Red Horse. Oh, stop it. Well, for all you know, I'm a, I'm a gangster, a safecracker, a jewel thief. Mm. Or worse still, playboy scion of a wealthy family who never did a lick of work in his life. In other words, a worthless bum. Don't say that, Johnny, even in fun. Had you fill them, huh? Yes, and their mothers. Old dowagers trying to marry them off to another wealthy family. Add the name Lamar to their end of the social register listing. Ensure the fortune with another fortune. I thought you said you were poor. Well, you know what I mean. A bunch of worthless fops, that's all they are. I've seen better men among the servants and chauffeurs, the little Mexican boy who helps one of the gardeners, and the young businessmen there in South Bend and in other cities. Maybe earning just enough to make ends meet, but but men, ambitious, hardworking, willing to get somewhere on their own merit. And... Well, you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Why don't you marry one of them, Bonnie? It isn't as easy as that, Johnny. You know it. Maybe I was waiting for someone like you to... Mm. I still don't believe in love at first sight. Mm. Good. Let me snuggle again. Like before we started this horrible discussion. Mm-hmm. The sun's going down, though, honey. And this little niche in the rocks is going to get cold. 
Yeah, look. Everybody else has left the beach. Come on, snuggle. I like it. <laughs> Kiss me. And I thought I'd have to ask for it. John, Johnny, what do you do? Well, hmm? well, I'll tell you. I live in Hartford, as I told you, and Wait. I'm really... Listen, he's calling you. Yeah, you too. Oh, the spoil sport. Well, maybe it's word from your dad. Here, up you come. Oh, I hope so. Come on, Johnny. Pedro! Pedro! Over here. Here we are. Here. What's up? Oh, senor, senorita. Telegrams. Telegrams? But the one for the senor was Mark Rush. So I rush. Good boy, Pedro. Here. No, I'll tip you when we get back to the motel. Stop si, by my cottage. Uh, Johnny, it, it's... What's wrong, Bonnie? It's from our family doctor. I'm afraid... Here, you read it. Sure, I'll be glad to. Regret having to inform you your father died a few hours ago. Suggest you return to South Bend immediately. Oh, Johnny! <laughs> it was a few minutes before Bonnie could pull herself together enough to walk from the beach up to her cottage where she could pack her things for the trip back to South Bend. I told her I'd make the necessary plane reservations for her. But what I didn't tell her was the contents of the wire I'd received, the one marked Rush. It was from Pat McCracken at Universal Adjustment Bureau. A request to call him at his home in Hartford immediately. I put through the call. Hello, Pat McCracken. Well, Killjoy, what's on your mind? Johnny? That's right. Hey, you got my wire. Why else do you think I'm calling? I tried to get you long distance all day. Your motel didn't seem to know where you were. Well, that was my doing. They might have spoiled a beautiful romance. But what's on your mind? Uh, Johnny, you've got to cut your vacation short. Oh, no, you don't. And you've got to come back to Hartford right away. What? Now, listen, I'm just... Yes, but plan to make a long stopover in South Bend, Indiana. South Bend? That's right. Oh, I get it. This is a gag. Or did you know I'd figured maybe on stopping over there anyhow? I don't know what you're talking about, but now listen... By a rare stroke of luck, we just got word of the death this morning of one of Trimutual's bigger policyholders. How much? A million and a half. <sighs> man named Thomas Rene Lamar. Lamar? Pat! Now listen, Johnny. The circumstances lead us to think it may be murder. <laughs> Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a set of circumstances arise that are enough to keep a man from trusting even himself. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. I have your party in Hartford, Connecticut now, Mr. Dollar. Oh, thanks. Just a moment, please. Hello, McCracken, Universal Adjustment Bureau. Hi, Pat. Johnny, 
Are you still in La Jolla? Didn't you get my telegram? Sure did. And I'm getting ready to leave for South Bend right now. In the company of a beautiful, charming, lovely... Now look, son, your vacation is over. Charming, lovely girl named Vonnie Lamar. Okay, okay. Now, will you... What? That's right. Thomas Renee Lamar's daughter. Does she know her father has died? Telegram for her arrived at the same time I received yours. You didn't show her my wife. No. She doesn't know yet that you think it might be murder. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Attention, Mr. Patrick McCracken. Following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Lamar matter. Or was it murder? Expense account item one. I'm calling it item one, Pat, because it's really the first tab on the Lamar case. Previous expenses here in La Jolla were charged against the Jolly Roger case. Expenses for the vacation you promised me and have now so rudely interrupted. Item one, $9.60 for that long-distance call to Pat McCracken in Hartford. Now, what under the sun is Vonnie Lamar doing in La Jolla? Vacation? Same as I was trying to take. Now, tell me something, Pat. Uh, Has a claim already been filed on Lamar's million-and-a-half-dollar policy? No claim has been filed. Well, then how'd you know about his death so quickly? Luck, pure and simple. The insurance company is Tri-Mutual, big office in Chicago, headed up by Lawrence Comstock. Oh, sure, known him for years, good man. Well, he's written all of Lamar's policies himself. He got to know the old man pretty well. Uh Uh-huh. Personal friends, you know, weekend golf together, same clubs, and both nuts about two-handed pinochle. So? Well, Comstock had been Lamar's house guest the past few days, and been with him practically every minute the old man wasn't at his plant. Was he actually there when Lamar died? Yes, yes. He was the one who called the doctor when the old man keeled over. Look, you keep referring to him as the old man. Just how old was he? Oh, not too. Uh, let me see. I've got it. Uh, he was 59. The doctor's name on her telegram was Wilson. You know his first name? No, I don't know. That stuff you'll have to get from Comstock then, South Bend. Okay. Well, at any rate, Johnny, he called me the minute the doctor pronounced Lamar dead and specifically asked that you be put on the case. Yeah, well, that's flattering. Okay, it looks like I am, but tell me something. Yeah? What makes Larry think the man was murdered? I'd rather not discuss it now. He'll, he'll give it to you when you see him. Our plane leaves in about an hour. No doubt you can be of some comfort to the daughter. Hmm? Her knowing that you're handling the case. Pat, that's the one thing I don't want her to know. I hung up, leaving Pat to ponder over that last remark. Wired Larry Comstock that I was coming and finished my packing for the trip back east. When I'd finished, I paid my bill at the fancy motel. And all I can say is, thank goodness it was on expense account. And I knocked on the door of the cottage next to mine. Yes, come in. Oh, Johnny. Hi, Bonnie. Any way I can help you? More than you have. You've been wonderful. Arranging the flight back for me. For us. Taking care of the things here. Johnny. That's right, for us. I'm making the trip with you. But you... I thought you said Hartford, Connecticut. And your vacation. Oh, the vacation's all over. Wouldn't be any fun for me to stay around after this. Oh, darling. And South Bend is along the way. I'd feel better if I kind of took you home rather than let you make the long trip alone under the circumstances. Maybe I have some business or something to attend to there. Darling, I, I don't know what... Easy, honey. Well, you, you made it so wonderful when Daddy couldn't get here these last few days. And now that this terrible thing has happened, you stick by me this way. That's the only way I'd have it. You... You're so wonderful. All right. All right. Come on now. Come on, get your things together. I've called for a cab to the airport in San Diego. Come on, you, Johnny. I love you for this. Sure. I can't say I exactly relish thoughts of the flight back east. Much as I hoped I could be of some small comfort to the girl. Much as I genuinely wanted to. Such things can be pretty rough. 
particularly in this instance. But I am an insurance investigator, and on a matter of this sort, a million and a half dollars at stake, the possibility of murder, well, it's up to me to suspect everyone, whether I like it or not. Yeah, I sometimes think it's a pretty rotten racket to be in. Johnny. Sleep, honey. Sleep. You'll need all of it you can get before you have to face things at home. I wasn't sleeping. I was just thinking. And being so thankful that you're here with me. Honey, I wired ahead for a hotel reservation. What? Yep. I'm going to stay in South Bend a few days. You wonderful one. No, no, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I also wired a friend of mine. Well, a fellow with whom I do business now and then. So I... Well, anyhow, I'll be there for, for a few days and maybe more. And as long as I can be of any help to you. It's funny. Hmm? You know, you still haven't told me what you do. Well, don't worry about that now. But I'm curious. Tell me. It'll give us something to talk about. Did you wire anyone at your home about your arrival? Yes, Harrison the butler. Johnny. Well, uh, how, how about the doctor who telegraphed you? Yes, Dr. Wilson, too. Honey. Wilson, Wilson. Wilson. Edward T. Wilson. Not tell me. No. No, now, you you stop talking and try to get some rest. But all... I'm going back to the lounge in the tail section so that you'll have nothing to do but get some sleep. Then you won't tell me. No. no. Tomorrow. I'll see. Thank you, Johnny. No, I, I can, maybe. Yeah, rough. Very rough. I felt like a traitor to her. Well, we landed in Chicago at 10 a.m. and took a cab from the airport to the Lamar home on the outskirts of South Bend. I'd never before realized that the big industrial city with all its huge, dirty, sprawling factories had such a wealthy residential section. And the Lamar home on Parody Lane was one of the most impressive of all, set far back in what must have been an acre of well-kept lawn. In addition to Harrison, the butler, we were met at the door by the housekeeper, cook, upstairs and downstairs, maids, and a couple of other servants, all of them obviously in deep sorrow over the passing of the master of the house. And may I most humbly for all of us express our deepest sympathy in this hour of this... <laughs> it's all... Thank you, Harrison. Thank you all. I'm going to my room and we'll call you when... Uh, yes, miss? This is Mr. Dollar. Mr. Dollar. He's to be admitted to the house. Any time he... Oh, I'll be here, Vonnie, as soon as possible. And you know where to reach me. Yes, Johnny. Thank you. And now to get to work, whether I liked it or not... I took the cab to the townhouse, dumped my bags, then back to Chicago in the office of Lawrence Comstock, Tri-Mutual's representative. He was waiting for me. Well, Johnny, you sure walked into something this time. Thick one, Larry? You don't know. You don't know the half of it. The million and a half of it. You gave Pat McCracken back in Hartford the idea that Lamar's death might be murder. I think it is. I really think it is, Johnny. Why? Tom Lamar was one of the best friends I ever had. He should have been. Your commission on the insurance he was carrying was enough to set you up for life. Oh, no, Johnny, don't talk like that. Tom was a good friend of mine, quite aside from business. I sold him his very first policy years ago, and he was just a bookkeeper for Atlas Processing Company, earning $70 a week. And when he married Delise... Delise? His wife, who died five years ago. Oh. That policy was only for 2500 straight life. So? Well, you know how little my commission was on that... But I liked him. I saw that he had a spark about him. That with the proper kind of encouragement, he could go places. And he did. Yeah, so I understand. I understand the Lamar Metal Products is a really big thing. General Metal Fabricators just bought them out. Oh? Yes, and Tom was getting all ready to retire. Spend the rest of his days having fun. Golf, fishing, winters in California, and summers in Minnesota, that sort of thing. And taking care of Vani, his adopted daughter. Yeah. Kind of worth taking care of, too. Eh? I know her, Larry. Met her in La Jolla, California. Oh, then you... Brought her back here to face the sad fact of her father's death. Why, I didn't... Oh, yes, of course. The family doctor, Ed Wilson. I should have realized. He sent a telegram to Vani to the same place you were in La Jolla. She's a wonderful girl, John. You're telling me. But, Larry... Yes? 
Something you told Pat McCracken back in Hartford has led him to think that possibly Thomas Lamar was murdered. John. Johnny, in the years I've known Tom Lamar... Yeah? I've not only known him, but I've known his family. Well? And much of his affairs, personal as well as business. Well? His wife, Delise. I would have married her long ago if I'd been able to. Oh, get to the point, Larry. Oh, yes, of course. And his daughter, LaVon. Vonnie. I wish she'd been my daughter, my child. Come on, Larry, come on, get at it. She's a wonderful girl. You said that. Oh, yes, of course. Well, there were things in her past, Vonnie's past, that even her mother and later her father didn't know about. But I did. For heaven's sake, man, get to the point. You too? Yes, me too. Yeah, me. The confirmed bachelor. Take him or leave him. Have fun. Forget him. Make a big... Come on, Larry. Listen, Johnny. Now, listen carefully. Dr. E.T. Wilson. Ed Wilson. An old friend of mine as well as Tom. Yes? It was Ed who made the last insurance examination. Four months ago. Thomas Rene Lamar was in better health than you are. After all, he was only 59, and he'd lived a careful life, taking good care of himself. Well, go on. We were sure of his physical condition. Sure of it. That's why I let him add to his already large policy. Larry, you've told Pat McCracken, and you've admitted to me that you think Thomas Lamar was murdered. Yes, John. Because of one man. Who? The one man who shared his confidences, business and person. Yeah? Who was closer to him than even Ed Wilson or me. Well, who? One man who alone could be sure of benefiting by Tom Lamar's death. Oh, look, Larry, that bush you're beating around is getting bigger and bigger. It's so simple, John, so discouragingly simple. <sighs> All right. All right, Larry, all right. Take it any way you like. I'm here for two reasons. Because I'm assigned to this case and because of Vonnie. Yes, I know. Now, who is it you suspect? The man Vonnie is really in love with. Oh. I'm sorry, John. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, some stuff I didn't want to hear, but I had to. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Johnny, this is Vonnie. Oh, yes? Please, come out here to the house, right away. Is something wrong? Johnny, I... You said you came back here to South Bend to... Well, because you didn't want me to have to be alone to face the death of my father. Yes, dear, I... Johnny, you also said you have business here. Well, yes. Is it... Is it connected with my father's death? Vonnie. Please, dear, don't lie to me. He was insured for over a million dollars. Or do you know that? I... 
Listen. Was this business of yours connected with Daddy? Was it because you two think he was murdered? Johnny? I'll... I'll come out and see you. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Lamar matter. The question, was it murder? The beautiful girl, Bonnie Lamar, and the beautiful romance I found during my so-called vacation at La Jolla, California. Well, things really got into a bind when she received news that her foster father back in South Bend, Indiana, had suddenly died. And I received word that I was assigned to the case. Not only because of the million and a half policy on Lamar's life, but because it looked as though it might be nothing more nor less than murder. From La Jolla, California to South Bend, Indiana, was only a quick flight by plane. And the first person I contacted was Lawrence Comstock of Trimutual, Chicago office, who'd issued the policies on Lamar's life. Yes, Johnny, the only two real friends Thomas Lamar had these past few years since his wife died were Dr. Ed Wilson and myself. And Wilson is the man you called in when Lamar died. Yes. You see, Tom and I used to spend a lot of time together. Weekend golf, belong to the same clubs, that sort of thing. And we used to love playing two-handed pinochle together. Uh-huh. Go on. I was with him at his house the night he died. And so unexpectedly, Johnny, as I told you, he'd had a most thorough physical examination only a few months before. Or I'd never have permitted him to increase his insurance to a million and a half. Must have cost him a fancy premium. It did. It did. Prohibitive. But that was the way he wanted it. For his adopted daughter. For Vani. Whom you know. And if you're half a man, having spent a few days with her in La Jolla, you're in love. Oh, shut up and tell me what you know, will you? You said murder. Oh, yes. I'm sorry, Johnny. It began last weekend. As I often do, I spent the weekend with Tom. Thomas Lamar. Well, Friday night, Dr. Ed Wilson was with us. We played three-handed pinochle. Yes, yes. Tom was in perfect health. I know he was. And our evening was all fun, completely uninterrupted. Except by young Marson. Marson? Tom's confidential secretary. And he's the one. Larry, you are the one who told Pat McCracken back in Hartford that you thought Thomas Lamar was murdered. That's why you wanted me to come on out here to investigate the case. Yes, Why, now, tell me the truth. Is it because of your great friendship for Lamar? Because of the million-and-a-half policy through your company? Or because you really think he was murdered? Are you here because of the commission you can earn on a case as big as this? Or because Thomas Lamar happened to be the father of Vonnie Lamar? I was ordered on this case from Hartford. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, of course. Okay. Okay. All right. Now, maybe I'm a silly old fuddy-duddy. Maybe I'm more worked up over this case than you are, whatever the reason. But let me tell you this thing in my own way. (sighs) Go on, Larry. Well, we know, Ed Wilson and I, I because of being so close to Tom Lamar so long, Ed because of his medical knowledge. We know that Tom was in perfect health. His 59 years were nothing for a specimen like him. Ed left Friday night. I stayed on. Saturday, we played nine holes golf. Tom wanted to play 18, but I didn't feel up to it. And that night, we played Pinochle, just the two of us. And we got to bed early. Well, Sunday, we just sat around and talked until evening when we played cards again. There was no strain, Johnny, even if the man had had a bad heart or something. I understand. Now, what about this Marson you named? We quit shortly before midnight. I was tired, my years, no doubt. And I knew Tom would have a hard day at the plan on Monday. And so I suggested we get to bed. He smiled, uh, as only Tom could smile. A warm, tolerant, yet at the same time understanding and friendly, completely friendly smile. Go on, go on. And he said he'd probably have to take one of Ed Wilson's sleeping pills to doze off so early. (laughs) But I knew, Johnny. You knew what? Sugar pills. That's all Ed had ever given him. Sugar pills. I think Tom knew it, too. 
Well? I went up to my room, Tom to his. I heard the water running in his bathroom. About the same time, I was brushing my teeth. And then the crash. Crash? Yes. I ran out through the hall to his room. He was lying on the floor of the bath. Broken tumbler beside him. He left the bottle of sugar pills still open. He'd taken one of them? Yes. And he was dead. You... You mean you no, think... No, no, I called Ed Wilson. He was there in only minutes. It was he who officially said that Tom was dead. Had died instantaneously. And he was sure it was poison. Peculiar color of the lips or something. What do you mean? It was some terrible stimulant to the heart. A very rare drug that only a few researchers would know about. Even the heart of a young and healthy boy would find the influence of this drug too much, too strong. Dr. Wilson told you this? Yes. What is this? Drug? I don't know. Something very rare. But he is sure... That's what did it. Well, what did the police say? You called them in, didn't you? Ed did. They'd never heard of it either, the drug. But they've sent samples of the sugar pills to Chicago and to Washington for analysis. Well? We should hear from them shortly. Where is this Dr. Ed Wilson? Oh, here. I'll, I'll just write you his address. Good, thanks. All right now, Larry. Yes? You told me earlier there was one man you thought might be responsible for this. Who? Walter Marson. Who's Walter Marson? Walter has been Thomas Lamar's personal private secretary for some years. Go on. And Walter has been married to Levon for over a year. Oh, I'm sorry, Johnny, because I, I know how you feel about her. Well. Why should that make him want to murder Vonnie's father? Because of Thomas's will. Tom made a will, Johnny, that left virtually everything he owned to the corporation of which he was the head, except for his life insurance. Is that why the amount of his insurance was so big? I suppose so. The sole beneficiary of the policy, as you know, is Vonnie. Well, go on. Go Therefore, on. the only way in which anyone else could share in the estate is by being married to her. All right, all right. You've knocked down a couple of dream castles for me. And I'm not talking about a family fortune. I'm talking about a girl. Yes, John, I understand. If she loved him enough to marry him, let him be happy. If he shares some of that million and a half bucks, so well, let him share it. He deserves to. If she wants him to. He married her, she married him, all right. It isn't as easy as that. What do you mean? You've forgotten you wanted to know why I think Walter Marson murdered Thomas Lamar. Yes. Yes, you see, I happen to know Vani did not love Walter. You just said she married him. Unknown to her foster father. What are you getting at? Somewhere, somewhere along the line, Walter Marson, shall we say, got something on Vani. What it was, I don't know. But he had a strange power over her, it seemed. Larry, what are you talking about? I don't know, Johnny. From the time Walter first started working for Thomas Lamar, I, well, I didn't trust him. And yet Tom seemed to have the most implicit faith in him. Walter was a good accountant, yes. Handled many of Tom's personal investments. And handled them very well, too. Thomas paid him very well. Rewarded him, always, when he made unusual profits. Why not? But Walter Marson made it plain from the beginning that he wanted to work his way into Thomas's shoes in the corporation. And this Thomas would not have. And the reason? Because Thomas knew that many of the stock deals Walter had made in his behalf were not completely, shall we say, legitimate. Or legally proper, perhaps. But not morally so, that is. Corporation money instead of his own, right? Yeah, that's it. Buying huge blocks in order to inflate the price and then dumping the stocks at their peak, that sort of thing. I don't know much of the details. That's out of my line. But Thomas knew very well that if Walter Marson were ever put into the corporation, he'd use the same slick methods for purely personal gain. At the expense of the corporation, he'd spent his life building up. How do you know about this? I was Thomas's confidant. His closest friend. All right, Larry. Let me do a little summing up. Walter Marson failed to dig into Lamar's money via the corporation. So he married his daughter to be sure of latching on to the family fortune. And that's it. Yes, it's as simple as that. Therefore, you're sure this Marson poisoned Lamar. Yes, and because of the findings of Dr. Ed Wilson. Which haven't yet been verified. Well, no. And even if you do find proof that Lamar was poisoned, you have no proof that Marson was back of it. No. Larry, what if Vani had something to do with it? Oh, no. Oh, yes, yes. That's a real possibility, isn't Good it? Good heavens, Johnny, you can't mean that. You, you say you know the girl. Yeah, sure. And I fell for her like a ton of bricks. 
Whether it's simply because I'm a sucker for such a charmer or just because she charmed me so well, I don't know. But why did she want me if she's already married? Johnny, what are you getting at? A million dollars at stake. A million and a half. How she could possibly have known I'd be staying at the La Crescenta in La Jolla, California, I don't know. But with a million and a half at stake, you could find out most anything. So she worked on me, got me on her side, even before she needed to. And when her father died, according to plan, she knew there'd be no question of settlement of a claim for the insurance because of the way she'd so successfully drawn me into a cozy little noose. Johnny, you're out of your mind. Am I? What are you talking about, you old... <sighs> yeah, I... I guess I am. John, I've been a confirmed bachelor all my life, even before I was your age. But I know very well that if I'd ever met Vonnie Lamar, my bachelor days would have suddenly ended. Oh, you're hurt. Now that you've found out she's married, you're hurt and you're angry. You're striking out at anything you can reach, anyone. And I'm sorry. Don't let it take away your judgment. I'm... I'm sorry, too, Larry. I... I didn't mean it. I really didn't... It's all right, Johnny. But now get hold of yourself. You have a job to do, not only for me, for the company, but for yourself. Okay, Larry, thanks. Good boy. I... I, I don't know what I'm going to do, but... I guess, whatever it is, I... I better start doing it. Yes. Good luck, Jim. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow? Well, it doesn't take long to find out what has to be done on this case, because the turning point in the whole thing comes straight to me, and with a vengeance. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dr. Edward Wilson, Mr. Dollar. Oh, hello, doctor. Mr. Comstock of Tri-Mutual Insurance asked me to call you. Regarding the death of Thomas Rene Lamar. Yes. I've just left the police department, the chief autopsy surgeon. Yes? There's no question about it. Thomas Lamar was poisoned. I... I see... I'd like to talk to you, Doctor. I understand you were one of Mr. Lamar's closest friends. Yes. And one of the beneficiaries of his will. That's quite... Where did you learn that? I didn't. It was a shot in the dark. No, look here, young... Better stick close to your office, Doctor. I'm on my way over to see you. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) 
Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Lamar matter. Now proven to be murder. As the facts of this case lined up, it appeared that Thomas René Lamar, wealthy manufacturer of aircraft components, had only two really good friends. Lawrence Comstock, who had issued him a million and a half worth of life insurance policies, and Dr. Edward T. Wilson, and a wonderful, lovely, charming adopted daughter, Laban, whom I'd met during my brief vacation in La Jolla, California, whom I'd accompanied back here to South Bend, Indiana, when she received word of her father's sudden death. What little evidence I've been able to pick up seemed to point to one Walter Marson, Lamar's personal secretary. Unknown to Lamar, he had married Bonnie, and therefore stood to benefit from his death. Oh, why kid about it? I'd fallen for the girl, heavily. And when I found out that she was already married to a slick, smart promoter, well, let's keep personalities out of this case, especially mine. I'd told Bonnie that I'd come up and see her out at the family mansion. But I thought I'd better contact Dr. Wilson first. Come in. Come in, Mr. Dollar. I've heard a great deal about you from Lawrence Comstock. And please, sit down. Thanks, Doctor. You said something over the phone that's bothered me. I won't mince words. Apparently, you and Larry Comstock were Thomas Lamar's closest friends. I don't think there's any question about it, my boy. And I'm sure Lawrence will verify that. He already has. That's why I took a shot in the dark and suggested that you're a beneficiary of Lamar's will, not his insurance. I already know that his daughter, Vani, gets that, but his will. Well, does that shock you? I suppose Larry's a beneficiary, too. Yes. Then either one of you might conceivably have had a motive for bringing about his death. What? Now, just a minute, you Relax, doctor, relax. I make no bones about it. This is the roughest case I ever tried to handle. Unfortunately, I started out by getting myself emotionally involved with Bonnie Lamar. Uh, go ahead, laugh if you want to. Hardly. She's a very wonderful girl. A bit mixed up at times, perhaps, because of... Uh... Well, because of what? Are you aware that unknown to her father, Bonnie was married? He is married? Yes, to some Walter Marson, Larry Comstock told me. Marson was Thomas Lamar's personal secretary. Did Lawrence tell you why she married him? I don't think he knows. It was a few short months after Thomas Lamar's wife died. A terrible blow both to Vani, who was completely devoted to her foster mother, and to him. By way of quenching his sorrow, Thomas drove himself in his work 16, 18 hours a day at the plant, all his waking hours, so that he would have time to think of nothing but his work. But Vani had no such outlet for her emotions. Her friends, a lot of rich 'er ne'er-do-wells, rich, worthless bums, if you like got her interested in gambling. She plunged into it with a recklessness and abandon that quickly got her into debt so deeply that there was only one way out. Her father didn't know? No, no. But young Marson did, and he took full advantage of it. In return for her agreement to marry him, he promised to quietly obtain the necessary funds from Thomas Lamar's investments, which he, Marson, handled. And he did. And she married him? Yes, But how could she? She didn't love him. You must realize her emotional state at that time. She was terribly upset over the recent death of her mother, and so was her father, of course. She knew the shock it would be if he ever knew of her gambling and the tremendous debt she'd incurred. She was beside herself, ready to do anything. So she married Marson. I could kill him. Now, let's get one thing straight, Mr. Dollar. Yes? You, too, were a bit upset when you came in here. You spoke as though you might think both Lawrence Comstock and I could have motive for wanting Thomas's death. I'm sorry, Doctor. I. It's true that we are beneficiaries of his will, at least Thomas assured us we were, but only in a very minor way. Thomas was loyal to us as he was to the servants who have been so devoted to him for so long. And whatever little he has left us and them... I'm sorry, Doctor. I... Oh, I, I guess I was just feeling hurt and angry and taking it out on anyone I could find... At least that's the way Larry Comstock put it. And he was right. Now I got a job to do. What have the police found out? Only enough to back up my immediate suspicion that Thomas was poisoned by pyridamron. Pyridamron? Yes, it's a little-known drug that produces tremendous but only momentary stimulation to the heart, causes the heart to almost literally burst, and it leaves virtually no traceable residue in the system. 
But you said the chief autopsy surgeon found out... No, no, no. He found only positive indication that pyrodamron had been used. I found the first clue to it only minutes after Thomas died. A staining of the tongue that even then was rapidly disappearing. Can you tie this drug in with Walter Marston? No. No, the fact that it was available at all has stumped both the police and myself. The last known source was a small island off the coast of Greece many, many years ago. And all the tiny plants from which it could be obtained as pollen were burned by the Greek government. But somebody, somewhere, must have had some seeds, planted them, and obtained this pollen. Yes. How do you suppose Mr. Lamar took the stuff? Well, it could have been mixed with one of the medicines in the cabinet in his bathroom, but we found no traces. Uh Uh-huh. Larry Comstock said you used to give him harmless sugar pills as a kind of sedative. Yes. Thomas knew they were perfectly harmless, but he occasionally took them anyway. (laughs) It was a kind of joke. Could this uh, pirate stuff have been mixed with him? We found no trace in the bottle. But you would have been able to. Yes. It is only an assimilation by the human body that dissipation is so complete as to make it virtually undetectable. Uh I'm afraid I haven't been of much help to you, Mr. Dollar. I think you have, Doctor. I think you have. It was only a hunch. But in this business, you sometimes have to depend as much on hunches as on common sense. I picked out the library nearest to the Lamar residence to do my research. Pyrodamron. You're sure that is the word? Yes. Can't you find anything on the subject? Nothing beyond what you found in the Pharmacopoeia Index, the name of the plant from which it is derived. Blepharia purpurus calandus. No common name. Yeah, no. Well, thanks. Of course, the main branch of the city library in Chicago might have something. Sure, thanks. Why, uh, yes, yes, I'm sure I can find what you're looking for. You see, I myself am quite a student of rare drugs and poisons. Oh, what's that? After a long, dull day here at the library, I enjoy nothing more than curling up in a big chair in my little apartment and reading detective fiction. Oh, Well, uh, where's the book? I'll show you. But quietly, please. We must maintain the proper atmosphere for our readers. Oh, sure. Yes, I know the poison pyrodamron very well. It was used in that wonderful story, The Case of the Yellow-Lipped Monster. Oh, excellent book. Thrilling. Oh, you should read it. Yeah, well... uh, Pyrodamron was new to me, so as usual, I had to find out all about it, and I did find out, too. The plant it's derived from, where it's grown, uh, where it was grown. You see, it's been extinct now for many years. Yeah, I understand. Oh, now, deadly thing, terribly deadly. But now here is the book that will tell you all about it. The title is Flora Exotica Mediterranea. That means exotic flowers of the Mediterranean. Uh, hmm, Flora Exotica Mediterranea. Hmm. What's the matter? Well, I don't... Oh, good heavens, it isn't here. Are you sure? But it was. I'm sure it was only yesterday. Oh, dear. Well, here, do you see? It was taken out from right here. Well, who took it out? I don't know. Won't your records show? No, I never permit any books to be taken from this section without my knowledge. Oh, never. Afraid somebody'd consult the stuff for ulterior motives? Oh, oh, dear, no. It's just that the only ones who want these books are the rabid whodunit fans like myself. And, uh, well, I like to talk to them. Well, isn't there some other book that might give me the information I want? Oh, not another book in the world. I know. And now, oh, tragedy. It's been stolen. <laughs> Well, this was one time a hunch didn't pay off. Quite the contrary. I'd wasted a lot of time. Expense account item 9, 520. Taxi out to the Lamar mansion. I was almost relieved to learn that Vonnie was not home. I'm very sorry, sir, but she and Mr. Marson left shortly afternoon to make the funeral arrangements. Thank you, Harrison. However, as you know, Miss Vonnie wished you to have full access to the house, and if you care to wait... How is she holding up, Harrison? Most admirably, Mr. Dollar, under the circumstances... Uh, Mr. Lamar's passing has been a terrible thing for her, for all of us. Yes, yeah, sure, of course. What will happen to the house, I don't know. Won't Miss Lamar continue to live in it? This morning she said no, that she'd travel for a while, and then settle down somewhere else far away from the city. Oh? And what about you, the servants? Oh, we shall, of course, have to seek employment elsewhere. Say, tell me, Harrison, didn't Mr. Lamar provide for you in his will? I do not know, sir, and I do not particularly care. His kindness and loyalty to us during his lifetime was far more important than any provision he may have made for us. Well, I guess that takes you off the list. Uh, Beg pardon? Nothing. So tell me, has Walter Marson been around much since Mr. Lamar's death? Yes, he's been most attentive to Miss Lamar, which we've all appreciated. He lives here in the house, you know. No, I didn't know. Harrison, I'd like to see his room. 
Sir? I'm going to lay my cards right on the table. I'm an insurance investigator. Here, my card. Why, I... Oh, I see. Miss Varney hadn't so informed me. Because she didn't know. Well, sir, I... Now show me to Marston's room. Uh, yes, yes, sir. Uh, this way, please. You like Walter Marson? Yes, sir, very much. Now. What does that mean? I've never spoken of this to anyone else, Mr. Dollar. For years, Walter Marson was a clever, scheming, conniving young man with overpowering ambition to take over the Lamar Corporation. So I've heard. I'm convinced that at one time he even tried to marry Miss Lamar and solely for the purpose of forcing his way into the business. Just trying to... Well, yes, sir. However, in the past year or two, Mr. Marson has changed completely. What makes you think so? Because of conversations between him and Mr. Lamar that I could not avoid overhearing from time to time. Mr. Lamar knew what Marson was attempting and faced him with his knowledge of it. Uh, here is his room. Go on. Uh, Mr. Lamar could have made it very difficult for him in view of his record. Prison record? Uh, yes, sir, for embezzlement. But instead he gave the young man another chance. So? Go on. And Mr. Marson made the most of it. He changed completely. I say without reservation, sir, that Mr. Marson is as honorable a young man as I know. Pretty sure of that, aren't you? Yes, sir. A butler living as close to them for both for so long can in very... Pardon me, sir, but does something give you the reason to think I'm mistaken? No, no. Unless perhaps it's this book I just found lying on his desk. Book, sir. Flora Exotica Mediterranea. <laughs> Here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the wind-up, and a switch that will make your head spin. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Larry Comstock, Johnny, at Tri-Mutual Insurance. You're out at the Lamar home. Yeah, Larry. Police crime lab find out anything more about the stuff from here they took in for examination? Yes. Yes, they certainly did. Well? They found traces of that poison, pyrodameron, on the toothbrush that Thomas Lamar was using just before he on died. To... Are you kidding? Oh, no. No, indeed, John. Not a bit. There's a murder weapon for you, a toothbrush. Larry, send the cops out here. I think I've just about got this case sewed up. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location South Bend, Indiana. To the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is my final entry of expenses incurred during investigation of the Lamar murder. And murder it most certainly was. It was in La Jolla, California, during my so-called vacation, that I met, and I must admit, kind of fell for Bonnie Lamar. It was from La Jolla that I flew her back to South Bend, Indiana, when we both received news of her foster father's sudden death. All the clues I'd been able to dig up seemed to point to one Walter Marson, 
who had been Lamar's personal secretary and who lived at the Lamar mansion. At his room there in the house, I found the one book in the world that described the poison, pyridamron, that had killed Thomas René Lamar. Poison derived from a pretty little yellow flower, once raised on an island near Greece. The flower was sudden death in its pollen. Huh? You're Johnny Dollar, aren't you? Harrison the butler said you were up here. And you must be Walter Marston. What, uh, what are you doing in my room? Let me ask the questions, Marston. Now, just a minute. Look, mister, you may as well know it. I'm an insurance investigator. So Harrison said, but I don't believe it. Right here, my credentials. Uh-huh. Oh, I, I see, but I, I thought... You that... thought I was just a boyfriend that Ronnie Lamar met in La Jolla and who just came back here with her to comfort her over the loss of her father. Yes, yes, that's right. Well, you were wrong, mister, or partly so. The main reason I'm here is to find out who murdered Thomas Lamar and why. And I think I've found out. You have? Well, well, who, Mr. Dollar? Interesting book you've been reading here. Flora Exotica Mediterranea. Stolen from the Central Library over in Chicago, wasn't it? Well, yes. Yes, it was. Found a poison in it, didn't you, Marston? Pyridamron. Deadly, quick, and hard to trace. So rare that the chances were pretty good it wouldn't even be recognized. But it was. Where'd you get it, Walter? As you said... The library. I'm talking about the poison, the pirate Dameron that killed Thomas Lamar. Oh, no, no, no. You're, you're all wrong. Am I? Who besides Vonnie would benefit from the million and a half insurance on Lamar's life? Well, what made you think that... that I know that you I'd would, be the... because I know you're married to Vonnie. Oh, no. You I, tried to inveigle I... your way into Lamar's business, but he wouldn't have it. All your chiseling and conniving and phony stock transactions got you nowhere. So you did the next thing you could think of. You got something on Vonnie and forced her to marry you. So you thought you'd at least be sure of a big hunk of the insurance money over my dead oh, body. Oh, no, look, Dollar, maybe I was yeah, married sure, to Bonnie, but... I found out about her big gambling debts, got her off the hook by some fancy manipulation of her foster father's investments. No doubt threatened to tell him all about it unless she did marry you, and thereby guaranteed yourself a prosperous future. Oh, and you timed the whole thing beautifully when she was emotionally upset over the death of Mrs. Lamar. No, Dollar, you, you don't know but what you're talking about. Couldn't wait for him to die a natural death. <sighs> Dollar! Mr. Dollar. Sure, go ahead, speak up and make it good. Well, I, uh, I was married to Vani. I'm not now. Sure. That's right. I did want a place in Lamar Metal Products, and I, I thought I could get it by showing Mr. Lamar how clever I was. <laughs> well, instead of throwing me out, he gave me another chance. I'll be forever grateful to him. It was a turning point in my life. I give you my word, Mr. Dollar, I've done nothing since that time that's been anything but completely honest and above board. Pretty speech. No, no, it, it's true. It's it's true, I swear it. Nevertheless, you married Vonnie in the hope We're that... We're divorced. You're... You're what? Well, it was the only honorable thing I could do. Would you like to see the final papers? Vonnie mailed them to me from Reno before she went to La Jolla. You mean she... Yeah, let me see them. Here. Yeah. Yes. Don't try to pull a gun out of there, Marston. You still don't believe me, do you? Yeah, there. Hmm. Then would you like to tell me who did murder Thomas Lamar? I wish to heaven I knew. That's why I got this book, hoping to find some clue as to where the pirate Dameron might have come from. But you sneaked this book out of the library. Because I was afraid of the very kind of suspicion that you've shown. Want to know something? I'm still showing. And I tell you, you're wrong. Ask Vani. She'll tell you. Oh, where is she? Harrison said you two had gone out together to make arrangements for the funeral. Yes, we did, and we came back together. But when Harrison told her that you were here to see her, she... Well, she she said she'd be back in a few minutes. Where did she go? Oh, she's still in the house somewhere, I I think. Marston, just what is your relationship with Vani now? Well, there... Never was any love between us. Our marriage was only on paper. Yeah? As the foster daughter of the man to whom I owe so much, it's my duty to do what I can for her. In spite of her... Never well, what? Oh, even to the end, we, we kept from him any knowledge of her dissipations, her drinking and gambling. I thought that was all over. Oh, no, she's more deeply in debt now than she's ever been. I'm I'm thankful Mr. Lamar died without knowing. Well, I'll be. But with the insurance, of course, you'll be able to pay off. Marson, you're a dirty rat, and your accusation isn't very well veiled. Are you trying to say that I'm accusing Vonnie of the... Murder. 
Oh. Mr. Dollar. Yeah, go on. This book. According to this, the plant from which Pirate Dameron is derived is now extinct. Unless somebody, somewhere, managed to salvage some seeds that were yes, then planted. Yes, exactly. Refera purpurus calendus, found only on a small Grecian island. I, I wonder if Dimitri would know about Dimitri? it. Dimitri? What's this sudden switch? Who's Dimitri? He's the old gardener. He's, he's here on the estate. Come on, Marson, and bring that book. Before going out to the gardener's cottage, I asked Harrison where Vani had gone, and he told us he only knew that she was somewhere in the grounds, that her car was still in the driveway. I phoned Larry Comstock again, but he'd left his office, presumably to come out here. And I called the man I'd talked to earlier at the library. Of course I can. As I told you before, I keep a very close check on the books in that section. Uh, let me see now. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Flora Exotica Mediterranea has only been out four or five times in the past several years. Once to a Mr. Thomas... Yeah? Uh, Thomas Hanley. Oh. Uh, to a Mr. Ralph Cummings, Miss Lavon Lamar, and... Uh... That's enough. Thanks. I tried not to show Marson how I felt as we walked out to the cottage of Dimitri, the old gardener. Could be nothing too nice for Mr. Lamar. So I always try to keep things nice. Yeah, I can see. Uh, Dimitri, Mr. Dollar's here to, to investigate the circumstances of Mr. Lamar's death. Investigate? Oh, yes. I hope you find who do this terrible thing to such a father. Well, I want you to look at this book. Here. Did you ever see a flower like that? Oh, yes. Yes, where? In old country. In Greece it used to be, but no more. You never saw it in this country? No, yes. Well, which is it? Uh, I should not say, because in old countries, against the law, I don't know why. Well, I do. Go on, Dimitri. But I keep many of my nice seeds anyway. And some of them were for this flower? Yes. You don't mind? It is very pretty flower. Did you ever plant any of them? Oh, no, no, not I. Somebody else? She was always so nice to me. Bonnie, Miss Lamar. <laughs> Look, sir. She even sent me gift on her trip last week. Dimitri. Look, look. You call it toilet case. See? It has soap and toothbrush and comb. Dollar. Dollar, look, look. That, that toothbrush. I am looking. The yellow stain on the bristles, the same color as the flower on this deadly plant. So, so... Pretty. She said her father, one of these two. Oh, Dollar, I'm, I'm sick. You sick, poor so man? So crude, so it, corny, it, and so obvious it would never be noticed. And she was safely a couple of thousand miles away, beyond any possible suspicion when the... Dimitri, uh, did she plant any of these seeds you gave her? She often planted many kinds. Where? He's... Show us. In the morning, maybe. It's getting pretty dark now. Now, now, now. Come on. Come on, Marcel. Yeah. I knew you... you... Must not tell her, I show you. She always keep her little garden secret. She not even think I know. She very sweet girl. Yeah, very. But not... You know. Oh, oh, wait. Huh? She there now, cultivating. Cultivating? With a shovel? Dimitri, go back to your cottage and stay there. Oh, you want... Come on, Marson. She's, she's digging. Digging. And I think I know why. She sees us. Go back. Go away, both of you. Stay here. I want to talk to you, Vani. What are you doing? What I'm doing is... I... I'm burying the little garden that was mine for Daddy. Little personal things, Johnny, that I grew with my own hands for him alone. Now that he's gone, this would be only one more bit of memory. Please... Leave me, Johnny, to finish. Wait, Bonnie. What? Before you turn under that little yellow flower. Here, I'll show you. No, Johnny, don't touch it. Here. Source of a poison called pyridamron. How did you know? Here, look. Oh, oh. no, you don't. I'll kill you, too. I'll kill you. Oh, nobody, no. Oh, Walter. Walter, help me. Help you, help you. No, Johnny was in love with me. But I turned him down, and he, he came out here. Oh, no and... good, Bonnie. I hate you. I hate you both. Everything would have been all right if you hadn't come along. I hate you. I... 
Listen, Johnny. A million dollars. A million and a half. You and I could... No, no, Johnny, please don't. Please! Believe me, this is one case I wish I'd never seen. Oh, sure, you, the company, are all right. You won't have to pay off a million and a half in insurance. Your gain. But me, I've lost something. Faith. Faith and... Oh, I'm sick over the whole thing. Expense account, I'll add it up later. Right now, I'm going out and get roaring... Get some flowers. Some clean flowers. And just sit and look at them. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now here's our star to tell you about next week's exciting story. Next week, tell me... Did you ever wake up from a pleasant dream to find a smoking gun in your hand and two bodies at your feet? Well, I have. Join us next week, and I'll tell you about it. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Heard in the cast were Virginia Gregg, Lawrence Dobkin, Harry Bartell, Eric Snowden, Howard McNair, John Daner, Gene Tatum, Joseph Kearns, Paul Richards, and Jack Moyles. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. And its 96,000 dealers present transcribed Mr. Alan Ladd in Motive for Murder, a suspense play produced and edited by William Spear. Remingchester, you look like a badly battered battery. A sorry sight indeed for an Autolite stay full battery man like me. Will Cox, I've just returned from a safari. Been hunting camels in Kilkenny. Camels in Kilkenny? Why, by St. Patty, didn't you know that the last camel in Kilkenny calmly curled up and died when the first Autolite Stayful battery landed in Ireland? He knew he couldn't compare with that teetotaling dispenser of pep and power. The Autolite Stayful battery, the battery that needs water only three times a year in normal camel, I mean car use. Such shenanigans, Wilcox. <laughs> Remingchester, Autolite Stayful batteries give 70% longer average life than batteries without Stayful features. And that's proven by tests conducted according to SAE life cycle standards. By the Blarney Stone. And furthermore, Autolite Stay Full batteries have three times as much liquid reserve above the plates as batteries without Stay Full features. That's why they need water only three times a year in normal car use. See no more, Wilcox. One thing more. You're always right with Autolite. And now with Motive for Murder and the performance of Alan Ladd... Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. Irish, you'd ask me? How is a guy a cop? You make with magnifying glass and bloodhounds. You make with facts, I tell her. You start with something you know for sure. Yeah. Yeah, you make with facts. But when you're a cop and you've got all the facts, 
What do you do when they're going to arrest? Arrest your own wife for murder. Even the reporters were nice. They didn't try to steal a picture of Mary, though there were plenty of them around. But I knew what they were thinking about. The little guy with the mustache sitting in my chair wearing a knife between his ribs. And about Mary, my wife. Lying over on the Davenport with a bourbon breath could use for a cutting torch. Jock Deuce and... He's handling it. My pal for eight years. He was doing what he could for a brother officer and a friend. But I knew what would have to go into his report. You see, I've made out too many of them myself. All right, all right. Boys, wait out in the hall till the basket gets here. Go on, go on. Yeah, but, Lieutenant, I ain't finished dusting the place go yet, man. Get out of the hall, please. Yeah, all right, sure, sure. Ah, um, smoke, Dave? No, thanks, Chuck. Well, she doesn't feel good. I'm going to ask you, Dave. You know who he is? Huh? No, I never saw him before in my life. His name's Hamilton. Victor Hamilton. How'd you find that out? Well, you sat there and watched me frisk him. Huh? Yeah, yeah, I guess I got some sawdust in my head. Seen a lot of dead guys, but not in my own place. Well, I just thought you might have known him, Dave, that's all. Funny you don't know the guy. Oh, look, Dave, I'm sorry about... I'm sorry it's your wife. Yeah, everybody's sorry. I can follow up the routine for an hour or two, maybe, but... Those guys from the DA. I office. know, I know. You're thinking of Second Avenue stuff. Spilled whiskey, broken glass, mere lipstick on dead man's cheek. She didn't kill him, Jock. Irish. Oh. Irish. I feel funny. She's awake now. Oh. Hello, Angel. Oh, hi, Irish. You're home early. Give me a kiss. Hello, Mary. Jock. Irish. She's drunk. Or drugged. Mm. We'll find out later. All right, Jack. I'm sorry. It's all right. Mm. Look, Angel. I want to ask you something. Mm. Why was Hamilton here? Hamilton? We don't know anybody named Hamilton Irish. A little guy with a gray mustache. Uh, oh. Oh, you mean the salesman. <laughs> I ordered a vacuum cleaner. He had to give me a demonstration. He cleaned the whole place. <laughs> he was a funny old man. I gave him a drink for doing all my work. <laughs> then what, honey? And then I... I felt this hurt in my head. And I, I saw you and Jack. I don't feel right, Irish. Baby. That set of knives in the kitchen. Mm. Did you use a chef's knife for anything? No, no. You know those knives scare me. Yeah. Uh, that's all you can remember, Mary? That's uh, everything? Yes, what are you two doing, practicing cops on me? Well, look, honey, the landlady came over to borrow a book. She heard the radio, but you didn't answer the bell. She got worried and used the passkey. Irish, what is it? We got trouble. Somebody used that knife on Hamilton. Oh, Irish. Jack, what is this? Why, Mr. Hamilton's sitting right over there, right? Irish. Oh, no! <laughs> Medic says that bruise on Mary's head is something she could have done on a chair arm or a door. Skin isn't broken. The swelling doesn't amount to much. So she was drunk and she fell down. Jock, you know she never took more than one drink. Let's hear the rest. Lab ran tests. Not finished yet. No sign of narcotic on her so far. Plenty of whiskey. Prints on the knife for hers. Well, why not? It was her knife in her kitchen. You're a cop, Dave. You can't beat the system. Everyone's leaned backward on this all down the line. Everything's been checked a dozen times. The system says she's guilty, Irish. You think she's guilty? What I think doesn't count. It's facts. Hamilton sold vacuum cleaners. He had business cards in his pocket, but there was no order book at your house and no vacuum cleaner. Well, you can see what that does to her story about that demonstration. You, uh, you better send a lawyer down to Harbor Precinct. Not yet. I want to dig myself. I know what you're thinking. She was slugged or drugged or both. And there was a third party. That's right. There was a third party. He slugged Mary and shoved that knife in Hamilton. Then he poured whiskey down Mary's throat and painted lipstick on Hamilton's cheek. There has to be a third party. Dave, I know you're trying, but you can't disregard what we found. Look, I've been a cop a long time, Jock. I know a woman will shoot a man or stab him or poison him and then stand there and scream what a louse he is. But a man did this job and I'm going to find him. We gave the neighborhood and the house the works and we came up empty, Irish. Then you didn't look hard enough. I'm going to go take a look. Wait a minute, Dave. I can't put you on this. The newspapers had crucified Because she's my wife? 
Because I might want to destroy evidence? Something like that. All right, here's the facts. I wouldn't want to get the department any bad publicity. Now, Dave, please. David X. Murphy, detective, second grade. It says I'm a part of the system, a cop. Give it to the commissioner with my regards. Oh, no, wait. Here, take this back, Irish. As far as I'm concerned, you're hunting the gunsel that knocked off those service stations. <laughs> How could you ask questions without a badge, huh? Thanks, Chuck. Thanks a lot. If there is a third party, find him, Dave. Find him. There is. And I'll find him. You make with facts, I told you. The start was something you know for sure. I knew Mary hadn't killed Hamilton. For sure. Fact. Strangers seldom kill each other. Ninety-nine times out of a hundred, the killer knows the victim. Hamilton had been stabbed at my house where he came to demonstrate a vacuum cleaner. The vacuum cleaner wasn't in my house. Hamilton had been killed for that vacuum cleaner. Fact. A vacuum cleaner? Is that a motive for a murder? Yeah? Police, I want to talk to you. Ah, oh, the police have been here. Well, they're here again. Victor Hamlin had an apartment here, and you're his landlady. I want to know about him. You do, huh? What do you want to know? The works, good and bad. Did he drink, gamble? Did he stay in nights or go out? Did he pay his rent? Start talking, and I'll listen. How would I know so much about a tenant? I got my work to do. Yeah, no maid to keep me. Almost breaks my back sometimes. Yeah, yeah, come on, now tell me. Oh, he lived like a monk. Paid his bills and kept to himself. I never saw no friends with him. Go on. I can't tell you any more about him. What do you think I am? I... Hey, Harriet. Harriet, come here. Yeah? What is it? This is a policeman. He's asked me about Hamilton. I thought you could help him, maybe, huh? Oh, Bob Victor. You know him, miss? Yes. Yes, I knew him. I'm Harriet Blodgett. I live in this building, too. Do I get to go back to my house for you? Uh, yeah, thanks. Fine. Uh. Well, miss? I wish I could tell you something, but I can't. I just felt sorry for Victor. Oh, Mr. Hamilton. He was small and he had no car. He... Used to carry those cleaners all over the north end. Now and then I'd fix him something to eat and take it up to him. That all? Nothing like you, man. I guess he wasn't interested. No compliment to me. What do you do for a living? Hostess, Elgin Restaurant, or Columbus Circle. Ever meet any of his friends? He was a lonely little man. No friend, no enemy. You're wrong. He had one enemy. The next morning, I was on the third floor of the Morgan building listening to a man named Richards, the sales manager of the vacuum cleaner company. Not house to house? Indeed, no. I'd like to have that absolutely clear. Our people work from lists supplied by us. We give the names prospects, and they close the sale. And make a fortune. Uh, well, not exactly. Uh, take Hamilton. A bad bat. Got pretty tired. Didn't have the old bounce, the old steam. A lot of sales got away. Bad bat? War wound, maybe. I don't know. He didn't talk much. You got his demonstrator here every morning, huh? We assign cleaners to each salesman. Whenever they make a sale, they bring a deposit in and get another new machine. Do they make reports? Absolutely. Every call. Give me what Hamilton turned in yesterday. Hey, why? Uh, oh, yes. Here you are. Hamilton's last report. 4502 Van Buren. 4510 Van Buren. 4515 Van Buren. No house to house, huh? Oh, you kidding. No friends, only one enemy. On Van Buren Street. That's where my killer had to be. Somewhere on a street that had its feet in the bay and its head in the clouds. From pawn shops to snob apartments. The 4500 block was middle ground. Somewhere in that block, Hamilton had put his thumb on one doorbell too many. I started to the top of the list. Police. Oh, no. My Herman's a good boy. He took that bicycle back. He is a good boy. <laughs> yes, Mr. Hamilton was here demonstrating a vacuum cleaner. He cleaned all my rug. I, I promised to keep him in mind. No, uh, no. Never let no strangers sell nothing inside of my place. No, never listen to what they got to say at all. Never. 
I went through 25 like that. 26 was bigger than the others. A half block of lawn, stained windows, and brick. Built by one of yesterday's fortunes when Van Buren Street was young. There'll be money in it somewhere. Somehow, I said to myself. This was money. He was tall, slender, and pretty. The mustache moved first. Please. My aunt's desperately ill. Police. Pol- but why? What do you want? We're checking. A little guy named of Hamilton came by here yesterday selling vacuum cleaners. He rang your doorbell with a lot of others. But he got himself killed. We uh, look into things like that. Oh. Whose house is this? Uh, my aunt, Cecilia Breckenridge. That chap was here. Hamilton, was it? An impertinent little fellow. He rang the bell several times, woke my aunt. I sent him away. He didn't get inside? Oh, no, not past the door. That's funny. The salesmen make reports. They list every house where they make a demonstration. Your house is on that list. Oh, it's a mistake. I sent him away. Mm-hmm. He didn't make any mistakes about his other demonstrations. He didn't lie. A mistake? I... But right, if you want it that way, I'll check the neighborhood. People see things. I'll find someone who saw him in here. All you. right, all right. He, he was here inside. Then why the run around? Well, my aunt, she's... Well, she's very old. It's my duty to spare her any unnecessary excitement. That's that's why I lied. And anyway, there's nothing she could tell you. He was here. He made his little speech. He went away. Mm-hmm. But I've got a report to make out. I know, but couldn't you make an exception? An imposition calling on people, bothering them. But it's better than having a murderer walk the streets. My aunt is really quite ill. I can be very gentle. Oh, it's embarrassing. Do you know what a persecution complex is? I read about them. Well, that's her trouble. She's old. Well, you know, Senna. She thinks she's being kept a prisoner here. Oh? (laughs) She's right, of course. If she weren't confined here, she'd be confined to an institution. She doesn't understand why. She's outlived all her close friends, and she wonders why no one comes to see her. And that's why you let Hamilton and his vacuum cleaner in. Well, I thought it would help. Instead, he made it worse. I see. Are you, uh, Breckenbridge? Well, my name is Dolph. Harold Dolph, her sister's son. I'm her only relative. I keep the place going. You know how old people are about family homes. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Let's go and see her. All right. This way. Celia Breckenbridge was sitting in a rocking chair beside a window that looked out over the backyard. She was thin and small. And she looked up at me out of blue, tormented eyes. Don't tell her that he was killed. It'll upset her. Aunt Cecilia. Aunt Cecilia. It's a beautiful day, Harold. A lovely day. Aunt Cecilia, this man is here to ask a few questions about that vacuum cleaner salesman you saw the other day. Oh. Oh. Now, be a good girl and answer him. It's... It's a lovely day, Harold. Mrs. Breckenbridge, I'd like to know what time he came in to see you. Hmm. Sometimes she'll talk, and sometimes she won't. Mrs. Breckenbridge... Do you remember how long he stayed? The way her mind is, it's hard to tell what to expect. Do you remember what he did while he was here? Oh, oh, it's a lovely day, Harold. A lovely day. you, Dave? Yeah, I'm in a drugstore at Van Buren and Hope. How's the coming out and give me a hand? What do you mean? I spotted that third party. He's tall and pretty and he's scared to death. Autolite is bringing you Alan Ladd in Motive for Murder. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Say, Reming Chester, were you in Limerick when you were hunting the Irish camel? Was I in Limerick? I invented the Limerick. Ah, but not this Limerick, old pal. Listen, a good name in Erin is Slattery. So's Autolite's stay full battery. Its watery needs a teaspoon feeds. Only three times a year is no flattery. Alas, poor Limerick. 
I knew him well. Well, you know that the Autolite Stay Full battery needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Why? Because it has three times as much liquid reserve above the plates as batteries without Stay Full features. Is it the leprechaun in you, Wilcox? Why, every leprechaun in Ireland knows that the Autolite Stay Full battery has a fiberglass retaining mat protecting every positive plate. That keeps the power-producing material in place, you see. In recent tests based on SAE life cycle standards... The Autolite Stay Full batteries gave 70% longer average life than batteries without Stay Full features. And remember, Autolite Stay Full batteries need water only three times a year in normal car use. Get an Autolite Stay Full battery and be right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage our star, Alan Ladd, in Motive for Murder, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. You start with something you know for sure Like the fact that Mary couldn't kill anyone Then you go to people and you ask questions You look for somebody who'll talk too much or not enough Somebody like Harold Dolph in a big old-fashioned house in Van Buren Street You meet his invalid aunt who only sits and dreams of 50 years ago And you look at tall and pretty in his $30 shirt standing there and you find out why go out and kill a man named Hamilton and steal his vacuum cleaner. All right, Dave, you've told me what you walked into. Now, tell me why you think Harold Dolph's the one. I tried to cover up before I could ask anything account it. He lied once. Oh, cut it, man. I've questioned people, too. All right, but there's something wrong in that house, something wrong about him. He looked like he knew she wouldn't talk before I asked her questions. I explained she was ill, a little crazy. Suppose she isn't crazy, Jock. Suppose she's afraid of him. All right, Irish, suppose. Maybe he's keeping a prisoner there. Well, you said he admitted that much. She'd be in an institution otherwise. But really keeping a prisoner in there. Why, though? Why? Money, money, of course. Her money. He explained it. Her family had money, not his. You looked into that part? No, oh, Jock, but I've seen his kind a hundred times. And gabardines that cost two fifty, standing around living off what another man worked hard for. Oh, it's a reach, Irish. A long reach. He's our man. I know it. He could stick around that house and torture that old lady by keeping her scared. He could kill Hamilton. Sure, but... Well, where does Hamilton fit? Uh, oh, I don't know, Jock. That old lady could tell me if I could talk to her. You could be awful wrong, Irish. I've been wrong before. All I want is a chance to talk to her without Dolph breathing down my neck. Yeah, yeah. If I'm wrong, okay. If I'm right, I want Dolph where we can make the pinch. He'll come out of there sometime. When he does, you trail a guy. I'll talk to the old lady. All right, Irish. Uh, hey, that him back in the roadster out of the carriage house? Hey, you're right. Check with the station any time you get a chance. I'll do the same. Right, Irish. She couldn't answer the bell I had to use my gun butt on the garden door This time she wasn't humming Just breathing slow, uneven I lifted an eyelid and felt her pulse Doped Then I noticed her hands Fine, long, delicately formed hands But no rings Yet marks that showed she'd worn rings most of her life Pictures of her all over the place showed her wearing rings. Rings with big stones and old-fashioned settings. Money. I went from top to bottom then. Attic to basement, every room. No rings and no vacuum cleaner. Harbor Precinct. Eddie speaking. Doc Dusen checked in yet? Who's this? It's Dave. Oh, Irish. Yeah, Jock checked in. Well, give it to me. I followed your man downtown to the Morgan building on 5th. Morgan Building? Yeah. Morgan Building? No house-to-house canvassing, only from lists. Hey, Irish, you all right? Yeah, thanks, Eddie. I'll call you back. Right. Oh, Eddie. Yeah, Dave? Send a car to 4698 Van Buren. There's an old lady down there, doped. Name Cecilia Breckenbridge. Take care of her. Nephew's name, Harold Dahl. Don't let him get close. Got it. Strict orders that he wasn't to be disturbed. All the salesmen were in for a big meeting today. Come on, and he... skip the act. Now, you can't go in there. I don't care if you are the police. You you can't go... What is this, Elsie? I... I told him, Mr. Richards, but he wouldn't listen. I left strict orders that... Oh. Oh, it's you. Mr. Richards... Beat it, he... sister. Now, see here. Such high-handed methods of entering a man's office. I'm a citizen of this And city you're and violating can... city ordinance 116, paragraph 5, code 2. You haven't got a peddler's license, and your boys are doing house to house. I distinctly told you we work from clients. That's not what I'm here. Don't know what the tall and pretty and the brown gabardines who came to see you a little while ago. Huh? Within the last hour, an officer from my division followed him this far. 
A tall man, uh, brown gabardines. Uh, but I... What do you want? Well, he just wanted to ask me about his vacuum cleaner. What about his vacuum cleaner? Well, he, uh, well, I had to tell him the same thing I explained to you this morning about how we handle our sales. What thing? Come on. But about a sale. When they make one, they bring the deposit money in and get a new machine to deliver to the customer. They can't sell a demonstrator. It's, it's used and worn. Is that all? Well, you see, he ordered a cleaner yesterday, and he said the salesman promised to deliver it, but he never got it. What salesman? He, he didn't know the salesman's name. He described him as a small man. Yes, a small man. All the man wanted really was a vacuum cleaner. My goodness, but he... he wanted something else. What? Well, he asked me for the address of that salesman. He said he wanted to talk to him about his vacuum cleaner that wasn't delivered. You gave the address to him? But I told you I don't know what salesman it is. It was. Just a little man, he said. So, so I remembered poor Hamilton. And I thought it might be... You told be... him where Hamilton lived? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. Yes, I did. Did I do something wrong? Driving across town towards Hamilton's apartment, I kept thinking of Mary and her question about how a cop works. No miracles, no magnifying glass, no bloodhounds, honey. Just facts. Facts to find a killer. An old house built with one of yesterday's great fortunes, fortune that dwindled down to a handful of wedding rings. Diamonds. Twenty or thirty thousand dollars worth of motive. Facts. A tall and pretty who was money hungry and liked expensive clothes and cars. Facts. A vacuum cleaner salesman apartment without a vacuum cleaner. Hey. You held out on me. What do you mean? You know how to throw that book at you? When I was here before, I went through Hamilton's apartment and there wasn't a vacuum cleaner there. But I never... Hamilton kept at least two cleaners here all the time. You kept still, hoping to grab one for free. But I never saw any... He didn't keep them in his place. He didn't want to lug them up three flights. He kept them somewhere on this floor. I didn't think you'd care. Where was it? The hall closet in back. He had a key. You'll give me yours now. And that's where I found the old lady's wedding rings. And sack on that demonstrator Hamilton used in her house. Facts. I had all of them now. And a minute later, I heard feet on the stairs. I left the cleaner sitting there in the hall and stepped back into the shadows and waited. Waited for my killer. Oh. Hello, sweetheart. I've been expecting you. We got business. Business? About your aunt's diamond rings. What are you talking about? Murder. Murder? It's an old lady waiting to die and you've been helping her with dope. What? Well, that's ridiculous. That's why you never let anybody in to see her. But you wanted some fun yesterday. Jokes. And you let a vacuum cleaner salesman named Hamilton come in and visit her. Now, see here, really... But as sick and as doped as she was, your aunt figured out a way so you'd never get those rings. She beat you, Dolph. All right, you've got... When you weren't looking, she took them off and threw them under the vacuum cleaner. Now, now, we can come to some understanding of... She wouldn't talk. You remember the salesman. Trailed him all over town. And you found him at one place along the line. You stabbed him with a kitchen knife, sapped Mary, and did Mary? the covering up with a broken glass, lipstick, and liquor. Mary? My wife, brother, and it's what? my place. Oh, when well, I look, I can get you money. Ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. Thanks. If That's you what th- I've been waiting for. <laughs> Please. He talked. Fact. Harold Dolph killed the salesman when he opened the cleaner and didn't find the rings. He didn't know that Hamilton had stopped off at his own place, where he left the demonstrator with the rings in the sack and picked up the new one he was delivering to Mary. Irish, how did you do it? With a magnifying glass and bloodhound? You know, honey, you make with facts. You start with something you know for sure. The fact that my wife can't be a killer. You see... I love it too much. Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Alan Ladd. Say, Wilcox, I've decided never to hunt Irish camels again, Bigori. Let me give you a tip, Reming Jester. You'll do better going for those Autolite Stay Full batteries and the more than 400 other products made by Autolite for cars, trucks, planes, and boats in 28 plants coast to coast. 
These include complete electrical systems used as original equipment on many makes of America's finest cars. Spark plugs, batteries, generators, coils, distributors, starting motors, bullseye sealed beam headlights. All engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly because they're a perfect team. So, friends, don't accept electrical parts supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on Autolite original factory parts at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. Next Thursday, for suspense, our star will be Ronald Regan. The play is called One and One's a Lonesome. And it is, as we say, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Tonight's suspense play was produced and edited by William Spear and directed and transcribed by Norman MacDonald. Music for Suspense is composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Bluskin. Motive for Murder was written by John and Ward Hawkins and adapted for radio by Jack Newman. Alan Ladd will soon be seen in the Paramount picture Captain Carey, USA. Don't forget, next Thursday, same time, Autolite will present Suspense, starring Ronald Regan. Batteries, Autolite resistor or regular spark plugs, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This week marks the 38th birthday of the Girl Scouts. Autolite joins that celebration and sends its warmest greetings to more than a million Girl Scouts of the USA who today are learning to become the better citizens of tomorrow. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Hello, Yukon 28209. Yes, this is Candy Madsen. Candy, this is a madder dash than the one made by Paul Revere. Look out for that man. I see him, Rembrandt. I know it, you know it, but does he? What's the reason for this wild scramble, girl? I started to explain, Ducky. Look at that car up ahead about a block. Yes, it's a police car. That's right, and do you know who's driving? Lieutenant Ray Mallory, that's who. A uh, whom? So Mallard's driving. There's no reason to get yourself up such a snit. I imagine the lad's driven before. I'm not worried about the mechanical aspects of placing a car in motion and guiding it to a predetermined terminal. It's the reason behind it that bothers me. What's that reason being what? I don't know what the reason is, and that's the rub. For days, Mallory's been avoiding me like the plague. I call him on the phone, all I get are muffled sentences. Nothing makes sense. Last night, I waited in front of the Hall of Justice and followed him when he left. And where did he lead you, dear? Into a pool room or some such thing? No. Pool room, I wouldn't have minded. I shoot a pretty good stick of snooker, you know. That's beside the point, Candy. Come now, concentrate. Where did Mallard lead you? To a small hotel on Ellis Street. He met a man in the lobby who was wearing dark glasses. They huddled in a corner and talked for a while. Then Mallard left. I didn't duck back fast enough, and Mallard saw me. Oh, brother, what a bawling out I got. How strange. With that, he got in his car and drove away like frantic. That certainly doesn't sound like Mallard. I called to apologize this morning. He wouldn't even talk to me. And now of this. He never drives a squad car unless it's absolutely necessary. Now you've got me curious. Something must be up. You're darn tootin' and I want in on it. Yes. Who does Mallard think he is keeping things from us like this? Oh, he's stopping. i better hold it up right here. He's getting out, Candy. So I see. Look, he, he's waving up at the middle flat. Do you see anyone in the window up there, Ducky? Yes, a man. I can't quite make out his features, though. Yes, yes, he's waving back. Well, what's Mallard doing now? Going up the stairs and in. How do you like that? 
Rather delicious, isn't it? Oh, I squirm with intrigue. Well, I squirm, too. Come on, Rembrandt, squirm out of the car. This is one time I don't mind doing a shadow job strictly for free. From San Francisco, the National Broadcasting Company presents another yarn in the adventures of that attractive private eye, Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. I knew there was something wrong three days before. Whenever I walk into Mallard's office in the Hall of Justice where he lieutenants for the San Francisco homicide, and all I get out of the big guy is an ugh, something's foul in Dixie. You can play that in any key you like. And the uggs kept up, mentally and verbally. Add that situation with Mallard's mysterious friend in the dark glasses and you've got something. Especially when Lieutenant Boy stops off at an old flat, waves to a gent, the gent waves back, and Mallard goes inside. (sighs) Now we're all tidy and up to date. We waited for about 20 minutes outside by my car. Two or three other people came and went. Finally, Mallard came out, carrying a very small box in his hands. He put it inside his coat pocket. The bulge wouldn't show any more than usual. That's where he keeps his police gun. Then he got in his car and drove off. Rembrandt and I immediately went to work. Object? A social call on our unknown friend in the second floor window. I must say, Candy, this is most mystifying. That it is, Ducky. In all the years I've known Mallard, I've never seen him act like this before. What are we up to now, Dove? We're going to take a look at the guy Mallard went to see. Find out what he looks like. What sort of a racket he's in. And supposing Mallard hears about it, won't you be even further into the doghouse? Indubitably, faithful old friend. But that's the chance I'll have to take. <sighs> Here we are. Little flat. This must be one of those babies built before the fire in the quake. Yes, all 1906 conveniences, including a door knocker. Well, give it a blast, Ducky. What did you say? This sort of place gives me a galloping case of depression. Yeah, I know what you mean. All the ghosts of the past half century. Try it again, remember. Any harder, and the building will slide off its foundations. What is this? You could have heard that last knock out of the Farallon. Maybe he didn't hear you. Anyone in the neighborhood would have heard that now. I'm going to try the door. Ah, voila. Except that it only moves about two inches. Shove on it, dear. My thought's exact. It gives a little. Help me, Rembrandt. Very well. Hey, hey, look. Under the door. That's blood. I wouldn't call it ketchup. Come on. Once again, and harder. (laughs) Oh, my word. That's the polite term. This guy's as dead as they come. And look. What, dear? This is the Joe Mallard was talking to in the hotel lobby, even to the dark glasses. I wonder what Mallard will say about this. I was wondering the same thing. Come on, Rembrandt. I don't think I feel very well. That was an understatement. I felt worse than that. But I had to follow through now. Our next step took us down to the Hall of Justice for a little visit with Mallard. He was in. Just beat his back by about ten minutes. He was still wearing the same scowl he had on the last time I'd spoken to him. You still mad at me, Mallard? No, I'm mad at myself. Did you stub your toe somewhere along the line, Minion? Is that it? No, but I'm about to. What do you mean by that, Footflat? You'll find out. And it's all your fault, too. You mean about last night, my following you? No, that was a dirty trick, but I forgive you. It isn't that. Then what is it? Yes, for goodness sake, stop sounding like a thruppany thrill book. I'll say what I have to say in my own good time, and nobody can force me to do otherwise. I've got news for you, Junior. The police can make you talk. The police? What kind of triple talk is this? We followed you out to that flat just now. We saw everything. What? Oh, the underhanded... So you know. Yes, but why did you do it, Mallard? Because I'm a fool. Just a plain fool, and I ought to have my head examined. And also, the poor fellow you left out there, he needs his head examined, too. He sure does. It's got a hole in it about the size a forty-five slug would make. Wait a minute. What are you talking about? Don't you know? I thought I did. Now I don't think so. Now, come on, quick. What's this hole in the head routine? He's serious, Candy. I really think he is. All right, I'm serious. Come on, spill. Okay, okay. I'll tell it to you like you don't know. 
We followed you out there. You wave up to the second story. Man looks out the window and waves back. Chuck. You go inside. We wait. Twenty minutes further away, you come out with a small object in your hands. You put said object in the inside coat pocket. Good report. Most efficient. You drive off. We go up to pay a visit. The host wasn't willing. He'd been shot to death. What? Oh, brother. And you thought I'd done it? Well? <laughs> <laughs> well, really, Mallard, I don't see anything to laugh about. <laughs> That's because you're not sitting where I am. Oh, Sister Susie, did you get your clues all fouled up? Let's get out of here. We got work to do. My mental reflexes climbed on a merry-go-round and whirled gaily for several moments. I was really confused. I didn't have time to do much about it because Mallard whisked us back to the flat. An hour later, the joint had been carefully gone over, photographed, and the body of the poor guy removed to the coroner's office for an autopsy report. It didn't take long to find out that I was right. It had been a forty-five that did the dirty work. Rembrandt had to leave, so I went back with Mallard to his office. Still think I had something to do with this thing, Cupcake? Oh, in, in my heart of hearts, no. But of course not. But jeepers, look at the facts, Mallard. You come out, we go up. The guy's stiff as a starch shirt. What would you think? The same thing you thought. Time element is what gets me. Not more than three minutes had elapsed between the time you left and the time we got up there. No, no. I can account for that, I think. But I'm not going to. As a matter of fact, there are several things I could account for, but I'm not going to. Now who's doing the triple talk? I am, deliberately. I'm going to tell you something, Candy. Listen carefully. You're a cute little old snoop. You've snooped your way into the middle of this thing, and I'm going to toss it right into your lap and let you snoop your way out. And when you come up with the right answers, you're going to get the shock of your life. I am he. I think so. At least it was quite a shock to me. You mean you've got the solution to this deal already? Part of it. You're a much smarter foot flat than I thought you were. I don't know who killed the guy, if that's what you mean. I take it back, then. And now you, you've really got me all topsy-turvy. <laughs> no, this is working out even better than I thought it would. Okay, Tootsie, you've got the ball. It's all yours. Take it from here. You mean you actually want me to help you on this deal? Sure. Who knows? You might come up with something. I'll beat it, will you? i got to find me a killer. I was so puzzled by then that I wanted to wrap the guy over his head. I fought off the impulse and left. If he gave me carte blanche on the killing, I was going to take advantage of it, if for no other reason than to prove I was right and Mallard wasn't the joker who did it. There's only one place to start, back at the flat where the guy had been done in. The cops had gone, so I did some question work. The landlady lived in the flat below. No, she didn't know the man. A gal named Jennifer Shirley had leased the middle flat for the past five years. I uh, swung a deal with the landlady, got the key to same, <laughs> not the landlady, the flat, and moved in. I had a good night's sleep and waited all the next day. Nothing. The odd thing about the deal was the fact that the cops hadn't been back. They usually return for a double check. So the next night I hit the sack again. About midnight, my dreams of a vine-covered cottage in the country with Mallard were rudely shattered by a sound. The sound of a key in the lock of the door. <gasps> oh, sorry, I frightened you, Jennifer. Take it easy, everything will be okay. Who... Oh. Who are you? Oh, oh, I'm coming to that. Oh, excuse me. And you are Jennifer Shirley, aren't you? That's right. Excuse my night here. If I'd have known you was coming, I'd have gone formal. Just what is all this? And what are you doing in my flat? Where have you been, Jennifer? Seattle? Why? Didn't you read the papers up that away? I was too busy. You know a man named Everett Stone? Of course I do. He's a very good friend of mine. He was up from Los Angeles on business, and I let him use my flat. And now you're here. I don't understand this at all. Look over there at your front door. Everett Stone was shot to death right on that spot. <gasps> Everett? Dead? <sighs> I can't believe it. I'm sorry. It's true. You can prove you were in Seattle, Jennifer. Yes. Here. My plane ticket receipt and the stubs on my luggage. I just got in at the airport less than an hour ago. Just for the record, where did you stay in Seattle? At the Olympic Hotel. We can prove that, too, can we? Of course. Now, wait just a moment. The shock of all this slowed me down for a second or two. 
Just who are you, and what are you doing here? Simmer down, Jennifer. My name's Matson, Candy Matson. I'm a private investigator. Oh, yes, I've heard of you. I'm trying to find out who knocked off your friend's stone. You got any ideas? Several. So have I. One being this, does everyone around here wear dark glasses? You've got a pair on, too. Same kind Everett Stone was wearing. Here, have a cigarette. Thanks. Got something you want to tell, Jennifer? Yes, I do. The dark glasses are standard equipment for the type of work we're in. And what would that be? We're gem dealers, precious stones. Whenever we have a valuable piece of property in our possession, we're required by bond to wear these dark glasses. A disguise, so to speak? That's right. Whenever it arrived from Los Angeles, he had with him the Cape Hatteras Diamond. You've heard of it? Who hasn't? Worth about a half a million? That's right. He was on his way to Seattle to show it to a prospective buyer. The first night here, Everett appeared on a television show to display the diamond. And as he left, he knew he was being followed. He called me and asked me if we could make a switch. Wanted to know if I'd take the diamond on up to Seattle and try to make the sale. And he'd stay here, is that right? Right. Well, it was a good switch, except that Everett got himself knocked off for his trouble. Have you got the diamond with you? Right here, in my purse. Look. What a little beauty. And not so little as that. No. Oh, it's the most gorgeous thing I've ever seen. And you just carry it around in your purse like that? Certainly. Who'd think to look in a woman's purse? <laughs> You've got a point. Lipstick, mascara, streetcar tokens, loose change, but not a half a million dollar rock. Did Everett say what the man looked like, Jennifer, the one who was following him? Yes. He wrote a complete description for me. Have you got it? Also in my purse. Here. Yikes. Miss Matson, you're white as a sheet. What's wrong? Plenty's wrong. This describes a certain Lieutenant Ray Mallard to a T. <laughs> From San Francisco, you are listening to a National Broadcasting Company presentation, Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. I slipped out of my nighty, slipped into my street clothes, slipped Jennifer a wet fish handshake, slipped out the door, slipped into my car, and slipped home to my penthouse on Telegraph Hill, and from there I kept right on slipping. That description was Mallard's beyond all doubt. What made it worse was the fact that Rembrandt and I had seen Mallard coming out of the flat with a small package that could have been a jewel box. I didn't sleep much that night, and that's for sure. In the morning, I put myself together as best I could and once again made the dismal journey down to the Hall of Justice and into Mallard's office. How are you doing, Cupcake? Not too well. I have some rather unpleasant news. Such as like what? Mallard Everett Stone was a gem broker. Good for you. You've got clue number one. You knew that? Don't be ridiculous, Candy. That came out of McGuffey's reader. Number two. He had the Cape Hatteras diamond with him when he arrived from Los Angeles. Atta girl, you're getting warm. He switched the rock to a gal named Jennifer Shirley. She took the diamond on up to Seattle because Everett thought he was being tailed. Hey, you're getting better and better. What's next? You mean none of this is news to you? Uh-uh. Old hat so far. Well, maybe this won't be old hat. Everett wrote a description of the guy he thought was following him. He gave it to Jennifer. It's you right on the nose, Mallard boy. What? It's you. Including the little mole you have behind your right ear. You don't look so good, Mallard, dear. Don't you think you ought to tell me what it's all about? Maybe I'd better. I can't for the life of me figure out it. Wait a minute. Sure. Of course. <laughs> you had me worried there for a minute, Cupcake. <laughs> Doggone, what is this, Mallard? I'm getting mad. <laughs> You'll find out. <laughs> oh, I'll find out. But when will I find out? Ooh, saved by the bell. Excuse me a minute, Detective Matson. Oh, sure. Lieutenant Mallard, homicide. Lieutenant, this is Sergeant O'Flaherty down on radio. We just got a report from Prowl Car 36. Yeah, O'Flaherty. There's been a dame killed out in that same flat, name of Jennifer Shirley. <laughs> It 
It was then I knew that Mallard was really in the clear. The phone dropped out of his hands and he looked as if he'd been slugged with a belaying pin. Mallard had work to do, so I left. Only this time I didn't go back to the flat. I have, um, tenderloin connections. So putting two and two together, I started making the rounds down around Turk Street. Turk, Ellis, Eddie, the whole section where the Easy Street boys hang out. I came up with nothing. Nothing until I stumbled into a little bar near Eddy Street on Leavenworth. I came face to face with an old acquaintance of mine. Name of, uh, Montgomery the Mole. Well, for crying in my beer, making it salty. Look what the high tide just washed in. Hiya, Candy. <laughs> Hiya, Montgomery. I ain't seen you since the night you caught up with me former pal, Willie Clark. Oh, I, I'm sorry I had to do that, Montgomery. Oh, I ain't. I'm gonna be too good for that crump bum. A oh, little second story work ain't too far out of line. I can even swell a, a well-executed stick-up. But when it comes to kidnapping and murder, uh-uh. Asana's characters draw the line. That's why I'm here, Montgomery. Yeah. There have been two killings in the last four days. Mm, the grapevine must be slipping. I don't hear nothing about no rump outs. They've been kept quiet for a reason. Just what the reason is, I don't know. Have you heard about any of uh, out-of-town ice men dropping in the last few days? No, uh, uh, not a one. Now, look, uh... Here's a, a 20, Montgomery. Mm. That's all I've got. I'll send you 20 more first thing in the morning. Is your memory improving? Ooh, 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 just like I never lost it. Well, is there a jewel boy in town? Look right ahead of you up at the bar. Yeah? That's him. If he ain't a hot ice juggler, my name ain't Montgomery. Got in just about the four days ago. Calls yourself Finch. Oh, Montgomery, I loves you. <laughs> I'm moving over there. Do me a favor. Tip the bartender off. Tell him to keep my drinks well watered. It didn't take long. A guy from out of town gets lonesome. I was sitting at the bar no more than three minutes, and we were old friends. He kept the drinks coming, and by closing time, he really had a snootful. He offered to drive me home, and oh, naturally, I accepted we got out on the sidewalk, and suddenly he darted back into the tavern. When he returned, he was carrying something in a paper bag. We found his car and climbed in. Don't you think you ought to let me drive, Mr. Finch? Ah, oh, no, 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 no. Quite a few. Ah, oh, I can handle this little old car. Uh, uh, I'm sort of a stranger here, you have to tell me which way to go. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, you go straight up Leavenworth here, and, and then you turn right on Bush. I'll direct you after that. Okay, doc. Oh, you think real pretty. Uh, when did you say you got into town, Mr. Finch? Oh, about four days ago. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, what sort of business are you in? Business? <laughs> I'm in no business. Retired, sort of. Oh. <laughs> Got lots of money. Get lots more, too. Mm. Hey, look out for that bag. Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. How clumsy of me. Yeah, Why, it's a purse. Why, Mr. Finch. <laughs> Put it back. I, it's a present for my sister in Riverside. Oh, how thoughtful. Oh, it, turn left on Kearney Street, will you? Sure. Then when you get to Washington, turn right one block to Montgomery Street. It's right on the corner. Uh, would you care to come up for a night, Captain, Mr. Bean? Hey, now, that sounds like a very good idea. Sure. <laughs> a nightcap. <Yeah. laughs> the corner of Washington and Montgomery is just half a block from Mallard's office in the Hall of Justice. With any luck, I could do a bloodless turnover to Lieutenant Boy. I reached down by my side, got my thirty-two out of my purse, and held it under my coat. We arrived at our destination, and Finch helped me get out of the car. There was only one pale light to illuminate the street, which was just what I wanted. Ah, there you are. You go ahead a little way, Mr. Finch. There seems to be something wrong with one of my heels. Oh, sure. Oh. Don't turn around, Mr. Finch. Not if you value your life. This is a gun I've got stuck in your back, and believe me, I know how to use it. Say, 
Hey, what goes on here? I'm almost broke, if that's what you're This after. isn't a stick-up. See that door up the street in that big building? Mm. Just keep walking right on into that door. He started walking, and I hung back a few paces. I didn't want to lose this baby. He was too good. Because that purse he had in the paper bag was the one owned by Jennifer Shirley. I'd never be able to get forget that purse. It contained the Cape Hatteras diamond. I marched him into Mallard's office, and Mallard was in. I gave him the full scoop, and in less than half an hour, we had one sad finch behind locked bars with the promise of a full written confession of two killings and one diamond theft. I had never seen anything fall into place so easily. A few minutes after we returned to Mallard's office from putting Finch into his ungilded cage, there was a knock on Mallard's door. Come in. Is I gum shoe? What on earth did you call me for at this hour of the night or morning? Yeah, come on in, Rembrandt. This ought to be fun. Tom, you too. Yeah. Why aren't you home getting your beauty rest? Oh, we just wound up a couple of killings, dear. Those of Everett Stones and Jennifer Shirley. Well, bully for you. And I had nothing to do with it. Candy did it all. I left her strictly alone and she came through like a trooper. There's only one little thing she's overlooked. When she comes up with that, she'll have solved her best and last case. Last case? What are you talking about, Mallard? Captain Mallard. This is Riley on the top deck. Captain Mallard? What is this? Yeah, Riley. We got this uh, Finch Joker all booked and fingerprinted. He's in the Lysol dip now, then we'll tuck him into Betty by for the night. Good. We're changing shifts now. Anything else you want from me? No, Riley. You can knock off. Fine, Captain. Oh, and all the boys up here send down congratulations. Oh, uh, thanks, Riley. See you tomorrow. You? You? A Captain well, that's right. Well, by Jove, I think that's splendid. Congratulations, Minion. Well, thanks, Rembrandt. Oh, I, I'm getting dizzy again. He's a captain. And, and what's this stuff about my best and last case? Give out here, Mellard boy. Doggone it, you're missing the most important clue in this whole case. Now, let's review it. Go ahead, girl. I'm bursting me buttons. Okay. I, I first get suspicious when you turn grumpy on me, Mallard. That's when I was wrestling with myself over, over a decision. That's right. Th- then you meet this stone guy in a small hotel on Ellis Street. Well, we had business. That's where he wanted to meet me. Then you go out to those flats. You wave, he waves, you go in. When you come out, you're carrying something. We go up, stone is dead. Later, I meet Jennifer Shirley. She shows me the Cape Hatteras diamond. But she also shows me something else. A description written by stone. A description fitting you exactly. <laughs> Here. Look what was in Jennifer's purse, along with the diamond. What? Another description. One that fits Finch. Everett Stone accidentally gave Jennifer the wrong slip of paper, the one that described me. Oh, for Pete's sake. That sure had me worried, Mellor, dear. Isn't there something else that worries you, Cupcake? Yes, there is, darn it, but I can't put my finger on... Wait a minute. That's it. The package. The one you carried down the stairs from that flat. At last, at last, you finally did it, Candy. Here it is, right here. Open it, see for yourself. Uh, okay. Well, it's beautiful. What a lovely ring. Did you steal this from Everett Stone? <laughs> sure did. The price he gave me made it a first-class deal. Uh... Why why don't you try it on? Ooh, (laughs) I'd love to. Oh, I I, I don't think you're putting it on the right finger, Candy. Which which finger do you mean? Third finger, left hand. Oh, you... You don't mean that... Mallard, tell me. I... I want you to be my wife, Candy, dear. Oh, say it again, will you, Mallard, dear? This is only another one of those fool dreams of mine, I'm sure. Ah, uh, it's not a dream, Cupcake. I mean it. More than I've ever meant anything in my life. 
Will you marry me, Candy? You big idiot. You don't need the answer to that. I wasn't asking you. Oh, yes, I'll marry you. Captain, dear. Forever and ever. Do you see now what I meant about this being your best and last case? Oh, yes, but you're wrong. I have another and a bigger case coming up. Uh, what's that, you little monkey? Just trying to be an awfully good wife to you. My word, I was wondering. Hmm? Uh, what, Rembrandt? When you're married, how shall I address you? Oh, that's easy. Just Mrs. Captain Mallard. Well, I won't even have to change my initials. For excitement and adventure and romance, just dial... Candy Matt. I mean, Mallard. Uh, Mrs. Captain Ray. Yukon 282. Oh, that won't be my phone number. I... Oh, gee, I'm so confused. I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> Heard on the program were Jerry Walter as Montgomery the Mole, John Grover as Finch, and Helen Klebe as Jennifer Shirley. Jack Thomas is Rembrandt Watson, and Henry Leff is Captain Ray Mallard. The program stars Natalie Masters as Candy and is written and directed by Monty Masters. Sound effects are created by Bill Brownell and Eloise Rowan is heard at the organ. Our engineer was Phil Ryder. The characters in the story were entirely fictitious. Any resemblance to actual people or names is purely coincidental. The program came to you from San Francisco, and this is Bud Heidi speaking. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.